Once again, I am at Limeridge. I have gathered some flowers from the garden and have brought them to the churchyard. I stand here in the bewitching twilight, and I almost persuade myself that I can see that poor, unfortunate woman kissing the marble cross and beating upon it with her hands. What an extraordinary chain of events has brought me here, and how it has transformed my life. The story I tell is one of mystery, villainy, and daring. It is a story of love, a story of deceit, a true story of the woman in white. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio in four episodes by Martin Wade With Juliet Aubrey as Marion Halcombe Toby Stevens as Walter Hartwright Emily Bruni as Laura Fairley, Edward Petherbridge as Mr. Fairley, and Jeremy Clyde as Sir Percival. Episode 1 The tale begins, I suppose, with my Italian friend, Professor Pesca. He had left his mother country for political reasons, the nature of which he preferred not to reveal, and had settled in England... We met by way of our work. He was a teacher of Italian. I taught drawing. One day, in 1849, at Brighton, he unwittingly set the adventure in motion. Oh, this water is freezing. Yes, but a cold dip is very beneficial for one, I'm told, if you can survive it. You can swim, can't you, Pesca? Of course I can swim. Well, the unpleasant experiences of this world are best met with courage and determination. So... Now, Pesca, I shall race you to the boat, the little blue one. Pesca! Pesca! Oh, my God! My good, dear chap... You know, of course, that I can never repay you. I don't wish you to repay me. I will always be in your debt. And whatever I do now, you cannot properly be rewarded. Let me tell you, nonetheless, of a small thank you that I have arranged. I have obtained for you the prospect of four months' employment. Uh, More, perhaps. Oh, yes? Where? In Cumberland. Limeridge House is the place. Your employer is certain Mr. Frederick Fairley. Four guineas to instruct two young ladies in the art of sketching and watercolours. It will all be perfection. I sent off my particulars to Mr. Frederick Fairley of Limeridge House, along with a testimonial or two. Within a week I had received a letter advising me that Mr. Fairley had accepted my services and that I must start for Cumberland immediately. My last evening before departure, I spent with my mother and my sister in Hampstead. We said our fond farewells, and then I walked back over the heath and down the high road. It was nearly one o'clock. The moon was full, the air close and sultry. I was immersed in my own thoughts about Limeridge House in particular, and whether I had made the right decision, and what the two Cumberland ladies would look like, and... Sir... Please. God Almighty. The hand was laid gently on my shoulder, and every drop of blood in my body seemed to freeze. I turned, and there, in the middle of the broad road, there, as if it had that moment sprung out of the earth or dropped from heaven, stood the figure of a solitary woman, dressed from head to foot in white. Sir, is that the way to London? Her face was bent in grave inquiry. Her hand pointed in the direction of the dark cloud that hung over the city. I asked you, sir. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Uh, Forgive me, I was was a little startled by your sudden appearance. I've done nothing wrong, sir. I've met with an accident, that's all. You must not be suspicious of me. Please, I am not, I assure you. And if you have no wish to explain why you are here at this late hour, I'll not press you on the matter. Tell me, though, if I can help you, and if I can, I will. You are very kind. I've only been in London once before. 
Can I get a carriage or is it too late? I have a friend in London. She lives in Guildford Street and she'll be glad to receive me. Promise you won't stop me from seeing her, please. I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know many people in London? Yes. <laughs> a great many. Do you know many people of the rank of baronet? No. You're not a man of rank and tight yourself. I am not. Good. Then I can trust you. Uh, may I ask, is there a particular baronet? You may not ask. I mustn't talk of it or I'll forget myself. <sighs> I've been cruelly used, sir. And cruelly wronged. We set our faces towards London. I confess I was bewildered. Here I was, in the company of a woman whose name and character, whose very presence by my side, were all a mystery to me. It was like a dream. Do you live in London? Uh, I do. But within a matter of hours, I am leaving. I'm going to Cumberland for a while. Cumberland? Oh, I wish I was going to Cumberland. I was there once, you know. I was happy in Cumberland. Oh, were you born there? No. I was born in Hampshire. I went to school in Cumberland. At a place called Limeridge. <sighs> what is wrong, sir? I was struck by the name you mentioned. That's all. Limeridge House, you see. Oh, the yes, place. the house. That is where Mrs. Fairley lived. Dear, kind Mrs. Fairley. But she's dead. And her husband, too. Their little girl, perhaps, is married and gone away and... She was about to say more, I think, about the Fairley family. But a cab came our way, and at her request, I hailed it. Perhaps I should come with you. No, I'm quite all right. I'm happy now. Give me your hand, sir. No. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I watched the cab disappear from view. I was perplexed, troubled. I had an uneasy sense that in helping her I might have done wrong. At the same time, however, I didn't know how I could have done right. On the opposite side of the road, I noticed a policeman strolling in the direction of Regent's Park. A carriage drove past me and pulled up alongside the policeman. Tell me, have you seen a woman pass this way? What sort of woman, sir? A young woman, in a white gown. No, sir. Sorry, sir. What's the matter? What's happened? What's happened? She's escaped from my asylum. I arrived at Limeridge House. During much of my journey, my mind had been fixed upon the woman in white. I had wondered if she had been found and returned to the asylum... I had wondered what would become of her if she was still free. Now, however, this conjecturing was put aside, for I was about to meet one of the two young ladies of the house. She was at the other end of the drawing room. Her back was facing me. I was struck by the rare beauty of her form and the unaffected grace of her attitude. <clears throat> uh, forgive me. Mr. Hartwright? She turned round. Oh. Her complexion seemed almost swarthy. The dark down on her lips was almost a moustache. Her mouth and jaw were large, firm, masculine. The lady was ugly. Mr. Hartwright, my sister and my uncle are in their respective rooms. The one with a headache, the other with his treasures and artefacts. So for the time being, you must make do with me. My name, sir, is Marion Halcombe. Halcombe? Yes. My late mother, you see, married twice. I am the result of the first marriage, and Miss Fairley is the result of the second. So she and I, in truth, are half-sisters only. Which helps to explain why we are as unlike each other as we possibly could be. She has beauty. I have none. Oh, I... Oh, please, Mr. Hartwright, to pretend otherwise would be absurd. To continue, she is an angel, while I am crabbed and odd. She has a fortune, but my father was poor and left me nothing. Despite these differences, however, we cannot live without each other, Laura and I. We are orphans together. You must please both of us, Mr. Hartwright, or else please neither. And what of Mr. Fairley? My uncle, you will please best by troubling him as little as possible. 
He never joins us at our meals. Keeps bachelor state in his own apartment. Oh, of course, he is not truly my uncle. He is Laura's uncle and her guardian. <sighs> there. You know it all now, I think. I'm grateful. Uh, but in reference to your family, Miss Halcombe, and to your mother in particular... Yes? Uh, I cannot help but mention an incident which occurred last night and which has been worrying me. A curious incident and a remarkable coincidence. And I proceeded to tell Miss Halcombe the full narrative of my meeting with a woman in white, of how she had talked of Mrs. Fairley in the most affectionate terms and had referred to the little girl, Miss Laura Fairley, I assumed, as if perhaps they had been at school together. Well, Mr. Hartwright, it is all very extraordinary, and I can understand why you have been anxious about the matter. Now, I think you did right, by the way, to protect the young woman's freedom. You do? Nothing you have recounted suggests to me that she was insane. Frightened, certainly. In a state of shock, perhaps. But not insane. I am glad to hear you say so, Miss Halcombe. The notion that I had let a mad woman loose upon London has caused me much self-reproach. You acted properly, I'm sure. Though I wish that you had found out her name. We must clear up this mystery. We really must. The village school, which my mother established when she came here, that still functions, uh, but there are no teachers there from that time. The only other recourse is my mother's correspondence. We have a large collection of her letters. I'll look through them and see if there's anything that might help us. Thank you. By the way, I would urge you not to speak of this matter to my sister, or indeed to Mr. Fairley. Laura is rather nervous and sensitive, and I wouldn't wish to alarm her. And Mr. Fairley? <sighs> Yes, well, he is nervous and sensitive, too, in his own distinctive fashion. And I don't think you will wish to alarm him. Mr. Fairley, sir. Come in, but do it quietly, if you will. Thank you, sir. You pray sit down, Mr. Hartwright. Uh, but don't move the chairs, you do so. The slightest noise, you know, cuts through me like a knife. Well, Mr. Hartwright, so glad to be able to possess you at Limeridge House. Mr. Fairley, believe me, the pleasure please, is all... Please speak more softly, if you will. The pleasure is all mine. Hmm. The pecuniary arrangements, are, are they satisfactory? Most satisfactory. So glad. And your room, will it suffice? Mr. Fairley... It is the most luxurious room I have ever seen. Good. Let me assure you, Mr. Hartwright, there is no want of taste and sensitivity at Limeridge House. Your status as an artist will be properly regarded, I can assure you of that. Put this tray of coins back in the cabinet, will you? <sighs> Exertion of any kind, you know, is indescribable torture to me. So, Mr. Hartwright, how is Mr. Fairley? In a fragile state, I think. How is our mystery? Still plunged in midnight darkness, I'm afraid. But I've only looked through a portion of my mother's letters yet, so don't despair. My sister has left her room, Mr. Hartwright, and is, I believe, in the summer house. Let me introduce you. This way. We walked through the garden down a winding path and approached a pretty summer house built in the form of a small Swiss chalet. Its single room was occupied by a young lady who was turning over the leaves of a little sketchbook. She was fair and delicate, with truthful, innocent blue eyes and a sweet expression. I was beguiled from the very first. Look, Mr. Hartwright, your model pupil. No sooner has she heard that the drawing master has arrived than she seizes her sketchbook and is ready to begin. Mr. Hartwright. Miss Fairley. Oh, delighted to meet you. The truth is, I was glancing over my juvenile efforts and becoming increasingly fearful that there is no hope for me. Laura, dear, you must let the drawing master be the judge of that. Well, if I do, you must show him your sketchbooks uh, too. I will. And when he laughs, I'll share the joke. <laughs> I trust that I will find an encouraging word to say about you both. Mr. Hartwright, I promise you, I wish for no compliments. I want the truth. Yes, and she meant what she said. I was certain. But there was something about Miss Fairley which troubled me. Something that was lacking, something incomplete. Or was it something lacking in myself which prevented me from seeing her as I should? I was to find out 
soon. Mr. Hartwright, I have something of interest to tell you. It was the evening. Miss Halcombe and I were in the drawing room. Through the French window I could see Miss Fairley walking slowly up and down the terrace, gazing at the moon's mysterious rays of light which slanted across the garden. There is a letter here, written by my mother to Laura's father when he was away on business. It mentions a Mrs. Catherick, who had arrived in the village to nurse her sister. Now, this Mrs. Catherick had brought her only child with her. A sweet little girl, writes my mother. Um, about a year older than our darling Laura. And my mother agreed to let the girl attend the school that she ran and to do so for as long as Mrs. Catherick was in Limeridge. I caught sight of Miss Fairley again as she walked by in the moonlight. She wore a dress of white muslin. Beautiful she looked in it, naturally, though it was very plain and unpretentious. Now, Mr. Hartwright, let me read you the rest of the letter. I have taken a strong interest in my new scholar, writes Mrs. Fairley. She is eleven years of age, a sweet, affectionate, grateful girl, but her intellect is not as developed as it ought to be, and she says the quaintest things. Yesterday, for instance, because her clothes leave something to be desired, I gave her one of Laura's old frocks to wear. White, I told her, suits girls of your complexion. Once more, Miss Fairley glided into view, but this time she stopped. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Fairley, she said, after she had kissed my hand. Thank you. I will always wear white for as long as I live. It will help me to remember you when I have left here. Well, the coincidence is interesting, is it not? Miss Fairley leant on the balustrade of the terrace, my gaze fixed on the white gleam of her gown. And notice, Mrs. Fairley reports that the girl's intellect was not as developed as it should have been. Well. Perhaps it has never developed. Perhaps even as a young woman she can't grow out of that grateful childish promise of hers. Yes. Yes, you may be right. No, but listen to the last few lines of the letter, Mr. Hartwright, and prepare yourself for a surprise. Dearest husband, there is a special reason why I am so fond of little Anne Catherick. She is not as pretty as our own sweet Laura, you will say that no girl could be, but in her hair, her eyes, the shape of her face, in all respects, young Anne Catherick... Yes, is of course! Laura's living likeness! But even before Miss Halcombe had said these words, I had leapt to my feet. The same thrill ran through me as when, that night, on that lonely high road, a hand was laid upon my shoulder. You see it. You see the resemblance, just as my mother did. Yes, I saw it. There stood Miss Fairley alone in the moonlight, and in her stance, the turn of her head, her appearance, she was in truth the very image of the woman in white. Now, of course, that sense of incompleteness I had felt when I first saw Miss Fairley, that was gone. The puzzle was solved. I had failed to recognize the resemblance between her and Anne Catherick, but now I saw it all too clearly. At Miss Halcombe's request, I kept the discovery of the likeness a secret from her sister, lest she should find it perturbing. But I was soon to discover something else with regard to Miss Laura Fairley. Well, ladies, what do you think? It is a wonderful view. Wonderful. Well, let us draw it, then. If we are to misrepresent nature, as I always do, let us manage it on a grand scale. An appreciation of the beauties of nature, it does not come to us by intuition. We must acquire it and practice it. And to do so, we must struggle against countless diversions and competing attractions. Yes. And even as I spoke these words, my eye was upon Miss Fairley, not upon the leaping waves and sand hills and moorland. My feelings were all for her, not for the distant scene. I was in love. Where is Marion? She went to her room to fetch something. Not her sketchbook, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, indeed. <laughs> Do you realize, Miss Fairy, I have been here almost two months? Is it so little? Well, now, I trust you didn't mean by that remark that time has seemed intolerably slow since I came to Limeridge House. No, I did not. Not at all. I meant that you have become so much part of our lives at Limeridge that it might be thought you'd been here for years. Are you happy here, Mr. Hartwright? Yes, indeed. 
Much more so than I deserve to be. Life here is almost perfect. Ah, uh, wait for the winter. Believe me, I would do. If I were given the chance. I would wait for the summer after, too. I would never leave. Play some more, please. It didn't occur to me that my words had betrayed me or had startled Miss Fairley into a sudden knowledge of the truth. But when we met again in the morning, a profound change had come over her. Those sweet lips no longer smiled at me. Her features had lost their animation. There was a coldness in her. Her nature, too truthful to deceive others, was too noble to deceive itself. It declared, he loves me, and I am sorry for him. Good morning, Miss Fairley. Good morning, Miss Halcombe. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, it is cooler today. Yes. The end of the summer, I fear. Yes, the end of the summer. Mm. It is so cool, in fact, that I think I'll go indoors. Well, before you do, Laura, I have talked with your uncle. He thinks that the purple room is the best, and it is being got ready. Oh, and he confirms that Monday is the day, not Tuesday. Monday. Very well. You'll excuse me. You're expecting a visitor? Yes. And his arrival, as it happens, is not unconnected with something that I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hartwright, I am not one, as you know, who likes to flatter. When I say, therefore, that in the time you have been here I have come to form a strong regard for you, you will know that I speak the truth. I'm very grateful. I would also like to think, Mr. Hartwright, that you and I are friends. I would like to think so, too. As your friend, therefore, I must inform you, in my own plain, blunt language, I have discovered your secret. My secret? You need not make a confession. Though you are, I know, too honest to attempt a denial, nor are you to be blamed. Pitied, rather. By forming an attachment to my sister, you are guilty of weakness and of lack of attention to your own best interests, but nothing worse. Miss Halcombe, I... No, I'm... let me continue. As I say, you are not at fault. Uh, nevertheless, the situation is this. You must leave Limeridge House. Leave? Yes, you must. When? As soon as possible, before more harm is done. Mr. Hartwright, this has nothing, I am glad to assure you, to do with the painful question of rank and standing. Nothing at all. I would ask you to leave where you are representative of the oldest and wealthiest family in England. Then may I know why? Laura I... Fairley is engaged to be married. Married? I see. Mr. Hartwright, you must leave for her sake as well as your own. Your presence has unsteadied her and made her unhappy. You see, it, it cannot be said that her engagement has a strong hold upon her affections. Can it not? It is an engagement of honour, not love. One which was sanctioned by her father on his deathbed. She was content to make her promise to the gentleman in question. She was settled in her mind and in her heart. But your arrival has threatened to disturb all that. Be kind to her, therefore, just as you were to that poor woman in white. Be considerate to her and leave Limeridge House. Yes. Well, I must. I will. Thank you. As you have heard, we expect a visitor on Monday. I understand. The uh, gentleman in question. I will go as soon as I can. Today, perhaps. No, not today. Saturday, I think. Give yourself time to find a reason for your going and to explain it to Mr. Fairley. As you wish. Mr. Hartwright, believe me, there is no hope for your love. Crush it, therefore. Don't shrink under it like a woman might. Crush it. Tear it out. Trample it underfoot. Am I permitted to inquire who it is that is engaged to Miss Fairley? He is a man of property. From Hampshire. Hampshire? And his name? Sir Percival Glyde. A knight or a baronet? A baronet, of course. Do you know many people in London? Yes, a great many. Do you know many who are of the rank of baronet? No. 
May I ask, is there a particular baroness? You may not ask. I mustn't talk of it or I'll forget myself. I've been cruelly used, sir, and cruelly wronged. I went indoors, back to my room. Thoughts and feelings crowded in on me. Sorrow, pain, bitterness and envy at the news of Miss Vera's engagement. Fear and foreboding, too. The various circumstances. The woman in white's fondness for Miss Fairley's mother. Her remarks about a certain baronet. The fact that Sir Percival had property in Hampshire. Where the woman in white had said that she was born, none of these perhaps exceeded the realm of coincidence. But the sense of eeriness and danger remained. The feeling that I was linked to a chain of events which even my departure from Limeridge House would be powerless to break. Come in. Mr. Hartwright. I had hoped that all painful subjects of conversation were exhausted for today, but it is not to be. There is, I fear, some villainy at work, an attempt to frighten Laura. To frighten her? An attempt, indeed, that has succeeded. Here. An anonymous letter addressed, as you see, to my sister. <sighs> Last night I dreamt of you, Miss Fairley. I was in church and you were about to be married. So pretty and innocent you looked that tears came to my eyes. And I dreamt that at your side was a man aged five and forty. And upon his hand was a red scar. And the tears that I shed became two rays of light. And with the rays I saw into the man's heart. And it was as black as night. And upon it the fallen angel had written in red flaming letters... Without pity and without remorse, he will strew his wife's path with misery. Who could have written this? Whoever it was is not illiterate by any means. No. But the sort of mind that could produce such a thing... ...is incoherent at the very least. You have not quite finished the letter, I think. Uh, Miss Fairley, I believe in dreams, and so should you... Inquire, I beg you, into the past life of that man with a scar on his hand. I urge you to do this because I have a great interest in your well-being. You are the daughter of a woman who was my first, my best, my only friend. I have been asking myself what should be done. I might seek legal advice, of course. I could do so tomorrow, indeed, when Mr. Gilmore arrives. Uh, Mr. Gilmore? He is the family solicitor, an old and trusted friend. His visit, I take it, is... With... Is in connection with the marriage, yes. Oh. I ought to tell you that during his stay here, Sir Percival intends to fix the date of the wedding. He has told Mr. Fairley that he is anxious that it should take place before the end of the year. Does your sister know about this? Oh, she does not know. Uh, was it posted here? No, a lad from the village brought it. I saw him myself. He said he was asked to do so by an elderly woman whom he'd never seen before. Perhaps we should take a walk into the village and see what we can discover. The letter didn't mention Sir Percival Glyde by name. No, it did not. But there were one or two particulars about the man in the dream. Yes, and they apply with accuracy to Sir Percival. The scar which came from a wound that he received in Italy. His age? Yes, Sir Percival is 45, I believe. 45. And Miss Furley is so young. True, but that doesn't mean they cannot both be happy. Our inquiries at Limeridge made no progress, and our walk through the village took us at length to the school. It was by now late afternoon, but we found a classroom still occupied by Mr Dempster, the schoolmaster and a sturdy, white-headed boy whose name it emerged was Jacob. I've been obliged to detain young Jacob, Miss Halcombe, because he's been frightening his fellow pupils. Frightening them? How? He's been telling them that he's seen a ghost. Well, I did see a ghost. Y you see? He persists in spite of all that I say to him. When did you see it? Yesterday evening, Miss. Miss Halcombe, please. It was all in white, as a ghost should be. All in white? <laughs> Yes, sir. From head to foot, sir. Where was it? In the churchyard. Of course it was. You've rehearsed your story well, Jacob, and you've taken the trouble to make it follow the traditional lines. I suppose you can also tell me whose ghost it was? Yes, miss, I can. Miss Holcomb, I know this boy. He's a very wayward boy. Whose ghost was it, Jacob? It was the ghost of Mistress Fairley. What? 
What did you say? Mistress Fairley, she that founded this school. Uh, you, you must forgive him, Miss Holcomb. He, he thinks he saw a white figure standing by the marble cross. And, of course, he and everyone in Limeridge knows that the cross is over Mrs Fairley's grave. Therefore... Yes, I understand. Listen, Master Jacob. Whatever it was you saw in the churchyard, or claimed to have seen, you did not see a ghost, so let us hear no more about it. Miss Holcomb. Yes? I must tell you, in my opinion, it was Anne Catherick that the boy saw. Anne Catherick? It may seem preposterous, I know, but he talked about a figure in white. Well, yes, as a ghost should be. It's possible, Mr Hartwright, that he invented the whole tale. But we know how dearly Anne Catherick loved your mother. If for some reason she had come to the village... Mr Hartwright... If she were here, would it not be natural for her to visit Mrs Fairley's grave? Well, it might well be, yes, but who is to say that she is in the village? The likelihood appears stronger, Miss Halcombe, if one considers the letter that was written to Miss Fairley. The letter? I said nothing to you at the time. I had this notion, but decided that my imagination must be getting the better of me. You believe Anne Catherick wrote that letter? Yes, I do now. Uh, these two events, the sending of the letter and the sighting of a figure in white, they surely bear each other out. Anne Catherick is in the village. I'm almost certain of it. Miss Halcombe, show me the churchyard, if you would, so that I can see your mother's grave. She took me to the churchyard and then went straight back to the house. I found the grave and looked around it. I looked at the marble cross. On the side which bore the inscription, the cross was clouded here and there by weather stains. But on the other side, I noticed that it was completely unmarked. Have you brought any news? Yes, Miss Halcombe, I have. Someone has indeed been visiting your mother's grave. Someone has been cleaning the cross. The work is quite recent, that's clear enough. And it is not yet finished. I see. I intend to go back to the churchyard. It was in the evening when young Jacob saw the figure there. Perhaps this evening the figure will return. I stood in the porch of the church and looked out. Before me a patch of bare burial ground, in the distance a strip of lonely brown hill and sunset clouds. A dreary scene and a dreary hour. I waited. A little more than half an hour elapsed. Then someone entered the churchyard. A woman dressed in a dark cloak. She walked to Mrs. Fairley's grave and stood there for a while, gazing at it. Then she went to the little stream that runs by the churchyard wall and dipped a linen cloth in it. She returned to the grave, kissed the cross, knelt down and began to clean the inscription. She was so absorbed in her work that she didn't notice me until I was quite close by. <gasps> it's all right. Don't be frightened. Who are you? I'm a friend. A friend? We met some months ago, late at night. Do you remember? You asked me the way to London. Oh, yes. I remember. You were very kind to me. How is it you were here? Well, when we last met, I told you that I was going to Cumberland. I have been staying at Limeridge House. Limeridge House? Of course. Oh, how happy you must be. Yes. Yes, in truth. I have been very happy. I looked at her saw Laura Fairley's face in Anne Catherick's. Of course, the face before me was worn and weary. It had none of the tender, delicate bloom which touched Miss Fairley's face. But it seemed to me that a single sad change to Miss Fairley's life, one act of misfortune, was all that was lacking to make the likeness complete. You know, I'm glad we have met again. I have felt anxious about you. Anxious? Why? Well... After you left me that night, a strange thing happened. A carriage came past, and one of the occupants spoke to a policeman oh. and asked if he'd seen you. He said you'd escaped from his asylum. <gasps> but the policeman hadn't seen you. And I said nothing. I could have told him. I could have said where you were going, but I kept silent. I helped you escape. Well, then, I am very grateful to you. You mentioned that night that you had a friend to go to. Mrs. Clements, yes, I found her. She is very kind to me. But she's not so much of a friend as Mrs. Fairley was. Dear Mrs. Fairley, my heart aches at the sight of a stain upon her tomb. 
It ought to be kept as white as snow. Tell me, have you known Mrs. Clements for long? She was a neighbour of ours in Hampshire. She took care of me when I was a young girl. Had you no father or mother to look after you? I never saw my father. He's dead, I suppose. My mother. I don't get on with her. We're a trouble and a fear to each other. I'm sorry to hear it. Mrs. Clements, though. She's good to me. She doesn't think I should be back in the asylum. Well, indeed, nor do I. There's only one thing I don't like about Mrs. Clements. She teases me because I dress all in white. She made me wear this ugly, dark cloak this evening. Do you know Miss Fairley? Does she wear white still as she used to when she was a girl? Is she well and happy? She wasn't very well or happy this morning. Oh. Would you like me to tell you why? She received your letter. How do you know it was mine? How do you know? I didn't write that letter. Yes, you did. And it was wrong of you. It was wrong to frighten Miss Fairley. If you have anything to tell her that is important, you should do it in the proper fashion. If, for instance, there's a good reason why she shouldn't marry Sir Percival Glyde, oh, then no, you must... Oh, no, please. Don't say his name. Don't say his name. Come, come this won't do. <laughs> Calm yourself. I beg you. But if only I would die, Mrs. Fairley, and be at rest with you. Oh, Mrs. Fairley, you know how I love your daughter. If I could save her, I would. Tell me how to save her. Tell me, please. <laughs> Before too long, an older woman hurried into view, alarmed by the sound of Anne's distress and angry with me for frightening a poor, helpless creature. But I managed to appease her and to discover that she was Anne Catherick's good, kind friend, Mrs. Clements. Soon the two of them left the churchyard. I watched as they went up the path that led to the moor, watched till all trace of Anne Catherick had faded in the twilight. And I was anxious for her, and sorrowful. As sorrowful indeed, as if it were the last time I would ever see her. You are quite sure? I am, Miss Halcombe. The word she spoke, the look of hatred and fear on her face when I mentioned his name. It was Sir Percival Glyde. I know it, who put her in the asylum. But why he did so, I just can't say. Well, we must discover the reason. And when we do, Sir Percival will have to satisfy any doubts there may be as to his conduct. If he fails to do so, he will not marry my sister, I assure you of that. How much more Anne Catherick is willing or able to reveal is uncertain. But it may be that she'd speak more readily to another woman than she spoke to me. She's staying at Todd's Corner, you say? Yes. Perhaps if Miss Fairley... No, I think not. This business of the letter has upset her enough. I shall go. The following morning... Shortly after Miss Halcombe left the house to find Anne Catherick, I headed for Mr. Fairley's study. A few months ago, Mr. Fairley had declared himself delighted to possess me at Limeridge House, but I had not set eyes upon him since. Now it was my task to tell him that I was obliged to leave. Something unforeseen has occurred which necessitates my return to London. A matter of life and death, is it? Uh, no, Mr. Fairley. Then I do not see that your request has any justification. Indeed, it is highly irregular. I, I am more disappointed and shocked than I can possibly say. Uh, I am very sorry. Not as sorry as I am, Mr. Hartwright. I have a right to refuse your application, you know. I suppose you have. But I must advise you, Mr. <laughs> Fairley, that even if you do refuse me, I still intend... Yes, stop. No, I forbid you to speak to me in that offensive, threatening manner. I forbid you to argue with me. My nerves won't stand it. <sighs> So? Your request is granted. Thank you, Mr. Furley. I plan to leave tomorrow. Uh, today, tomorrow, it doesn't matter. But when you do leave, make sure you manage it without a lot of noise. You are back very soon? Yes. Anne Catherick has gone. Gone? She left the farm along with Mrs. Clements at eight this morning. I spoke with the farmer's daughter there... She said that she was with Anne yesterday evening, a little after you had seen her, and that as they talked, Anne had started showing signs of distress and had fainted. Uh, why? Well, the girl couldn't understand it. But it seems that she had been telling Anne about events at Limeridge House, and one of the items of news, inevitably, was Sir Percival Glyde's expected arrival.
My hours were numbered at Limeridge House. I went out for a walk, took the path that led to the spot above the beach, a favourite of mine and Miss Fairley's. Now the view which he had sketched was cold and barren. The tufts of ferns and grasses were overcome by pools of stagnant water and draggled weeds. The flowers whose names she had taught me and whose forms I had taught her to draw they were gone. Leaves fell around me. The sky was grey. Winter was approaching, but it already gripped my heart. My name, sir, is Gilmore. Ah, yes, the family solicitor. Pleased to meet you. Uh, Miss Halcombe has already told me about the anonymous letter and has indicated that you have an interest in the affair. Yes. I uh, would like to inform you, therefore, that I have decided to send a copy of the letter to Sir Percival Glyde's solicitor. Have you indeed? I'm glad of that. Thank you. It's an unpleasant, unsavoury business. But Sir Percival's standing is very high, you know. And I'm certain that nothing has occurred which could sully his reputation. Now, I feel quite easy about it all. Oh, do you? In my experience of our sad state of society, things like this happen all too often. Unfortunate women, malicious letters... I'm afraid, Mr. Gilmore, that I see the matter differently. Just so. Just so. I am old and I take the professional view. You are young. Your view, therefore, is romantically inclined. Just so. Well, events will decide. Charming places, though it's not what it was. Saturday morning. My bags were being brought down from my room, and it was time for leave-taking. So, Mr. Hartwright. Miss Halcombe. Miss Fairley. I am... I'm very sorry that you are going. Thank you, Miss Fairley. I shall remember those kind words. I, too, am sorry. Goodbye, Mr. Hartwright. Miss Fairley... Goodbye. Uh... It is better this way. For you and for her. Yes. I shall write to you. Will you, Miss Holcomb? I'd be so grateful. What is the very least that you deserve? Whatever happens, but whatever we discover with regard to Anne Catherick and Sir Percival, you shall know it. And if I, for my part, can be of any help, once my folly is forgotten... I... Of course. I will trust you. As my friend, and as Laura's friend. As my brother, and as hers. God bless you. She kissed my forehead and left the room. I went to the window, saw the carriage draw up on the gravel, and two of the servants begin to put my bags on board. And as I watched them, I heard behind me the rustle of a dress. I turned. Miss Fairley, seeing that I was alone, hesitated at the door, but then stepped forward. I have brought you something, a gift of dubious value, I'm afraid. <sighs> sketch of the summer house. Yes, indeed. The place where we first met. Miss Fairley, I shall treasure this for as long as I live. I shall prize it above all other possessions. Well, it will remind you, perhaps, of happy days we spent together. Yes. Days which may never return. But you will, I hope, remember me from time to time. I will. I promise it. Give me your hand. You must leave me now. Please, leave me. <sighs> These words were witness to her love for me. These words marked the start of my banishment. I let go of her hand. I said no more. One farewell look I gave as she sank into a chair. And then I was gone. The image of Laura Fairley was already a memory of an unrecoverable past. The day after Mr. Hartride left Limeridge House... Mr. Fairley? Gilmore here. 
The day after, as I say, Mr. Fairley at last consented to talk with me about the proposed marriage between his niece and Sir Percival Glyde. Mr. Fairley. Enter. Uh, Gilmore, come in very quietly, if you will. No. Oh. I've explained too many times, Gilmore. I find it upsetting to talk about business. Yes, perhaps you do, but... There's no reason, no reason at all why you should want to disturb my tranquility, unless it is out of malice. Oh, Mr. Fairley. The marriage is a good thing, I'm certain. Laura's father sanctioned it, you know, on his deathbed. Yes. And I sanctioned it too. It is a desirable match, and I see no reason why the wedding should not proceed as quickly as possible. Indeed. I shall be glad when it is all over. But as regards the settlement... As regards the settlement, you look into it. Why don't you, Gilmore? That's the kind of thing you do, surely. Talk to Laura if you need to. Talk to Sir Percival if you absolutely must. He arrives tomorrow, I believe. Get everything ready, dear Gilmore, and then, when it is, I'm sure I shall say yes. Sir Percival, may I introduce Mr. Gilmore to you? Uh, Mr. Gilmore, uh, this is a great pleasure. Uh, you are, I gather, a devoted friend of the family. Well, I have tried to be of service to the Fairleys, and they, in return, have been indulgent towards my faults. <laughs> Sir Percival, I am afraid that my sister will not be joining us. Not for a while, at least. She is feeling a little unwell. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. I'm very sorry indeed, but, but as she's not with us, perhaps this would be an appropriate moment to address an unpleasant and distasteful matter, one which is too painful for me to talk of directly with Miss Fairley. You are referring, no doubt, to the anonymous letter that she received. Yes, I have read the copy which you were good enough to send. We believe that the letter was written by a young woman named Anne Catherick. You're right, Miss Halcombe, I'm sure of it. Uh, let me tell you what I know. Anne Catherick and her mother live in Hampshire... Anne is an only child and has been mentally disturbed from an early age. Mrs. Catherick was long ago deserted by her husband, and uh, though mother and daughter live some distance from my own home, I have kept in touch with Mrs. Catherick in consideration of um, a faithful service rendered in past years. So when her daughter's mental condition deteriorated and Mrs. Catherick recognised that Anne must be placed under proper medical care, I offered to pay for Anne to be looked after in a private asylum. Ah, I see. Unluckily for me... Anne discovered something of my involvement. And she assumed... She assumed that I was chiefly, if not solely, responsible for her being locked away. I, I became the object of her deep suspicion and hatred, as the letter demonstrates. I still am. Sir Percival, you've made everything clear, and I'm most grateful to you for doing so. As I'm sure is Miss Halcombe. Yes, yes, indeed. I'm happy, of course, to provide any further details you may require, the names of the doctors who admitted her to the asylum and so on. But I should add that my solicitor has been instructed to spare no expense in finding the poor young woman and restoring her to medical care. Have you any questions, Mr Gilmore? No, I'm entirely satisfied. Miss Halcombe? I have no questions, now. Uh, but you are, I think, not as satisfied as Mr. Gilmore. You would rather not take my word on the matter. Sir Percival, please understand, I do not distrust you. Uh, but as one more closely involved in the affair than Mr. Gilmore here, you are entitled to some proof of what I've told you. I do not ask for such proof. Uh, you do not, but you will excuse my obstinacy if I insist that it be provided. I therefore ask you, Miss Halcombe, to be so good as to write to Mrs. Catherick and to ask her for verification. Oh, Sir Percival, I have no wish to write such a letter. And nevertheless, I beg you to do it. As a favour to me. In consequence of this conversation, in which, by the way, I thought Sir Percival conducted himself with quiet tact and refinement, Miss Halcombe sent word to Mrs. Catherick, and Wednesday's post brought a reply. It is, as you see, Mr. Gilmore, a brief, terse letter. Yes, but it is as plain a confirmation of Sir Percival's statement as could be desired, I think. Has Sir Percival seen it? Yes, he has. I suppose now that we have done all that we can. If we are friends of Sir Percival and we know him and trust him, then we have done all and more. Yes, indeed. And yet, Miss Halcombe, you are doubtful. I ought not to be, I know. I have been over-anxious about Laura, I suppose, and it has unsettled me. Oh, but I do wish that Mr. Hartwright was still with us, and I could hear what he thought. You would sooner trust Mr. Hartwright's judgment than your own. Well, Or yeah. mine? No. 
Forgive me. Mr. Gilmore, there is another reason for my disquiet. This morning, after I had shown Sir Percival Mrs. Catherick's reply, he began to talk about Laura. About how he had observed that her spirits were low, and that her manner towards him had changed since his previous visit here. And he said... Yes? He said that with regard to the proposed marriage, he would urge Laura to reflect very seriously on two things. First, his own conduct, from the beginning of the courtship to the present time, and secondly, the circumstances under which the engagement was made. You mean the fact that her father sanctioned the marriage? Exactly. And he declared that if, after considering these matters, Laura then decided to withdraw from the engagement, she would be perfectly free to do so. No man could have said more than that, Miss Halcombe. Few, indeed, would have said as much. Well, perhaps... He has specifically requested that Miss Fairley should not act against her own desires. Yes, but do you not see? That is the very outcome I am likely to encourage if I pass his message on to her. Sir Percival's conduct has been beyond reproach. Not only that, but Laura's father, on his deathbed, spoke hopefully of her marriage to Sir Percival... So Laura's love for honour and truth, and her respect for her father's memory, together make it impossible that she should break the engagement. Miss Halcombe, what do you say? That Sir Percival made his statement in the full knowledge that he would be obliging Miss Fairley to accept him? No, no. If I thought he was capable of such baseness as that, I would tell him to leave Limeridge House at once. But unconsciously, perhaps... Without intending it. Forgive me, Miss Halcombe, but such speculation, it seems to me, is not to the point. Whatever effects of Percival's words might have, they won't prejudice the outcome for the simple reason that the outcome is already decided. Nothing has changed. Sir Percival is the same man that he was when last he was here. Why should Miss Fairley even contemplate rejecting him? Mr. Gilmore, do come in. I wondered, my dear Miss Fairley, if you and I might have a talk. Of course. Take a seat. Oh, thank you. My dear, I have to get back to London today. I'm sorry to hear it. But before I go, I would like us to talk about the engagement and matters related. Must we, Mr. Gilmore? Yes, my dear, I think we must. Your sister advises me that she has spoken to you today about the marriage... Yes. I believe she has told you, among other things, that it had been Sir Percival's purpose in coming to Limeridge to fix a day for the wedding. But you, it seems, would prefer that it be decided sometime in the future. Yes, that is right. I have to confess, I was a little surprised to hear it. You are quite determined about this? Yes, yes, I am. I have asked if I might defer my final answer for a month or two, till the end of the year at the latest... Has Sir Percival... Your sister informed him only a few minutes ago. And? He granted the request straight away, without demur. So, we cannot at present be certain if you are to marry or not. The decision rests with you. But even when the time comes, I must be ready to draw up a settlement. And to do that, I need to consult you first. If it does happen, if I am... If you are married... Please don't let him part me from Marion. Please, Mr. Gilmore. Well, that, my dear, you can easily settle by private arrangement. I was referring to your property, to the disposal of your money. If you were to make a will when you come of age, to whom would the money go? Might I leave it to Marion? Certainly, but you should bear in mind what a large sum it is. Do you wish everything to go to her? No, not quite everything. There is... There is someone else who might like a little keepsake. If I were to die, I'm sure there'd be no harm in him having it. Oh, Mr Gilmore, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Oh, my dear, please, there's nothing to forgive. <laughs> you have not been well. I wish you were not leaving us. I wish... Things were as they used to be. Oh, Mr. Gilmore, I wish I could be happy again. I am Richard.
returning to London. Returning indeed, heavy-hearted. Poor Miss Fairley. So young and yet already looking back on more cheerful days and all too clearly anxious and distressed about what is to come. I confess, before I talked with her, I was rather inclined to be on Sir Percival's side, believing he would have had good reason to complain about the wedding arrangements being put off. But by the time I had left her, my sympathies were all with Miss Fairley. Sir Percival is courteous and considerate, delightfully free from pride. But there is a voice within me that says that he is not the man for Laura Fairley. I pray to God, therefore, let him not marry her. was episode one of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Dramatised for radio by Martin Wade. Marion was played by Juliet Aubrey. Walter by Toby Stevens. Laura by Emily Bruni. Mr Fairley by Edward Petherbridge. And Sir Percival by Jeremy Clyde. Mr Gilmore, Sean Baker. Anne Catherick, Alice Hart. Pesca, Ewan Meredith. Jacob, Oliver Cookson and Mr. Dempster, Jonathan Keeble. The music was specially composed by Elizabeth Parker. The director was Cherry Cookson. I confess it. I did not, till the last few days, realise the strength of my sister's feelings for Walter Hartwright. I had no suspicion that the love Laura felt for him had taken root so deeply and threatens to alter her for life. Now, having discovered my error, I find that I have lost all faith in my judgment. Can it be right for Laura to marry Sir Percival Glyde when she loves another? And if she does marry Sir Percival, is he a man to be trusted? One thing, however, I am sure of. Dearest Laura is deeply, pitifully unhappy. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio in four parts by Martin Wade With Juliet Aubrey as Marion Halcombe Emily Bruni as Laura Fairley, Toby Stevens as Walter Hartwright, Philip Voss as Count Fosco, Jeremy Clyde as Sir Percival, and Edward Petherbridge as Mr. Fairley. Episode 2 Marion, I can bear this no longer. My dear sister... I must finish with it, and I will. You mean you will break off the engagement? No, no, I can never do that. But I will end this secrecy. I will tell Sir Percival the truth, that I love another. What? You'll make a confession? Yes. And then, if he wishes, he may release me from my promise. But Laura... Dearest sister, he has a right to know... If Sir Percival is to grant to my release, he must do so because he knows the truth. The 9th of November. It was arranged that Laura should talk with Sir Percival this morning and that I should be present too. Laura's courage in this business has astonished me. We have, it seems, changed places. She has been the determined one. I have been all hesitation. Sir Percival, Marion has told me of your offer... She has told me that if I expressed the wish to break off the engagement, you would grant it. That was generous of you. Very generous. However, if it is to be broken off, then the wish must be entirely yours, not mine. Uh, Miss Fairley, I promise you, uh, there is no reason why I would want to end the engagement. Oh, but there is. Sir Percival, when our engagement began, I was unable to feel any strong affection towards you. But affection was still mine to give to you if I could. 
There was no other man, I mean, to whom I felt an emotional attachment. You must forgive me, however, when I inform you that this is no longer the case. Sir Percival, well, my sister has been more than frank with you. Have you nothing to offer her in reply? I can only repeat, Miss Halcombe, what I've said already. If your sister wishes to break off the engagement, well, she's free to do so. Sir Percival, let me also tell you that if I do not marry you, I will not marry another. The person... the person who has gained my affection... I have not spoken to him of my feelings, nor am I ever likely to meet him again. I have said all that I wanted to say, more than enough, I think, to give you justification in withdrawing from the engagement. No, Miss Fairley, quite the opposite. You have said more than enough to make it my dearest wish to marry you. I see. Sir Percival, please, I urge you... Uh, forgive me, Miss Halcombe. If your sister had asked for the engagement to be broken, well, I, I would have submitted... But she has left the decision to me. And since my love and admiration for her are greater than ever, I find myself averse to wrecking my own happiness. I'll not relinquish Miss Fairley. How could I, when she has shown herself to be the noblest of her sex? No, oh, the most wretched, surely, if I must offer myself in marriage when I cannot offer my love. But since my aim will be to deserve your love in return for mine, who knows? In time, perhaps? Never, never! I will be your wife, Sir Percival, your true and faithful wife, but your loving wife, never. Cab! Cab! Mr. Gilmore! Mr. Gilmore! Yes? It's me, Walter Hartwright. Well, so it is. I haven't much time to talk, I'm afraid. Euston Station, please. I have a train to catch. Well, then, I'll accompany you, if you don't mind. By the way, Mr. Gilmore, I'm being followed. Followed? By who? Two men. I don't know their names. Yes, there they are. Where? Getting into their cab over there. Uh, wh they go everywhere I go. It started as soon as I returned from Limeridge House. I see. Uh, I have to say, Mr. Hartwright, you don't look well. Oh, let me assure you, my mind is not at all disordered. I have not been imagining things. I am being watched, pursued, everywhere, every day. I suppose you have heard about the marriage. Miss Fairley's, you mean? Yes. I had a letter recently from Miss Halcombe. It's going ahead. So I understand, yes. Do you know at all if a date has been fixed? I don't. You will have to look for the announcement in the papers. Oh, well, that may be difficult. I'm leaving England very soon. Oh, are you indeed? May I ask... Oh, Honduras. And thence the ruined cities of Central America. Oh, good heavens. Yes. Let's see if my two new friends are prepared to follow me there. I'm going with a group on a private expedition as their draftsman. I'll be gone six months at least. More if the excavation is successful. <sighs> to tell the truth, Mr. Gilmore, I don't care how long I'm away. I've not felt very... settled since I've been back in London. Where are you bound, Mr. Gilmore? Oh, not quite as far as Honduras. Limeridge. Again? I must speak once more with Mr. Fairley about the marriage settlement, you know. No, Gilmore, you are being heartless, you are being a bully. But I have come here at great personal inconvenience. I did not ask you to come. That is true, Mr. Fairley, but there is a considerable amount of money involved. There are two separate sums to be considered here. Mm. First, £10,000, in which Miss Fairley has what is termed a life interest only. If she were to die before your sister, Eleanor, the money would go to your sister. Uh, how is Madame Fosco, by the way? I have no idea. You haven't communicated with her about Miss Fairley? Fairley's marriage? Heavens no. I never communicate with her. You may possibly be aware, Mr. Fairley, that Madame Fosco was more than a little upset by your brother's will. Considering the respective ages of Miss Fairley and her aunt, the latter's prospects of receiving the £10,000 are rather doubtful. Yes, perhaps. Uh, Gilmore... But in my view, the coolness that she has shown towards Miss Fairley is quite without justification. Indeed, if Miss Fairley had not interceded on her aunt's behalf, Madame Fosco would not have appeared in the will at all. Well, you see, 
My brother had a dislike of foreigners, and my sister made the foolish mistake of marrying one. Uh, Gilmore, is there any difficulty with all this? I very much hope not, but I am coming now to the nub of the case. Mm. The sum of twenty thousand pounds. Yes, Gilmore. Which sum is to be Miss Fairley's own when she becomes twenty-one? Now, my stipulation was that if Miss Fairley were to die without leaving children, the money should go to whomsoever she nominates in her will. Mr. Merriman, on the other hand, Sir Percival's solicitor, he finds this inadmissible. He maintains that if there are no children, then Sir Percival, were he to survive his wife, should receive the entire twenty thousand himself. Hmm. What is your point, Gilmore? My point? My point, Mr. Fairley, is that Sir Percival has no shadow of a claim to this money. It should be your niece's to dispose of, and it should be under her control. And what you must do, Mr. Fairley, in order to bring this about, is stand firm. St stand firm? Yes, and then Sir Percival will either give way, or else be exposed to the charge of marrying your niece for her money. Oh, Gilmore. The charge might stick, you know. From what I have gleaned, the debts on his estate are enormous. Gilmore, I trust you are not becoming a radical. You mustn't detest Sir Percival simply because he is a baronet. Mr. Fairley. No, no, please don't shake the room a worthiest of all possible Gilmores. Don't get angry. I have no prejudice against Sir Percival Glyde. No husband should have an interest of £20,000 in his wife's death. It is a matter of common legal caution. Oh, is that what you call it? Mr. Fairley, are you willing to oppose Sir Percival in this business? Oppose him? No. Mr. Fairley! No, don't upset me. Please don't upset yourself or Sir Percival or Laura. What is the point? My niece is less than half his age. She'll outlive him, surely. We really needn't worry about the £20,000. I won't. At any rate. But... So nice of you to see me. Try not to bang the door. Liverpool. I'm about to leave this country and my friend Professor Pesker is here to say goodbye. Pesker, whose life I once saved, who as an act of gratitude found me my position at Limeridge House. I think... My good dear Hartwright, that you have no great desire for this adventure. I think you are sailing the ocean simply to get away from here. Yes, Pesca. I'm afraid you're right. That young lady you wrote to me about, your drawing student at Limeridge, you are in love with her, and the course of that love has not run smoothly. Yes. Right again. I am so sorry. If I had not suggested your employment at that place... Pesca, no more of that, please. You are not gifted with clairvoyance. By the way, you remember perhaps my telling you of a certain Anne Catherick? How I met her the night before I left for Limerick? Ah, yes. The strange woman in white. Mm. I heard her name mentioned just now. You did? By those two fellows over there, by the wall. You know them, do you? Oh, yes. They've been on my trail ever since I got back to London. Well, I'm afraid the mystery of Anne Catherick remains and I must leave the solving of it to others. Pesca, give me your hand. I bid you and England farewell. So, dearest sister, what says my uncle? Sir Percival has suggested a day for the wedding and your uncle has agreed. It is to be the 22nd of December. The 22nd? Less than a month away. It is so soon. Yes, Laura, it is very soon. Well, let me go back to your uncle, therefore, and tell him so. He and Sir Percival need not have it all their own way. No, Marion, please. It will only cause more trouble and confusion. Sir Percival will be here again with, with fresh causes of complaint. Well, what of it? Are you to break your heart so that Sir Percival's mind can be at ease? Oh, Laura, why should men be allowed to drag us away from our homes and loved ones, destroy our innocence and peace and give us nothing in return? Why, Laura, why? You know, it's very cruel, most unjust. 
It makes me so angry. It makes you weep, dearest sister. I am not used to your tears. Marion, you are devoted and you are kind, but you cannot alter the inevitable. Sooner or later, the wedding must happen. After the wedding, your uncle informs me Sir Percival wants to take you to Italy. To Italy? For how long? Until spring or early summer. He is concerned to get extensive renovation work done on the house in Hampshire, and being away from England for the winter months will be good for you, he says. Yes, I hope so. Dearest sister, you will like Italy, I think. Uh, Laura, I will not be going with you. Oh. No, no, Laura. When a man first marries, he is least disposed to tolerate a rival, male or female. If you still wish that I should share your new home in Hampshire... Yes, yes, of course I do. Well, then I think we would be well advised not to arouse Sir Percival's jealousy on the wedding tour. So, I am to lose you? Just for a few months. And on the return journey, I gather, you and Sir Percival are to join up with your Aunt Eleanor and her husband. Oh, indeed. She has hardly, I know, been the most affectionate of aunts. But her husband, Count Fosco, is a friend of Sir Percival's, is he not? Yes, so I believe so. So perhaps you and she will be able to meet on civil terms, at the very least. Perhaps. The wedding, I assume, is to be at Limeridge Church? It is. And when will Sir Percival be here? Some days before. On the 17th. Oh, Miss Halkel! Sir Percival! What a pleasant surprise. How are you? And how is your dear sister? Oh, we are well enough, thank you. Doll is ready for your arrival. I confess, though, I didn't expect to meet you in the village. Well, I thought that before I descended upon Limeridge House, I would pay a visit to the farm at Todd's Corner, oh. where Anne Catherick was staying. Yes, indeed. I was anxious to discover if they had any news of her, but oh, sadly, there's none. You've heard nothing, I suppose? Nothing. Oh, dear. The poor creature, as I'm sure you're aware, needs proper care and protection. I hate to think what might have happened to her. Strange, is it not? During the weeks that he was away from us, my recollection of Sir Percival was distinctly less than favourable, not least on account of the distress that he had caused my sister. But his concern about Anne Catherick immediately put him in a different light. I decided that I would test his character still further. Sir Percival, you, you will think me very forward, I am sure, but I have a question to ask of you. Yes? With regard to the time when you and Laura returned from Italy... Uh, Miss Halcombe. Yes, Sir Percival? If you are about to suggest that you should come to stay with us at Blackwater Park... Oh, I was intending merely to ask what your thoughts were. Uh, Miss Halcombe, dear Miss Halcombe, it is the very notion which I was anxious to put to you. If you would share our home and be Laura's companion, you would be conferring on her and me... A lasting favour. Now, sweetest sister, I must wish you good night. Yes. Oh, but I almost forgot. A present from your uncle. Oh, thank you. No precious stone upon the ring, I'm afraid. Just a strand of his hair. He wanted you to have the gift today, he said, so as to avoid increasing the excitement of tomorrow. <sighs> And he insists there must be no scenes during the course of the day. No tears. Let him insist all he may. There will be tears, nonetheless. Well, Marion, my last night at Limeridge House. This past week, you know, I seem to have put myself into a dream for fear of waking up and discovering the truth. But think, just think how different it would have been if... It was not Sir Percival I was about to marry, but someone else. Laura, my dearest, forgive me. There she lay in her pretty little white bed. The same bed she had slept in since she was a girl. And on the table by her bedside, a prayer book, a miniature portrait of her father, and a brooch of mine which I had given her that afternoon as a keepsake. I stood by the bed. Between her half-closed eyelids glistened the traces of tears. Forgive me. Black 
Blackwater Park. Five months have passed, and more. Five long, lonely months since Laura and I last saw each other. But she and her husband are due to arrive tomorrow. Aunt Eleanor and her husband, Count Fosker, will be with them. They are staying for the summer. I journeyed here yesterday, and have been made very welcome by the housekeeper, Mrs. Mitchelson, a clergyman's widow. Blackwater Park, as the county history obligingly informs me, is an ancient and unusual seat. Very different from Limeridge. It has been quiet here, and I have but one incident to report. Mrs. Mitchelson? Mrs. Mitchelson! Why, Miss Halcombe? Whatever is the matter? I found this dog while I was walking by the lake. It was in the boathouse. It's been shot, I think. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I recognise that creature. Rest it just here, Miss Halcombe. I suppose it was Baxter who shot it. Who was Baxter? The gamekeeper. It must have strayed off the path. Belongs to Mrs. Catherick. Mrs. Catherick? Well, we can bathe the wound, I suppose, but I don't think we'll do much good. This Mrs. Catherick? You know her, do you? Well, I know of an Anne Catherick. Anne, that's right, her daughter. It was because of her that Mrs. Catherick was at the house. She said that the daughter had disappeared. Yes, yeah, so I understand. She was asking for news about her. It seems that someone had seen a young woman in the area, a stranger, and she wondered whether it might be Anne. Does Mrs. Catherick live in the neighbourhood? No, no, she's at Welmingham, five and twenty miles away at least. Have you been acquainted with her for some while? I never saw her before yesterday morning, though I'd heard of her, of course, on account of Sir Percival's kindness in helping with Anne's medical care. Yes, of course. But, strangely enough, when I told her that Sir Percival was returning soon from abroad... She said that there was no need to mention that she'd been here. Now, that was odd, I thought. Yes, it was. Did she speak at all about her daughter? Very little. She talked chiefly of Sir Percival and what sort of lady his wife might be. She didn't seem distressed that she hadn't found Anne. More vexed, put out. Oh, there, look. I told you the dog wouldn't live. Oh, the poor thing. I'll get Baxter to bury it. The 12th of June, the evening. At last, at last, they have arrived. Hurry, Mrs. Mitchelson. Oh, dear, what excitement. Ah, Miss Halcombe, glad to see you again. Oh, and you, Sir Percival. Welcome back home, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Mitchelson. Marion? Marion! Oh, my dearest oh. sister! How do you do? Madame Fosco. It's been a long time. Yes, indeed. Uh, Come, Fosco, you're holding up the party. The Count at last left the carriage. What an extraordinary sight. So immensely fat he was, and yet he moved towards me on light, nimble feet. I looked at his face as he drew near, and it put me in mind of Napoleon's. The regularity of the features, their grand calmness and power. And his skin, closely shaven, was beautifully smooth, smoother than mine, I fear. And yet I had heard he was almost sixty. You must be Miss Marion Halcombe. I am. Delighted to make your acquaintance. Please forgive me for delaying to greet you, but I have some of my family with me in the carriage, and I was ensuring that they are safely in their cages. Their cages? I have brought with me a cockatoo of transcendent plumage, oh. two canary birds of unrivaled vivacity and intelligence, and five sublime, ineffable white mice. Oh. A count. Shall we go in? Certainly, my angel. Oh, no, no. After you, Miss Halcombe. Show me your rooms first, Marion. I want to be sure that you're comfortable. Oh, I am, believe me. I am in the habitable part of the house. As you are, Laura, you will be relieved to know. But the other wing is 14th century and not to be contemplated. Oh. <laughs> you see? A very agreeable little sweet. Yes, indeed. Laura, I couldn't help hearing as we entered the hall 
Sir Percival was asking Mrs. Mitchelson if a gentleman had called recently. Yes, I heard him too. He was very agitated, was he not, when Mrs. Mitchelson couldn't give him the man's name or say what his business was? Well, in truth, there is something worrying Sir Percival at present. Some difficulty. But he says that he'll be able to resolve it soon. Oh, Laura, I have so many questions to ask you. About Italy, I mean, and all the people you met, and your new life. What it is like to be Lady Glyde. Dearest sister, I shall talk of Italy for as long as you want, but I shall not talk of being Lady Glyde. Whenever you and I are together, Marion, we shall be happier and easier, I think, if we accept my married life for what it is. Or oh, what it is not. Say as little about it as possible. As you wish. I'm afraid this isn't quite like home. <laughs> That's true enough. But it is so good to have you with me again. Mm. To see you surrounded by your possessions. The dear little shabby old bookcase. The horrid heavy man's umbrella. Oh. And your writing things. Tell me, Marion. Have you been sending lots of letters to people and getting letters in return? In particular, I wonder... Laura, if... my dear... Just tell me... Tell me if he is happy and well and, and has recovered himself and forgotten me and is getting on in his profession. Laura, you ought not to ask me such questions. You promised you wouldn't. Yes. I'm sorry. Anyway, there's been no recent exchange of letters. Or indeed any news of Walter Hartwright at all. But I pray for him. Yes. So do I. She has changed. She is less beautiful. The freshness and softness that was in her face, the tenderness, the charm, that's gone. She has changed in that respect. And yet, where one might have expected her to change, because she is a married woman, there she is the same. She speaks of her husband as little as she can, and then it is invariably Sir Percival, not Percival only. There is no sign of any sympathy towards him, or indeed from him to her. Nothing she says convinces me that she is reconciled to marriage. In her heart, she is Laura Fairley still, not Lady Glyde. Figaro qua, figaro la, figaro su, figaro giù. Good morning, Miss Halcombe. And to you, Count. You've been walking by the lake. Yes. I was there too, just now. Ah. It is the lake, I assume, which gives the house its name. Though the water is not quite black. Figaro qua, figaro la. <laughs> Sir Percival has some fine beasts here. Figaro su, figaro giù. Ah. And this is a splendid-looking creature, too. Splendid, yes, and very fierce. He is wise to have had himself chained. Excuse me, Miss Halcombe, excuse me, sir. I'm looking for Sir Percival, and I was told he intended going riding. I have not seen him. Nor I. If you should see him, Mr Merriman has arrived from London. Has he now? He wishes to speak to Sir Percival as soon as possible. He's waiting in the library. Very well. Uh, by the way, sir, that dog flies at everyone. I wouldn't go anywhere near it, sir, if I were you. Nonsense! Of course you would. If you were me, Mrs. Mitchelson, you would have no fear of dogs at all. But, of course, the reason he flies at people is precisely because they are afraid. Big dogs are bullies. Big dogs are craven creatures. All I need do is approach without fear, place my hand upon his head, and look him straight in the eye. Though that is difficult, is it not, you big coward? Because you will keep looking away. Coward! Bully! You'd kill a cat. You'd kill Mrs. Mitchelson here. Oh. Even perhaps Miss Halcombe. But only because they're afraid of your wicked white teeth and your slobbering jaws. Talking of which, you have besmirched my nice, clean, pretty waistcoat. Get back to your kennel. Tell me, if you would, who is this Mr. Merriman who has come all the way from London? Mr. Merriman is Sir Percival's solicitor. It is clear he was not sent for, else Sir Percival would have been ready to receive him. Yes, Miss Halcombe, you are right, I'm sure. And yes, Miss Halcombe, for him to have come all the way from town, he must be bearing some very important and perhaps unexpected news. I never said so. But you thought as much. You're a clever woman, Miss Halcombe. 
There is little, I guess, that escapes you. Laura, I have something distressing to tell you. Well, sister? This Mr. Merriman, who arrived earlier today, Sir Percival's solicitor. Yes? But just now, as I was walking from my room, he and Sir Percival were coming out of the library, and the solicitor was talking about a sum of money, a loan which was overdue, and which could be paid if you were to sign a document. Laura, your husband, I fear, is experiencing some financial embarrassment. Yes, and his being relieved of it depends on me. You are very calm about all this. Well, what you were telling me I had suspected... The day I arrived and we went into the hall, do you remember Sir Percival asked Mrs. Mitchelson about a gentleman who had called at the house? It was that gentleman, you think, who lent Sir Percival the money? Yes, I fear so. And now he's demanding repayment. You promise me, Laura, you will not sign any document without studying it with care. I promise. I imagine our friend the Count is more than a little aware of Sir Percival's current situation. He knew who Mr. Merriman was. And I wouldn't be surprised if he knew the reason for Mr. Merriman's visit. But, Marion, we must ask no questions of Count Fosco. We must not take him into our confidence. You think not? I don't like the man, and I don't trust him. I can't say why. What about you, dearest sister? Do you like Count Fosco? Well, he interests me. He's an extremely indolent man, I think. And yet he seems to have a deep knowledge of all sorts of things. Also, it is some time, I gather, since he was in his mother country. Yes. And yet he was asking Sir Percival with a strange degree of earnestness if he was aware of any Italians in the neighbourhood. And this morning, Laura, when I came down to breakfast, I noticed a letter for him which bore a large official seal, so he is not, it would seem, a political exile but is perhaps engaged in government business of some sort. I asked you, Marion, if you liked him. I half like him, and only half willingly at that. He flatters my vanity. I must be plain to you. It is plain enough to me when I am away from his presence. I think Aunt Eleanor thinks you like the Count, and is rather jealous of the Count's attentions. Yes, perhaps, though I suspect she has to suffer in silence. Count Fosco may be sweetness and light in company, but behind his door, I'm certain, he wields a rod of iron. I don't entirely like him as a friend, but I'd be very sorry to have him as my enemy. Well, Miss Halcombe? Hmm, I believe it's all up. But I will fight on. Ah, <laughs> oh, here you are. Uh, may I disturb your game? No need, my good Percival. It is, as you say, Miss Halcombe, all up. There, you see, Sir Percival, thoroughly humiliated. The Count politely allowed me to win two games, and then when he saw that I had found him out, he checkmated me before the third game had had time to begin. The, I wonder, Fosco, whether you could seek out your wife and come with her to the library. I've sent for Laura to go there, too. A, a mere business formality, you understand? A formality or not... I will have to decline your invitation. Oh. I told Madame Fosco that I would accompany her to the lake at 11 o'clock, and it is three minutes to. As it transpired, we all went to the lake. Sir Percival readily conceded that his mere business formality could wait until the afternoon, and our party which also included Count Fosco's white mice, conveyed in a little pagoda of gaily painted wirework, was soon encamped in the boathouse at the lake's northern end. You have to admit, it is a very gloomy lake. Uh, my bailiff, you know, he's quite sure it has a curse upon it. Just the place for a murder, he says. I think it is a very bad place for a murder. The water's too shallow to hide the body, and the murderer's footprints would show too clearly in the mud. A fool would commit a murder here, but not a wise man. As we sat, Laura worked at her sewing, and Madame Fosco was embarked upon a favourite pastime of hers, rolling cigarettes for her husband. The Count, meanwhile, had freed his mice from their cage. Pretty mouses, harmless little mouses. And he watched them as they scampered over the undulations of his vast clothing. Myself, I am sorry to hear the lake connected with anything as horrible as a murder. 
And I am sorry, too, that I am being asked to think of wise murderers and foolish murderers. A truly wise man surely would be a truly virtuous man, and would therefore have a horror of crime. My dear lady, what an admirable sentiment. I'm sure I must have seen it in a copybook or a sampler. Perhaps you're embroidering those very words at this very moment. Listen, pretty mouses. A truly wise mouse is a truly virtuous mouse. Remember that, please, and never gnaw at the bars of your cage again. It is easy to ridicule, but you will not find it quite so easy to give me an instance of a wise man who is also a great criminal. <laughs> too true, Lady Glyde. For the wise man who is a criminal is the wise man who is never found out. What is your view about all this, my angel? What is my view? Oh, I am not so importunate a woman as to offer an opinion on such a matter. Not at least until I've received guidance in full from you, my <laughs> dear, or from Sir Percival. It all depends, I suppose, on what one means by virtue. I regard myself as a citizen of the world, and I tell you, I've met with so many different sorts of virtue that I'm puzzled to say which is the right sort and which is not. One thing is clear enough. There can be no virtue in me. For in my view, crime tends to pay, and virtue doesn't. But you see, I am saying out loud what virtuous people only think. Conversation flagged. Both Laura and I recoiled from the Count's glib cynicism and were not disposed to offer him further opportunities to be offensive. Soon we were all preparing to leave and go back to the house. Count Fosco began collecting up his mice. One, two, three, four... Ah! In the name of heaven, where is the fifth, the youngest, the whitest, the most amiable, my Benjamin of mice? The mountain began to search for the mouse, <laughs> and he found the creature beneath the bench. He found something else as well. Percival, Percival, come here. Well? Look, on the floor. Can't you see it? No, Fosco, I can't. Look closely there. I can see it. Blood. Blood? It's all right, Laura, I know what happened. The day you arrived, I found a dog lying here. It had been shot. Whose dog was it? It wasn't one of mine. No, Sir Percival, it wasn't one of yours. Well, so whose was it? Well, Mrs. Mitchelson said that it belonged to Mrs. Catherick. Mrs. Catherick? The previous day, apparently, she brought the dog with her. She came to the house and spoke to Mrs. Mitchelson. What? Oh, what, what, what the devil did she want? Who else saw her? My dear Percival, gently, please. Who else saw Mrs. Catherick? No one, so far as I know. Perhaps, my dear Percival, you should consult Mrs. Mitchelson about this woman. Since she was the one who met her? Uh, yes, yes, I'll do that straight away. Uh, will you all excuse me? Now, Miss Halcombe, let me return Benjamin to his cage. And then, if you would be so kind, you will remedy my state of ignorance. And mine, too. Sir Percival, you know, has told us nothing about this Mrs. Cathery. And you, Marion, have told me nothing either. So, Miss Halcombe, speak, please. Who is this woman? And why is my friend so agitated by news of her visit? I would have liked to have told them very little, for I did not wish to alarm Laura, and I was reluctant to act as an informant to the Count. But the latter was full of eager curiosity, and Laura was prompting me too. So I said what I knew. That Mrs. Catherick's daughter, Anne, was mentally disturbed, and that Sir Percival, for whom Mrs. Catherick had rendered service in the past, had arranged to have the daughter confined in a private asylum, for which reason Sir Percival was hated by Anne. And I told them what Walter Hartwright had told me about his meeting with Anne after her escape from the asylum. Sir! Sir! God Almighty! Who's that? Please! I turned, and there in the middle of the broad road stood the figure of a solitary woman, dressed from head to foot in white. I've done nothing wrong, sir. I have met with an accident, that's all. You must not be suspicious of me. I told them of how Mr. Hartwright had met Anne Catherick again when he was at Limeridge and of how she had wanted to prevent Sir Percival from marrying Laura. But while I talked and observed the Count's rapt attention, a thought occurred to me. Count Fosco was a close friend of Sir Percival and seemed knowledgeable enough about Sir Percival's affairs in general. Why, therefore, should he have been kept ignorant of the story of Anne Catherick? Ah, uh, Miss Halcombe. Do come in. I understand that you wish me to act as a witness. Uh, yes, if you would be so kind. The postponed business formality was about to commence, and I had been summoned to the library. 
Laura was seated at the writing table, uncertain, apprehensive. Sir Percival, almost as apprehensive himself, stood behind her. Count Fosco was at the other end of the room. He was smoking a cigarette and picking off the dead leaves from a vase of flowers. I'm afraid, Miss Holcomb, that I am to blame for you being given this duty. Sir Percival had asked that my wife should be a second witness, but I, being Italian, am a wily, wary character, and prefer that the two witnesses be independent of each other. As it happens, there is no reason for your objection. The law of England... Yes, 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 Percival, I'm sure. But apart from the law of England, there is the conscience of Fosco. Well, your conscience is appeased. Oh, oh, by the by, I'm obliged to leave you all for the rest of the day. It's a matter which can't be put off, I'm afraid, but I shall be back in good time tomorrow. Now, this is the document. Uh, No, 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 Uh, keep it folded, please. If you would sign here, Laura. Uh, Fosco, witnessing a signature is not to be done by gazing out of the window. Uh, uh, Sign here, Laura. What am I signing? My dear, it's a purely formal document, full of legal technicalities and so on. I haven't time to explain it now. But surely, before my sister writes her name, she should know what the document says. What nonsense, Miss Halcombe. It's nothing she needs to be concerned with. And even if I told her, she wouldn't understand it. Let me try to understand it. Whenever Mr Gilmore had some business matter for me to deal with, he always explained it first, and I always understood Well, perhaps, but he's a solicitor and he's obliged to explain. I am your husband and I'm not obliged. In that case, may I not at least unfold the document so I can see what is written there? You distrust me. Go on, speak out, say it in front of these witnesses here. You distrust your own husband. First of all, control your temper. Lady Glyde is right. Is she indeed? Yes, Sir Percival, she is. And I shall not witness her signature unless she has first understood what it is that she is signing. Oh, really? Well, next time you invite yourself to a man's house, Miss Halcombe, you might consider your conduct. Taking the wife's side in a matter which doesn't concern you, it's a poor way of repaying hospitality. How dare you! Laura, sign the document, please. I demand that you sign it. Sign the document! Calm yourself, Percival. I will sign it with pleasure. If only you will treat me as a responsible being and allow me to know what the document is about. Count Fosco says I am right. Why do you treat his scruples so much more indulgently than mine? Scruples? It's rather late in the day for scruples. I'd have thought you'd have got over any weakness of that sort when you made a virtue of necessity and agreed to be married. A virtue of necessity? That's all. I'll not sign the document. I'll not sign it until you let me read every word from the first line to the last. Uh, One moment, Lady Glyde. Come, Murray. Uh, Just one moment, I implore you. Is it absolutely necessary, Percival, that this document be signed today? It is necessary to my plans and wishes. But it is possible for the signature to be put off till tomorrow. It can be, I suppose, if it must. Then put it off. Very well, then. Until tomorrow. I am almost ashamed to look at you, Marion, after the way he treated you. Dearest sister, please. My pride was a little hurt. No more. It was nothing compared with what you had to endure. What are we to do? Perhaps I should sign the document so that he has no excuse to speak so vilely to you again. No, Laura, you should not. For that reason, least of all. Well, he has left us for a little while. Yes, gone to Wilmingham, perhaps, to interrogate Mrs. Catherick about her daughter. Perhaps. But wherever he is, we have some respite. Oh, Marion, if only there was a friend to help us. A true, dear friend. Yes. The Count, I think, was on our side just now. For his own purposes, no doubt. I thanked him afterwards. Though he can't be trusted, perhaps his influence will ensure that Sir Percival is more restrained in his conduct, that I am not thrown out of his home for my insolent behaviour. Marion, don't speak of such a thing. I have noticed such a change in Sir Percival since he was here. 
I'm forced to think that the politeness and modesty and delicacy that he displayed before was all a sham, that he was playing a part in order to win your hand. Yes. And now, having achieved that end, he has dropped his disguise and shown himself to be... Mean. Brutal. Cunning. Willing to use fraud and deception to obtain your money. You must not sign that document, Laura. Not unless you are shown its contents and are satisfied by them. But if he should press me as he did today... We must resist. We must equip ourselves with sufficient knowledge to help us fight him. Yes, but how? Well, let me think. I could write to Mr Gilmore, I suppose, and seek his advice. Yes, indeed. Oh, but Sir Percival will demand that I sign the document tomorrow. How shall we get the answer in time? I'll ask Mr. Gilmore to send his reply by a special messenger who must travel on the morning train. With any luck, the messenger will reach us before Sir Percival returns. I wrote the letter to Mr. Gilmore and took it downstairs to the hall. There was a post bag there which was always collected in the middle of the afternoon. I dropped the letter into the bag and as I did so... Miss Halcombe! Madame Fosco. How fortunate to have come upon you. I wonder if I might have a word. Oh, very well. In private, I mean. In confidence. Perhaps we should go out into the garden. What happened then? Very little, at first. Round the fish pond we walked several times, and as we did so we talked. But really, Laura, your aunt had nothing very private to tell me at all. What was it she said? Simply how distressed she had been to hear of Sir Percival's recent conduct. How, if it happened again, she might have to think of leaving Blackwater Park. Mm. And she was so friendly and concerned, so unlike her customary self, that altogether I became very suspicious. And then? I managed at last to make my excuses and went back into the house. And suddenly, I found myself face to face with the Count. He was dropping a letter into the post bag. We exchanged a few words. He seemed unusually subdued. And then he went to join Madame Fosco. By now, of course, I was decidedly uneasy. I went straight to the post bag and took out my letter to Mr. Gilmore. Well? It was open. Oh, Marion. Perhaps I had not secured it sufficiently. That is possible. But there is another possibility. Yes, there is, and it distresses me to think about it. I have sealed the letter now and returned it to the post bag, so we must hope that it arrives safely. And we must take good care, dearest sister, that we are the first to read the reply. At Laura's suggestion, she and I went for an evening walk. There was a sense of blight in the misty, oppressive air. The flowers in the garden drooped and the ground was parched and dewless. We arrived at the lake. You seem very fond of this dismal place. It's not the lake that attracts me, Marion, but the scenery around. Heath and the fir trees, they remind me of Limeridge. Nothing else does, I'm afraid. I wish I had never left home. I wish I was poor and had never married. Or at least I wish I'd never married him. Oh, Laura. While we were in Rome, he and I rode out one day to the tomb of Cecilia Matella. It's such a beautiful ruin, so grand. It's built by a devoted husband to the memory of his wife. I said to Sir Percival, before we were married, you told me you loved me dearly. Would you build such a tomb for me? He looked away. At length, he laughed and replied, If I do build you a tomb, it will be with your own money. Till that day, I'd endeavoured not to think about Walter Hartwright. I'd tried my hardest to push him from my mind. But since then... I've let the memory of him come back to comfort me. I've recalled the happy times we shared. I've pictured him and me as husband and wife, living a frugal, simple life. Happy, loving. Oh, Laura. I ought to tell you, Sir Percival knows about him. He knows? Ever since I made that confession to Sir Percival at Limeridge when I told him there was someone else... Ever since then, he'd wanted to know who it was. And one day in Rome, when the talk turned to my drawings, he challenged me outright. Your drawing master at Limeridge, he said. Hartwright, it was him. He read the answer in my face. 
He warned me that if he ever met Walter Hartwright, he would horsewhip him, and that I'd repent my love for him for the rest of my life. My dearest, dearest sister, I'm so sorry. It's getting dark. Yes. We should be heading back. Laura, whatever's the matter? Look. Over there. A figure. It's going across the heath. No, I can't. There, at the edge of that bank of mist. Oh, yes. It stopped now. Huh? Is it a man or a woman? I'm not sure. A woman, I think. It's moving on again. Perhaps it's following us. I can't see it now. Marion, I'm frightened. Well, you needn't be. There's no reason why someone shouldn't be walking here. We're quite near the village, after all. Come on. Marion. Yes? I heard a noise. A twig blown off a tree. No, Marion, there's hardly a breath of wind. I heard it again. Stop. It's coming from behind us. We're being followed. Well, whatever, whoever it is, we should walk on. If there is anything to alarm us, the nearer we are to the house, the better. It's still following us. Oh, Marion. Who's there? Who is it? Thank God. It's going away. Marion, I was half dead with fear. Who could it have been? I don't know. But when we get back to the house, I think it would be safest to be silent. Say nothing of this, Laura. To anyone. I slept badly. There was, of course, the mystery of events at the lake to occupy me. But much of the night was given to tears and self-reproach at the thought of Laura's unhappiness. And the fact that it was I who had encouraged Walter Hartwright to leave Limeridge House. It was I who had kept him apart from Laura, because she was engaged to Sir Percival. But I must tell myself, I was not at fault. I acted in good faith. And though Sir Percival deceived me in the past, he will not do so again. Laura will come to no harm, I make that promise. Not while I am with her. Marion, I'm so upset. My dearest sister, what has happened? I've lost your brooch, the one you gave me on the day before the wedding. Well, no matter. It wasn't of much value. It was to me. I was wearing it yesterday, I'm sure. Perhaps I lost it when we went to the lake. I'll try and look for it while you're waiting for the messenger from London. When do you expect him? In half an hour. I asked that he should be on the 11 o'clock train. The Count, however, is safely in the drawing room. I heard him talking to his canary birds. So I think I shall leave the house now. I walked calmly and casually through the grounds. I reached the lodge and waited. At length, a carriage approached the turn into the lane and began to slow. Excuse me! Excuse me! Are you by any chance bearing a letter from London? I am. It's for Miss Halcombe. Oh, I am Miss Halcombe. You may give me the letter. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Oh, and wait, please, if you would, in case I wish to give a reply. Very well, ma'am. I scanned the letter. Mr Gilmore was alarmed by what I had told him. That was clear. Phrases such as a palpable fraud, a flagrant breach of trust, leapt off the page. The advice was that Laura should withhold her signature and should give us her reason that she wished the document to be submitted to her family solicitor. Excellent, excellent. Is there a reply, ma'am? Simply that I am very much obliged to Mr Gilmore, that is all. Thank you, ma'am. Very well, driver. Are you all going back to the house now, Miss Halcombe? Count Bosco! <sighs> uh, yes, yes, I am. So am I. Would you allow me the pleasure of accompanying you? Certainly. My dear Miss Halcombe, you look surprised to see me. <laughs> Let me make a confession. When my wife informed me that you'd gone for a walk, I found that the pleasurable prospect of escorting you was too great to resist. <laughs> Take my arm, dear lady. If you would. I took his arm and felt tainted by the very act. We walked. The Count said nothing about what he had seen or about the letter that was in my hand. 
but it appeared from his manner that he had discovered enough to suit his present objective. We approached the house and found Sir Percival awaiting us. So, here you are. Now, where's Lady Glyde? She lost a brooch yesterday and has gone to look for it. Well, brooch or no brooch, she has an appointment at the library this afternoon. I expect to see her in half an hour. Um, before then, Percival, I'd like a talk with you, if I may. Oh, more scruples, I suppose. More objections about the document. I refuse to hear them, Fosco. I refuse. But the Count persuaded him, led Sir Percival some distance away and spoke to him in low tones. It was of Laura and me he spoke beyond a doubt. I went indoors, heart-sick and anxious. See, Marion, the brooch. Dearest sister, well done. Where did you find it? Oh, I didn't find it. Well, then who did? Anne Catherick. I have met her, Marion. I have met the woman in white. I'd walked through the garden and the wood, and I'd searched by the lake, too, without any luck. And then I went into the boathouse and looked for the brooch there. And while I was looking... It's all right, Miss Fairley. You have no need to be frightened of me. My name is Anne Catherick. Anne Catherick? See? I'm wearing white. I always wear white in remembrance of your mother. Such a kind, dear lady. You and I used to walk with her to the school in Limeridge, do you remember? Happy days they were. Happy days. Miss Fairley, were you searching for a brooch? Yes. I have it here. You found it. Oh, thank you. She came up close to me, gently pinned the brooch to my dress. Her face, near to mine, was so pale and thin and weary. And I was startled because it seemed like my own face reflected, or rather my own face ravaged by illness and care. There we are. Now, Miss Fairley, you have your brooch back. Yes. I'm so very grateful to you. By the way, I'm not Miss Fairley anymore. Last December... Oh, yes. I know you're married. I call you Miss Fairley because I love that name and the other name I hate. Did you see someone near the lake last night? Did you hear someone following you in the wood? Yes, that was me. I have come to this place to tell you a secret. A very important secret. About... About the man you have married. And once the secret becomes known, Miss Fairley, it will be his ruin. That was episode two of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Dramatised for radio by Martin Wade. Marion was played by Juliet Aubrey. Laura by Emily Bruni. Count Fosco by Philip Voss. Sir Percival by Jeremy Clyde. Mr Fairley by Edward Petherbridge. And Walter Hartwright by Toby Stevens. Madame Fosco was Geraldine Fitzgerald. Anne Catherick, Alice Hart. Mr. Gilmore, Sean Baker. Pesca, Joan Meredith. Mrs. Mitchelson, Carolyn Pickles. And the messenger, Jonathan Keeble. The music was specially composed by Elizabeth Parker. The director was Cherry Cookson. Anne Catherick, the woman in white. She was waiting for me by the lake, waiting to speak to me. She said she had a secret about Sir Percival which would destroy him if the world got to know of it. She would tell me the secret, and then he'd be afraid of me and wouldn't dare to treat me badly. In the past, she said, she's been afraid of him. But now, it seems, she's afraid no more. Woman in White by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio in four parts by Martin Wade With Juliet Aubrey as Marion Halcombe 
Emily Bruni as Laura Fairley, Toby Stevens as Walter Hartwright, Jeremy Clyde as Sir Percival, Philip Voss as Count Fosco, and Edward Petherbridge as Frederick Fairley. Episode 3. My heart, you see. It isn't right. And I haven't long to live, I'm certain. That's why I don't fear him. But before I die, I must try and make atonement. Atonement? What do you mean? I let you marry him. That was my sin. I should have stopped you when I was at Limeridge. But I became frightened and I fled so that he wouldn't take me back to the asylum. He can't harm me now, though. And if I tell you the secret and atone for my sin, I might meet your mother in the world beyond. Oh! If only I could be buried with her. If only I could wake up by her side when the trumpet sounds and the graves give up their dead. Well, then, the secret. Yes. It was because of the secret that he put me in the asylum. My mother knows the secret, too. I learned it from her. Tell me what it is. No. Not now. Why not? I think there's someone watching us. There's someone listening. But come here tomorrow. At the same time, alone. I will tell you it then. Did you try to speak further with her? Yes, Marianne, I tried, but she refused. She was determined to leave. Do you think she's telling the truth? Do you think there is indeed a secret that Sir Percival is afraid of? I do. I judge her words by Sir Percival's actions. And by his actions, it's clear he has something to hide. These journeys that he makes, they relate to Anne Catherick and her disappearance. I'm sure of it. He is determined to find her and prevent her from telling what she knows. Well, Laura, I must give you my news now. Mr. Gilmore has replied to your letter. He has. Here. Here. You will see that he is highly suspicious of Sir Percival's conduct and is quite positive that you shouldn't sign a document whose contents are kept concealed from you. It should be sent to him first, he says, so that he may advise you. Good. Then I shall tell Sir Percival so. Well, Laura, as it transpires, Sir Percival won't be asking you to sign the document. He won't? Not for a while, at least. Why? What has happened? First of all, dear sister... I'm afraid that Count Fosco saw me when I received Mr. Gilmore's letter. Oh, Marion. He followed me without my knowing. And then Sir Percival arrived back and Count Fosco spoke with him in private. And shortly afterwards, the Count came to the drawing room and informed me that the business of the signature is put off. How very strange. He discovered that I had written to Mr. Gilmore. He guessed, I suppose, that the letter I'd received was a reply. I can only assume, therefore, that whatever conclusions the Count drew from this were enough to persuade Sir Percival to change his mind. Yes, but the question is, what are they planning now? Whatever it is, dearest Laura, the discovery of Sir Percival's secret will surely help our cause. You must keep the appointment with Anne Catherick tomorrow. Oh, I will. It is to be at the boathouse, she said, and at the same hour as today. Yes, that would be half past two, approximately. Very well. But this time, I'll come with you. She said I must be alone. No, I'll be nearby, and I'll make sure I keep out of sight. But of course we mustn't leave the house together. That would inevitably arouse suspicion. Well, then I'll go first. I'll finish luncheon a little early, and you will follow as soon as you safely can. No one observed me as I went out of the house. I am sure of that. And there is no one, I think, in pursuit. I'll make towards the side of the boathouse so that Anne Catherick doesn't see me. No voices. Perhaps Laura's alone. Laura? Laura? Nobody here. Laura? Please, God, let nothing have happened to her. Mrs. Mitchell, sir. Oh, Miss Halcombe. There you are. My sister, have you seen her? She went 
out for a walk? Yes, she came back a little while ago with Sir Percival. I'm afraid something distressing has occurred. What? Has she had an accident? No, but she was in tears, and Sir Percival has ordered Lady Glyde's maid to be dismissed. Dismissed, Mrs Mitchelson? Why? I don't know. And however much I prompted poor Fanny, she wouldn't tell me. She says she'll stay in the village in tonight and then go back to Cumberland. She has no friends here, she says. Where is Lady Glyde? In her bedroom, but you can't see her. Why ever not? The door's been locked. Sir Percival's orders... I found Sir Percival in the library, along with the Count and Madame Fosco. They fell silent as I entered. Am I to understand, Sir Percival, that my sister is being kept under lock and key? Yes, that is exactly what you are to understand. And perhaps you should take care, Miss Halcombe, that the same treatment isn't meted out to you. What? Percival! How dare you? How dare you threaten me? How dare you treat your wife in this fashion? There are laws in England, you know, to protect women from cruelty and outrage. If you hurt but a hair of Laura's head, if you try to interfere with my freedom, I will have recourse to those laws, I assure you. You see, Fosca? You see? <laughs> what have you got to say now? I say what I said before. This is wrong. It is very wrong. And I say this, Sir Percival. If such conduct continues, I will no longer be able to take advantage of your hospitality. I'll not remain in a house where ladies are treated in this despicable way. Oh, will you not? Well spoken, my angel. Sublimely spoken. Mm, thank you. As a rule, Percival, my opinion directs and leads Madame Fosco's. But today, you see, the roles have been reversed. My angel, I'm at your service. If you wish us to leave this house, then leave we shall. So, Percival, what now? What do you say to that? Have it your own way. Have it your own way, damn you, and see what comes of it. Oh, before you go, yes. the key to Lady Glyde's room, if you will be so kind. The Count, once he had received the key, handed it to me with great ceremony, and I hurried up to Laura's room. Laura, it's Marion. Marion, here is... Oh, oh, how glad I am to see you. You persuaded Sir Percival? No, I'm afraid it is due to the Count that I am here, and to your aunt. Now, Laura, you must tell me everything. Did you meet with Anne Catherick? What happened? Why did Sir Percival lock you in here? I shall tell you, I promise, but first you must tell me, has Sir Percival relented? Am I still a prisoner? He has given way. You are, as the Count declared, mistress once more in your own house. Oh. You know, Laura, I am becoming ever more wary of Count Fosco. His influence over Sir Percival seems to grow greater by the day. Please, don't talk of the Count. I hate him, Marion. Mm. I detest him. He is the vilest creature on earth. Laura, Laura. He is a spy, an oh, informer. Laura, shh, shh. There's someone outside. Yes, it is I. Oh, Miss Halcombe. You dropped your handkerchief when you were downstairs. And I thought I would bring it to you as I was on my way to my room. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Madame Fosco. Laura, she heard everything you said. Yes, well, what I said is true. I do detest the Count, and he is a spy. He's been spying on you, Marion, and he was spying on me and Aunt Catherick yesterday. He overheard a part of what she said to me. He knew that I was to meet her today, and he advised Sir Percival as much. Where is the note, Laura? Sir Percival has it. Sir Percival? He was waiting for me. Oh. I just had time to read it, and then he suddenly appeared and took it from me. Oh, Laura! He demanded to know what Anne Catherick said to me yesterday, every word, from first to last. And? Did you tell him? I was alone with him, Marion. He was gripping my arm so tightly. He was beside himself. He was like a madman. You told him everything? Yes. But he's certain I know more, and he swore he'd force the truth out of me. He thinks I've discovered his secret and told it to you. He's afraid that Fanny might learn of it also. That's why he's dismissed her, I suppose. Laura, I think we are in great danger. Yes. But what are we to do? I must write to your uncle. Tell him something of what has happened. Of the way Sir Percival has treated you. Oh, but the disgrace of it. No, the disgrace will be Sir Percival's, not yours. And the threat of disgrace may help to bring him to his senses. Or he may be driven to desperation and make things a hundred times worse for us. Well, perhaps. It is a risk we must take. 
I will ask your uncle if you might... if we might stay at Limeridge House for a while. He is a selfish, indolent man, I know, but he might grant the request in order to achieve some peace and quiet hereafter. But what if the letter is intercepted? It won't be. I'll make sure of that. Mrs. Mitchelson said that Fanny was staying at the village inn tonight before starting for Cumberland tomorrow. Yes. Oh, poor Fanny. She is a girl who can be trusted, I know. I'll give her the letter, and she can deliver it herself. First, though, I have an unwelcome but pressing appointment. I must speak with the Count, though it will sicken me to do it, and apologise for what his dear wife overheard just now. I am afraid of him, Laura, and he must be appeased. Let me assure you, Miss Halcombe, I keep no secrets from my husband. None, Miss Halcombe. When he noticed that I was distressed, it was my painful duty to tell him why. I feared as much. Count Fosco, let me earnestly entreat you. Miss Halcombe, there is no need. Lady Glyde spoke rashly and thoughtlessly. She did me an injustice which I lament, but I am unresentful. I forgive her. Let us all this instant dismiss the matter from our minds. Thank you. You are very kind. Thank you so much. My dearest Miss Halcombe, the pleasure is mine entirely. Give me your hand. Count. Yes, my angel? Miss Halcombe, being an Englishwoman, may not be accustomed to such demonstrations of civility. My angel, you are right. Miss Halcombe, my apologies. My sweetest wife, I will take your hand, if I may. I was sickened by the feel of the Count's fat fingers and the touch of his poisonous lips. And if Madame Fosco's tigerish jealousy had not come to my rescue, I cannot say if I would have maintained my degrading self-control. I hurried back to my room and sat down at the table to compose the letter to my uncle. And as I did so... I had the feeling that my writing things were not as I had left them in the morning, but were, perhaps, a little too tidily arranged. In future, I decided I would take no risks. I would always lock my door. Well, I have been to the inn, and the letter is safe in Fanny's hands. Or rather, in the bosom of her dress. And there it shall stay, she says, until she delivers it. Do you mean to join us at dinner? No. Not for the world. Laura, has anything happened? Sir Percival was at the door, hardly five minutes ago, demanding to be told where Anne Catherick is. He's certain, I know. Well, he hasn't found her yet, and one must be thankful for that, not just for her sake, but also for ours. While his efforts are directed towards finding Anne Catherick, he may not be quite so active in his persecution of us. I was exhausted by the heat of the day and by the trials and anxieties I had endured. I decided that before dinner I would go to my room and rest. Within minutes of lying down upon a sofa, I fell asleep. And in a dream, a face appeared. A man's face. Listen. Listen. Walter Hartwright! The wide ocean separates us. But I shall return, I promise, and give what help is in my power. That night when I met the woman on the high road, the woman in white, that night I dedicated my life to a purpose as yet unseen. I shall return. I shall visit the tomb of white marble, and I shall read upon the cross a newly cut inscription. And as I kneel by the cross, the shadow of a veiled woman shall rise up from the grave beneath and the three of us shall be together once more. Till then, have courage and be resolute. I shall return. I awoke trembling. I'd never dreamt such a vivid dream before. I prepared for dinner and went downstairs. Within a few hours, I would need all the courage and resolution I could muster. The English, Miss Halcombe, they love to praise their oratorios. And the Germans, they praise their symphonies. Fosco. And together they pour scorn on us Italians because, they say, we have failed to produce these 
higher forms of music. Uh, Fosca, my response I... is this. They forget Rossini. Rossini the immortal. Rossini the phenomenal. Uh, Fosco, I must talk with you. Well then, talk. No, I meant in private. Ah, then it must be later. I'll not abandon the ladies. It is close, is it not? It is indeed, Madame Fosco. Ah, but we will gain relief, ladies, and very soon the weather will break, I promise you. There'll be rain tonight. I wonder, Miss Halcombe, was it you whom I saw a little earlier, taking a walk in the direction of the village? The village? No, I think not. Oh, perhaps it was Lady Glyde. I might have a walk myself, before it rains, you know. Madame Fosco. Good evening to you, my dear. No, 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 please. Sit down. What an unfortunate business it is, you having to leave us, and so suddenly. Yes, your ladyship, it is. My reason for coming here, Fanny, my dear, is that I have one or two messages which Miss Halcombe forgot to give you. Oh, but... Yes, Fanny? Miss Halcombe has already given me a message. Has she? For Mr Fairley. A very important message. Well... These are additional messages, my dear. But before anything else, why don't you and I have a cup of tea? The Count was right, I think. A change in the weather. Oh, my head still aches. I ought to go to bed. I've been trying to write my diary, but my thoughts have wandered and have never reached the page. Outside, darkness. No moon, no stars. The rain will come, but not yet. <laughs> Tobacco smoke. Someone must be on the lawn. Oh, yes, I can see a red spark. Ah, and here comes another. This one slightly larger. The first was a cigarette, the second a cigar. What's the matter? Why don't you come in and sit down? I'm waiting for Miss Halcombe to go to bed. See, up there? The light's still on in her room. Oh, but why must you wait? Well, dear Percival, Miss Halcombe is a clever woman, and a distrustful one, and a bold one, too. She mustn't have the chance to overhear us. For heaven's sake, we shall be in the library. We shall sit at the far end of it, if you like, away from the door. We shall not be overheard. Oh, nevertheless, I shall wait. You go in, if you wish. I'll join you. Oh. Very well. Patience, Percival. You must have patience. Well, what if I could overhear them? Sir Percival clearly thinks the matter for discussion is a pressing one, and the Count regards it as important enough to warrant taking precautions. It ought to help our cause, therefore, to discover what they have to say. How to do it, though? To go downstairs, to listen at the door, that would be a great risk and would probably be fruitless. Oh, but the veranda, perhaps. Yes. Its roof is just a few feet below me. If I could lower myself down and creep along, I'm sure I could get as far as the library window. Yes. I'll do it. For the sake of Laura's happiness and her honour. Perhaps even for the sake of her life itself and mine. Now, Count Fosco, I shall blow out the candle and you shall go back indoors. And then, let the adventure begin. There now. Slowly, carefully, keep close to the wall. <gasps> keep very close. Flap or crashing to the ground won't greatly help your plan. Slowly, carefully. There's a light in that window. Madame Fosco's room. The blind is pulled down, thank heavens, and there's her shadow on it. Do I wait till she has gone to bed, or, or do I move on very quietly? Very quietly. Move on. Will you have a brandy? Thank you, Percival, but no. Oh, sucre, nothing more. Sugar and water for a grown man? You can mix it yourself. Very well. So, yes, we must take action. Yes, and we must take it soon. 
We are at a crisis, Percival. My crisis, perhaps, is a little less critical than yours, being a matter of some hundreds of pounds, in contrast to the thousands you are owing. Uh, those hundreds, Fosco, you owe to me. Indeed, we both need money. My wife's money. Yes, but how to obtain it? Are we to use threats and brute force as the lower orders prefer? Or may we not find, as men of education and refinement, that quiet determination is the better way? Bear in mind, Percival, we are dealing not merely with your wife, but with her sister, too, who is sharp-witted, strong-minded, and altogether unusual example of her sex. A fine, glorious creature. I drink her health in my sugar and water. Do so. Damn the woman, I say. Damn the pair of them. Ah, you see? You've allowed them to provoke you. And that is why you have failed. From now on, therefore, you should leave the whole business to me. Tell me, Percival, how much do you hope to get from your wife? Mm. Three thousand a year, once her uncle has died. Mm. Is the uncle old? Uh, no. Is he ill? No, he pretends to be. And the three thousand a year is all that you can expect? Uh, that's right. Unless she dies, of course. Uh, yes, uh, of course. At last. At last. It's starting to rain. Unless she dies. Oh, God. If she were to die, what then? Well, assuming there were no children. Is it likely that there will be? No, Fosco. <laughs> it is not likely at all. Then you would get how much? Twenty thousand pounds. Twenty thousand? Good. Madame Fosco has gone to her window. She's pulling the blind up. She's looking at the rain, I suppose. There she is. Oh, don't turn this way, Madame Fosco, please. Oh, she's dropped the blind. Thank heavens. So, if you want money soon, if you want to make certain... No, Fosco, no. We shall not even talk of it. My dear friend, I'm simply stating the position... If you are to win the 20,000, and let us not be coy, if my beloved wife is to inherit too, then your wife, sadly, must die. It's very simple. Simple it may be, but I'll not have it, Fosco. I'm being practical, that's all. Business-like. You and I need money. Your wife has the money we need. You have tried to get at it, but she has refused to sign that document of yours. And so... He means it. He does. If it's left to him, he'll have Laura killed. Then, of course, there is a second difficulty. And this second difficulty seems to have got itself mixed up with our little financial embarrassments. But it is your difficulty, Percival, and yours alone. And it has altered you for the worse. The name of the difficulty, I understand, is Anne Catherick. I could draw your secret out of you if I wanted. I could, believe me. But if you wish me to respect your privacy, then I will. I have consummate self-control, Percival. I'll not pry into this difficulty of yours. But I am nonetheless willing to help you out of it. Would you like me to help? Oh, yes, Fosco. Yes, yes, I would. It's more serious than the money, you know. Anne Catherick must be found. And if she isn't, there's no hope for me. Why? Because she knows your secret, too? Yes. And because she knows it, you had her put in an asylum? Yes. She isn't mad, I take it? She's mad enough to be locked away. Just. And sane enough to ruin you when she's at large? Precisely. Who else knows the secret? Anne Catherick's mother. She told it to Anne. What about Lady Glyde? Well, in the note that I found, Anne Catherick wrote that she and my wife would talk about the secret again. So it's clear that my wife has knowledge of it. But also... There's a man named Hartwright, a drawing master. He knows something too, perhaps. He and my wife... Yes? Well, they are, they, they, they were, in love. Ah, indeed. Where is this Hartwright now? He's out of the country. And what about Anne Catherick's mother? Is she to be trusted? She is. She told your secret once? Yes, but she won't repeat her mistake. She has some interest in the matter, does she? It, she does. If I'm to search for Anne Catherick, I must know how to recognise her. I saw her from a distance only when she was at the boathouse. Oh, it's very easy to describe her. She bears a remarkable resemblance to Lady Glyde. 
Really? Imagine my wife after a severe illness, and you have Anne Catherine. Good heavens. And they're not related? Not at all. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, well, well. Why are you laughing? Oh, a rather fanciful little thought has just struck me. You'll like it, I think. Tell me. No, oh, no, no. We've talked enough tonight. Time for sleep, Percival, the sleep of the just. And when daylight comes, let us see what the magnanimous Fosco will do for his dear, dear friend. They said no more. They said all that I needed to know. More than I needed. I dragged myself back across the veranda roof, entered my room and sank down upon the floor. I was drenched. I was frozen to the bones. And my heart was chilled by all that I had heard. After a while, I can't say how long it was, I roused myself and changed into dry clothes. And now a throbbing heat has replaced the cold. Was it four that struck? Or five? I, I should lie down and rest, but, but, but if I do, I may lack the strength to get up again. Uh, burning. Skin's parched. And I'm so very frightened. Please, God, help me. Tell me, Mrs. Mitchelson, how is the patient? Still in a fever, sir. Did you give her the mixture I made up? I tried, sir, but she refused. Sir Percival has sent for the doctor, of course. Well, let us hope that he's a man of competence. Mr. Dawson? Oh, yes, certainly he is. Now, you may think so, Mrs. Mitchelson, but forgive me. You're not fit to judge. Oh. Lady Clyde, I suppose, is greatly distressed. She is, sir, she is. She was out in the rain, sir. Miss Halcombe, I mean. Last night? Last night, sir. That's what has started her illness, I'm certain. The maid found a pile of clothes in Miss Halcombe's room. Soaked through, they were. That's strange. That's very strange. From the bottom of my heart, oh, magnificent Marion, I breathe my wishes for your recovery. Here is her table. And here is her diary. Let me read what she has written since last I looked. Mr. Fairley? I am he. You, I am given to understand, are called... Fanny, and you are Lady Glyde's maid. I was, sir, till yesterday... Something is creaking. Creaking, Mr. Fairley? Yes. Very loudly. Please make it stop. <sighs> well? I have a letter for you, sir. From whom? Lady Glyde? No, sir, from Miss Halcombe. Put it on the table and don't knock anything over. Seems to be a very crumpled letter. Yes, sir. I noticed that, sir, when I came to after fainting. Fainting? Yes, sir. At the inn. The inn? Which inn? At Blackwater. Madame Fosco was... What? Madame Fosco was at this inn, was she? Yes, sir. She came there, she said, because there were some other messages I had to take, as well as Miss Halcombe's letter. But I never received them, because Madame Fosco told me I must have tea with her. That was uncharacteristically kind of my sister. And then, you see, sir... I fainted. Uh, pray, why did you do that? I don't know, sir. I've never fainted before in my life. And then when I came to, Madame Fosco left. I think it may be the stays, sir. The stays? Yes, sir. They caused the fainting? No, sir. They're making the creaking noise. Uh, hmm. I have read Marion Halcombe's diary. I have written in it, too. Just a few words of sincere homage and admiration. But now, 
I return the diary to the writer's table. Events are hurrying me away. Serious issues await me. Vast perspectives of success unroll themselves before my eyes. I, Fosco, must embark upon an extraordinary enterprise. Well? Ah, Percival, have you found Anne Catherick? What a pleasant day it is. Uh, tell me. I'll tell you, Percival. But this, I think, is not the time. Good morning, Mrs. Michelson. Good morning. How is the sufferer? Miss Halcombe is a little better, I'm glad to say. I'll be in the library, Fosco. Don't be long. The fever came and went, sir, during the night, and now it seems she is improving. Mr. Dawson is with her at the moment. Ah, yes, Mr. Dawson. And so is Lady Glyde, of course. She won't leave her sister for a minute. Oh, she does cry so, and is so very anxious and fearful. Well, Mrs. Mitchelson, there is help at hand. Mm -hmm. For Lady Glyde, for my wife, who has done her share of the nursing duties, and indeed for you. Uh. I've sent for a woman of excellent conduct and capacity, who is known to my wife as a person to be trusted. Mm. Don't tell Mr. Dawson. He will, I'm sure, look with a prejudiced eye on anything that I provide. Ah, here is the good doctor himself. What news, Mr. Dawson? Can it be true there is improvement? It is true, though the illness is still a cause for great concern. I suppose, because you think Miss Halcombe is making progress, that you will persist in the saline treatment that you are giving her? Certainly I will, since it's justified by my professional experience and by its effect upon the patient. Uh, um, might I offer some advice? Why should you? Are you a doctor? I have studied medicine. Perhaps you have. But it's not my habit to consult with amateurs. <laughs> well, let me make an inquiry then. I wonder, as you are a little way removed from the centres of scientific research, whether you've heard of the use of ammonia and quinine in the treatment of debilitation. Also, of the palpable benefits of mesmerism. And if you Sir, have... please, no more. If you were a trained and practised physician, sir, I would gladly discuss such matters with you. But you are not. Therefore, goodbye. Mrs. Mitchell, sir. Yes, Mr. Dawson. I shall return this evening. In the meantime, there are to be no alterations to my course of treatment. Is that clear? I obeyed Mr. Dawson, of course. Being nearly the housekeeper, I was obliged to do so. But I must confess... The Count spoke with such conviction concerning the appropriate treatment for Miss Halcombe that I began to have more trust in him than in Mr. Dawson. And it was clear to me that the patient was slow in making progress. Well, Mrs. Mitchelson? She had an indifferent night, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. But before you go up to see her, Mr. Dawson, yes. I should warn you, there is a nurse with her. A nurse? Who arranged this? The fat foreigner, I suppose. Mr. Dawson, really? The man to whom I suppose you are referring is a nobleman, a member of the highest aristocracy. Yes, and he wouldn't be the first quack with a handle to his name. He's a charlatan. He's an infernal meddler, too. He should have spoken with me first. He should have sought my permission. Where is he? Oh, Count Fosco's not in the house. He's gone away. Oh, for good? No, no. Just for a few days, mm. I think. On business... The nurse is perfectly competent, Mr. Dawson. Yeah. Truly, she is. Mr. Dawson, please, come in. Thank you, Lady Glyde. Good morning to you. Ah, I see Miss Halcombe's asleep. Yes, though it is fitful sleep at best. Oh, I'm so worried about her. Of course you are. But your sister will make a full recovery. She will, provided that my instructions and mine only are carried out. What is the name of the nurse? Mrs. Rubel. Good morning, Mrs. Rubel. Good morning. Pleased to meet you. I wish she weren't here. I don't think I want to trust her. Well, Lady Glyde, I won't seek her dismissal yet. But I assure you, if I have reason to complain of her, she'll go at once. Tell me, Mrs. Rubel... Have you been seated over there since you arrived? Yes. Yeah. Can you perform your duties well, do you suppose, while you are sat at the window? Miss Halcombe has been asleep all this while. 
She does not yet know me. If I were to sit at her side, I might alarm her when she wakes. Yeah, true enough. You might. Mr. Dawson, forgive me. I'm reluctant to say this to you. Not least because it was suggested to me by Count Fosco. Oh, him again. But if Marion should get worse, or if after many more days there should be no change for the better... Yes, Lady Glyde? Would you permit me to send for advice from London? Of course. Indeed, I hope that before you think it necessary, I will have taken such a step myself. It will be a sensible precaution. And it will also, I trust, give me the pleasure of exposing Count Fosco as either a fool or a fraud. Five days of undisturbed tranquillity, that is all. Five days in which to attempt to recover from the uncivilised intrusion of the young person who is Laura's maid, or, or was. And then, on the sixth day, I'm to be visited again by the husband of my tiresome sister. Oh. Mr. Fairley? Uh, Count Fosco. What a delightful house this is. And what a veritable treasure trove is contained within this room. Shall I be seated? Uh, please, but quietly, if you can. I see that you're in some distress. I'm always in some distress. I'm nothing but a bundle of nerves. Less than a week ago, I must tell you, I was put upon by a young person in service who had a bizarre tale to tell and a crumpled letter uh, from Marion, Miss Halcombe. Ah, indeed. Miss Halcombe. It seems that Laura, Lady Glyde, has had a falling out with Sir Percival, and Marion, therefore, was demanding that I open Limeridge House as a refuge for her. Yes, I am aware of this. I have to say, I was not pleased by the letter. I think it is very unfortunate and very unfair that, having shown myself to be too considerate and self-denying to add a family of my own to an already overcrowded population, I should be made to suffer for other people's marital mishaps. Mr. Fairley... If I do have Laura back, is Sir Percival not likely to follow her here? <laughs> and is he not likely to demonstrate a violent resentment toward me for harbouring his wife? No, not at all. Mr. Fairley... I have written to Marion. I have asked her to come here alone and talk the matter over with me. If nothing else, the strategy will grant me some breathing space. Miss Halcombe has not replied to your letter. I'm glad to say she has not. The reason she has not replied is that events at Blackwater Park have taken a melancholy turn. Oh, have they? I, I, must I hear about them now? Won't they keep? Sadly, no. Is anybody dead? Dead? No, heavens, no. Oh, so glad. Uh, forgive me, but I always like to anticipate the worst. It breaks the blow by meeting it halfway. Is anybody ill? Yes. Miss Halcombe. Is it serious? Yes. A fever. A fever? Is it infectious? Not at present. Not at present? Mr. Fairley, I am here, as it were, as Miss Halcombe's proxy. Since she is not well enough to plead her sister's case, I must plead it for her. Oh. Must you? She is right. Lady Glyde cannot remain under her husband's roof. You must receive her here, and very soon. You need not be anxious about Sir Percival. I know him. I'm his oldest friend. He'll not pursue her here. You have my word on it. So, write to Lady Glyde, if you will. Do your affectionate and honourable duty and invite her to Limeridge House. Do it now. Now? Yes. So that I can take the letter back with me. She won't come, you know. Not while her sister is ill. She will come. She must. Not only do relations with Sir Percival deteriorate day by day, but Lady Glyde's health and spirits suffer too. Because of the marriage, because of her anxiety over Miss Halcombe. Oh. As for travelling arrangements, there is no difficulty there. I have recently taken a house in London, in St John's Wood. Lady Glyde can be met at Waterloo Station, and she can stay with myself and your dear sister, and can continue the journey the following day. Nothing could be simpler or more convenient. Now, the letter. Oh. You have writing materials here, I see. Oh. Uh, do mention the overnight stay in London. It will help to convince her. Mm. Mm. Sir, I must protest. You ought not to have come into the room. But I had no choice, Mr. Dawson. The housekeeper has informed me that Miss Halcombe's condition has greatly deteriorated. 
So I'm here in the interests of sacred humanity. Excuse me. When did the change occur? Late last night. You should have called a physician from London. I have already done so, and when he arrives, I will consult with him, sir, but with no one else. Ah, she begins to wake. You! You! Yes, my dear Miss Halkin, it is I. You need have no fear. Go away, please! Go away! Leave her this instant, sir. Can't you see she's terrified of you? Well, Mr Dawson, it is not to be wondered at. Irrational fears, hallucinations... These are to be expected in one who has contracted typhus fever. Typhus? No. No, it's not typhus. You're quite mistaken. I assure you, Mr Dawson, there is no possibility of error. It is typhus fever. And your treatment, sir, is responsible for bringing it on. The Count was proved to be correct, as I thought he would. The physician came from London and confirmed the Count's diagnosis. But he gave us some small cause for hope... We waited. I prayed, as did Lady Glyde, who was very brave. And after five days, merciful providence saw to it that Miss Halcombe's condition improved. The London physician visited again and declared that the patient was out of danger. Ah, Mrs Mitchelson, come in. I've just heard, sir, that Mr. Dawson will not be returning here. Uh, that is correct. He's had something of a falling out with Count Fosco, oh. and his pride, I suppose, has taken a bit of a knock, too. Yes, but, Sir Percival, I do worry that there is no local doctor to attend on Miss Halcombe. No, 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 it's not necessary. The man from London said so. She might suffer a relapse, though, and, and there is Lady Glyde to consider, too. Ah, Lady Glyde. Her sister's illness has greatly affected her. I almost feel that there should be as much concern for her as for Miss Halcombe. Well, Mrs. Rubell is still here, and she's proved herself to be more than capable. No, no, your fears, I think, are quite unfounded, and I would ask you, therefore, to give your full attention to a rather more pressing matter. Mrs. Mitchelson, I find that Blackwater Park is something of a drain upon resources at present, and that serious economies have to be made. I want you, in consequence, to dismiss the domestic staff. Uh, d dismiss them, sir? All of them. With the exception of Mrs. Rebell, of course, and your good self. But the rest of the staff must go. I want this house cleared of the whole lazy, useless pack. When must they go, sir? By this time tomorrow. Tomorrow? But, sir... I... Mrs. Mitchelson, there's no need for them, and therefore they must go. Uh... Is that understood? The staff were dismissed, and the house became a strange, quiet, lonely place. It was surely not unnatural that my spirit should sink, or indeed that I should be uneasy about the way events were unfolding. I became still more so when Sir Percival declared that Lady Glyde and her sister, once they were well enough to make the journey, might benefit from a few days in the genial climate offered by Torquay. He instructed me to go there straight away and reconnoitre for a suitable place of residence. But I had a suspicion that I was being sent quite deliberately on an unnecessary errand. Come in, Mrs. Mitchelson. Thank you. Oh, your ladyship has gained in health, I think, while I was away. I think I have. And what of Miss Halcombe? Yesterday she was no worse, but I've heard no news of her at all today. Perhaps you and I should go to her room. Uh, yes, please. We'll, we'll do that. The Count and... Madame Fosco left yesterday, you know. Didn't they? I had no idea it would be so soon. Ladies. Sir Percival. Uh, may I ask where you're going? T to Marion's room. Well, then, let me spare you a disappointment. She's not there. Not there? She left yesterday morning with your aunt and Fosco and Mrs. Rebell, too. She's going to Limeridge House, you see, and thought that since the Count and his wife were travelling to London, she'd go with them. It's impossible. She wasn't fit to travel. If Mr Dawson had been here... Uh, but Mr Dawson was not here. Mr Dawson has decided to have nothing more to do with this. Why should Marion want to go to Limeridge? Because your uncle won't receive you until he has seen your sister first. He stated as much in the letter he wrote to her at the start of her illness. It was shown to you. Do you not remember? Yes, I remember. She has never left me before... Not without telling me. But she knew that if she did tell you, then you would try to stop her. You're very anxious. 
Absurdly so. I'm anxious for my sister. Well, there's no need to be. She's left for Limeridge to speak to your uncle. What's strange about that? You must forgive me, but I'm not satisfied. I wish to take the first train that I can and follow her. Your ladyship. If my sister was deemed fit to travel, then I am too. I intend to leave here. Very well. I'll not oppose you, but you must go tomorrow. Not today. I'll write to Fosco by this evening's post. Why? To tell him to expect you. He'll meet you at the station and you can stay overnight in St John's Wood. No, please. That's not necessary. Of course it is. You mustn't attempt the whole journey in one day. You must rest in London and I won't permit you to be on your own in some hotel. And nor would your uncle. My uncle? I have a letter from him which you will read when you come downstairs. A Fosco offered to have you stay for the night whenever you should make the journey and your uncle strongly endorses the idea. The arrangement is eminently sensible and appropriate. Uh, do you not think so, Mrs. Mitchelson? I, I confess I can see no objection to it. Nevertheless, don't write to the Count. Please. Oh, but I shall write to him. And there will be no more argument. Unless you prefer not to go at all. The train doesn't leave for half an hour. You have plenty of time. Yes. Please assure me, my lady, that you are going of your own free will. Well, yes, I am. No one compels me, but go I must. I am so fearful for my sister. Ah, here is Sir Percival. You needn't have troubled to wait. Get in, please. So this is our parting. It may well be that I will see you no more. Will you try to forgive me as sincerely as I forgive you? Driver. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sir Percival. Goodbye. Lady Guy. Oh, Count Fosco. How good to see you. Sir Percival's letter reached me just in time. You had a pleasant journey, I trust? Thank you, yes. Tell me, please, where is my sister? Has she already left for Limeridge? She has not. She is at my house. And we are going there now. We are indeed. Where is she? Tell me. I will take you to her soon. Who are those men outside? They are friends of mine. Medical men. The truth is, Lady Glyde, your sister's health has become much worse. Oh, no. The truth is, I fear for her life. Oh, do not say so. Lady Glyde. Help me. Help me. Oh. The afternoon following Lady Glyde's departure... I sat in the garden and tried to compose my mind. I sat and I gazed out across to the old, disused wing of the building. And as I gazed, I realised of a sudden that there was someone seated by one of the windows. A woman. The blood curdled in my veins. The woman, I was almost sure, was Mrs. Rubell. Mrs. Rubell? Mrs. Rubell? Yes? What is the matter? So it is you. What are you doing? I was told you'd gone to London along with Miss Halcombe and... Well, you were told incorrectly. I have never left the house. I don't understand. Sir Percival said quite plainly that... What of Miss Halcombe then? Oh... Miss Halcombe is making good progress. Where is she? She is here. Here? In this room. She is asleep at the moment. Come in and see her.
After many adventures, I returned to England in October 1850. During my time away, I had thought constantly of Laura Fairley, she who married and took another's name, she whom I loved and would always love, though there was no hope for me. The day after my ship reached port, I visited the office of Mr. Gilmore, solicitor to the Fairley family, in order to ask if he had any news of her. Mr. Hartwright, dear Mr. Hartwright, you must prepare yourself for a shock. Why? What has happened? Laura, Lady Glyde, she is dead. Dead? She died a few months ago. I am so sorry. How did she die? Was there some accident? No, no. She became ill. A heart condition. A heart condition? When she was in London. Why was she in London? She was staying at the house of a friend of Sir Percival's, a man named Fosco, a count. Soon after arrival there, apparently, she experienced a fit of convulsions. She seemed to recover, but then, all of a sudden... I ought to advise you that Miss Halcombe came to this office shortly after her sister's death. She was emphatic that her sister had never suffered before from any problem affecting her heart. To tell the truth, she was suspicious about the entire circumstances in which Laura died. Was she indeed? On her instructions, I made some inquiries. Though it was a delicate business, as you can appreciate... I communicated with Count Fosco and found him to be most helpful and cooperative. I communicated with the Count's wife, Laura's aunt, you know, with the medical man who attended Laura, with the servants in Count Fosco's house. And? I discovered nothing. There was not the smallest fragment of detail that could lead me to share Miss Halcombe's anxiety. I can only assume that the loss of her sister had affected her judgment. Where is Miss Halcombe now? Is she at the husband's house? I have no idea where she is. But Blackwater Park, I understand, is empty. Closed. Sir Percival Glyde has gone abroad, I think. Where have they buried Laura? At Limeridge. She is laid to rest in her mother's grave. To Cumberland. The same journey I made a year ago and more when at the instigation of my friend, Professor Pesca, I went to Limeridge House to teach drawing to two young ladies. With one of those ladies, I fell deeply in love. But now, she is dead. I have gone along the well-remembered road, looked across at the high white walls of Limeridge House and the drive, the garden, and the summer house where Laura and I first met. And finally... I have made my way down to the lonely churchyard. The air is calm and still. I walk across the sacred ground. I approach the grave with its marble cross which bears the name of Laura's mother. The cross which the woman in white all those months ago clung to in her distress. If only I would die, Mrs. Fairley, and be at rest with you. Oh, Mrs. Fairley, you know how I love your daughter. If I could save her, I would. Tell me how to save her. Tell me, please. Now on that cross is a newly cut inscription. Hard, clear, cruel letters which tell the stark story. Sacred to the memory of Laura, Lady Glyde, wife of... I turn my eyes away, refusing to read the name of that man who took her from me, who was not worthy of her. I kneel down... Rest my hands, my head upon the broad white stone. Close my weary eyes. Recall our last tearful words to each other when she promised that she would remember me. And I took her hand and kissed it. Oh, Laura. Laura, come back to me. Let my heart speak to yours. Laura, my love. Footsteps. Two women in the cold clearness of the slanting light. Two veiled women who are walking in my direction. They see me. They stop. One of them lifts her veil. Marion. Marion Halcombe. It is her face, though it has changed, as if many years have passed over it. 
Her eyes are large and wild, terrified. The other woman, still veiled, comes nearer. The shuddering of an unutterable dread creeps over me from head to foot. Walter Hartwright. Walter Hartwright. She has possession of me, body and soul. Oh, Lord God, strengthen him. Help him in his hour of need. She approaches. As she moves, her shadow falls upon the grave and then rises up. The tombstone stands between us. The cross, sacred to the memory of Laura, Lady Glyde. She lifts the veil. It is I. <sighs> Laura! Laura! That was episode three of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Dramatised for radio by Martin Wade. Marion was played by Juliet Aubrey. Laura by Emily Bruni. Count Fosco by Philip Voss. Sir Percival by Jeremy Clyde. Walter by Toby Stevens. And Mr Fairley by Edward Petherbridge. Madame Fosco was Geraldine Fitzgerald. Anne Catherick, Alice Hart. Mr Gilmore, Sean Baker. Mrs. Mitchelson, Carolyn Pickles, Mr. Dawson, Jonathan Keeble, and Mrs. Rubel, Richenda Carey. The music was specially composed by Elizabeth Parker. The director was Cherry Cookson. To others, Laura was dead. To others, it was Laura who had been buried beneath the marble cross in Limeridge Churchyard. She was dead to her uncle dead to those who knew her, save her sister Marion and me. She was dead in the eye of the law, and as a result her fortune had been given to her husband and to her aunt. She was dead. How therefore could she ever be Laura again? The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Dramatised for radio by Martin Wade. With Juliet Aubrey as Marion Halcombe, Emily Bruni as Laura Fairley, Toby Stevens as Walter Hartwright, Philip Voss as Count Fosco, Jeremy Clyde as Sir Percival, and Edward Petherbridge as Mr. Fairley. Episode 4. We took the London train from Limeridge. Laura sat by my side. Her poor, innocent head lay trustingly on my shoulder. She is asleep, I think. Yes. The day's excitement has worn her out. Tell me, Marion, how much does she remember of what has happened to her? Very little as yet. She knows that she left Blackwater Park and went by train to London and was met at the station by Count Fosco. And she was taken to a house and became very frightened. After that, she remembers nothing until the moment when she woke up in a small, brown-tiled room. She had been drugged, one assumes, and taken to the asylum. Yes. And the dress that she was wearing was not her own. It was a white dress. It was Anne Catherick's. It was. <sighs> Laura had become the woman in white. And the woman in white, she had died. And under Laura's name was laid to rest at Limeridge, reunited with her beloved Mrs. Fairley. Extraordinary. Almost beyond belief. But the process of exchanging the two identities released Laura's money without the need to kill her. And at the same time preserved Sir Percival's secret. It was a brilliant plot. Devised, no doubt, by Count Fosco. If I am to search for Anne Catherick, I must know how to recognise the woman. Oh, it's very easy to describe her. She bears a remarkable resemblance to Lady Glyde. <laughs> well, 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 well. But, Marion, you yourself must have believed that Laura was dead. Uh, uh, how was it you found her? It was Anne Catherick I was looking for, of course, not Laura. I was hoping to discover Sir Percival's secret from her. Count Fosco had already written to my uncle stating that Anne Catherick had been found and had been put into the same asylum from which she had previously escaped and warning that she might use her resemblance to Laura to claim Laura's identity. So I found the asylum and secured a meeting with the patient in the asylum grounds. She was pointed out to me by a nurse. 
She was walking in my direction. I saw her face. So like Laura's, I thought. So very much like hers. She caught sight of me. She stopped, amazed. Marion! She rushed towards me. Marion! Laura, Laura, it's you, alive! Dearest sister! Oh, dearest sister! <gasps> The three of us took humble lodgings above a news vendor's shop in East London. I earned some money from illustrations for various cheap periodicals, but we were very poor, for I had no savings, and all that Marion possessed had been handed to the nurse who was in charge of Laura to secure her release from the asylum. Worse than the poverty, though, was the condition into which my dearest Laura had sunk. Her mind, her spirit, they had been dealt a crushing blow. I'd like to show you a drawing, Laura. Do you remember that place at all? Yes, yes, I remember it. The summer house, the garden at Limeridge. That's right. And who did the drawing? And then gave it to me as a present, a perfect present. It was me. It was. And I must tell you, your drawing has never been separated from me since. Now look, I have a little present for you. A sketchbook? It is very like the one you had when I first met you. Do you wish me to draw in it? Yes. If you wish. I'm not sure I can. What skill I had to make that drawing of the summer house, I think I have forgotten. It will return, dearest Laura. It will all return. Your lost life, your lost happiness. One day again you will be Laura, just as I remember you. Her mind was clouded. Her beauty was faded. On account of her suffering, indeed, her looks bore a greater resemblance to Anne Catherick than to the Laura of old. I was determined, however, to restore her to health, and to restore her also to her true identity, redress the wrong that had been done to her. To this end, I decided first that I would pay another call on Mr. Gilmore, the Fairley family's solicitor. Sadly, Mr. Hartwright, you haven't a glimmer of a case. You put it very strongly. I would dearly wish to believe what you've told me. Despite myself, I almost think I do. But as a solicitor, I must advise you that the evidence of Laura's death is all too plain. There is the statement which the Count gave to Mr. Fairley. There is the testimony of the doctor who attended the dying woman and the death certificate that he provided. Well, yes. There is the fact that when Laura was taken to the asylum, let us call her Laura for argument's sake, she was received as Anne Catholic without question. There is the fact that in order to obtain her release, Miss Halcombe decided not to take the proper formal steps, but bribed a nurse. And you and Miss Halcombe have now hidden the fugitive in London. Well, what else could we have done? We are in fear for our safety. Mr. Hartwright, please... I am simply stating the position from a legal point of view. When Miss Halcombe presented Laura at Limeridge House, her own uncle failed to recognise her. The servants likewise. She is much changed. Her imprisonment in the asylum... Of course, I understand. But I'm afraid that as things are, you and Miss Halcombe are to be regarded as either foolish dupes or scheming accomplices. <sighs> to be truthful, Mr. Hartwright, you haven't much hope. Your only chance, perhaps. Yes? Your only chance would be if there was some discrepancy in the dating of events. If the death certificate, I mean, showed a date that was earlier than Laura's journey from Blackwater Park to London. Yes, I'd already thought of that. But unfortunately, the date of the journey isn't certain. Laura can't remember it, nor says Marion can the housekeeper at Blackwater Park. Count Fosco and Sir Percival Glyde will know it, perhaps. But if you are right, you can't expect any help from that quarter. They may be forced to help, and indeed to answer for their crime. Oh, yes? Forced by whom? By me. You are very determined, Mr. Hartwright. One last thing. Do you happen to know if Sir Percival Glyde is still abroad? I do. He is not. I was speaking to his solicitor only yesterday. Sir Percival has been in Paris, but is now returned. Indeed. 
Well, Mr. Gilmore, I am much obliged to you. Mr. Hartwright, I wish I could do more. Oh, this letter came by post a day or two ago for Miss Halcombe. Perhaps you could deliver it for me. Walter! Oh, you were so late! Yes, I'm sorry. I came a long way home. I was being followed. Oh, no. I fear so. But I think, I hope, that I lost him at last. He was one of Sir Percival Glyde's men. I'm certain of it. Gilmore informed me that Sir Percival is back in England. Walter! He has heard, no doubt, of Laura's escape from the asylum and is very anxious to find us. We are in danger, then. We are. Grave danger. So tell me, what advice did Mr. Gilmore offer us? Oh, precious little. Our only hope, he says, lies in proving that Laura was still alive after the date shown on the death certificate. Oh, a letter for you. Do you recognize the hand? Yes. Yes, I do. It's Count Fosco's. Dear and admirable woman, oh. I urge you, dwell in the Valley of Tranquility and let the storms of life pass over you. If you have rash friends, encourage them not to threaten the interests of Count Fosco, lest he become a man of action. Let no one cross my path, Miss Halcombe. I will show no mercy. He's trying hard to frighten us. A sign, perhaps, that he is a little frightened himself. So, we should frighten him still more if we can. And Sir Percival, too. The proof that Laura didn't die. The proof that we must show the world. I'll get it from them somehow. You begin with the Count. For my sake, Walter, pursue him first. But for Laura's sake, I must begin where there is the best chance of success. Oh, yes, yes, of course. The Count has no palpable weakness. Sir Percival, however, does. His secret? Yes! When Sir Percival agreed to the plot against Laura, it wasn't merely money that drove him. He thought, still thinks, that Laura knows enough to ruin him, that she was told it by Anne Catherick. Marion, my old superstition still clings to me. Though the poor creature is dead in her grave, the woman in white shows the way to the appointed end. My mind went back to that first meeting with Anne Catherick. I have a friend in London. She lives in Guildford Street. Promise you won't stop me from seeing her. Guildford Street, where Mrs. Clements, her faithful protectress, was living. I resolved to begin my search for the secret there. I blame myself for her disappearance. You mustn't do that, Mrs. Clements. Oh, but I do. We were in Hampshire. We were staying near Blackwater Park, and... I met a foreign gentleman. A count he was. By this time, Anne was quite ill. She had a heart condition, I think. That's right. It seemed to come on after she heard that the day of the wedding was fixed. Between Sir Percival Glyde, you know, and... Um... Uh, yes, yes, I know. And when I told the count about Anne's illness, he gave her a medicine, which made her feel stronger. He was most kind. And Anne had something very important to tell Lady Glyde. But the Count said that the lady had gone up to London and that we should do the same and meet her there. So we went up and Anne stayed with me for a few days. And then the wife of the foreign gentleman called for Anne to take her to Lady Glyde. And they went away in a cab. I haven't seen her since. Mrs. Clements, I cannot help you find her. Indeed, you should not hope that she will ever be traced. Oh. Oh, no. But you can help me, Mrs. Clements, by giving me the information that I seek about Anne and her family. You have known her, I believe, since her childhood. Oh, I nursed her from a baby, sir. The first time she said, Mother, she said it to me. Well, perhaps you can tell me about her actual mother, Mrs. Catherick. Were you a neighbour of hers? Oh, yes, sir. At Wilmingham. Which is some 25 miles from Blackwater Park, I believe. Oh, that is right, sir. It was her husband who brought her to the town when he became parish clerk. Before that, she'd been in service at Varneck Hall near Southampton, which was owned by a friend of Mr. Philip Fairley. The same Fairley who was Lady Glyde's father? Yes. 
But that's by the way. Mrs. Catherick, she held herself uncommonly high, she did. Thought she was far too good for her husband. <laughs> well, I don't like to speak ill of anyone, sir, but she is a heartless woman, with a terrible will of her own. And she's not a stranger to scandal, either. Scandal? Mm, yes, sir. There was another man, a gentleman, so-called. His name? Sir Percival Glyde. Did the husband ever find out about his wife's relationship with Sir Percival? Oh, yes. Well, he'd suspected already because he discovered various gifts she'd had from Sir Percival. But then he came upon the two of them near the vestry of the church and they were whispering together. The men came to blows and Sir Percival was the stronger and beat the husband in the cruelest manner. And that same night, the husband left the town and was never seen in Wilmingham again. And Sir Percival? Oh, the place was too hot to hold him. He left soon after. But Mrs. Catherick, despite the scandal, she stayed on. She did. The brazen hussy. She told everyone she was the victim of a dreadful mistake, that she wasn't a guilty woman, and that she wouldn't be driven out. You haven't yet explained how it was that Anne was trusted to your care. Very simple, sir. Mrs. Catherick seemed to hate the helpless little creature from the day it was born, and there seemed to be nobody else to look after her. But when Anne was ten or eleven, Mrs. Catherick took her away from me, took her to Limeridge. Ah, uh, yes, because Mrs. Catherick's sister was there and was dying. Mrs. Catherick went to nurse her. Well, she thought her sister had some money. That was her only reason. And after that, Mrs. Catherick wouldn't let Anne stay with me. She liked to distress us by keeping us apart. I moved to London, and I wrote to Anne from time to time, told her that if ever she was in trouble, she should come and see me. Which she did, after she escaped from the asylum. Yes. Oh, poor Anne. My initial inference, of course, was that Sir Percival's secret must be connected with Mrs. Catherick's disgrace. But from what you say, the disgrace wasn't a secret at all. Not in Wilmingham, at least. Exactly, Marion. And it seems Sir Percival made no attempt to take Mrs. Catherick away from the town. It's as if he were happy for her to stay there. Yes. So perhaps Mrs. Catherick was speaking the truth when she said there had been a dreadful mistake. Perhaps Sir Percival even encouraged the notion of Mrs. Catherick's disgrace to divert from himself some other suspicion. Mm. So when he and Mrs. Catherick had their encounters, they weren't pursuing a liaison at all. Not an amorous one, at least. They were meeting for another purpose. What purpose, though? Well, I must pay a call on Mrs. Catherick, must I not? And do my best to find out. Morning came. I packed a bag for the journey to Wilmingham and sat down to speak to my poor, dearest Laura. You are going away? For how long? Not long, I think. And when I return, I can give you more lessons in your drawing. You are not tired of me, I hope. You are not going away because you are tired of me. Uh, no, Laura. I'll try to get better, I promise. I'll try not to be so pale and weak and useless. Uh, I'm such a burden at present. Laura. You will start liking Marion more than me. My dearest. You will, you... because I'm so helpless. Laura, listen to me. One day you will be well again. I know you will. But whether you are well or not, I love you. I love you as much as I have ever done, and I will love you forever more. Remember that. Please, my dearest. I arrived at Wilmingham early in the afternoon. I walked through its prim, torpid streets and found Mrs. Catherick's house in an arid square set around a bare plot of grass. Mrs. Clements had given me a discouraging impression of Mrs. Catherick, so it was with little optimism that I knocked upon the door of number 13 and was shown into a little room with big patterned wallpaper and cheap furniture. You have come, my maid tells me, to speak about my daughter. Yes. I am afraid that she is dead. Ah, is she? 
Well, then I suppose I shall have to go into mourning, as you see there is not much alteration required in my attire. I should also inform you, Mrs. Catherick, that your daughter's death has been used as an opportunity for inflicting grave harm upon a person who is dear to me. There are two men involved in this wrongdoing. The name of one of them is Sir Percival Glyde. Indeed? Mrs. Catherick, I am determined to bring Sir Percival to account, and in order to do so, I must obtain some information about events which occurred before your daughter was born, when your husband was the clerk of the parish. Oh, I understand. You have a grudge against Sir Percival, and I must help you take your revenge on him, because you think I am a fallen woman who will do anything you ask for fear you may injure me in the town's estimation. You say that I have a grudge against Sir Percival. But you have a grudge, too. Do I? I'm certain of it. Mrs. Catherick, you can help me ruin him. You can help me crush him. I've no wish to help you. Do you not trust me? No. Are you afraid? Of you. No, of Sir Percival. He's a man of some power and influence. Oh, yes. He possesses a fine estate, is descended from a great family. A great family, indeed. Especially on his mother's side. Well, I know nothing about Sir Percival's mother. I imagine that you know very little about Sir Percival. I know a few things, and I suspect many more. Mrs. Catherick, you remember that day when you and Sir Percival were discovered by your husband? You and he had met by the vestry of Welmingham Church. No, you will not ask me about that. Whatever it was that brought you together, it was not a bond of guilty love, was it, Mrs. Catherick? Get out! of my house. I am right, am I not? Leave! Now! My reference to the church vestry had been little more than casual, but Mrs. Catherick's response persuaded me that Sir Percival's secret must be associated with that place. Also, her snide remark about Sir Percival's mother opened a line of thought about Sir Percival's parentage, which could well have some connection. If there were a marriage register in the vestry of Welmingham Church, might the secret perhaps lie there? Two men. Look, beyond the churchyard wall. I think I recognize one of them. He followed me when I was in London. Yes, but I wasn't followed from Mrs. Catherick's. These men have been waiting for me. So, my suspicions about the vestry were correct. Sir Percival was afraid that my investigations might lead me to the church. And he's got his men here in advance. Ah, and here's another fellow. If you wish to go inside, sir... Uh, yes, I do. Then I can help you. I'm the parish clerk, sir. Excellent. It's parish records that I wish to see. They are kept in the vestry, I take it? Yeah, they are, sir. Come with me. Mm. Where are you from, sir? London? Yes. Uh, now, this lock is a very perverse lock. Mm. Oh. It ought to have been changed, as I've said to the church warden, 50 times at least. But you see, nothing gets done round here. Not like London. <laughs> ah, there we are. You'll uh, have to excuse the mess, sir. Very, very old, all these bits of wood. <laughs> old and as brick as crockery. They're meant to be sent away to be mended, but as I say, uh, nothing gets done round here. Uh, so... You'd like to look at a register? A marriage register. Ah, all right. Now, what year was it you want, sir? Uh, let me think. Uh, 1804, and then working backwards. 1804. I hope you'll excuse me for saying so, but uh, that cupboard doesn't seem a very secure place for such important books. Shouldn't they be kept in a safe? Well, bless me, sir. But those are the very words my old master, Mr. Wandsborough, used to say. A solicitor he was, and, uh, and vestry clerk, too. Vestry clerk? Yes, sir. The vestry clerk deals specifically with business relating to the vestry. Fancy you living in London not knowing that. Here. Register of marriages, 1800 to 1810. And uh, these are the entries for December 1804. Thank you. December... November... So, as I was saying about Mr. Wandsborough, if fearful as he was that a register might get stolen or destroyed... He made copies of the registers here and kept them in his office in Knowlesbury. Of course, he's long gone, but his son's in the same line and in the same office. It was young Mr. Wansbury who got me the position after the previous parish clerk left in a hurry. Catherick, his name was. Yes, I've heard about him. 
December 1803. November... Will you be a while, sir? Uh, I hope not. October... September... What is the name you're looking for? Glide. G-L-Y... Ah! Ah, got it! Got it! Here, look! Sir Felix Glide. And the bride's name... Cecilia Jane Elster of Knowlesbury. Where young Mr. Wansbury is. What? Oh, oh, yes, yes. The uh, writing's very small, sir, is it not? It is. The details have been compressed rather awkwardly at the bottom of the page. And there isn't the same sureness of hand. You know, there is cause here for a little suspicion. I decided I would walk to Knowlesbury. The distance, said the clerk, was not quite five miles, and pay a visit to Mr. Wandsborough's office. The two men were still waiting when I left the church, but they followed me a short distance only. By early afternoon, I had reached my destination. 1803, you said? That's right. Uh, September. And the names? Glyde and Elster. Uh, Glyde. Are you certain it was September, sir? Quite certain. There's no such entry here. The truth was clear enough. Sir Percival had made a fraudulent entry to the vestry register, and he had done so in order to conceal his illegitimacy, to suppress the fact that he was not truly Sir Percival Glyde. I commenced the walk back to Welmingham, my head full of Sir Percival's secret. His secret is now mine too. One word from me and he loses everything. Becomes a nameless, penniless, friendless outcast. Of course, he can't yet know whether I've discovered the secret. But he surely must fear that I'm getting close. Therefore, therefore there's nothing he won't attempt against me. To protect himself, he'd have me killed if he could. In the gloom, two shapes. Two men. Evening to you. Not a pleasant one. Do I go back? Attempt to run past them? <laughs> Very well, then. I'll stay and fight. <laughs> Get him! Get him! They kept up the pursuit, but I took a turn down a footpath and across the fields, and I lost them. I discovered a lane, and after following its muddy windings, I at last found myself in Welmingham once more, in front of some cottages on the other side of the church. Sir, wait there. Yes, you, sir. From one of the cottages, a man with a lantern came hurrying towards me, the parish clerk. Where are the keys? Where are they? They were hanging up in my kitchen. Have you taken them? No, I have not. You mean the keys to the church, do you? Yes. Give me the lantern, quick. <sighs> It must have been that young man, then. Or his master. His master? They were here about an hour ago. Sir Percival, the young man called him. Lord, save us. Look at the skylight. My God. The vestry's on fire. You better go back. Get whatever help you can. Yes. Yes. Lord, save us. Fire. Fire. <laughs> help me. Oh. Oh. You've locked the door! Yes, I, I can't turn the key for it move! Oh, get me out! Please, get me out! The lock may be broken. You're a dead man if you wasted another moment on it. What about the door into the church? No, it's impossible! The flames are too fierce! Well, then, get down on the floor! I'll try and climb it through the skylight! Oh, for God's sake, be quick! For God's sake, I must say, I'm very surprised that you chose to risk your life for him when you had claimed to be his enemy. That was weakness on your part, I think. <laughs> As it is, I owe you a debt of gratitude. You owe me nothing, Mrs. Catherine. No, no. Your presence in Welmingham, your inquiries, they frightened Sir Percival. Because of you, he decided to try and hide his crime and remove the register from the vestry. You, Mr. Hartwright, you drove him to his 
death. And because he was an ill-tempered, cruel, foul-mouthed, insolent man, I must thank you for what you've done. Mrs. Catherine... Was the fire, do you suppose, an accident? I think it was. There was a large amount of old wood stored in the vestry, and it will have caught a light very fast. But what was needed was for a lantern to overturn. But Sir Percival's fatal error lay in the fact that he locked the door behind him to ensure that he wouldn't be disturbed. The lock, I'm afraid, was faulty. Mrs. Catherick, I have one or two unanswered questions still. If, as you say, you wish to do me a favour, then all you need do is satisfy my curiosity. Sir Percival's parents, for instance, why did they never marry? The mother was married already. So the couple lived together as man and wife, and no one in the area supposed them to be anything else. What happened when the father died? Well, there was no difficulty at first. Sir Percival took possession of the title and the property, and his right to do so wasn't challenged. But he discovered that in order to borrow money on the property, he must have proof of his parents' marriage. So he hit upon the idea of forging an entry in a marriage register in a parish near to where his mother had lived. And he made the acquaintance of the parish clerk's wife and gave her gifts. And in return... I obtained the keys to the church vestry. Did he volunteer his reasons for wanting them? No, but I persuaded it out of him. What happened after your husband left you? Did Sir Percival assist you at all? Oh, yes. I've been receiving a yearly allowance from him ever since. You'll be sorry to lose that. I've saved enough in the last 20 years. I'll be comfortable, thank you. I assume there was a condition attached to the allowance. You had to keep silent about Sir Percival's secret. Yes. Also, I had to stay in Welmingham so that he would always know where to find me, though he would let me go to Limeridge when my sister was dying. Anne claimed she knew the secret. No, she never knew it. She knew that there was such a secret and that it could ruin him. I had revealed as much one day in her presence when I had read a letter from Sir Percival and had found it insulting and angrily blurted something out. And the next time Sir Percival came to the house, Anne, in turn, was angered by him because he called her an idiot. So she threatened him by repeating what she'd heard from me. That sealed her fate. She was soon in an asylum. Yes. Not a pauper's asylum, a private establishment. I insisted on that. One final question concerning Anne's father. Anne bore a striking resemblance to Sir Percival's wife, Lady Glyde, and it seems to me that the resemblance cannot be put down to mere chance. I have discovered, Mrs. Catherick, that you were in service before you came to Welmingham, at a place called Varnock Hall whose owner was a friend of Mr. Philip Fairley, Lady Glyde's father. Is it possible, I wonder, that while you were in service at Varnock Hall, Mr. Fairley came to stay there for a while? Well, Mrs. Catherick? It's possible. You were, as you said yourself, a handsome young woman. No doubt Mr. Philip Fairley found you so. Well, Mrs. Catherick? Count Fosco. Yes, dear lady. It is I. How delightful to see you again. What are you doing here? A matter of business. I shall not detain you long. I have a cab waiting, just there. A gentleman is seated inside. Do you recognize him, dearest lady, from your visit to the asylum? He is the owner of that place, and I am assisting him in his search for a missing patient. How is the patient? And how are you? Go away, please. Leave me. You receive my letter, I trust. I suggested in the letter you will recall that I would be happy to lie quiet, provided that my interests were not threatened, provided my personal freedom and the money my dear wife inherited remained secure. Well... It seems now that my interests may be threatened. Why? Sir Percival is dead. Dead? Oh, yes. And in consequence, no doubt, your friend Mr. Hartwright will begin considering ways of striking at me. Advise him against such a course of action, please. Advise him in the strongest possible terms. He cannot succeed. Well, I must return to the carriage. And what will you tell the gentleman who is waiting there? For your sake, Marion... Because of my esteem for you, because I cannot bear to think of you experiencing anguish, I will tell him that I made an error, that the patient is not to be found at this address. Remember this sacrifice of mine, dearest Marion. 
In return for my act of clemency, persuade Mr. Hartwright to interfere no more. He has Fosco to deal with otherwise. And Fosco stops at nothing. Walter. Yes? The admiration that the Count professes for me... It... It's real enough, shamed as I am to admit it. But it won't protect you. No, I realise that. I know the danger I'm in, but I must pursue Count Fosco nonetheless and extract from him whatever is needed to establish Laura's identity. Laura, I take it, does not know that the Count was here. She does not. I have not told her either that her husband is dead. Well, she cannot should not be in ignorance of that forever. Spare her all the details, Marion. Break it to her tenderly. But tell her, please. Because the Count knew our address, we decided to move house, and we took up residence in Fulham. We were peaceful and happy enough, and Laura's progress towards recovery was plainly visible. It is a very fine drawing, Laura. Indeed it is. No, it is merely the best that I have managed since I was ill. It is not a good piece of work. I have no illusions, Mr. Drawing Master. Show me what you have done. Uh, oh. You don't like it? It is of me. <laughs> well, there must be some merit in it, then, if you can recognise its subject. But I'm afraid I haven't done you justice. You know, Laura... Your face has changed. It's become your own once more. The face I saw at Limeridge. You are Laura Fairley again. The Laura of old. And I thank God for it. She has said nothing to me. And yet I see as plainly as you do, Walter, that the situation cannot go on as it is. You and she must come to a decision. Marion, I will be guided by your advice, just as I was before in the garden at Limeridge when you urged me to crush the love I felt for Laura. I shall not say that now. It is strange how as Laura has got better, relations between her and me have become more and more constrained. I have noticed as much. It is as if we were indeed back at Limeridge, and I was the drawing master, utterly captivated by her, but unable to tell her what I feel. Well, if you cannot tell her, then I must do so for you. That day in the garden, I said there was no hope for you. Let us see if things are changed. Shedding a tear, she kissed my forehead and left the room. My life was at a turning point. I sat and waited a long, breathless interval. Scenes from my days at Limeridge presented themselves. The garden, the summer house, the place above the beach where Laura sat and sketched, and I guided her hand. Walter? Laura entered, alone. Dearest Walter, the answer is yes. We married and were very happy, but the shadow of the Count still lay over us. Clearly it would be helpful in the struggle to come for me to know something about the man and his past life, which so far was an impenetrable mystery. I decided therefore to seek help from a friend of mine who was Fosco's countryman. I mean Professor Pesca. Pesca, whose life I had once saved and who had set me off upon my strange adventure. One evening, I called on him. I took him to the opera. Pesca, I'd like you to take another look at that gentleman, if you would. I told you, my good dear chap, I don't recognize him. Take a look at him nonetheless. Uh, 
What did you say his name was? Fosco. Count Fosco. Well, I'm afraid I know neither the name nor the man. Why should I? Is he famous? He may have changed his name, of course. He may have changed his appearance, too. Yes, in his younger days he may not have been quite so fat. <laughs> Tell me, how are you so sure that he would be here tonight? I've been spying on him. Followed him to the box office this morning. Pesca, he's turning this way. Yes. My God! He's looking straight at me, Hartwright. He is. And though you say you don't know him, he certainly knows you. Oh, he stares. Perhaps I'm famous. He doesn't seem very happy. You're right, he doesn't. He's lost some colour. Seeing you, Pesca, has made him thoroughly alarmed. Ah, he's decided to leave. Quick, Pesca, this way. Hurry, Pesca. I think he's escaped us. Yes, the other fellow's disappeared too. Uh, what other fellow? There was a fair-haired man with a scar on his left cheek. Did you not see him? He was sitting near us, and when we were talking about the Count, I noticed that he became most attentive. He looked at you, and then looked at the Count, and when we left, he followed us. My good dear Hartwright, this is all absurdly confusing and mysterious. Can we return for Act Two? No. Back to your lodgings. Please, Pesco, we need to talk. What the deuce am I to do? I don't understand. What is my connection with this man? Well, Pesco, I was hoping that you would tell me that. Listen, today while I was following Count Fosco around the streets, I was suddenly reminded of a remark that Marion, Laura's sister, made. She called Fosco a spy, by which he meant that he was partial to snooping, he liked to listen at doors. But it occurred to me, what if he were a political spy? What if espionage were his vocation? If nothing else, that might explain why he has stayed on in England, even though the crime against my wife was accomplished some time ago. Hartwright, I am not a spy. And as far as I'm aware, there are no spies among my acquaintances. But you are an exile from your country, a political exile. And because of that, I thought to myself, perhaps my good friend Pesca has come across Count Fosco and can give me some information about him. Well, you say I was wrong, but Count Fosco, it seems, has come across you. He is frightened of you, Pesca. Why do you suppose that is? Tell me. Count Fosco has done a great wrong to the woman I love, and I want that wrong redressed. Without your help, that may not be possible. That's right. Dear friend, you won your right of obligation over me on the day that you rescued me from drowning, so now... I put the life you saved back into your hands. And I tell you what should be told to no man. I'm not, in truth, a political exile. I was never persecuted by the government and driven out. I belong to a secret society. That is why I am here. I see. Please, go on. The aim of the society is the destruction of tyranny and the assertion of the rights of the people. I joined it in my younger days on an impulse, and being too zealous, I endangered myself and others in the society. And so I was ordered to England to wait here in case my services were needed. I am waiting still. I wonder, Pesca, what would happen to someone who betrayed the society? He would die. No human laws can protect him. Is there any way in which the society's members can be identified? There is a mark which each of us bears. It is branded upon the left arm. I will show you. It is a very small mark, but it lasts for life. <sighs> From the Count's conduct this evening, one might guess perhaps that he too bears this mark upon his arm. One might guess, perhaps, that he has betrayed his comrades and that the betrayal lies heavily upon his soul. Perhaps. Uh, ten o'clock. I must go. And I will tell you where I must go, dear friend. To the Count's place of residence. Now? Yes. If I wait till the morning, he may have fled. Pesca, should I not have returned here by nine o'clock tomorrow morning, you may assume that I have risked all and lost all. 
I urge you now for the love that you have borne me. If I do not return, use the power entrusted by the society to which you belong. Use it, I urge you, against my enemy. Use it without mercy and without delay. Within 15 minutes, I was approaching the gate of Count Fosco's house. I rang the doorbell and was at length shown into the sitting room. Bags, boxes, papers and clothes were scattered around. On a table stood a cage in the shape of a pagoda, in which a number of white mice were secured. Amidst this scene stood the Count. Mr. Hartwright. Count Fosco. We know each other by reputation. Yes. I am fortunate, I think, in finding you here tonight. You seem to be on the point of taking a journey. I am. Do you know why? Oh, yes. I know why. I can show you why, if you like. All you need do is roll up the sleeve of your left arm. Mr. Hartwright. I assure you, you will see the reason there. Before you came to this house, Mr. Hartwright, did it by any chance occur to you that I am not a man you can trifle with? Count Fosca, I am not here to trifle with you. I am here on a matter of life and death. But whose life and whose death? I would advise you, sir, do not be imprudent. Sir Percival may not have given you much opposition. But you are face to face with Fosco now. Before you think of using that gun, Count Fosco, just wait a moment, please. As you wish. This room is very untidy at present, and I'm not certain if I ought to add to the disorder by scattering your brains upon the floor. Well, then, to help you decide on that question, I shall tell you that a friend of mine... An Italian by the name of Pesca. You saw him earlier this evening, do you recall? He knows of my visit here, and he knows what is to be done if I should not survive our encounter. A notice, Mr. Hartwright. I have returned the gun to the drawer. But I haven't locked the drawer, not yet. Your brains may indeed be scattered before the end of the evening. Though I acknowledge they are cleverer brains than I gave you credit for. So, come to the point. What do you want of me? I am here to represent a lady's interests. Uh, My wife's uh, interests. Her name is Laura. Oh, so she's your wife, is she? (laughs) I have two demands. Demands? First, a full confession of the conspiracy that you plotted against her. Second, plain proof of the date on which she left... Blackwater Park and travelled to London. Ah, yes, the crucial date. The only weakness, you know, in my grand scheme. It was not my intention that Anne Catherick should die so soon. But her heart disease was beyond even my medical capabilities, I'm afraid. As I say, I require plain proof Sir, you shall have it. There is a letter in my possession from the late lamented Percival in which he writes of the day and hour of Lady Glyde's arrival in London. I'll make a full confession for you, too. But to match your two demands, I have two conditions. First, you will let me and Madame Fosco leave this house. Second, you will remain here in the company of my man of business a full half an hour after we have departed. Well... I accept your conditions. Excellent. Excellent. So, to work. Pens, paper. One of the rarest of intellectual accomplishments, Mr. Hartwright, is the ability to arrange and express one's ideas. I possess it in abundance. Do you? (sighs) He embarked upon the confession. A very full confession, as it transpired which he wrote with great noise, enthusiasm and rapidity, and in such a large, bold hand that he completed each page in less than two minutes. And as he completed each page, he threw it over his shoulder with his left hand, while already scratching away at the fresh page with his right. Would you like some coffee, Mr. Hartwright? No, thank you. Oh, you think I'll poison you? You know, the English intellect has one grave deficiency. It is always cautious in the wrong place. At last, the count was finished. Ah, Done. To my profound satisfaction, the subject is exhausted. The man is not. Eleanor, my angel! So, 
I shall now sign the document. Isidore Ottavio Baldassare Fosco, Count of the Holy Roman Empire, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Brazen Crown. Come in, my sweetest. Perpetual Art Master of the Rosicrucian Masons of Mesopotamia. Eleanor, this is Mr. Hartwright. Yes, I've heard about you, Mr. Hartwright. Madam? Our guest has been detaining me, I'm afraid. But I am now free to complete my preparations for departure. Perhaps you would like to amuse Mr. Hartwright, my angel, while I do so? I was listening to what you said to my husband a little earlier, Mr. Hartwright. I tell you, if I had been in his place, you would be dead on the hearthrug by now. The packing was completed. Count Fosco's confession and Sir Percival's letter lay safe in my pocket. Madame Fosco got into the cab, along with a cage of precious mice, and Count Fosco held out his hand to me. Mr. Hartwright, I bid you farewell. Do take care of Miss Halcombe. Admirable woman. Take very good care of her, sir. A week later, no more, I travelled up to Limeridge to confront Laura's uncle. Mr. Hartwright, this is all very troublesome. She is not dead, Mr. Fairley. And these documents, I trust, will convince you. Oh. A confession from Count Fosco, a letter from Sir Percival, mm. which was written on the day of your niece's supposed death, mm. but which announces that her journey to London will be made the following afternoon. I have obtained numerous supporting statements, too. Mm. From Marion, from Mrs. Mitchelson, the housekeeper at Blackwater Park, from Mr. Gilmore. Sir, Laura is not dead. I urge you, therefore, to invite her to Limeridge House and to receive and recognise her publicly. Oh... But, but that would be such a great ordeal for me. It would be a greater ordeal still, Mr. Fairley, if the matter were raised in a court of law. A court of law? Heavens, are you trying to hurry me to my grave? Does Laura... Maybe it is Laura. Contemplate stopping here, I wonder, after I have publicly acknowledged her? No, sir. Very well. Nor will Marion be stopping here, nor will I. You, sir, why on earth would you be stopping? Well, Laura and I are married. Married? Married? Yes. I take it that you wish us both your heartiest congratulations. It was not long afterwards that an illustrated paper offered me a commission which required me to spend some time in Paris. Pesca came with me. Since that fateful visit to the opera, he had not recovered his customary cheerfulness, and we both thought that a holiday might raise his spirits. At our hotel on the final morning, as I was about to knock on the door of Pesca's room, the door opened and a man emerged and brushed past me. Oh. I'm sorry, Pesca. Didn't realise you had someone with you. Well, uh, he's gone now. I only caught a glimpse of him, but... Uh... Yes, it was the man you said was sitting near us at the opera. The man with the scar. Did he bring you bad news? Horrible news. Oh, I tried. However hard I try to forget the mistakes of my youth, those mistakes, I think, can never forget me. We had arranged, if you recall, that we would see Notre Dame. I won't go. I'll stay here. And when you return... We'll go straight back to London. I promise. Approaching the cathedral, I passed the terrible dead house of Paris, the morgue, and my attention was caught by some people who had just come from there and were talking about a corpse that they had seen. The corpse of a man of immense size. I entered the morgue. I pressed in with the crowd and moved inch by inch towards the great glass screen that separates the living from the dead. I looked in. There lay Count Fosco. The wound made by a knife or a dagger was over his heart. 
No other sign of violence was apparent on his body, except upon his left arm, exactly in the place where, on Pesca's arm, I had seen the branded mark. Over the mark, two deep cuts had been made, in the shape of the letter T. Pesca later confirmed what I guessed. T signified traditore, traitor. Our demons at last had been laid to rest. We lived simply and quietly together, the three of us, I mean, for Laura and I would not be parted from Marion nor she from us. And then in the new year, a fourth member of the family was added and was christened Walter. One final event I must report. Walter? Yes, my dear? Marion and I... And your little namesake here? We have some news to give you. Well? My uncle is dead. Oh, my dearest. I'm... I'm so sorry. He'd suffered a severe stroke and failed to recover. We received the news from Mr. Gilmore. He has asked us to go to Limerick straight away. Walter, Limerick House is ours. On the journey north, I thought back over past events. I contemplated the curious chance by which my life had become entwined with the tragic story of Anne Catherick. I asked you, sir, is that the way to London? <sighs> yes, yes it is. Forgive me, I, I was a little startled by your sudden appearance. I've done nothing wrong, sir. You must not be suspicious of me. And now, I am at Limeridge again. I have gathered some flowers from the garden and have brought them to the churchyard. I stand here in the bewitching twilight, and I almost persuade myself that I can see that poor, unfortunate woman kissing the marble cross and beating upon it with her hands. Oh! If only I would die, Mrs. Fairley, and be at rest with you. If only I could be buried here and could wake up by your side when the trumpet sounds. I walk to the cross. I kneel. And I place the flowers. And then I offer a prayer at the grave. The grave that holds the remains both of Laura's mother and of the woman in white. That was the final episode of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Dramatised for radio by Martin Wade. Marion was played by Juliet Aubrey. Laura by Emily Bruni. Walter by Toby Stevens. Count Fosco by Philip Voss. Sir Percival by Jeremy Clyde. And Mr Fairley by Edward Petherbridge. Madame Fosco was Geraldine Fitzgerald. Anne Catherick, Alice Hart. Pesca, Johan Meredith, Mrs. Catherick, Carolyn Pickles, Mrs. Clements, Richenda Carey, Mr. Gilmore, Sean Baker, and the parish clerk, Jonathan Keeble. The music was specially composed by Elizabeth Parker. The Woman in White was directed by Cherry Cookson. Stone by Wilkie Collins, dramatized for radio in six parts by Brian Gear, with music composed by Sidney Sager. The Moonstone, Part One. Hold out your hand, boy, and make a hollow of your palm. Now I pour the black ink into your hand. So, just a little. And I make the signs over your head. Now, look into the ink and tell me, do you see the English gentleman from foreign parts? 
Yes, I see him. Is it on the road to this house and on no other road that the English gentleman will travel today? Yes, on this road no other. And does the English gentleman carry with him that which we seek? Yes, he carries it with him. Will the English gentleman come here as he has promised to come at the close of day? I don't know. Why do you not know? I'm tired. I cannot see into the ink any more. I blow gently upon your forehead. So. You can wake up, boy. You have done well. Brothers, that is all we need to know. In the meantime, we will return to the top. Come. My name is Gabriel Betteridge. I am over 70 years of age, though still in good health, thank God, and I am house steward to Lady Verinder, in whose service I have been since I was a lad of 15. This morning, Mr. Franklin Blake came to me and said, Betteridge, my good friend. Oh, pray be seated, Mr. Franklin. Thank you. <coughs> I've been to the lawyers about some family matters, uh -huh. and among other things, we've been talking of the affair of the Indian Diamond. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Well, Mr Bruff thinks that the whole story ought to be placed on record in writing, and the sooner the better. No, 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 no. Some might say, Mr Franklin, that the whole thing will be best forgotten. There are those who come out of it very badly. <sighs> True, but the characters of innocent people have suffered under suspicion already. Oh, I don't Would know. hardly do if their memories were to suffer also. <sighs> I think that we should all tell the story of the diamond in turn. No, I don't now, As far agree. as our own personal experience extends, and no further. We must begin by telling how the diamond found its way into my aunt's house in Yorkshire two years ago. Nobody knows as much as you do, Betteridge, oh, about no. what went on in the house at that time. So, you must take the pen in hand and start the story. house is high up on the Yorkshire coast and close by the sea. We have got beautiful walks all round us, in every direction but one. That one leads for a quarter of a mile through a plantation of firs and brings you out between low cliffs on the loneliest little bay on all our coast. The sand hills run down to the sea and end in two spits of rock jutting out opposite each other. Between the two lies the most horrible quicksand. No boat ever ventures here. No children from our fishing village ever come here to play. The very birds of the air, as it seems to me, give the shivering sand a wide berth. And what, you may ask, was I, Gabriel Betteridge, doing in such a desolate spot on a fine summer morning? Well, I will tell you. I was looking for our second housemaid, Rosanna Spearman, who was late for a dinner. And believe it or not, this was her favourite walk. I saw no sign of Rosanna in the plantation, but when I got on to the beach, there she was, in her little straw bonnet and her plain grey cloak that she always wore to hide her deformed shoulder as much as might be. You've been crying, Rosanna. I had one of my fainting spells this morning, that's all. I asked if I might come out here for a breath of air. Oh, yes. Now tell me what you're really crying about. About the years that are gone. My past life still comes back to me sometimes. Come, come, my girl. Your past life is all sponged out. Why can't you forget it? The stain is taken off, Mr Betteridge, but the place still shows. No one among the servants knows about the reformatory. No one but my lady and Miss Rachel and me. But I know. Don't you see? No, I don't see. That's just foolish talk. Now dry your eyes and come back with me. I don't want any dinner today. Let me stay a little longer. Why do you like to come here? It's such a miserable place. Something draws me to it. I try to keep away, but I can't. Sometimes, Mr Betteridge, I think that my grave is waiting for me here. There's roast mutton and suet pudding waiting for you, so go in to dinner directly. This is what comes of thinking on an empty stomach. Oh, please not to tell my lady I'm discontented, Mr Betteridge. I am not. My mind's unquiet sometimes, that's all. Well, we'll say no more about it, Rosanna. Now, come along. There's much still to do before Mr Franklin arrives this evening. What sort of a gentleman is Mr Franklin? Why, uh, as to that, I cannot tell you. 
I haven't seen him these seven years, but he was the nicest boy that ever broke a window. That I can say. Mind you, he still owes me seven and sixpence. Mr. Franklin had a hole in his pocket that nothing would sew up. Cook says his father was a duke. Cook would do well to hold her tongue, and I shall speak to her when I get back. Then who was Mr. Franklin's father? Mr. Franklin's father was plain Mr. Blake. He fancied he was a duke and spent a considerable fortune trying to prove it. Oh, the whole thing dragged on for years and years, and he was still playing Mr. Blake at the end of it. He took revenge on his country by sending Mr. Franklin abroad to be educated. Then, yesterday morning, came this letter from Mr. Franklin to say he's arriving today to keep Miss Rachel's birthday. Oh, look, Mr. Petridge, look. The tide's on the turn. Look at the sand, how it heaves and shivers. It's as if there were hundreds of suffocating people under there, all struggling to get to the surface and all sinking deeper and deeper. Rosanna! Throw a stone in, Mr. Betteridge. Throw a stone in and let's see the sand suck it down. Now, I will not have you talking like this. I will not have it, I say. You Petridge, just... Be... where are you? Who's there? Dear old Betteridge, I owe you seven and sixpence. Now do you know who I am? Franklin. <laughs> Mr. Franklin! Oh, Lord bless and save us. Four good hours before we expected you. Mr. Betteridge, thank you. I'll go back now. I'll go back, and I'll try not to have any more silly thoughts. Yes, that's right, Rosanna, and do try to eat some dinner. It'll do you good. What a strange girl, Betteridge. Rosanna Spearman, Mr. Franklin, second housemaid. She's not herself today, but you'll be wanting some luncheon, Mr. Franklin. Oh, no. No, no, Betteridge. There's one advantage to this horrid place. We've got it to ourselves, and I've something to tell you. I dare say you'll hardly credit it, but I suspect I've been followed and watched in London. That's why I'm here four hours early. I came by the morning train to give a certain dark-looking stranger the slip. But who's watching you, sir, and why? Why? Oh, just a minute. First, tell me about the three Indians you've had at the house today. I saw Penelope before I came down here, and she mentioned them. Tell me, Betteridge, what did they do? Oh, very little, sir. They took themselves off, as I asked them to. There were just three of them, and they had a little boy with them. I thought they were jugglers of some kind. They asked if they could put on their show for the lady of the house. But you straightway told them to leave. Well, sir, the family silver was on the pantry table, and their manners were so nice, that made me suspicious. And then what? Well... Well... Then I tried to go back to a nice little nap, I was having... <sighs> But I'd scarcely dropped off before Penelope came running up and she said the Indians knew you were coming and they meant you some mischief. What mischief? And how did she know? Well, she was having a chat with the lodgekeeper's daughter and they saw the Indians on their way out. Well, you know what women are. They took it into their heads that the little boy, uh, largely on account of his being fair and delicate looking, was ill-used. So they followed them along the inside of our hedge. Ah. They said they saw them pour some sort of ink into the boy's hand. Ink? Then they made him look into it and asked him questions about the English gentleman whom Penelope took to me in use. And um, what did the boy say? He said you would be coming along that particular road this evening and that you would be carrying what they were seeking for. So, what do you make of that, Betteridge? I'll tell you what I make of it, sir. Plain trickery. Well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? They must have heard the servants talking about your arrival and saw their way to making a little money by it. They meant to wait until they saw my lady drive home and, oh, and then come back and, and foretell your return as, well, as if by magic. What Penelope overheard was them rehearsing all that hocus-pocus. Oh, it all strikes me as just nonsense, doesn't it, you, sir? No, Betteridge, it does not. I suspect that what they seek... Is this little package. Really, sir? And what might there be in that little package? Colonel Herncastle's legacy to his niece, Rachel Verinder. His diamond. The Moonstone. The Moonstone? And you carrying it about as though it were no more value than a piece of cheese? My father is the Colonel's executor. He has given it to me to bring down here. But your father wouldn't have touched the Colonel with a pair of tongs. No one would. <laughs> Why not? What is there against the Colonel? Surely you know that John Herncastle was one of the greatest blackguards that ever lived. I know that's what everyone says, but why? Well, sir, take what happened in the army. He had to leave the guards before he was two and twenty. He went out to India to try a little active service. He, he was at the taking of Seringapatam, but soon after that he changed into another regiment and then into a third. Was that a crime? No, no, sir, but he came back to England with a character that closed the doors of all his family against him. 
I've heard say that the diamond was at the bottom of it, or how he came to get the diamond while he was in India. Did you ever see him yourself? Only once, about two years ago. It was on the night of Miss Rachel's birthday. There was a party, as usual, at my lady's house in London, and John Herncastle came to the door. Go up to my sister, says he to me, and say that I have called to wish my niece many happy returns of the day. Well, of course, my lady would have none of him. And when I gave him her answer, he just laughed. And I remember his very words. Thank you, Betteridge, he said. I shall remember my niece's birthday. Uh. And he walked out of the house. Miss Rachel's next birthday came round, and we heard he was ill. Six months after that, he was dead. That would explain it. Listen, Betteridge, it's my belief that certain people in India want to get that diamond back. And more than that, I believe the Colonel, knowing this, has deliberately left a legacy of trouble and danger to his sister through Rachel. What? Are you sure, Mr. Franklin? Yes, I'm sure. Well, nearly sure. A few days ago, I had dinner with Mr. Bruff, the family lawyer, and he told me more about it. We see, the Colonel had some papers that my father thought would help him in his claim to the dukedom. Well, as you know, nothing came of it. But he and the Colonel struck a bargain. In return for seeing the papers, my father was to look after the Moonstone, deposit it with his bankers. But why didn't the Colonel keep it himself? Because he was afraid that some Indians were on the track of it and would kill him to get it. Then they would kill your father, wouldn't they? No, because they probably wouldn't know he had it. Then they would suppose the Colonel still had it, and what was there to stop them killing him? Ah, he had taken the care to inform them, through certain channels that were open to him, that if they did, then the Moonstone would immediately be sent to Amsterdam and cut up into a number of smaller stones before they could lay their hands on it. That's how the Colonel hoped to save himself from being murdered. But the Indians could still raise the value on the smaller stones, (sighs) couldn't they? Yes, but the value in money means nothing to them. The Moonstone's value to them lies in its religious significance as a whole stone. That's where the Colonel was so clever. If they killed him, they as good as destroyed the Moonstone themselves. And they would never do that. It's sacred to them. But are you sure that all this is true, Mr Franklin? It sounds fantastic to my common-sense way of thinking. Well, I had it from Mr Bruff himself, and he drew up the Colonel's will, so he knows all about it. Now, let me get this clear, sir. You think the Colonel has left the Moonstone to Miss Rachel so as to bring all this danger onto my lady? Yes, almost certainly. But suppose my lady had died before the Colonel did, or even, God forbid, but such things do happen, or even suppose that Miss Rachel had died? Uh, in either event, the will provides for the diamond to be cut up and sold, and the proceeds go elsewhere. Not to Miss Rachel or my lady? No. Then it does look black, Mr Franklin. Black indeed. But on the other hand... Precisely. On the other hand, we don't know what his intention was. We could be misjudging him. Now, Mr Bruff says the Colonel was reconciled with the church on his deathbed. Perhaps it's just as it says in the will. The moonstone is a token of forgiveness for the way Aunt Julia closed her house to him. But then again, perhaps he took the clergyman in. That's not Mm. difficult to do, you know, sir. Not when you're telling them what they want to hear. Now, Betteridge... Do you see why I believe there's a conspiracy at the bottom of all this? I'm beginning to, sir. Though I keep hoping there still might be some perfectly innocent explanation for it. (sighs) I don't think there can be. I think it means a plot among the Indians. A plot with some old Hindu superstition behind it. Mr Franklin, you said you were followed in London. That was something to do with all this, I take it? Yes. After I took the Moonstone out of the bank... I thought I was followed by a man with a dark complexion. I went to my father's house to pick up my luggage and found a letter there which unexpectedly detained me in London. So, of course, I had to put the moonstone back in the strong room again. And again, I thought I saw the man with the dark complexion. Now, I saw him definitely for the third time when I took the moonstone out of the bank again this morning. So, I took the morning instead of the afternoon train as I'd intended. Now, here I am with the diamond safe and sound... And what is the first news that meets me? I find that three strolling Indians have been at the house and that my arrival from London is of particular interest to them. It could be just coincidence. Yes. And it could be that in bringing the Moonstone to my aunt's house, I am serving the Colonel's vengeance blindfold. But then again, I could be vindicating him in the character of a penitent and Christian man. God alone knows, sir. Don't ask me. (sighs) Why did my uncle leave the Moonstone to Rachel? 
Why didn't he leave it to my aunt if he wanted to make his peace with her? Because he knew my lady well enough to know that she would have refused any legacy that came from ah. him. Well, how did he know that Rachel might not refuse it too? Is there any young lady who could resist the temptation of such a birthday present as the Moonstone? Hmm? <laughs> but why did he leave the diamond to Rachel only if her mother is still alive? Now, that's the condition in his will. I even have a copy of that part of it to give to Aunt Julia. If he has purposely left a legacy of trouble and danger to his sister through her daughter, then it must be conditional on her being alive. Cigar, Betteridge? No, no, thank you very much, sir. I prefer a pipe. I wish I knew what to do. I don't want to alarm my aunt without reason, and I don't want to leave her without what may be a needful warning. If you were in my place, Betteridge, tell me, in one word, what, what would you do? In one word, sir, wait. <laughs> With all my heart... How long? Now, this is the 25th of May, and Miss Rachel's birthday is on the 21st of June, so we have close on four weeks in front of us. Mm -hmm. Let's wait and see what happens in that time, and let's warn my lady or not as the circumstances direct us. <laughs> Perfect, Betteridge, as far as it goes. Ah, but, but what's to be done with the diamond between this and the birthday? Put it in the bank at Frising Hall. The Bank of England isn't safer than the Bank of Frising Hall. <laughs> If I were you, sir, I would ride straight there with it before the ladies come back from their drive. Excellent. The very thing. Betteridge, you are worth your weight in gold. Come along. Back to the house and saddle the fastest horse in the stables. Why, this is the way. I do like to be doing something. When I heard the last of his horse's hoofs on the drive and found I was alone again in the yard, I felt half inclined to ask myself if I hadn't woken up from a dream. The afternoon wore on and my lady and Miss Rachel came back. There, that's my duty done for another month. <laughs> the rector may be a worthy man, but he is an exceedingly dull one. <laughs> my lady... Mr. Franklin has arrived. Already? Oh. But he's not expected until this evening. Yes, Miss Rachel. Uh, that is to say, no, Miss Rachel. But where is Mr. Franklin? He has gone away again, my lady. Gone away again, Betteridge? Whatever for? I don't quite know, my lady. Uh, oh, he is returning, naturally. Uh, I can only put it down to one of Mr. Franklin's freaks. <laughs> he galloped off on a horse almost as soon as he got here. A freaks, Betteridge? And no doubt it was one of Mr. Franklin's freaks, as you call them, that inspired his arrival some hours earlier than expected. Uh, no doubt, my lady. Tell me, Betridge, what does Mr. Franklin look like? Look like, Miss Rachel? Uh, well, he, he looks like Mr. Franklin, I suppose. Betridge, don't be obtuse. You know very well what I mean. The last time I saw Mr. Franklin, he was a boy of 14. He promised to be tall, I remember. Indeed, Miss Rachel, so he did. But, uh, <clears throat> tall? No. I, I would not describe him as tall. But not short, Betteridge. Surely Mr. Franklin has not turned out short. He does want middle height by an inch or two, or, or so it seems to me. But he's neat and slim and he still has that bright, straightforward look in his eyes. <laughs> you will just have to contain your curiosity, Rachel, until Mr. Franklin has another of his freaks and <laughs> returns. Oh, I'm going to my room. I don't know which is more fatiguing, the heat or the rector of Rising Hall. <laughs> I thought I slipped out of that rather neatly. <laughs> but no sooner had I gone to my own little sitting room than I had difficulties with Penelope. You will remember it was Penelope who told Mr. Franklin of the Indians when he arrived and sent him on to find me at the Shivering Sand. Uh, did I mention that Penelope was my daughter? Well, at all events, I've mentioned it now. She was also Miss Rachel's maid, and no sooner had she taken Miss Rachel's sunshade and gloves... And she came to question me. Well, father? Well, what, my girl? Now, father, you know very well what. What did Mr Franklin say about the Indians when you told him? Uh, Mr Franklin and I went on, uh, having dismissed the Indians as of no account whatsoever, to talk of foreign politics until we both fell asleep in the heat of the sun. Oh, by the by, I, I trust Rosanna returned satisfactorily. She left us in rather a hurry when Mr Franklin found us. It's funny you should say that, Father, because Rosanna's been acting very strange since she came back, 
and Mr Franklin's at the bottom of it, if you want my opinion. She turned all colours of the rainbow and asked hundreds of questions about him. And when I said I thought it was extraordinary that a strange gentleman should have any interest for her, she grew quite angry with me. Well, really, Father, there's only one explanation for it. Oh, and what might that be? Why, Rosanna has fallen in love with Mr Franklin at first sight. Nay. That's all it can be. Fallen in love with him? Fallen in love with Mr Franklin? Yes. Oh, come, come, come. That's the silliest thing I ever heard. Now, you just keep that idea to yourself. It would do the poor girl a deal of harm if that got about among the other servants. They have a low enough opinion of her as it is. Rosanna Spearman in love with Mr Franklin. The very idea. Mr Franklin returned from Frising Hall, and to my great disappointment, and no doubt to yours also, nothing had happened. He had not met with the Indians. He had deposited the moonstone in the bank, and he had got the receipt for it safe in his pocket. I would have given something to have waited at table that evening. But waiting at dinner, except on high family festivals, was letting down my dignity in the eyes of the other servants. Penelope brought me some intelligence, however. And really, Father, I've never known Miss Rachel so particular over dressing her hair. Oh, but it was worth all the trouble, every bit. She looked so bright and pretty when she went down to meet Mr Franklin in the drawing room. Later in the evening, we heard them singing duets, and my lady, on the piano, following them as it were over hedge and ditch, and seeing them safe through it in a manner most wonderful and pleasant to hear through the open window. Later still, I went to Mr Franklin in the smoking room with the soda water and brandy, and found that Miss Rachel had put the diamond clean out of his head. When I endeavoured to lead the conversation to more serious things, all I could extract from him was... Really, Betteridge, I've no hesitation in saying that Miss Rachel is the most charming girl I've seen since I came back to England. Towards midnight, I went round the house to lock up, accompanied by my second-in-command, Samuel the footman. When all the doors were made fast, except the side door that opened onto the terrace, I sent Samuel to bed and stepped out for a breath of fresh air. The night was still and close, and the moon was at the full. I had come out on the dark side of the house, and as I looked to my left, I saw the shadow of a person thrown forward from behind the corner. Being old and sly, I forbore to call out, but my feet betrayed me on the gravel. Before I could steal round the corner, I heard lighter feet than mine, and more than one pair of them, retreating in a hurry. By the time I had got to the corner, the trespassers had run into the shrubbery and were lost to sight. From there, they could easily make their way over our wall and into the road. While I was thinking what to do, I noticed for the first time a little bright object lying on the gravel under the light of the moon. I picked it up. It was a small bottle. Inside there was a thick, sweet-smelling liquor, as black as ink. Hmm. Well, you know, Betteridge, even in England there are people who believe that some have the power of seeing persons and things beyond the reach of human vision. They call it uh, clairvoyance, brightness of sight. The Indians must believe the boy is one of these. Just a lot of hocus-pocus, if you ask me. Mm, quite. But depend upon it, Betteridge, the Indians took it for granted that we should keep the diamond here, and they brought their clairvoyant boy to show them the way to it. Do you think they'll try again, sir? Mm. It depends on what the boy can really do. And if he can see the diamond inside the bank at Frising Hall, we shall be troubled with no more visits at present. But if he can't, we shall have another chance of catching the Indians in the shrubbery before many more nights are over our heads. My own feeling was that the Indians had reports of Mr Franklin having been seen at the bank and drew their own conclusions. Now pay close attention to what I say next. You will find it has a bearing on something that is still to come. Mr Franklin dabbled in decorative painting. He had invented a new mixture to moisten paint with which he described as a vehicle. What it was made of, I don't know. 
um, what it did, I can tell you in two words. It stank. Miss Rachel, being wild to try her hand at the new process, they set to work decorating her own little sitting-room door. Mr Franklin scraped off all the nice varnish and made a, a surface to work on. Miss Rachel then covered the surface under his direction with birds and flowers and cupids, copied from a famous Italian painter whose name escapes me. When they were not riding or seeing company or taking their meals or singing their songs, there they were, with their heads together, spoiling Miss Rachel's sitting-room door. The servants' hall began to debate whether or not we should have a wedding in the house before the summer was over. That Mr Franklin, on his side, was in love, no one who saw him could doubt. The difficulty was to fathom Miss Rachel. There was also her other cousin, Mr Godfrey Abelwhite. Mr Godfrey, father? How can you possibly think Mr Godfrey's chances are better than Mr Franklin's? For one thing, Mr Godfrey is very well off. Mr Franklin, I fear, is always in want of money. How can you possibly know that? Because I know Mr Franklin, that's how. Only the other day that foreigner called to see him on business and he was very quiet for a whole day afterwards. That was over some debt while he was travelling on the continent. You can be quite sure of that. As if Miss Rachel was the sort to marry for money. It's not just money. Mr Godfrey is a barrister by profession. And what is Mr Franklin? Nothing. As a speaker at charitable committees, Mr Godfrey is tireless. What does Mr Franklin do besides ride out and sing pretty songs and spoil young ladies' sitting-room doors? But would Mr Godfrey make any sacrifice for Miss Rachel? You know how fond Mr Franklin is of his cigars. Yet when Miss Rachel said she hated the smell of them in his clothes, he instantly offered to give them up. And he did so. Yes, and that night he slept so badly for want of tobacco and looked so haggard and worn the next day that Miss Rachel begged him to go back to smoking again. And he refused because he said he could take to nothing that would cause her a moment's annoyance. What about the presents? The beautiful casket in China from Mr Godfrey with his love and best wishes and a plain little locket from Mr Franklin not worth half the money. How could it be, seeing you're so positive Mr Franklin has none... Besides, do you really think Miss Rachel could be moved by such a consideration as that? If you ask me, Miss Rachel would sooner marry the dustman than Mr Godfrey Abelwhite. Shortly before Miss Rachel's birthday on the 21st, we had the doctor in the house professionally. He was summoned to prescribe for Rosanna Spearman. And as it was a matter concerning one of the servants, my lady naturally wanted to hear my opinion of the matter. Waking and crying at night, loss of appetite. Yes, I put it down to nerves, Lady Verinder. I doubt if the girl's fit for service. But would a change of air be beneficial, do you think, Mr Candy? Indeed, a change of air is often most beneficial in cases like this. I would strongly advise it, if it be possible. Would you like to go to one of our farms inland, Rosanna? Perhaps as a dairymaid? And getting more fresh air than you do here, you, you would find your spirits improve remarkably. Oh, my lady, I know you mean to be helpful, but I do so love it here. I would be far worse if you sent me away from from here and all of you. I'm so grateful to you, my lady, for giving me a chance. Please let me stay. Oh, Betteridge, what do you say? Uh, well, my lady, seeing as Mr Candy thinks it's nerves and Rosanna does so want to stay, it would only do her nerves more harm to send her away. At least that's how it seems to me. I have no complaints of her work, my lady. Very well, Rosanna, you may stay. But no more crying at night, do you hear? It cannot be good for you to lose your sleep. Thank you, my lady. As you wish, my lady, but I still think a change of air is the thing. Thank you, Mr Candy. And I look forward to seeing you at dinner on Rachel's birthday. Oh, it will be my pleasure, my lady. That proved to be the worst advice I could have given, though I meant only to help Rosanna. If I could have looked a little way into the future... I would have taken her out of the house then and there with my own hand. Later the very same day, Penelope made an awkward discovery which we hushed up on the spot. She caught Rosanna at Mr Franklin's dressing table, secretly removing a rose which Miss Rachel had given him to wear in his buttonhole and putting another rose like it of her own picking in its place. June the 21st. 
the day of the birthday, was cloudy and unsettled at sunrise, but towards noon it cleared up bravely. After breakfast, Mr. Franklin and I had a private conference on the subject of the moonstone. I must own, Betteridge, I'm in twenty different minds about what to do. Why, how can that be, Mr. Franklin? There is only one thing to do. Take the moonstone out of the bank at Frising Hall and present it to Miss Rachel. Oh, yes, that's all very well, but what if... But nothing, sir. Nothing can alter the legal obligation you have to give the diamond to Miss Rachel. And nothing has happened to justify you in alarming my lady. Nothing? What about the prowlers in the night? They haven't bothered us since. And we have no proof that the diamond was what they were after. Well, that's my way of looking at it. Betteridge, you were not followed on three separate occasions by a man with a dark skin. <sighs> I must own that I'm a little nervous about riding back from Frising Hall alone and with the moonstone in my pocket. Well, there's a way out of that difficulty, sir. Oh? Mr. Godfrey sent a note this morning. He was obliged to consult his father on business and he spent last night at Frising Hall. He intends to ride over in good time for dinner this evening with his sisters. Now, what could be more natural than for you to return in their company? Yes, yes, Betteridge, what a good idea. That's what I shall do. But first, Miss Rachel and I have got to finish that door. Oh, dear. And we shall want Penelope to mix the colours again, so perhaps you'd send her up at the first opportunity. They used the whole morning and part of the afternoon in the everlasting business of the door. It was three o'clock before Miss Rachel and Mr Franklin took off their aprons and released Penelope and cleaned themselves of their mess. But they had finished the door on the birthday and proud enough they were of it. Mr Franklin snatched a morsel from the luncheon table and rode off to Frising Hall to escort his cousins, the Abelwhites, as he told my lady to fetch the moonstone, as was privately known to himself and me. This being one of the high festivals on which I took my place at the sideboard, I had plenty to occupy me while Mr Franklin was away. Then I retired to collect myself over a pipe of tobacco. I was aroused by the clatter of horses' hoofs outside, and going to the door, received a cavalcade comprising Mr Franklin and his three cousins escorted by a groom. Ah, oh, my dear Betteridge, good day. Good day, Mr. Godfrey, sir, good day. But so hot, Betteridge, so hot. However, I'm most glad to see you wearing so well. That's very kind of you, sir. You do not seem to be quite your usual self, if I may say so. Ah, the pressures of the world, I fear, Betteridge. Quite, sir, quite. And your father? I trust you found him in good health? And much as usual, Betteridge. Uh, Felicity, Georgina, do you stop gossiping and come inside, out of the heat? Oh, Godfrey. oh, Godfrey, you know how much you've been looking forward to meeting Mr Franklin after all these years. And since you monopolised him all the way over. With your everlasting business, business, business. We were just making up a little leeway. Better Ridge. Oh, oh. Better Ridge, looking younger than ever. How do you do it? You must have the secret of perpetual youth. <laughs> Felicity, Georgina, a word in your ear. Mr. Franklin, sir, have you got the diamond safe? Here in my breast pocket, Betteridge. Safe as the bank of Frising Hall. And the Indians, did you see anything of them? Not a sign, not a glimpse. Then you will wish to give the diamond into Miss Rachel's hands as soon as may be. Immediately, and then my duty is done. But I have first to tell Lady Verinder about the Colonel's bequest and give her the copy of that part of the will. Where is she, Betteridge? In the small drawing room, sir. I shall go there directly. Perhaps you would ask Miss Rachel to come along too in a minute? Very good, Mr. Franklin. Cousins, pray excuse me for a few minutes. I have some small business with Aunt Julia and Rachel. Then I think I can promise you a surprise. <laughs> About half an hour afterwards, I was crossing the hall when I was brought to a standstill by an outbreak of screams from the small drawing room. I can't say I was at all alarmed, for I recognised them as the screams of the Miss Abelwhites, and they screamed at anything and everything. However, I went in to discover whether anything serious had really happened. There stood Miss Rachel at the table with the Colonel's diamond in her hand. There, on either side of her, knelt the two Miss Abelwhites, devouring the jewel with their eyes and screaming with ecstasy. There, at the opposite side of the table, stood Mr. Godfrey, clapping his hands like a large child and singing out softly, Exquisite! Oh, exquisite! There sat Mr. Franklin in a chair by the bookcase, tugging at his beard and looking anxiously towards the window. And there, at the window, stood my lady. 
the extract from the Colonel's will in her hand, her back turned on the whole of the company. <coughs> yes, Betteridge. Uh, excuse me, my lady, but I wondered if you had any particular instructions about the dinner. Uh, come to my room in half an hour. I shall have something to say to you then. Uh, Godfrey, pray excuse me. I should like to rest before dinner. Look, Gabriel. Come and look at my wonderful gift from Uncle John. Lord bless us. Oh. That is a diamond. Why, it must be as big as a plover's egg or, or nearly. Close the shutters, yes. someone, so that we may see it in the dark. Yes. Godfrey, would you mind? Of course, Rachel. Mere carbon, Betteridge, mere carbon, after all. Oh. Oh. How it does excite the ladies. And not only the ladies, Mr. Godfrey. Some men would commit any wickedness to possess a jewel like that. Very true, Betteridge, my good friend. Very true, unhappily. Look at it now, in the dark. Just look at the way it glows. It's like the harvest moon. Oh, it's lovely, Rachel. Quite lovely. Oh, you are lucky. I wish that I had such a jewel, don't you, Felicity? Oh, yes, Georgina. You'll be the envy of the county with this, Rachel. Won't she, Godfrey? No, of all society, my dear Felicity. Oh, Godfrey. There's only one thing that troubles me. Why should my Uncle John have left me this? I do believe he never even saw me, and by all accounts he was a dreadful man. Franklin, have you no idea? No, Rachel. I wish from the bottom of my heart that I had. It is so beautiful. I must wear it at dinner time. Oh, yes, yes you yes, must, you must. But yes. I can't. There is no setting for it. Well, I, I dare say I could make something that would do for a temporary setting. A, a bit of silver wire and a pin so that you could fix mm, it to your dress, yes. if that's what you want. Oh, Franklin, could you? Of course. Such ingenuity, Franklin. We shall all be in your debt. At the end of half an hour, I presented myself in my lady's room. What passed between us was a repetition of what had passed between Mr. Franklin and me at the Shivering Sand, with this difference, that I kept my own counsel about the Indians. When I left, I could see that Lady Verinda took the blackest possible view of Colonel Herncastle's motives, and that she was bent on getting the moonstone out of Rachel's possession at the first opportunity. The time came for me to spartan myself up for receiving the company, and just as I had got my white waistcoat on, Penelope knocked at my door on pretense of improving the tie of my cravat. News for you, Father. Miss Rachel has refused him. Oh, and who's him? The ladies' committee man, Mr Godfrey. Oh, how I hate him for trying to stand in the way of Mr Franklin. Nay, uh, nay, oh, nay, Penelope, not so tight. Sorry, uh, Father, but uh, I know you agree with me. Well, that's as may be. And how do you know Miss Rachel has refused him? I saw him take her away alone into the rose garden, and I followed them. Penelope, that was most improper of you. Now, don't interrupt, Father. And where's your hairbrush? Oh. They'd gone out, arm in arm, both laughing. I waited behind the holly bush to see what happened. Well, girl, get on with it. They came back, walking separate, as grave as could be, and looking straight away from each other. I was never more delighted in my life. Here, ma'am, what are you doing with that brush? Just the other side of the holly, Mr Godfrey came to a standstill. Then you prefer that I should remain here as if nothing had happened? You have accepted my mother's invitation and you are here to meet her guests. Unless you wish to make a scandal, of course you will remain. I am sorry if what I have said has caused you any pain or distress. Let us forget what has passed. Let us remain just cousins. Now, please excuse me. I must go in and change for dinner. Now, that's awkward. Very deuced awkward indeed. And you never saw a man look more put out in all your life, Father. He ground quite a hole in the gravel with his heel. Not so hard, Penelope. My head's as red as a lobster. And you should not have eavesdropped like that. There's one woman in the world who can resist Mr Godfrey Abelwhite at any rate. And if I was a lady, I should be another. It was a noble sight to see when all the company were settled in their places and the rector of Frising Hall, with beautiful elocution, rose and said grace. But as the dinner got on, I became aware that this festival was not prospering as others had before it. There were gaps of silence in the talk, and when they did use their tongues, it was usually in the most unfortunate manner. Uh, Mr Franklin, I regret to say, was no exception. 
Yes, it is true, Mr. Candy, that latterly I have not slept very well at night. Your nerves are all out of order, young man. You ought to go through a course of medicine immediately. In my estimation, Mr. Candy, a course of medicine and a course of groping in the dark mean one and the same thing. But you yourself, constitutionally speaking, are groping in the dark after sleep, oh. and nothing but medicine will help you find it. Why, Mr. Candy, I have often heard of the blind leading the blind, and now, for the first time, I find out what it means. You go too far, young man, you go too far. You think medicine of no account and doctors a bunch of fools. Do you? Well, a fool I may be, but I can still make you eat your words tomorrow morning. A fool you certainly are, Mr. Candy, if you think I shall eat any words I've addressed to you tonight. Oh, Franklin, <laughs> Mr. Candy, really, this is too disagreeable. I forbid you to discuss the subject any further. Of course, Lady Verinder. For my part, secure in my scientific knowledge, I shall gladly bow to your wish. Shall we withdraw, ladies? <laughs> yes, indeed. It seems as though the devil possessed that dinner party and worse was to come. The ladies had just risen to leave the gentlemen over their wine when there was a sound from the terrace which startled me out of my company manners on the instant. Georgina, oh. hark, the Indians! Oh, the Indians from Rising Hall! Oh, show us their juggling! Oh, exciting! Oh, what a sweet little boy! Oh, what a little darling! Oh, I must kiss him! And I! <laughs> <laughs> As I live by bread, here were the Indians returning to us with the return of the Moonstone to the house. Mr. Franklin got on one side of Miss Rachel, and I put myself behind her. There she stood, innocent of all knowledge of the truth, showing the Indians the Moonstone in the bosom of her dress. The next thing I clearly remember was one of the company, Mr. Murthwaite, the famous Indian traveller, coming up quietly behind the jugglers and addressing them in their own language. The next moment their faces turned grey. The chief Indian, the one who spoke English, turned to my lady and informed her that the entertainment was over. The Miss Ablewhites were loud in their disappointment. The little boy went round with the hat and the juggling was over as soon as almost it had begun. The ladies withdrew to the drawing room. The gentlemen returned to their wine. And I and Samuel the footman saw the Indians safe off the premises. Going back by way of the shrubbery, I found Mr. Franklin and Mr. Murthwaite walking slowly up and down among the trees. Mr. Franklin beckoned me to join them. Mr. Betteridge, I have spent many years in India, and I can assure you that those three Indians are no more jugglers than you or I. Really, Mr. Murthwaite? Then what are they? Unless I'm mistaken, they are high-caste Brahmins. I know what Indian juggling really is. What you saw tonight is a very bad and clumsy imitation. When I spoke to them in Hindu, I accused them of being impostors, and you saw yourself how it told on them. But I thought Brahmins would never, under any circumstances, sacrifice their caste. Quite right. And these have doubly sacrificed it, first in crossing the sea, secondly in disguising themselves as jugglers. There must be something very serious at the bottom of it to plead for them when they return to their own country. I suppose you have no idea what it might be, Mr. Blake? Yes, I have. The diamond Miss Verinder is wearing in her dress this evening was left to her by her uncle, Colonel Herncastle, who obtained it in India some 50 years ago. I brought it here from London, acting as executor. And I suspect that while taking it from the bank, I was followed by a dark-skinned man. If the diamond was of some sacred significance to the Hindus, then that would certainly explain the presence here of the three Indians. All we know, sir, is that the colonel got it in some mysterious way in his travels. We don't know that it has to do with their religion. Ah, yes, we do, Betteridge. Now, I had a letter from Mr. Bruff this morning. I wrote to tell him that it looked as though the Indians really were after the Moonstone, and he sent me a document he'd been holding back. It was written by a cousin of John Herncastle and describes how he got the diamond at the taking of Seringapatam. The writer says he thinks that Herncastle had killed three Indians, not in the fighting, but during the looting which followed, and had obtained the moonstone at that terrible cost. That was why his reputation was in shreds when he returned to this country, and why none of his family would have anything to do with him. And was this diamond set in the handle of a dagger? Yes. It had belonged to a sultan, Tipu, sultan of Seringapatam. Well... So I have looked upon the moonstone. Mr. Blake, the jewel that your cousin so carelessly wears in her bosom is the most sacred known to the Hindu people. If she were to set foot in certain parts of India dressed as she is tonight, her life would not be worth five minutes' purchase. Murthwaite, you can't mean it. I'm afraid I do. Listen. I know the history of the moonstone. It is centuries old. 
and tradition says that it was originally set in the forehead of the Indian god who typifies the moon. Hundreds of years ago, when the Mohammedans sacked the holy city of Somnath and stripped the temple of its treasures, only the moon god escaped. Three Brahmins, at great risk, took it to Benares, and there it was set up and worshipped again. There's a legend that Vishnu appeared in a dream to the Brahmins and commanded that the moonstone should be watched from that time forth by three priests in turn, night and day, to the end of the generations of men. The next turn in the story took place in the reign of Aurangzeb, the Mughal emperor. At his command, there were more attacks upon the temples of Brahma, and the moonstone was seized by an officer in his army. It passed from one lawless hand to another, until it fell into the possession of Tipu, who placed it as an ornament in the handle of a dagger. Now suppose those three men whom Herncastle is reported to have killed were the three Brahmin priests who were then the Moonstone's guardians, disguised and outwardly conforming to the Muslim faith. Do you not begin to see who our three incompetent jugglers might be? Lord bless us. The three Brahmin priests who have succeeded to the guardianship of the Moonstone. And dedicated, you may be sure, to securing its return at whatever cost. Y you mean they would kill to gain their object? My dear fellow, the sacrifice of caste may be a serious thing in India. The sacrifice of life is nothing. What a set of murdered in thieves. Ah, but a wonderful people, Mr. Betteridge. <laughs> yes, it sounds like it. They have seen the moonstone on Rachel's dress. There's no help for it. I must speak to my aunt tomorrow. What about tonight, sir? Supposing the Indians come back? The Indians won't risk coming back tonight. The direct way is hardly ever the way they take to anything, let alone something as important as this. But suppose the rogues are bolder than you think, sir? In that case, let the dogs loose. Very good, sir. Ah, it's been building up to this all day. The Indians will want their umbrellas tonight, Mr. Betteridge. Come, let us rejoin the ladies. I own that after that I went back to my little room in a perspiration. I was far into my second pipe when Penelope came in with her report from the drawing room where she'd been handing round tea. The Miss Ablewhite sang a duet very loudly. I saw Mr Franklin positively flinch. And Miss Rachel has been stealing looks at him. And I know very well what sort of looks. And Mr. Franklin has been going on at Mr. Godfrey about ladies' charities. And Mr. Godfrey has been hitting back rather smartly. Mm. And Mr. Murthwaite has been asleep. Oh, have you seen anything of Mr. Candy during the evening? Why, no, should I have? Well, he vanished most mysteriously for a time. And when he came back, he was wearing a very smug look. I wonder what he's been up to. The arrival of the carriages was the signal for the arrival of the rain. Most of the company went home under cover. The exception was Mr Candy, who had only a gig, but he still seemed very pleased with himself. It looks as though it means to rain all night. What a downpour. I'm afraid you'll get wet through, Mr Candy. Mr Betteridge, I wonder you have arrived at your time of life without knowing that a doctor's skin is waterproof. Good night to you. When the last of the guests had driven away, I went back to the drawing room. Mr Godfrey had some brandy and soda water. Mr Franklin took nothing. He looked dead tired. I suppose the events of the day had been too much for him. And truth to tell, they'd been rather too much for me. My lady was looking hard at the wicked Colonel's legacy shining in her daughter's dress. Rachel, where are you going to put your diamond tonight? Oh, I don't know. Anywhere. Why, on my dressing table, of course, with my other things. Who oh, no. It might take to shining in the dark. I'm sure I'd be quite terrified if I woke up and saw its awful moony light shining out of the gloom. I know. The Indian cabinet in my sitting room. Now that is just the place, Mama. What could be more appropriate than the Indian diamond going into the Indian cabinet? Why, they could admire each other. Uh, my dear, your Indian cabinet has no lock on it. Good heavens, is this an hotel? Are there thieves in the house? Why not let me keep the diamond for you tonight? Oh, Mama, no. How could you suggest such a thing? Very well, my dear, as you wish. But I'd like you to come to my room first thing tomorrow morning. I shall have something to say to you. Not something unpleasant, I hope. Well, I really can't discuss it with you in your present mood. Uh, good night, gentlemen. Good night, Andrew. Good night, Peter. Good night, my lady.
And so the day ended. Already, it seemed to me, the moonstone had begun to cast its shadow over our lives. When the gentleman retired for the night, Mr. Godfrey was very solicitous for Mr. Franklin's rest and pressed him to take a brandy and soda to his room. It would help him sleep, he said. That night I shut up everything myself and left nothing to Samuel. All was safe and fast when I went to bed between midnight and one in the morning. The day had been a little too much for me, I suppose, for I had a touch of Mr. Franklin's malady, and it was sunrise before I fell asleep. All the time I lay awake there was not a sound but the splash of the rain and the sighing of the wind among the trees. About half past seven I woke and opened my window on a day of fine sunshine. The clock had struck eight and I was just going out to chain up the dogs again when I heard a sudden whisking of petticoats on the stairs above me. Father, Father, come quick! Penelope, you'll wake the house, whatever's the matter. Oh, Father, don't stand there, for God's sake. Come upstairs, the moonstone has gone. Gone? But how could it have gone? Oh, how should I know, but gone it most certainly is. And Miss Rachel's half out of her mind. Oh, Father, come up and see. That was part one of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Brian Gear. The cast, Gabriel Betteridge, John Sharp, Franklin Blake, John Telfer, Rachel Verinder, Sally Baxter, Godfrey Abelwhite, Geoffrey Beavers, Lady Verinder, Petra Davis, Rosanna Spearman, Tammy Ustinoff, Penelope Betteridge, Josie Kidd, Mr Berthwaite, Gordon DeLew, Mr Candy, Danny Schiller, the Indian, Geoffrey Searle, The Boy, Crispian Barmer, Felicity Abelwhite, Lisa Penny, and Georgina Abelwhite, Deborah Jane Sharp. The music was composed and conducted by Sidney Sager, and the programme, which came from Bristol, was directed by Brian Miller. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio in six parts by Brian Gear, with music composed by Sidney Sager. The Moonstone, part two. Gabriel Betteridge is my name, and I am my Lady Verinder Steward at the family seat in Yorkshire. Perhaps you will remember that Mr. Franklin Blake wanted me to begin the story of the Moonstone, telling you just as much as I knew at the time, and no more. Let me go back a bit. The Moonstone was a large diamond left by Colonel Herncastle to his niece, Miss Rachel Verinder, on her 18th birthday. But the Colonel was a secretive man, and some trouble seems to accompany the Moonstone wherever it goes. When Miss Rachel's cousin, Mr Franklin, brought it to her in Yorkshire, he was followed by three Indians. According to Mr Murthwaite, the explorer, who lives in our locality, they're Brahmin priests, dedicated to getting the diamond back by any means whatever. The morning after Miss Rachel's birthday, I was just opening the front door when my daughter, Penelope, called out that the moonstone had vanished from Miss Rachel's sitting room where it was left overnight. Now, Father, come and see for yourself. I saw Miss Rachel put the diamond into the Indian cabinet last night. When I came in with our cup of tea at eight this morning, I found the drawer open and empty. Is this true, Miss Rachel? Yes, Betridge, it's true. The diamond is gone. I'm going into my bedroom and I don't want to be disturbed. Betteridge, what is the matter? What is all this noise? The diamond, my lady. It's gone. And where is Rachel? In her room, my lady. And she has locked the door. Rachel, it is I. I do not wish to see anyone, Mama. Rachel, open this door instantly. Now, Rachel, what is all this about the diamond? 
poor Miss Rachel. I've never seen her so upset. Miss Betteridge, Miss Rachel's diamond gone? Yes, sir. I'm afraid it's true. Oh, awful. How very shocking. Are you quite sure? Quite, Mr. Godfrey. Oh, dear me. How very unfortunate. Oh, Franklin, have you heard the news? Rachel's diamond is missing. What's that you say, Godfrey? The diamond, the moonstone. It's vanished. What? The moonstone has gone from where it was put in the Indian cabinet. Gone? Gone, you say? Are you quite well, Mr. Franklin? You don't seem quite yourself, sir, if I may say so. Well, the fact is, Betteridge, last night I had the best night's sleep I've had for ages. I haven't quite woken up. However, let's think what to do. Now, where was the diamond put? In the Indian cabinet, Mr. Franklin. I saw Miss Rachel put it there. Oh, well, now, perhaps it's fallen down behind the drawer. Have you looked, Penelope? Why, no, I haven't. I was so upset, and so was Miss Rachel. Well, because... then, look now, girl, look now. Yes, Father. I'll look on the floor in case it fell down and rolled away somewhere. Would you like some black coffee, Mr. Franklin? Oh, no, thank you, Betteridge. I'm beginning to wake up now. The diamond is definitely not in the cabinet. Well, I can't see it on the floor. Oh, Penelope, knock and see if Rachel can tell us anything. Well, I'll try, sir, but really she seems so upset. I... Huh. Oh, good morning, Franklin. Godfrey. Good morning, Aunt Julia. Good morning, Aunt Julia. I excuse me, my lady, but Mr. Franklin wishes to speak to Miss Rachel. Oh, we thought Rachel might be able to tell us something. Impossible. She seems quite overwhelmed. But did she say anything to you which might throw any light on the matter? Nothing, not a word. She seems positively to shrink from speaking of it, even to me. I suppose I have no alternative but to send for the police. And the first thing for the police to do is lay hands on the Indians who were here last night. The jugglers? Whatever for, frankly. Because they stole the moonstone. Aunt Julia, we mustn't lose a moment. Give me a letter of introduction to a magistrate and I'll ride straight over to Frising Hall with it. And we may stop them before they've got away too far. Now then, Betteridge, while I'm away, make sure the servants leave the doors and windows exactly as they were last night. Of course, Mr. Franklin. But I don't see how the Indians could have got into the house. I was awake till quite late and I heard nothing, no dogs barking. One of them might have slipped into the hall while the dinner company were going away. He could have stayed hidden under a sofa until the house was quiet and then the moonstone would have been his for the taking. But how would he have known where to look for it? Eve's dropped at the drawing room door. Rachel talked about where she might keep it last night. But I can't waste time in speculation, Betteridge. I must be off to Frising Hall. Yep. It all seemed rather flat after Mr. Franklin had ridden off. My lady sent for me, and I had to tell her everything that I had kept from her so far about the Indians and Mr. Franklin's suspicions. She was a woman of high courage, and agreed we had been right to say nothing until now. Miss Rachel stayed locked in her room. The women servants took to whispering in corners, except Rosanna Spearman, who kept by herself. At eleven o'clock, Mr. Franklin came back from Frising Hall. Well, Franklin, are the police coming? Yes, Superintendent Seagrave and two men are following, but it's a mere matter of form. The case is hopeless. Do you mean the Indians have escaped? The poor Indians have been most unjustly put in prison. But what about one of them being hidden in the house? That has proved to be quite impossible. Oh, would you explain yourself, Franklin, instead of adding to the mystery? Perfectly simple, Aunt Julia. I took your letter to the magistrate, and the magistrate sent for the police. Well, so far, so good. But when the police made inquiries, they discovered that the Indians were still in the town. Hardly the act of guilty men. And more than that, they'd all been seen returning with their little boy between the hours of ten and eleven, which proves they'd walked straight back from here. But might they not have returned later in the night? No, the police had some reason to make inquiries at the lodging house where the Indians are staying, and they saw them all there at midnight. And soon after midnight, I went round and shut up the house. So... That disposes of any idea of their returning and breaking in. Then why are the Indians still in prison, Franklin? Because the magistrate thought something might be turned up against them. So he committed them for a week as rogues and vagabonds to keep them at our disposal, as it were. But in truth, there isn't even a case of suspicion against them. This gets worse. If the Indians did not take the diamond, then who did? Ten minutes later, Superintendent Seagrave arrived. He was the most comforting officer you could wish to see. Tall and portly, and he ordered his two inferior officers about with great severity. He asked me to wait upon him in Miss Rachel's sitting room. I've gone round the premises, both outside and in, Mr. Betteridge, and the result of that investigation proving to me that no one has broken in, and I deduce that the robbery must therefore have been committed by someone in the house. I sincerely hope you are wrong, Mr. Seagrave. Oh, depend upon it, I'm right. So I've posted uh, one of my men on the staircase leading to the servants' bedrooms, 
with the strict instructions to let nobody past him until further orders. Now then, I shall now examine this sitting room. Now, what all this, Mr. Superintendent, about none of us been allowed to go to our room? Who is this person, Mr. Betteridge? Nancy Swales, our kitchen maid. Well, then, Nancy Swales, it's true that until further inquiries have been completed, I... Well, I have barred all the servants from going to their rooms. Have you indeed? Then which of us do you think it was that did it? Can you tell me that? Aye, that's right. Oh, right. You just oh, it. Oh, silence, silence. I will not, I will not have you women barging in here when I'm conducting an investigation. Well, I don't know. You. Ah, you. Me, sir. Ah, who are you? Rosanna Spearman, sir. Well, Rosanna Spearman... You just look at the mischief someone's petticoats have done already. What mischief, sir? Well, that smear of paint on the door just under the lock. I was just trying to say that. Out. Clear out, all of you, will you now, please? Clear out. <laughs> now then, Mr. Betridge, I should like to speak to Miss Rachel Verinder. Would you be so kind as to summon her for me? She's in there, Mr. Seagrave, in her bedroom. Oh, indeed, well then. Pray ask her if she would kindly favour me with a word. Miss Rachel? What is it, Bedridge? Superintendent Seagrave is here, Miss Rachel, and would like to speak with you. I have nothing to tell him, and I can't see anybody. Very good, Miss Rachel. Did you hear that, Mr Seagrave? Miss Rachel regrets that I she's... heard, thank you, Mr Betteridge. And, and I must say I find the young lady's attitude, quite frankly, to be obstructive. Highly obstructive. Miss Rachel is very upset by the loss of her jewel. I beg you to wait a little and see her later. Very well, Mr. Betteridge. Well, as I cannot speak to the young lady, I should like to question her maid. Yes. That is my daughter, Penelope. I'll send for her. Penelope told Mr. Seagrave all she could, which was little enough. Questioning Mr. Franklin, Mr. Godfrey and myself produced still less. Mr. Seagrave next tried to discover whether any of the furniture had been moved out of its usual place during the night. While we were poking about among the chairs and tables, Miss Rachel herself suddenly appeared out of her bedroom. Penelope? Yes, miss? Mr Franklin Blake sent you with a message to me this morning, saying he wished to speak to me. Yes, miss. Where is he now? He's on the terrace with Mr Godfrey. Then I shall go down and see him. If you please, Miss Verinder, I would rather you favoured me with your conversation. My business is with Mr Blake, not with a superintendent of police. Oh, dear. <sighs> It showed a want of due respect, but I couldn't help looking out of the window. Miss Rachel went up to Mr. Franklin without appearing to notice Mr. Godfrey, who drew back and left them alone. She spoke a few words to Mr. Franklin, who seemed to be utterly astonished by what she said. While they were still together, Lady Verinder came onto the terrace. Miss Rachel saw her, said a few more words to Mr. Franklin, and went back into the house. Then Mr. Franklin seemed to tell Mr. Godfrey and my lady what Miss Rachel had said to him, for they too stopped short in amazement. I had just seen as much as this when the door of the sitting room opened violently and Miss Rachel walked swiftly through to her bedroom. Miss Verinder, I must insist, if I am to recover your jewel, then... I have not sent for you. I don't want you. My diamond is lost and neither you nor anybody else will ever find it. And precisely what am I supposed to make of that, Mr. Betteridge? I can only assume, Mr. Seagrave, that Miss Rachel's temper is still upset by the loss of the diamond. Ah, but I'm here to help find it. That appears to be the very thing she objects to. I imagine that's what she was telling Mr. Franklin just now on the terrace. It was his idea to fetch you, and she was certainly saying something very serious to him. And how, may I ask, does Miss Verinder know the diamond will never be found again? No, Mr. Betridge, no. Uh, there's nothing else for it. I shall have to search the servants' quarters. The result, of course, was that the Moonstone remained as lost as ever, and Mr. Seagrave was fast approaching his wit's end. At this point, Mr. Franklin sent for me in the library. To my astonishment, just as my hand was on the door, it was suddenly opened from the inside and out walked Rosanna Spearman. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Betridge. Rosanna. What are you doing in the library at this time of day? Mr Franklin dropped one of his rings upstairs and I have just been to give it to him. You should have handed it to me. 
Just because the police have turned the house upside down, there's no need for you to forget your manners, my girl. Now, don't let me have to speak to you again. I'm sure Mr Franklin was obliged to me. Come in, Betridge. I want to convince to the station. Yes, Mr Franklin. Going to London? No. I've convinced my aunt that we need a better man than Seagrave. Now, my father knows the Chief Commissioner of Police, and if anyone can lay his hands on the right man for this job, he can. So, I'm going to telegraph him straight away. Very good, Mr Franklin. I'll have the pony chaise got ready. Right. Oh, by the way, that girl who was in here just now, is she altogether right in the head, Betteridge? She behaved very oddly. Oh? In what way, sir? She came to give me a ring I'd dropped, and instead of going away again, she said, they'll never find the diamond, will they? Nor the person who took it. I'll answer for that. <laughs> and she heard your step outside and she left. I'm sorry that she's troubled you, Mr Franklin, but uh, I don't think there's any harm in the girl. I'll see that she doesn't bother you again. Well, keep a careful eye on her, will you? This is a more important matter than you may think. It's a matter of £20,000, sir. It's a matter of quieting Rachel's mind. I'm very uneasy about her. And so am I, Mr Franklin. Oh, by the way, Mr Seagrave says he wants to question the Indians at Frising Hall. He says he thinks someone in the house stole the diamond in collusion with them. The man's a fool. Well, I suppose I'd better wait and see what the result is before I send my wire. But if you ask me, he's just trying to gain time. Yes, sir. Uh, perhaps you would be good enough to take him into Frising Hall with you. Oh, and Mr Godfrey, he's interested in the interview with the Indians, too. On my way to the stables to order the chaise, I looked in at the servants' hall. They told me that Rosanna Spearman had been suddenly taken ill and was lying down in her room. Curious, I thought. She'd looked well enough just a few minutes before. She came downstairs again at tea time, had an hysterical attack and was sent back to bed. I was forced to accept what Penelope had told me, that the girl was in love with Mr Franklin. And so that miserable day came to an end, with Miss Rachel keeping to her room and refusing to come down to dinner. The next morning, I met Mr. Franklin and Mr. Godfrey in the hall. I knew it'd be a waste of time questioning the Indians again, suspecting someone in the house indeed. I'm sure Superintendent Seagrave's experience in these matters is more to be relied on than ours, Franklin. Mr. Franklin, sir. Mr. Franklin, a telegram for you. It arrived only a minute ago. Good man, let me see. Oh, excellent! Couldn't be better. What is it, Franklin? Has the Commissioner found someone who can help you? I'll say he has. Sergeant Cuff, no less. Sergeant Cuff? Where have I heard that name? The newspapers, perhaps? There isn't his equal in England when it comes to unravelling a mystery. We're to expect him by this morning's train. I shall be most interested to hear his opinion of the case. I'm afraid I must be in town on Friday. I have a ladies' committee on Saturday morning. But I'll gladly stay until the last train today. I wonder what Seagrave will find to say for himself. He's coming back to us this morning. I'm sure that Mr Seagrave has done all that any competent officer can be expected to do. Now, if you'll excuse me, there are some notes I want to look over before Saturday. Certainly. By the way, Mr Franklin, hmm? you remember Mr Candy, with whom you had that um, discussion at Miss Rachel's birthday dinner? Discussion? What discussion? About your sleepless nights. Oh, yes. And I was proved right. I had the best night's sleep for ages, and no medicine passed my lips. So much for Mr Candy and his ideas. Indeed, sir. But the postman tells me the poor man is in a fever. Quite delirious, he says. Delirious? What's the matter with him? Pneumonia, I shouldn't wonder. Don't you remember how it came on to rain very heavily and he only had his gig to drive home? <laughs> oh, yes. Well, there's rough justice for you. Is anybody looking after him? He has an assistant, a Mr Jennings. Strange man, but competent, I suppose. Sergeant Cuff drove up in a fly from the station. A lean, elderly man dressed in decent black, with a hatchet face. He asked to see Miss Rachel's sitting room, and I took him there with Mr Franklin hovering in the background. Eventually he came face to face with the door covered with the decorative painting. Immediately he laid his finger on the little smear. That's a pity. How did that happen, Mr Superintendent? Well, the women's petticoats did it. I was questioning the female servants in here yesterday morning and, well, their petticoats did it, Sergeant. Mr. Betteridge was here, he'll tell you that. Did you see which petticoat did it, Mr. Betteridge? No, sir, I'm afraid I did not. 
You noticed, of course, Mr Superintendent. Oh, and I can't charge a memory sergeant on that point, but it's a mere trifle, after all. I made a private inquiry last week, Mr Superintendent. At one end of the inquiry was a murder, and at the other end was a spot of ink on a tablecloth that nobody could account for. In all my experience, I have never met with such a thing as a trifle, Mr Superintendent. <coughs> Before we go a step further, we must see the petticoat that made that smear. And we must know for certain when the paint was wet. I can tell you that, Sergeant. Pray do, Mr Blake. Oh, Miss Verinder and I painted the door. We used a vehicle that I myself devised. It dries in 12 hours. And what time were the servants in this room yesterday morning? Well, let me see. Um, oh, yes, the, the women were in here at 11 o'clock precisely. Thank you, Mr Superintendent. Now, Mr Blake, mm -hmm. do you remember when the smeared bit was done. Perfectly. It was the last part of the door to be painted, and I finished it myself by three on Wednesday afternoon. Ah. Today is Friday, Mr Superintendent. Let us reckon back. At three on the Wednesday afternoon, that bit of the painting was completed. The vehicle dried in 12 hours. That is to say, it was dry by three o'clock on Thursday morning. At 11 on Thursday morning, you held your inquiry here. Take three from 11... And eight remains. That paint had been eight hours dry, Mr Superintendent, when you supposed the servants' petticoats smeared it. Uh, uh, yes, Sergeant, yes, indeed it had. It is quite on the cards, Mr Blake, that you have put the clue into our hands. Now then, it is clear from my examination of the smear that it was not done by a hard object <coughs> and Why? no... Miss Rachel, Sergeant Cuff, this is Miss Rachel. Did you say that Mr Franklin Blake had put the clue into your hands? That gentleman, Miss, has possibly put the clue into our hands. Now may I ask you a question? Do you happen to know who smeared the paint on your door? Are you another police officer? I am Sergeant Cuff of the Detective Police. Do your duty by yourself, Sergeant Cuff, and don't allow Mr Franklin Blake to help you. Thank you, Miss. Now, do you happen to know anything about the smear of paint? Might you have done it by accident yourself? I know nothing about it! I told you, Betteridge, that I was uneasy about Rachel. Now you see why. I've never known Miss Rachel to behave like this. Oh, now you see the difficulties I've been working under. Miss Verinder appears to be a little out of temper. Naturally enough. Now, I have looked at the smear closely. No skin mark like a human hand has printed off on it. Mr Betteridge, could perhaps some large dog have got in here and done it with a whisk of his tail? Quite impossible. No dogs ever come into this part of the house. Then it must have been done by an article of clothing. The next thing to discover is when the door was last seen without that smear. Mr Blake, <clears throat> did you notice your work here on the Wednesday afternoon after you had done it? I can't say I did. Who was the last person to be in here on Wednesday night? Miss Rachel, I suppose. Oh, oh possibly my daughter. She's Miss Rachel's maid. Would you be so good as to send for her, Miss Petridge? Penelope, Penelope, come along now. I uh, thought you might want a word with her, Sergeant, so I uh, asked her to wait in the corridor in readiness. Yes, Father. Uh, this is Sergeant Cuff from London. He'd like to ask you about Wednesday night, Penelope. Perhaps you'd be so good, Penelope, as to help me a little over that smear of paint on the door. Just under the lock. Why, yes, sir. And at what time on Wednesday did you last see the door? Why, I should think, after I wish Miss Rachel good night, About twelve o'clock. And was it smeared then? No, sir. Could you have smeared it accidentally yourself as you went out? Well, I suppose I could have, sir. But I knew the paint was still wet and took particular pains to hold in my skirts. Do you happen to remember the dress you had on? Why, it was this one. And there's no paint on it that I've noticed. Indeed. You seem to be right, Penelope. Can either of you gentlemen see any paint on that dress, perhaps at the back? No, 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 none at all. Oh, neither can I. Thank you, Mr. Seagrave. Then I think we can safely say that someone must have been in this room and done the damage to the paint between midnight and three o'clock. This trifle of yours, Superintendent Seagrave, has grown a little in importance since you noticed it. We have now to look for an article of dress in this house with a smear of paint on it and to ask the owner of that article how he or she can account for being in Miss Verinder's sitting room in the early hours of Thursday morning. 
If that person can't satisfy us, we haven't far to look for the hand that took the diamond. Ah, not to turn you any longer from your regular business in the town, Mr. Superintendent. Well, I've only one opinion to offer on leaving this case in your hands, Sergeant Cuff. There is such a thing as making a mountain out of a molehill. Good morning. Be so kind as to leave one of your men here in case I should want him, Mr. Seagrave. Very good, Sergeant Cuff. Mr. Betteridge, ask her ladyship if I may have ten minutes' conversation with her, as soon as it may be convenient. Is this absolutely necessary, Sergeant Cuff? Absolutely. The other officer has done a world of harm by letting the servants see that he suspected them. But at the same time, their rooms must be searched again, because the first investigation only looked for the diamond. And now I must look for the article of clothing with the paint on it. And if you find that, I presume it implies you have also found the thief. At present, I don't say the diamond is stolen. I only say it's missing. And finding the dress with the paint on it may lead to its recovery. My servants have been with me for years. I will not allow them to be insulted a second time by having their room searched as though they were common thieves. But suppose, Your Ladyship, that this time everyone in the house consented to be searched. That would impress the servants as fair dealing between them and their betters. And instead of hindering the investigation, they will make it a point of honour to assist it. Oh, what do you say, Betteridge? I agree with the sergeant, my lady. Then you shall speak to the servants with the keys of my wardrobe in your hand, Sergeant Cuff. Thank you, my lady. But hadn't we better make sure that the other ladies and gentlemen will consent? Come in. Excuse me, Aunt Julia, but it's time for me to depart to catch my train, and I've come to take my leave. Franklin here is coming to the station with me. Well, just before you go, Godfrey, Sergeant Cuff wishes to search the servants' rooms again, and he proposes we all consent to be searched. May I have your agreement? Of course. Here's the key to my trunk, Sergeant Cuff. It can follow me to London when you have done with it. Nothing I have is under lock and key. You may search my things with pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Perhaps you'd say my farewell to Rachel, Aunt Julia. When next I see her, I hope I may return to a certain subject which I mentioned to her on her birthday. Come along, Godfrey. We've no time to lose. Oh, yes. Thank you for reminding me, Franklin. Farewell, Aunt Julia. Godfrey. Well, it now remains only to obtain Rachel's consent... I shall go and speak to her at once. There is just one more thing, Your Ladyship. May I see the washing book, if you please? Well, certainly, if it will bring this business to a speedier conclusion. Your Ladyship, I'll have Samuel send someone up with it immediately. Well, while you are waiting for the book, I will go and see my daughter. I hope not to keep you waiting for her answer. Thank you, Your Ladyship. You are being most helpful. You will have the book in a moment, Sergeant Cuff. I see you are admiring the view from her ladyship's windows. I was looking at the rose garden, Mr. Betteridge. Gravel walks between the roses, dear, dear. Tell your gardener grass, not gravel, Mr. Betteridge. You sent for the washing book, Mr. Betteridge. Ah, uh, yes, Rosanna. Thank you. Uh, here you are, Sergeant Cuff. Thank you, Mr. Betteridge. You are looking pale, Rosanna. I'm all right, Mr. Betteridge. Thank you very much. I heard you were not well yesterday. It was nothing, Mr. Betteridge. It's past now. Thank you, Rosanna. Here you are. You may return the book. That will be all, Rosanna. Thank you, Mr. Betteridge. Why did you want the washing book, Sergeant Cuff? Because when Superintendent Seagrave drew the attention of the women servants to the smear of paint, he may have pointed out the necessity of getting rid of an article of clothing presuming it belonged to one of the servants. If it were an article of linen, it might have been sent to the wash or been made away with by its owner. Now, tell me, has that young woman been here as long as the other servants? Rosanna Spearman, why do you ask? Because the last time I saw her, she was in prison for theft. <clears throat> Sergeant Cuff. Rosanna Spearman was once in prison. She was also in a reformatory in London, in which my lady takes a great interest. Rosanna was recommended by the matron as being a totally reformed character, and neither I nor her ladyship has had any serious cause for complaint since she has been in service here. No serious cause, Mr. Betteridge? No cause to doubt her honesty, Sergeant Cuff. It is true she is not like the other servant girls. Uh, <clears throat> she, she has fainting spells, is, is all that I meant. And a deformed shoulder. Sergeant Cuff... 
It pains me beyond expression to tell you this. But my daughter will not allow you to search her room. <sighs> I gave her your reasons, but she was adamant. She will not consent. In that case, Your Ladyship, the idea must be given up. Either all the rooms must be searched or none. Mr. Betteridge, send Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite's portmanteau to London by the next train. Unless there is anything else you wish to ask me, I should like to retire. There is nothing, Your Ladyship, and my thanks for your assistance. Oh. You don't seem to be much disappointed, Sergeant Cuff. No, I am not. Let's go into the garden and look at the roses. It's a pity Miss Verinder won't help me. She makes this investigation more difficult than it might have been. I have decided to see the servants and search their thoughts and actions instead of their rooms. Now, did you notice anything strange in any of them after the diamond was found to be missing? Anyone unexpectedly out of temper or taken ill? Hello? What's the matter? A uh, uh, touch of rheumatics in my back, Mr. Betteridge. We shall have a change in the weather soon. Yes, I've noticed it myself. Let's make our way to the garden. I want to look at your moss roses. I should have known. Shrubberies are as bad as doors for gathering eavesdroppers. Tell me, Mr. Betteridge, does Rosanna Spearman have a sweetheart like the rest of them? Really, Sergeant Cuff, with her appearance, poor thing? I ask for her own sake. You see, I saw her hiding in the shrubbery as we went by. Very well, Sergeant. Uh, yes and no. She has been foolish enough to fall madly in love with Mr Franklin Blake. The shrubbery is his favourite walk. Well, I see nothing foolish in a girl falling in love with Mr Franklin. He scarcely notices her. He'd notice her soon enough if she were pretty. However, I'm glad it's cleared up. Did you notice anything you couldn't account for among the servants when the diamond was found to be missing? Nothing except that we all lost our heads, including myself. <laughs> Would you allow me the use of a room for seeing the servants in? You'd better have my own. Thank you. Send them in in order of rank, just the indoor servants, Mr Betteridge. And so they went in. Cook, Lady Julia's maid, my daughter Penelope, Miss Rachel's maid... Then the first housemaid, and the second housemaid, Rosanna Spearman, then Samuel the footman, and last, Nancy the kitchenmaid. All emerging flushed or pale, tight-lipped or garrulous, according as they had been dealt with. And when it was over, I went in and found Sergeant Cuff standing by the window and whistling the last rose of summer. Any discoveries, Sergeant? If Rosanna Spearman asks to go out, let her go. But let me know first. I hope you don't think she has anything to do with the loss of the diamond. I'd better not tell you what I think. You might lose your head for the second time. Come in. Oh, excuse me, Mr Betteridge, but may I have leave to go out for a bit? My head's that bad again and I'd like some air. Uh, why, yes, Rosanna, of course. Thank you, Mr Betteridge. Oof. Are you blessed with the gift of second sight, Mr Cuff? No, Mr Betteridge. Just uncommon powers of observation and many years of dealing with the sad byways of this little world. Now, which is the servant's way out? I'd like to know where she's going. Ask Samuel, the footman. It's easier to direct you from the ground floor. Just lock the door of your room, would you? If anybody asks for me, say I'm in here, composing my mind. Now, it may have been foolish of me, but I wanted to know what Sergeant Cuff had found out from his questioning. So I dropped in at the servants' hall where the women were taking tea, and there I learnt a lot. Shortly afterwards, I came upon Mr Franklin taking his favourite walk in the shrubbery, having returned from driving Mr Godfrey to the station. I wish to God I'd thrown the moonstone into the quicksand that day I brought it here. Well... And what has the great Sergeant Cuff been doing? He's been questioning the servants. And I've been doing some detecting of my own. 
Now, you've noticed yourself that Rosanna Spearman's been behaving oddly. Well, yesterday afternoon she said she was ill. Mm. But it seems that Lady Julia's maid and Mary the First housemaid didn't believe her. They crept up to her room where she was supposed to be resting and found her door locked and the keyhole blocked up and not a sound from the inside. Well, of course not, if she was supposed to be lying down. Yes, but that's not all. It seems the baker's man thought he saw Rosanna yesterday afternoon walking over the moor to Frisinghall. What? And there's more. Rosanna appeared at tea time, had an attack of the hysterics and was sent back to bed. The same two women kept up their watch. They said there was a light under her door at midnight and they heard a fire crackling in her room at four in the morning. And that's what they told Sergeant Cuff. Well, there's an end of the mystery. It's obvious. The paint-stained dress is Rosanna Spearman's and the fire in her room was an attempt to destroy it. She has stolen the moonstone. I'll go in directly and tell my aunt... Not just yet, sir, if you please. Cuff! And why not just yet? Because if you tell her ladyship, her ladyship will tell Miss Verinder. Am I to understand that you forbid me to tell my aunt what has happened? You are to understand, sir, that if you tell anybody what has happened until I give you leave, then I throw up the case. Oh, very well, if you insist. Good day. Mr. Betteridge... Perhaps you'll be so obliging as to do your detective business along with me in the future. Uh, now, is there any path leading from the house to the beach? Yes, Sergeant, there is. Through the plantation of firs. Be so good as to show it to me. Mr. Betteridge, you refrain from giving me any information which you think may tell against Rosanna Spearman. Sergeant No, Crawford. don't deny it, Mr. Betteridge. Your humanity does you credit. Ah. But you see, it's all a waste of time. Because Rosanna won't get into trouble, not even if I implicate her on the strongest possible evidence. Why not? Has my lady said she won't prosecute? She can't prosecute. Rosanna Spearman is simply an instrument in the hands of someone else. And she will be held harmless for that person's sake. What other person? Do you know who? Don't you, Mr. Betteridge? Uh, no, Sergeant Cuff, I don't. Do you happen to know if Rosanna has had a new outfit of linen lately? Why, yes. As it happens, my lady gave her a new outfit only a fortnight ago. A little reward for her good conduct. And a pity. But for that, we should have found a new nightgown or petticoat among Rosanna's things and nailed her that way. How? What has a new nightgown got to do with it? Listen, listen. At 11 on Thursday morning, Superintendent Seagrave points out to all the women servants that smear of paint on the door. Mm -hmm. Rosanna, who has her reasons for suspecting her own things, takes the first opportunity of getting to her room, finds the paint on her nightgown or whatever, shams ill, and goes to the town to buy the stuff for making a new one. Really? Sergeant, Hear me you... out, Mr. Betteridge. She makes it in her room on Thursday night, lights a fire, not to destroy the old one, there'd be a smell of burning and lots of tinder to get rid of, but to dry and iron the new one. Then what does she do with the one with the paint on it? She simply wears it, Mr. Betteridge. Nightgown or petticoat, it's hidden under her other things. She's occupied in making away with it this very moment at some convenient spot on that lonely beach ahead of us. Incredible. Logical, Mr. Betteridge. It's what you'd do yourself, I venture to suggest, in similar circumstances. Now then, when she asked to go out after I'd questioned her, do you know where she went? No, of, uh, of course not. I followed her to a cottage in the fishing village. She stopped inside for some time. When she came out, she had something hidden under her cloak. Yes. I shall have to find out what it was. Why didn't you arrest the poor girl on suspicion? I didn't want to risk giving the alarm to another person, so I came back to the house to ask you to bring me to the beach by another way. Ah, now look. Huh? These footprints in the sand. Ah. A woman's foot. You see, Mr. Betteridge, ah, some yes. pointing to the village, some from it. Purposely confused, I should say. Now, perhaps you would introduce me at the cottage, Mr. Betteridge. You could speed the flow of information. Was it the one next to the church? It was. Yes. She's friendly with the daughter, a poor, crippled thing they call Limpin Lucy. They're a comfort to each other in their affliction, I suppose. The father's a fisherman. Yolland, his name is. Then let us see what they have to tell us.
So she wrote a letter there to a friend, Mrs. Yolland says. And from Yolland's beach combing, she bought two dog chains and a small tin case. Now, what on earth would she want with those? Oh, I can tell you that easily enough. She's joined the two chains and tied them to the hasp on the case. She's sunk the case in the water and made the loose end of the chain fast to some place under the rocks. She'll leave it there until this business is over, and then she'll come back and haul it up again. The mystery is, what the devil has she hidden in that case? The Moonstone? No, not the Moonstone. The whole experience of my life is at fault if Rosanna Spearman has got the Moonstone. Then the dress with the paint stains on it. If anything is thrown into that quicksand, does it ever come up again? Oh, never. You can depend on that. Does Rosanna know that? Everyone round here knows that. Then if she wants to be rid of the dress, all she has to do is tie up a stone in it and throw it in. She hasn't got rid of it. She's hidden it. Now, why? It's no good. There's nothing else for it. Tomorrow I must go to Frising Hall and discover what she bought there. Mr. Betteridge, I'm degraded in my own estimation. I've let Rosanna Spearman puzzle me. Mr. Betteridge, uh, my lady would like to see you and the sergeant immediately. Very good, Samuel. Just one moment, Mr. Betteridge. Samuel, has Rosanna Spearman returned? Yes, sir, nearly an hour since. And where is she now? Why, at supper, sir, with the rest. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Betteridge, let us see what Lady Verinder wants of us. Sergeant Cuff, is it important to your inquiries to know if anybody is planning to leave the house? Most important, my lady. Then I have to tell you that my daughter proposes going to stay with her aunt, Mrs. Abelwhite of Frisinghall. She has arranged to leave first thing tomorrow morning. May I ask when Miss Verinder made this decision? About an hour ago. My lady, I would be grateful if you could put off Miss Rachel's departure until later in the day. I have to get to Frisinghall myself in the morning, and when I return, I would like to say two words to her, unexpectedly. Betteridge. My lady. Tell the coachman not to send the carriage for Miss Rachel until two o'clock. Tell him those are my orders. Very good. Have you more to say, officer? Only one thing, Your Ladyship. If Miss Verinder is surprised at the change, please not to mention me as the cause. That's a wonderful woman. But for her self-control, the mystery that puzzles you, Mr. Betteridge, would have been at an end tonight. Damn you, Cuff! There's something wrong about Miss Rachel, and you've been hiding it from me all the while I've been leading you on to it. I did say that if I told you what I thought, you might lose your head again. I beg your pardon, Sergeant, but I have served this family for 50 years. Miss Rachel used to climb onto my knee and pull my whiskers. Don't distress yourself, Mr Betteridge. In my line of business, if we were quick at taking offence, we wouldn't be worth salt to our porridge. Well, tell me the truth, Sergeant. What do you suspect? It's no kindness to keep on hiding it from me. I don't suspect. I know. Do you mean to tell me in plain English that Miss Rachel has stolen her own diamond? I do. Miss Verinder has been in possession of the Moonstone from first to last. Oh. And she has taken Rosanna Spearman into her confidence because she calculated I would suspect Rosanna of the theft. It's the whole case in a nutshell. But why? What are your reasons? Not so hasty, Mr Betteridge. If Miss Verinder refuses to put off her visit to her aunt, which you will find she will, then I shall be obliged to lay the whole case before Lady Verinder. So let the matter rest there for tonight. But, Sergeant... No! Cuff, I... Not another word you get out of me tonight. Come in. Uh, excuse me, Mr Betteridge, but uh, my lady sent this message for you. Oh, yes, thank you, Sam. It's for you, Sergeant. My lady says she forgot to mention that the magistrate at Frisinghall reminds her that the Indians must be released early next week. Ah, oh, yes. Let me see. Superintendent Seagrave's report mentioned an Indian traveller who spoke their language. Yes, Mr Murthwaite. Oh, yes, Murthwaite. Be so good as to write down his address for me, Mr Betteridge. I'll look him up when I go to Frisinghall in the morning. The sergeant went to talk roses with the gardener. I lit a pipe. But this was the first trouble for many a year that wasn't to be blown away by a whiff of tobacco. I felt wretchedly old and worn out. Yet with all this, I held firm to my belief in Miss Rachel. I knew her, and Sergeant Cuff didn't. There was a change in the weather coming, and after a bit, I stirred myself to go to the hall and look at the glass. As I came up to the swing door leading from the servants' quarters to the hall... 
It was violently opened from the other side, and Rosanna Spearman ran past me. Rosanna, what's the matter? Are you ill? Speak to me. For God's sake, don't speak to me. Is anything the matter, Mr. Betteridge? No, Sergeant. Nothing. Nancy! Nancy! Yeah, Mr. Betteridge? Go and look after Rosanna Spearman and hurry up, girl. Go on, hurry. Yeah, Mr. Betteridge. Get on my nerves, Sergeant Cuff. You're everywhere. I find it pays to be. That's it! Oh. oh, Mr. Franklin. Excuse me, Sergeant. Betteridge, have you seen anything of Rosanna Spearman? Yes, she's just run into the servants' quarters looking very upset. I'm afraid I'm the one who upset her. You, sir? I can't explain it, but I really do believe she was on the point of confessing something. Something about the Moonstone. Not two minutes since. What's that? Only the swing door, Mr. Franklin. There's a wind getting up. What did Rosanna say to you? I was in the billiard room, just having a knockabout, you know, trying to get this wretched business out of my mind. Then all of a sudden, there's Rosanna Spearman at my side, looking like a ghost. Quite startled me. Do you want to speak to me, I said. Yes, she said, if I dare. Well, what an odd thing to say. I thought she must mean something about the diamond. I don't quite understand you, I said. Is there anything you want me to do? And I just took another shot with the cue, and she said... He plays billiards, anything, rather than look at me. Well, I ask you, Betteridge. And then she dashed out. I didn't mean to upset her. You mustn't worry about it, sir. Rosanna is a strange girl. <sighs> well, to tell you the truth, Betteridge, I almost wish the loss of the Moonstone could be traced to her. If only to... Oh, damnation. I was pretty sure Sergeant Cuff had been listening at the swing door. He knew he could expect no more help from me, so it was just like him to help himself. As I was going the rounds and locking up that night, to my astonishment I found him stretched out on some chairs across the passage leading to Miss Rachel's bedroom, with a red handkerchief tied round his head. Hmm. Good night, Mr. Betteridge. What are you doing here? I want to stop any possibility of communication between Miss Rachel and Rosanna Spearman. Why should there be any? Oh, because there was a coincidence between the time Rosanna came back from the shivering sand and the time Miss Verinder said she wanted to leave this house. It's quite clear to my mind. Uh, but whatever Rosanna was hiding, your young lady couldn't go away until she knew it was hidden. They've already communicated once this evening, in secret. I want to stop them communicating again. But Sergeant Cuff's uncomfortable night was spent in vain. Rosanna didn't try to speak to Miss Rachel. The next morning, before breakfast, I was taking a turn in the grounds. Going towards the shrubbery walk, I found the sergeant talking to Mr Franklin. One of the female servants spoke to you last night. Once more, Sergeant Cuff, I have nothing to say. At this moment... Who should appear at the other end of the walk but Rosanna Spearman, followed by Penelope, who was trying Come to make her go Rosanna. back to the house. Come back to the house with me. Seeing that Mr Franklin was not alone, Rosanna stopped dead. Mr Franklin saw the girls as soon as I did. So did Sergeant Cuff, but he pretended he hadn't. You needn't be afraid of harming the girl, Mr Franklin. On the contrary, it would be in her interest if you told me what passed between you. I take no interest whatever in Rosanna Spearman. The moment she heard that, Rosanna suddenly turned round and let Penelope lead her back to the house. The bell rang for breakfast and Sergeant Cuff went to Frising Hall. As well as we could, we tried to settle down. Mr Franklin went for a long walk after breakfast and I went through the household accounts with my lady. After that... Penelope wanted a word. Mr Franklin hurt Rosanna cruelly by what he said in the shrubbery this morning. He said that to help her. Oh. He could see that Sergeant Cuff was trying to make one or other of them give themselves away. But surely he doesn't think either of them could have anything to do with the diamond? He suspects Rosanna of having something to do with it, oh. or not of taking it, of course, but of being some innocent party to it. And he knew that she'd spoken alone to Mr Franklin last night. Now, you keep that to yourself. Nothing's proved yet. But what was Rosanna doing in the shrubbery walk this morning? Oh, she was bent on speaking to Mr Franklin. You know how she feels about him. Didn't you try to stop her? Of course I did, Father. You saw that. But when she heard him say he took no interest in her, it, it frightened me. She seemed turned to stone. 
Now she's going about her work like someone in a dream. At a quarter to two precisely, Sergeant Cuff returned from Frisinghall. Mark my words, Mr. Betteridge. You haven't seen the last of those Indians. There isn't a shadow of a doubt in my mind or in Mr. Murthwaite's that they came here to steal the Moonstone. And if we don't find it, they will. And have you found out what Rosanna was doing in the town? Yes. She went to a linen draper's and bought a piece of long cloth, enough to make a nightgown. Whose nightgown? Her own, of course. Between 12 and 3 on the Thursday morning, she must have slipped down to Miss Vedender's room to settle the hiding of the Moonstone. Then, as she left, her nightgown must have brushed against the paint, which was still wet at that time. Paint wouldn't wash out, and she couldn't destroy the nightgown until she'd made another one to replace it. But how do you know it was Rosanna's nightgown? By the material she bought. Plain long cloth means a plain servant's nightgown. Ah. If it had been Miss Verinder's, for instance, she'd have had to buy lace and frilling, and she wouldn't have had time to make it in one night. But the question is, why did she hide the other one and not destroy it? I must search the hiding place of the shivering sand. That's where the answer is. But how will you find it? She won't tell you. I should have made some sort of note of how to find it again, and she'll have that note on her or in her room. And while I was in Frising Hall, I took the opportunity of getting a search warrant, should I need it. Well, a close carriage to take Miss Verinder to her aunt, I presume. Yes. May I have a word with your footman on the back? Samuel, uh, Samuel, just come here a moment, please. Sure. Uh, uh, Sergeant Cuff wants to speak to you. Samuel, there is a friend of mine waiting among the trees this side of the lodge gate. As the carriage passes, he'll jump up alongside you. All you have to do is hold your tongue and shut your eyes. Do you understand? Uh, yes, sir. Do you mean to say you're setting a watch on Miss Rachel? No one regrets the necessity more than I do. Goodbye, ah, Penelope. there is Lady Verinder right, come to watch her daughters leaving. Try to forgive me. Goodbye, Penelope. Goodbye, Miss Rachel. Miss Verinder. Yes? I can't presume to stop you visiting your aunt. But if you do, it makes it much harder for me to recover your diamond... Now, do you go or do you stay? Thank you, Sergeant. Drive on, Stockdale. Rachel! Rachel! At least say goodbye. I said drive on. Rachel! Yes, Stockdale, do as Miss Verinder says. Betteridge, for God's sake, get me away to the train as soon as you can. Of course, Mr. Franklin. Thank you for all your kindness, Aunt Julia. Let me go now. If that is what you wish, Franklin. But let me see you before you leave us. Penelope! Have you seen Rosanna lately? Why, yes, Sergeant. About an hour ago, that is. And where was she and what was she doing? Why, she was... Oh, come on, speak out. This is a serious matter we're dealing with, you know. She stopped the butcher's man and gave him a letter to post for her in Frisinghall. I suppose you have no idea to whom the letter was addressed? To Lucy Yolland at Cobb's Hole. Because the man said it was a roundabout way of delivering a letter directed to Cobb's Hole, to post it in Frisinghall. And the only person she knows at Cobb's Hole is Lucy. That's true, Sergeant. But what do you think is in the letter? A note to guide her back to the hiding place when she needs to go there in the future. Penelope, have you seen Rosanna? Since she gave the note to the butcher's man? Why, no, I can't say I have. Then she's either gone to Frising Hall before I can get there or she's gone back to the shivering sand. Please, sir. Oh, uh, and who are you? Name's Duffy, sir. I weed the garden, sir. Are you looking for Rosanna? I am. I saw her not half an hour since in plantation. She was running towards sea. Do you know the coast here about? Born and bred on, sir. Do you want to earn a shilling? Oh, yes, sir. Then take me there. Penelope, get one of Rosanna's boots and follow us. One of her boots, sir? Do as I say and don't waste time. There's a good girl. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. Betteridge? I'm coming too. Then be content to follow. I do believe I can cover the ground faster than you. But first, get the pony chaise ready. I may need it when I get back. Now, come along, Duffy. I so we'd best make haste. We shall get a soaking afore long. Rain, you mean? Aye, you mark my words. Her footprints. The rain hasn't quite blotted them out. Her boot fits them to a hair. Then where is she? There's not a soul to be seen. Well, except that fisherman over there by those boats. Yes, Mr. Yolland. Then run and fetch him, Duffy. Go on. Mr. Yolland, have you seen Rosanna Spearman? All her footprints point to the rocks and the sea, Mr. Betteridge. There are none returning. She's been back to that hiding place and some fatal accident has happened to her. No, Sergeant. No. No accident. We're looking for Rosanna. I've seen out of her today. These are her footprints, Yarland, leading straight out to those rocks, and none coming back. 
Could a boat have taken her off? Well, no boat that ever was built could have got to her through those breakers. She wasn't meeting a boat, and she didn't have an accident. She came here weary of her life, and she came to end it. Mr. Betteridge, are you saying she deliberately killed herself? I know she did, and I know why. Oh, Father, I've completely forgotten. She left a note for you here. Give it to me, girl, give it to me. I found it in her room when I went to fetch her boot. Well, what does it say? You have often forgiven me in past times. When next you see the shivering sand, try and forgive me again. Well, there you are. Was that if he's not proof she'd come here to destroy us in both things? Mr. Yolland, is there any chance of recovering her body when the tide ebbs? No, sir. But the sand takes, the sand keeps forever. That was part two of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Brian Gear. The cast, Sergeant Cuff, John Franklin Robbins, Gabriel Betteridge, John Sharp, Franklin Blake, John Telfer, Rachel Verinder, Sally Baxter, Godfrey Abelwhite, Geoffrey Beavers, Lady Verinder, Petra Davis, Rosanna Spearman, Tammy Eustonoff, Penelope Betteridge, Josie Kidd, Superintendent Seagrave, Rex Holdsworth, Samuel, Matthew Adams, Duffy, Debbie Cumming, Nancy, Joe Scott Matthews, and Yolland, Tom Eastwood. The music was composed and conducted by Sidney Sager, and the programme, which came from Bristol, was directed by Brian Miller. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio in six parts by Brian Gear, with music composed by Sidney Sager. The Moonstone, part three. Once again, I, Gabriel Betteridge, take up my pen and resume the tale of the Moonstone as requested by Mr. Franklin Blake. After the terrible event at the Shivering Sand, the death by her own hand of Rosanna Spearman, Sergeant Cuff, Penelope and I returned to the house and changed our soaking clothes. It was now time for Sergeant Cuff to make his report to my lady. Mr. Franklin said he couldn't stand by and hear this man make out his case against Miss Rachel, and I understood his feeling but my lady asked me to be present. Sergeant Cuff, you are responsible for this appalling tragedy. I beg your ladyship's pardon, but it was in my interest to keep the poor girl alive. It was your merciless probing and prying that drove her to her death. What drove Rosanna Spearman to her death was some unbearable anxiety about the Moonstone. And I think I can lay my hand on someone who can tell me whether I am right or wrong. You mean my daughter? And you suspect her of taking her own diamond, of hiding it away from us and pretending it is stolen. My lady, for the last 20 years, I have been largely employed in cases of family scandal. It is well within my experience that young ladies occasionally have private debts, debts which they dare not tell anyone about, not even their closest friends or relatives. Debts? Uh, To whom? Sometimes the milliner or the jeweller. Oh. Sometimes the money is wanted for purposes which I don't suspect in this case and which I won't shock you by mentioning. <sighs> Quite impossible. I am Miss Verinder's mother, and I can tell you that the sort of action you are suggesting is quite at odds with her character. She is absolutely incapable of such deception. My lady is quite right, Sergeant. Miss Rachel may be sometimes a thought too forthright, but she's as open and honest as the day is long. Right or wrong, my lady, I had drawn my conclusion. And the next thing was to put it to the test. 
I suggested examining all the wardrobes in the house. What happened? Everyone agreed to it, except Miss Verinder. That satisfied me that I was right. Now, if you still don't agree with me, you must be blind to what happened here today. In your hearing, my lady, as Miss Verinder was about to leave for her aunts, I told her that her going would make it more difficult for me to recover her diamond. You saw yourselves, both of you, that in the face of that statement, she drove off. It all points to one thing and to one thing only, that Miss Verinder had the diamond in her possession and was trying to leave the house before I found it. You make a strong case, Sergeant. What I have to say next relates to Rosanna Spearman. My first thought was that Miss Verinder would take advantage of Rosanna's previous record and try to make me believe that she had stolen the diamond. But it was deeper than that. You see, Rosanna Spearman, before she appeared to have reformed, was no common thief. She was at the top of the profession. She had connections with one of the few men in London who would advance a large sum of money on such a jewel as the Moonstone without asking awkward questions. Now, that is something Miss Verinder would not have been able to do herself, to raise money on the diamond, I mean. So, Rosanna was the very person to help her out of this difficulty. As you know, the paint on Miss Verinder's door was smeared by a dress of some kind. The smear must have been done between midnight and three on Thursday morning. On Thursday afternoon, Rosanna Spearman shams ill and pretends to take to her room. But a tradesman reports that he saw her walking over to Frising Hall in the afternoon. She reappears at tea time, shams ill again, and returns to her room. Her door is locked, the keyhole is blocked up, and she lights a fire. The explanation is this. I went to Frising Hall and found that Rosanna was there on Thursday afternoon and she bought the material to make a servant's nightgown. And on Thursday evening in her room, she made it, washed it, dried it and ironed it because it was her nightgown that made the smear. How do you know? Well, it is something I have not yet proved. But remembering what I've already told you, doesn't it seem probable that she visited Miss Verinder between midnight and three on Thursday morning and smeared the paint as she was leaving? And what was she doing at the sand in the afternoon? It's my belief... She was trying to visit the hiding place. She could have got rid of the old nightgown by wrapping a stone in it and throwing it into the quicksand. Why she should have hidden it, indeed if she has hidden it, baffles me at present. Now, there are two courses of action open to me, my lady. One is to put a watch on Miss Verinda, on the people she sees, the rides and walks she takes, the letters she writes and receives. And how would you do that? With your permission, I could introduce a woman of great experience into your house as a servant, or <laughs> Mrs. Abelwhite's house, if Miss Verinda remains there. The other thing would be for an officer in London to make an arrangement with that moneylender. You may depend upon it. Rosanna would have told Miss Verinda his name. And how does all this spying and prying help us? It means we draw a line round the moonstone. And we draw it closer and closer until we find it in Miss Verinder's possession. Supposing she now decides to keep it. And if her debts press and she decides to sell it herself without Rosanna's help, then we have our man ready and we meet it in London. No. Absolutely no. I will not have my daughter spied on in this manner as though she were a common criminal. You mentioned another way. Yes, my lady. Not so certain as the other. But worth a try. A sudden shock, administered when she least expects it. What sort of shock? I'll go to her, at Frising Hall, and confront her with Rosanna's death. She may break down and confess everything. Yes. To that I agree. Oh, very good, my lady. The pony chaise is waiting. I'll go to Frising Hall without delay. Uh, no. I... I beg your pardon, my lady? I shall tell my daughter of Rosanna's death. I am her mother. It is my right and my duty. Uh, oh, you may rely on me uh, to try the experiment as boldly as you would yourself. Ah, and I shall inform you of the result before the last train leaves for London tonight. When I told Mr. Franklin what was happening, he immediately put off his plan to leave by the next train so that he could hear the news from Frising Hall. This decision left him with a lot of time on his hands and nothing to talk about except Miss Rachel's treatment of him and nobody to talk to except me. How do you explain Rachel's conduct? You see, it, it's perfectly understandable if only we proceed from what we know and not from what we imagine we know. 
Now, we know that the loss of the Moonstone threw her into a state of nervous excitement from which she has not yet recovered. Now, her being in a state of nervous excitement, are we to expect that Rachel should behave to us all as she would normally behave? Of course not. Rachel, properly speaking, is not Rachel, but somebody else. Do I mind being ill-treated by somebody else? Of course I don't. Do you know, Betteridge, I think I should like a glass of sherry. Don't suppose that I was quit of Mr Franklin as easily as that. He drifted round the house, found his way to the office, smelt my pipe, was instantly reminded that he had been simple enough to give up smoking for Miss Rachel, and burst in upon me with his cigar case. Give me a light, Betteridge. There's a good chap. <laughs> you know, I can scarcely believe that a man can have smoked as long as I have without discovering that there's a complete system for the treatment of women at the bottom of his cigar case. <laughs> <laughs> you choose a cigar, you try it, it disappoints you. So what do you do? You throw it away and try another. No, no. <laughs> you choose a woman and she breaks your heart. So what do you do? You throw her away and try another. I often felt inclined to try that when the late Mrs Betteridge was alive. But the law insists that you smoke your cigar when once you've chosen it. <laughs> oh, too true, Betteridge, too true. <laughs> Change the law, I say. <laughs> Sergeant Cuff passed the time arguing roses with the gardener. The pony chaise returned a good half hour before I expected it. My lady had decided to stay at her sister's house for the present. The groom brought two letters from Lady Verinder, one addressed to Mr Franklin, the other to me. I sent for Sergeant Cuff and read mine to him since it concerned him. I have performed the promise I made to Sergeant Cuff with this result. So far as Rosanna, Rosanna Spearman, Spearman is concerned, concerned Miss Verinder declares that she has never spoken a word in private to her since she entered my service. They did not meet on the night the diamond was stolen, and no communication took place between them from the time the alarm was first raised to this present Saturday afternoon when Miss Verinder left us. This is the result of my telling my daughter suddenly and plainly that Rosanna Spearman is dead. She also assures me, and I believe her, that she owes no money and that the diamond is not now and never has been in her possession since she put it into her cabinet on Wednesday night. When I asked her if she could explain the disappearance of the Moonstone, she maintained an obstinate silence. Read this letter to Sergeant Cuff and give him the cheque which I enclose. I am convinced of his intelligence, but I am more convinced than ever that the circumstances in this case have misled him. This is such a generous estimate that Lady Verinder has made of the value of my time that I feel bound to make some return for it. I'll remember the amount in this cheque when the time comes. What do you mean, when the time comes? Her ladyship has smoothed matters over very cleverly for the present. But this family scandal is of the sort that burst out again when you least expect it. That's as good as saying that Miss Rachel has deceived my lady with a whole pack of lies. I consider your remark an insult, Sergeant Cuff, to both Miss Rachel and my lady. You would do better to consider it as a warning to yourself. You haven't done with the Moonstone yet, you know. In fact, I can tell you three things that will happen in the near future. First, you will hear from the Yollans at Cobb's Hole. You will hear from the Indians again. And sooner or later, you will hear from that moneylender in London whom I have mentioned. How can you be so sure? Because there are inevitable consequences of what has already happened. You will hear from the Yollans when Rosanna's letter reaches them on Monday morning. You will hear from the Indians because they will not give up their pursuit of the diamond. You will hear from Mr Septimus Luca because the diamond will cross his path sooner or later. Septimus Luca? The moneylender. He lives in Lambeth. Make a note of it, Mr Betteridge, so that there shall be no mistake when it happens. And with that, Sergeant Cuff left us, walking to the station with the gardener, the better to argue about roses. That left Mr Franklin, who, having read my lady's letter to him, had also decided to go perhaps abroad again. Aunt Julia says that Rachel and I are best apart for the present. 
Rachel still cannot forgive me for bringing in the police. But that would only have been to help her get her diamond back. I cannot understand, Miss Rachel. Really, I can't. Anyway, Aunt Julia intends to take Rachel to London for the best medical advice and to get her away from this place and all its memories. You know the proverb, sir, when things are at their worst, they're sure to mend. Well, they can't be much worse than they are now. Do you know, when I came here from London with that horrible diamond, I don't believe there was a happier household in England. Look at it now. Scattered, disunited, the very air poisoned with suspicion. The Moonstone has served Colonel Herncastle's vengeance by means he never dreamt of. Tell me where you're going to sift. Going? I'm going to the devil! God bless you, sir. Go where you may. That was a miserable weekend, I can tell you. Poor Rosanna Spearman's death hung over us like a pall. My lady and Miss Rachel were gone, so was Mr Franklin. A message came from my lady summoning her own maid and Penelope to London and Samuel the footman as well. And so on the Monday there were more departures. I was pottering about the grounds on the Monday morning when I got a jolt that shook me out of my lethargy. The first of Sergeant Cuff's prophecies came true. Mr. Betteridge! Mr. Betteridge! What? Why, Lucy Yolland? What brings you here, girl? Where's Franklin Blake? Mr. Franklin Blake, if you please. Oh, murderer Franklin Blake would be a better name for him. Just you watch your tongue, my girl. You've no right to say that. No right, haven't I? Oh, she'd be living now if it weren't for him. Doesn't that make him a murderer? No, it does not. Mr Franklin is not to be blamed if a girl falls in love with him. He did nothing to encourage her, nothing whatever. We had plans, Rosanna and me. <gasps> there, now, come on, love. Don't take on oh, so. We're going to London together to make our living from sewing. And then this morning comes her letter saying she's made away with herself. <gasps> and it's his fault. What do you want with Mr Blake? I have a letter for him. From Rosanna? Yes. Well, I'm afraid you can't see Mr Blake. He went to London last night. Is that God's truth? Of course it is. Then I will bid you good morning, Mr Betteridge. No, no, no. Wait a minute, Lucy. Don't be so impatient. If you leave the letter with me, I'll forward it on to him. I have his London address. Rosanna said I was to give him this letter myself, from my hands into his. No other way. Be reasonable, girl. No, from my hands into his. If he wants the letter, he must come back here and get it. From me. And write and tell him that, Mr Betteridge. Tuesday's post brought me two letters. One from Penelope, saying that my lady and Miss Rachel were safely established in London. One from Mr Franklin, saying that by the time I received it, he would be bound for foreign parts, quite where not even he knew at that moment. I must confess, I could not get Rosanna's letter to Mr Blake out of my mind. Did it contain the confession he thought she was trying to make to him about the diamond, or was it merely the unhappy outpouring of her love for him? But until he returned to claim it, if he ever did, it would remain sealed and its secret as hidden as poor Rosanna's body in the quicksand. Wednesday came and brought nothing. Thursday brought a second budget of news from Penelope. Some great London doctor had been consulted about Miss Rachel and had earned a guinea by recommending that she had better be amused, so there was a whole round of gaieties in prospect. Mr Godfrey had called and, to Penelope's great annoyance, had been most graciously received. On Friday, again nothing. On Saturday, the last day of my narrative, the postman brought me a London newspaper. I opened it eagerly and found one of the police reports marked in ink. As I read it, I fancied I could hear the voice of Sergeant Cuff in my head. Lambeth. Shortly before the closing of the court... Mr Septimus Luca, the well-known dealer in gems, etc., etc., applied to the sitting magistrate for advice. 
The applicant stated that he had lately been annoyed by some strolling Indians, three in number. After having been sent away by the police, they had returned again and again and had attempted to enter the house on pretense of asking for charity. Mr. Luker said he had only the day before been compelled to dismiss from his service a skilled carver in ivory, a native of India, on suspicion of attempted theft. He expressed a fear that this man and the street jugglers might be acting together. The magistrate remarked that if the annoyance were repeated, Mr. Luker could summon the Indians to that court. And, as to the valuables in his possession, Mr. Mr. Luker, Luker would, would do well, well to communicate, communicate with the police and adopt such additional precautions as their experience might suggest. And so Sergeant Cuff's three predictions had been proved right in less than a week. If you desert me and side with the sergeant, if the only explanation you can see is that Miss Rachel and Mr. Luca must have got together and that the Moonstone must be in pledge in the moneylender's house, I'm bound to say I can't blame you. At this place, then, we part. The mystery of the Indian diamond has threaded its way to London, and to London you must go after it, leaving me at the country house. And so I, Gabriel Betteridge, bid you farewell. For the present. My name is Drusilla Clack, Miss Drusilla Clack, and I am a niece of the late Sir John Verinder. I had been cut off from all news of my relatives by marriage for some time, for when we are poor, we are not infrequently forgotten. When a letter arrived from my wealthy relation, Mr. Franklin Blake, the whim had seized him to stir up the deplorable scandal of the Moonstone, and he wanted me to help him by writing the account of what I saw while visiting at Aunt Verinder's house in London. A pecuniary remuneration was offered to me. It cost me a hard struggle before Christian humility conquered sinful pride, and I accepted Mr. Blake's cheque. My diary informs me that I was accidentally passing Aunt Verinder's house in Montague Square on Monday, the 3rd of July, 1848. Seeing signs of occupation, I felt it would be an act of polite attention to knock and make inquiries. Accordingly, I was invited to luncheon the next day, at two. In addition to Lady Julia and her daughter Rachel, Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite was present. I am an ardent worker on behalf of many good causes, including the Mother Small Clothes Conversion Society, with which Mr. Godfrey was associated. So we were already acquainted, and I had the highest opinion of him. Only a few days previously, he and another gentleman, Mr. Septimus Luker of Lambeth, had been the victims of an assault which had made them the talk of London. After luncheon, Rachel, ever, I am afraid, of a willful and unregenerate spirit, pressed him for the full story. My dear Rachel, the newspapers have told it far better than I could. Nonsense. It was you to whom it all happened. Now I promise you, you shall have no peace until you tell me the last detail. Oh, Rachel! <sighs> Very well, then. I returned home last Friday to find a little boy waiting in the hall for me with a letter. It was from or seemed to be from, a lady who wanted to donate a large sum of money to the Mother's Small Clothes Conversion Society, uh, supposing she got a satisfactory reply to certain questions she wanted to put to me. The Mother's what, Godfrey? Allow oh. me to enlighten you, Rachel, dear. The Mother's Small Clothes Conversion Society exists to rescue unredeemed father's trousers, if you will forgive the word at the drawing room table, from the pawnbroker. We then, with our needles, abridge them to suit the proportions of the innocent son of the family to prevent their resumption by the irreclaimable parent. I trust I make myself clear? Perfectly, Clack. It sounds quite disgusting. I wonder you aren't dead of any one of a hundred dreadful diseases. Rachel! Oh, please go on, Godfrey. Oh, I went to the address. It was in the Strand, Northumberland Street, and the door was opened by a most respectable, though somewhat corpulent man, who conducted me to an empty room at the back on an upper floor. There was a faint odour of musk and camphor about the place, I remember, and on the table was a beautiful oriental manuscript. I was looking at this 
when I was suddenly attacked from behind, overpowered and searched. Oh. All my personal possessions were strewn here, there and everywhere. Of course, I didn't know this until afterwards, because I was blindfolded and gagged almost immediately. Oh, gosh. Was it the Indians? Well, certainly the arm that was thrown around my neck at the very start was a bare brown arm. Yes, they could have been Indians. And how many of them were there? I'm pretty sure it was two who attacked me and one who searched my pockets. Three all told. And it was all done in total silence. I didn't hear so much as a footstep behind my back. And then when they didn't find whatever it was that they were looking for, they spoke in some foreign tongue, and then they hauled me into a chair and bound me, hand and foot. Oh, quite shocking. And how long were you left like that? Oh, not very long, Aunt Julia. Only a minute or two, I should judge. The landlord and landlady found me. They'd seen the three Oriental gentlemen leave, accompanied by the portly gentleman who had let me in. They remembered that a visitor had arrived but had not left and had thought it prudent to investigate. Lucky for me that they did. Did they know anything of the Indians? Uh, nothing whatever. The portly gentleman had engaged the rooms, paid a week in advance and had said that they were wanted for friends of his. Three Oriental noblemen newly arrived in the country. And then exactly the same thing happened to Mr Septimus Luker. Indeed. But I know only what the newspapers tell us of that. Well, it, it, it appears he received a note, just as I did, except that his pretended to be from one of his customers who wanted to make a purchase. Mr Luca went to an address in Alfred Place, off Tottenham Court Road. Exactly the same events occurred. The empty room, the beautiful manuscript, the attack. With this one difference, that they took from him a receipt which mentioned a valuable of great price. The Moonstone. I should hardly think so, my dear Rachel. In any case, it would have been of no use to them, since it stated that the valuable, whatever it was, should only be given up to the owner in person. No doubt their English friend looked it over and explained this to them. They made no attempt to produce the receipt at Mr Luca's bank. It seems an extraordinary coincidence that both you and Mr Luca should have been attacked by these people. And the police explain that by my having been seen speaking to Mr Luca earlier the same day. Oh, so Mr Luca is known to you? Oh, no. No, but it seems we share the same bankers in Lombard Street. Ah. <laughs> And when Mr Luca and I were giving our statements to the police, I recognised him. It was one of those silly little contests of politeness as we met at the door of the bank. He insisted that I precede him, and I said a few civil words. Evidently the Orientals were watching him and had assumed that I was known to him. Have the police done anything, Godfrey? Nothing whatever. And I suppose it is certain that the men who attacked you were also the men who attacked Mr Luca? Well, it would certainly seem that they were. And not a trace of them has been found? Not a trace. Do you think they were the three Indians who came to our house in Yorkshire? My dear Rachel, I told you they blindfolded me before I could see a thing. What do you know about Mr Luca? Nothing at all, beyond the fact that he's a moneylender. <laughs> no one knows less about Mr Luca than I do. Had you ever seen him before you met at the bank? Never. Now, pray forgive me, Rachel, but I am tired of talking about But I this. am not. Have you seen him since? At the police station, when we were trying to help the inquiries. This banker's receipt you said had been taken from him. Or didn't it mention what the valuable was? I haven't seen the receipt, but according to the description I've heard of it, it didn't. Well, what did it say? A valuable gem belonging to Mr Luca, deposited by Mr Luca, sealed with Mr Luca's seal, and only to be given up on Mr Luca's personal application. And that is all I know about it. Some of our private affairs have got into the newspapers. Unfortunately. And some people are trying to trace a connection between what happened in Yorkshire and what has happened since in London. Unfortunately, again, that is true. Rachel, my dear, I don't see the point of questioning poor Godfrey like this. He has been through enough, goodness knows. And the doctor said you shouldn't excite yourself on the subject. I have nearly finished, Mama. <sighs> Tell me plainly, Godfrey. Do people say that Mr Luca's valuable gem is the moonstone? They do say it. There are people who don't hesitate to accuse Mr Luca of telling a falsehood to serve some private interests of his own. He has over and over again solemnly declared that until these events he had never even heard of the Moonstone, and these vile people reply without a shadow of proof to justify them that he has his reasons for concealment. I think it's shameful. Quite shameful. Considering that Mr Luca is only a chance acquaintance of yours, you take up his cause rather warmly, Godfrey. I hope, Rachel, I take up the cause of all oppressed people rather warmly. Oh, keep your noble sentiments for your ladies' committees, Godfrey. I am certain that the scandal that has fallen on Mr Luca has not spared you. My dear Rachel, you really have no right to say I that. mean no harm, Mama. I mean good. Godfrey, an unlucky accident has associated you in people's minds with Mr Luca. 
You have told me what Scandal says of him. What does Scandal say of you, Godfrey? Oh, no, don't ask me. It's, it's better forgotten, Rachel. It is indeed. I will hear it. Oh, tell her, Godfrey, please. Whatever it is, it cannot do her as much harm as your silence is doing now. If you will have it, Rachel. Scandal says that the Moonstone is in pledge to Mr. Luca and that I am the man who pawned it. Oh, no. No, this is my fault. I must put it right. I had a right to sacrifice my own reputation if I wished, but to let an innocent man be ruined oh, because... Rachel, Rachel, calm yourself. You exaggerate. My reputation stands too high to be harmed by a thing like this. It'll be forgotten in a week. Drusilla, quick, in my workbox, a little glass vial. Why? Whatever's the matter? Hurry, six drops in water. Do not let Rachel see. Mama, Miss Clack, hear what I say. I know the hand that took the moonstone. I know Godfrey Abelwhite is innocent. Take me to the magistrate, Godfrey. Take me to the magistrate and I will swear it. Rachel, you must not appear in public in such a thing as this. Your reputation is far too pure and sacred a thing to be trifled with. <laughs> My reputation? What reputation? The best detective officer in England says that I've stolen my own diamond to pay my private debts. What reputation does that leave me with? Godfrey, I won't let you be accused and disgraced through my fault. I won't. If you won't take me before the magistrate, draw up a declaration of your innocence on paper and I will sign it. Rachel. Do it, I say, do it. Or I'll write to the newspapers. I'll go out and cry it in the streets. My dear, but... Well, very well, my dear. Where's my pocketbook? Thank you, Drusilla. Uh, stand between us for a minute or two. Do not let Rachel see. My dear, you're quite blue. The drops will put me right. Godfrey, I'm afraid I have not done you justice. You were a better man. You were more unselfish than I believed you to be. Call on us here when you can, and I will try and repair the wrong I've done you. Are you feeling better now, dear? Yes, thank you, Drusilla. It was not a bad attack this time. I will come, dearest Rachel on condition that we don't speak of this hateful subject again. Oh, they've come to take me to the fly show. I've not distressed you, Mama, have I? No, no, my dear. Now go with your friends and enjoy yourself. The declaration, is it ready? I must sign it before I can go out with an easy mind. Here you are, Rachel, and here is my pen. Rachel, dear, such an intense emotion as you have just shown is an infallible indication of an unquiet spirit. Perhaps if instead of visiting flower shows, you would care to spend an improving hour or so with a number of tracts which I happen to have with Save me. Save that for I... those with simpler minds than mine, Miss Clack. Rachel, my dear, I pity you. What do you mean by pitying me? Don't you see how happy I am? I'm going to the flower show, Clack, and I've got the prettiest bonnet in London. Goodbye. Dear aunt, a little conspiracy. Dear Miss Clack, a pious fraud which even your high moral rectitude will excuse. Why, Mr Godfrey, whatever do you mean? Uh, will you leave Rachel to suppose that I accept the generous self-sacrifice which has signed this paper? And will you kindly bear witness that I destroy it in your presence before I leave the house? <sighs> Any trifling inconvenience that I may suffer is as nothing compared with preserving that pure name from the whiff of scandal. There. A harmless heap of ashes. And Rachel will never know what we have done, will she? And now, dear ladies, I must take my leave of you. Another committee, you know? Uh, dear Godfrey, thank you for your kindness and understanding. And do call again, won't you? Of course, Aunt Julia. Miss Clack? Goodbye. Good... Goodbye, Mr. Godfrey. Uh, oh, dear Lady Verinder, are, are you quite recovered now? Should I take my leave of you to let you rest? Uh, no, no, Drusilla, please sit down. Uh, have you any pressing engagements, or is your time your own this afternoon? Oh, no, I, I'm entirely free, if I can be of service to you. You can. You can be one of the witnesses when I sign my will. Mr. Bruff is bringing it at five. You will? Oh, dear me, surely it's not as bad as that. I'm afraid it is, Drusilla. I have been seriously ill for some time past, and strange to say, without knowing it myself. Oh, dear. 
I brought Rachel to London for medical advice, and I thought it right to consult two doctors. Yes, dear, yes. One of them had been an old friend of Sir John's and had always taken a sincere interest in me for his sake. After prescribing for Rachel, he said he wished to speak to me privately in another room. I expected, of course, that he wanted to give me some special directions about Rachel. But no, he said he had been looking at me, and he thought I was far more in need of medical advice than Rachel. Oh, dear. Well, the next day I was seen by both doctors, who agreed that precious time had been lost, and my case was now beyond their art. Oh, my dear. For more than two years I have been suffering under an insidious form of heart disease. There have been no symptoms to warn me, but little by little it has broken down my health. I may live for some months, or I may die before another day has passed over my head. Oh, what terrible news, my dear. Uh, permit me to offer what little comfort I can. I have in my possession... Thank you, I... my dear. I, I won't conceal that I've had some miserable moments since I learnt the truth, but I am more resigned than I was. My one great anxiety is that Rachel should not know... She will be bound to think it was due to anxiety about the diamond and reproach herself bitterly. Oh, my dear aunt. You, you inspire me with such interest. I shall do you such good before we part. Good, Drusilla. What do you mean? Now, I have any number of clerical friends who would be only too happy to see you and prepare you. It would be such a pleasure oh, to me to... Oh, my dear, I really don't think I could face strangers... Uh, not under the circumstances. Uh, of course not. Uh, but perhaps books. I have a little library of enlightening and fortifying works. Uh, perhaps I may bring you a few. Uh, turned down at all the right places and marked in pencil? Well, if you really think so, then I will do what I can to please you. The clock on the mantelpiece informed me that I had just time to hurry home to provide myself with a first series of selected readings, say a dozen only, and to be back in time to meet the lawyer and witness Lady Verinder's will. The servant who answered the door upon my return informed me that the doctor had called and was still with my aunt. I was shown into the library and found Mr. Bruff, the lawyer, who had arrived a minute before. Miss Clack, how do you do? You'll find Lady Verinder somewhat occupied with business this afternoon. Uh, I'm well aware of that, Mr. Bruff. Uh, she has been so good as to ask me to be one of the witnesses to her will. Oh. Well, you'll do. You're over 21, and you have no pecuniary interest in it, whatever. I'm relieved to hear it, Mr. Bruff. Doubtless there are those who would misconstrue my motives, were it otherwise. No. Oh. And what's the latest news in the charitable circles? How's your friend, Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite, after the mauling he got from the rogues in Northumberland Street? The gad, they're telling a pretty story about him at my club. A vile falsehood, sir. Oh, yes, you believe in your friend, Miss Clack. But the world in general is not so easy to convince as a committee of charitable ladies. He was in the house where the diamond was lost, and he was the first to leave it afterwards. Ugly circumstances, ma'am, viewed by the light of later events. Later events? Oh, and uh, what later events do you mean, Mr. I Brown? mean those in which the Indians are concerned. What do they do the moment they are let out of prison at Frising Hall? They go straight to London and fix on Mr. Luca, who consequently feels alarmed for the safety of a valuable of great price. He lodges it under a general description in his banker's strong room. Now, whom do the Indian sees and search? Not Mr. Luca only, but Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite as well. I understand from Mr. Ablewhite that he had been seen speaking to Mr. Luca earlier that same day. That won't do, Miss Clack. That won't do. Half a dozen other people spoke to Mr. Luca that morning. Why were they not followed home and decoyed into the trap? No, no. The plain inference is that Mr. Ablewhite had his interest in the valuable as well as Mr. Luca. The Indians were so uncertain as to which of the two had a disposal of it, they had no alternative but to search them both. Public opinion says that, Miss Clack. And public opinion on this occasion is not easily refuted. <laughs> I don't presume to argue with a clever lawyer like you, Mr. Bruff, but uh, is it quite fair to Mr. Ablewhite to pass over the opinion of the famous London police officer who investigated the case? 
uh, which was that not a shadow of suspicion rested upon anybody but Miss Verinder herself. Do you mean to tell me, Miss Clack, that you agree with Sergeant Cuff? I judge nobody, sir, and I offer no opinion. Well, I do. I judge Sergeant Cuff to have been utterly wrong, and I offer the opinion that if he had known Rachel's character as I know it, then he would have suspected everybody in the house but her. Oh, yes, I admit she's self-willed, and unlike other girls of her age, but true as steel, and high-minded and generous to a fault. If the plainest evidence in the world pointed one way, and nothing but Rachel's word of honour pointed the other, then I would take her word before I took the evidence, lawyer as I am. Suppose you found Miss Verinder extraordinarily interested in what has happened to Mr. Abelwhite and Mr. Luca. Uh, suppose she asked the strangest questions and showed the strongest agitation when she found out the turn this scandal was taking. Suppose anything you please, Miss Clack. It wouldn't shake my belief in Rachel Verinder, not by so much as a hair's breadth. Then permit me to inform you that Mr. Abelwhite was in this house not two hours since and that Miss Verinder herself denied he had any connection with the disappearance of the Moonstone. Denied it, Mr. Brown. In the strongest language I have ever heard used by a young lady in my life. Hey, what's that you say, Miss Clack? And what do you say about Mr. Abelwhite now? I say this. If Rachel has testified to his innocence, then I don't scruple to say that I believe in it as firmly as you do. I've been misled by appearances, like the rest of the world. But there is surely another conjecture to be made. Maybe, but well, I must own, I don't know what it is. You said that one of your reasons for suspecting Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite was that he was in the house at the time of the diamond's disappearance. But so was Mr. Franklin Blake. Ah, it won't do, Miss Clack. It really won't do a second time. I own that Franklin Blake is a prime favourite of mine, but that doesn't matter. You see, Franklin Blake had no possible cause to steal the Moonstone. <laughs> His debts are notorious in the family. And Mr. Abelwhite's debts have not yet reached that stage, quite true. But there are two objections in the way of your theory. Really? And what are they? First, I manage Mr. Blake's affairs, and I can tell you that the vast majority of his creditors, knowing his father to be a rich man, are quite content to charge interest and to wait for their money. There's your first difficulty. The second is tougher still. Lady Verinder has told me that Rachel was ready to marry Franklin. To marry him? Aye, to marry him. Oh, yes, she'd drawn him on and put him off again, but that's the way of young girls. But she told her mother that she loved Franklin, and what's more, her mother had told Franklin. So there you are. With his creditors content to wait, and with a certain prospect of marrying an heiress, will you tell me why Franklin Blake should steal the Moonstone? The human heart is unsearchable. Who oh, is to fathom it? In other words, he might have taken the diamond through natural depravity. Well, suppose he did, then why the devil did he... I beg your pardon, Mr. Buff. If I hear the devil referred to in that manner, I must leave the room. I beg your pardon, Miss Clack. I'll be more careful of my language. Why, supposing he did steal the diamond, should Franklin Blake take the lead in trying to recover it? Oh, did I have suspicion from himself, perhaps? But nobody suspected him. No, 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 it's impossible. First, he steals something he had no reason to steal, and which belongs to the young lady he loves... And he tries to help recover the jewel and thereby provokes her implacable hostility. Oh, no, no. You are very convincing, Mr. Brough, and, of course, you have much experience in these matters. But who did steal the moonstone? Ah. Now, that I cannot tell you. In fact, I confess I find the whole case utterly baffling. The only certainty seems to be that someone has brought the moonstone to London and that Mr. Septimus Luca, or his banker, is in possession of it at this moment. At this point, the servant came in to say that the doctor had gone, and Lady Verinder was waiting to receive us. The signing of the will was hurried over, to my thinking, in indecent haste. Samuel, the footman, acted as second witness. Mr. Brough left immediately the signing was completed, so that I was alone with my aunt who reclined among the cushions on her sofa. I hope you won't think yourself neglected, Lucilla. I mean to give you your little legacy, my dear, with my own hand. Give me your attention, dear aunt, to this precious book, and you will give me all I ask. Here it is. Satan among the sofa cushions. I am afraid, Drusilla, I must wait until I am a little better before I can read that. The doctor tells me I am not so well today. He orders me, if I read at all, to read only the lightest and most amusing books. 
And uh, Satan among the sofa cushions hardly promises to be light or amusing. Oh, but you might feel stronger, dear, tomorrow. You will let me leave the book. The doctor can hardly object to that. Oh, very well, Drusilla. If you feel you really must. Before I withdrew, I slipped it under her sofa cushions, close by her handkerchief and her smelling bottle. And before I left the house, finding it quiet, I was able to slip round and deposit all my other treasures in any room my aunt was likely to visit. The next day, towards lunchtime, the young footman Samuel called at my humble lodgings with a parcel in his arms. Uh, my lady's love, and I'm to say that you will find a letter inside. Oh, thank you, Samuel. Uh, oh, well, uh, just one moment before you go. Uh, could I see Lady Verinder if I called? I was thinking of passing Oh, I'm afraid off. she's gone out driving, miss, with Miss Rachel and Mr Godfrey. Oh, indeed. Uh, well, I... Oh, I must I... hurry, miss. I'm to get some tickets for the morning concert tomorrow, and I'm afraid all the places may be taken if I don't go now. And who, pray, is going to a morning concert? Surely not Lady Verinder and her present state of health. Oh, no, miss. Miss Rachel and Mr Godfrey, miss. Now, excuse me, but I really must go, miss. We had a special meeting of the Mother's Small Clothes Conversion Society the next morning, summoned expressly with a view to obtaining Mr Godfrey's advice. Instead of sustaining our sisterhood under an overwhelming flow of trousers, he had arranged to go to a morning concert. Well... On finding myself alone in my room, I naturally turned my attention to the parcel. Had my aunt sent me my promised legacy? Had it taken the form of worn-out silver spoons or unfashionable jewellery? I opened it. And what met my view? The twelve precious publications I had scattered through the house the previous day. All returned to me by the doctor's orders. Preparation by clerical friends had failed. Preparation by books had failed. The next thing to try was preparation by little notes. A selected extracts from the books, copied by different hands and addressed personally to Lady Verinder. Some I wrote myself. Some were written by my fellow workers at the Mother's Small Clothes. Six were sent through the post. Six I kept myself for personal distribution. Soon after two o'clock the following day, I was again on the field of pious conflict. Samuel told me my aunt had had a bad night and was resting. I said I would wait in the library on the chance of seeing her. The house was quiet. Rachel and Mr Godfrey were not yet back from the concert. The six letters I had posted the previous night were lying unopened on the library table. I ran lightly upstairs to scatter the other six throughout the house. Just as I entered the front room, I heard a knock at the street door, answered immediately by Samuel. The next moment, a man's footsteps coming up the stairs. Supposing it to be the doctor, and not wishing to be surprised by this incorrigible materialist, I slipped into the little room which communicated with the back drawing room, and dropped the curtains which closed the open doorway. The visitor was shown in. In a minute or two, he would be taken to see my aunt. I heard him pacing to and fro and muttering to himself. Did I recognise the voice? I couldn't be sure. And then I heard another voice. A voice I did recognise. Why have you come up here, Godfrey? Why didn't you go into the library? Samuel tells me that Miss Clack is in the library. Oh, you're quite right, Godfrey. We had much better stop here. Godfrey Abelwhite. Imagine my feelings. What to do? To show myself after what I had just heard was out of the question. To retreat was impossible. No choice but to stay in here. I told them that you didn't like to leave your mother in her present condition, and they quite understood. You don't think it's serious, do you, Godfrey? Oh, no. In a few days, I'm quite sure she'll be well again. It seems very hard that you should miss the concert. Mendelssohn's your favourite. But I'm so much happier here with you. Do try not to pay me compliments, Godfrey. I never paid you a compliment in my life. Hopeless love always speaks the truth. Have you forgotten what we agreed on when you spoke to me in the country? I break the agreement every time I see you. Then don't see me. Oh, but I break it even when I think of you. Rachel, you told me the other day that I was higher in your estimation than before. Am I mad to build the hopes I do on those dear words? To dream of some future day when your heart may soften towards me? His voice trembled. 
He put his handkerchief to his eyes. Even her obdurate nature was touched. Are you so fond of me as that? Really? Oh, Rachel, I've lost every interest in life except you. Would you believe it? My charitable business is an unendurable nuisance to me. When I see a ladies' committee, I wish myself at the ends of the earth. Was there anything in the annals of apostasy to compare with it? What a backsliding I was witness to. Shocked though I was, I did not lose a syllable of the conversation. I wonder if it would cure you if I made my confession. Would you think to look at me that I am the wretchedest girl living? It's true, Godfrey. What greater wretchedness can there be than to live degraded in your own estimation? That is my life now. My dear Rachel, you can have no possible reason to speak of yourself like that. How do you know I have no reason? Because I know you. Besides, your silence has never lowered you in the opinion of your real friends. Of course, the disappearance of the diamond seems very strange. Your connection with the disappearance may seem stranger still, but to your true friends... Are you speaking of the Moonstone, Godfrey? I certainly thought that you referred to the Moonstone. I referred to nothing of the sort. If that story ever comes to light, people will see I had to keep a miserable secret. Yes, but not that I did anything to be ashamed of. No, you misunderstood me, and it's my fault for not speaking more plainly. I will be plainer now. Suppose you were in love with some other woman, and suppose you knew it was a shocking disgrace to waste another thought on her, and suppose, in spite of all that, you couldn't forget her. And this is what you're trying to tell me is the case with you? That there is a man? Who... Oh, he doesn't know. Of course he doesn't know. But try as I may, and I have tried, God knows, I can't forget him. I can't tear him out of my heart. Oh, Godfrey, I'm so unhappy. <laughs> Will it be credited that at this point Mr. Godfrey fell on his knees before her? Not just one knee, mind you, but two. I was indescribably shocked. Noble creature. Yes, you are a noble creature. <laughs> A woman who can speak the truth for the truth's own sake. A woman who will sacrifice her pride rather than sacrifice an honest man who loves her is the most priceless of all treasures. Oh, Rachel, let me cure your poor wounded heart. Will you honour me? Will you bless me by being my wife? At this point, Rachel Verinder uttered the first sensible words I had ever heard fall from her lips. Godfrey, you must be mad. Oh, no, I never spoke more sensibly in my life. Believe me. Look, think of the future. Are you going to sacrifice your whole happiness on this man who doesn't even know how you feel towards him? In justice to yourself, you must not. Think of the consolations of a home, motherhood, peaceful claims and happy duties. But then she began to weaken. Oh, how differently I should have acted in her place. It would be useless, Godfrey. I don't love you. I don't ask for your love. You say I have your esteem and respect. I am content with that. Oh, don't tempt me. I am wretched and reckless enough as it is. Hundreds, no, thousands of women marry only for esteem and respect, yet they and their husbands get on very well. A girl with your attractions cannot possibly sentence herself to a single life. You may marry some other man, some years from now, or you may marry me and know that I prize your respect far more than the love of any other woman on earth. Godfrey, I am miserable enough and desperate enough to give in if you keep on like this. Take the warning and go. I won't even rise from my knees until you have said yes. If I do, we shall both be sorry when it is too late. No, we shan't. We shall bless the day. Godfrey... You won't ask me for more than I can give. I ask you only to give me yourself. Very well. Then you accept. You will marry me. Yes, Godfrey. I will marry you. He drew her nearer and nearer to him until her face touched his and then... No... I really cannot carry this shocking disclosure any farther. Let me only say that I tried to close my eyes before it happened and that I was just one moment too late. I had calculated, you see, on her resisting. Shall I speak to your dear mother? Or will you? No. I don't want her to hear about this until she is better. Let us keep it a secret for the present. 
Now, you had better go and come back this evening. We have been here alone together quite long enough. Who has drawn those curtains? The room is close enough as it is. Miss Rachel! Miss Rachel! Yes, Samuel, what is it? What's the matter? Where are you, miss? In the back drawing room. Oh, please come downstairs, miss. My lady has fainted. And we can't bring her to again. That was part three of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Brian Gear. The cast, Sergeant Cuff, John Franklin Robbins, Gabriel Betteridge, John Sharp, Franklin Blake, John Telfer, Rachel Verinder, Sally Baxter, Godfrey Abelwhite, Geoffrey Beavers, Mr Bruff, Nat Brenner, Miss Clack, June Barry, Lucy Yolland, Liza Flanagan, and Samuel Matthew Adams. The music was composed and conducted by Sidney Sager, and the programme, which came from Bristol, was directed by Brian Miller. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio in six parts by Brian Gear, with music composed by Sidney Sager. The Moonstone, part four. It is with the deepest sense of duty, uh, coupled with the comforting knowledge of Mr. Franklin Blake's check awaiting me, that I take up my pen to resume the account of events relating to the Moonstone scandal. I am reminded, by consulting afresh Mr. Blake's strict instructions, that I am confined to events that I witnessed myself. Consequently, there will be some gaps in my narrative, which you must excuse. A month elapsed between the time of Lady Verinder's decease and my meeting Rachel Verinder again. My aunt's will left her daughter in the guardianship of Mr. Abelwhite Senior until Rachel married or came of age. In these circumstances, Mr. Godfrey told his father of his engagement to Rachel. There now arose the question of where Rachel was to reside. The house in Montague Square was associated with the calamity of her mother's death, the house in Yorkshire with the loss of the diamond, and in her present state of bereavement her residence at her guardian's house in Frisinghall would be an unwelcome check on the gaieties of the Miss Abelwhites. It ended in a proposal from Mr. Abelwhite Sr. to try a rented house in Brighton. He would join Rachel and his wife later in the season, and they would have Godfrey, with the London train so convenient, always at their disposal. My Aunt Abelwhite is a large, fair-complexioned woman who has never been known to do anything for herself. The task of engaging servants for the house in Brighton was quite beyond her, and she sent for me to do it her son, Godfrey, having already found the house. It was thus that I met Rachel again for the first time since her mother's death. Drusilla, I'm so pleased to see you. I wanted to ask your forgiveness. I have spoken very rudely to you in the past. Why, of course, my dear. A Christian is ever ready to forgive. Thank you, Drusilla. Now, the servants... Here is the list. Uh, cook, kitchen, maid, housemaid and foot... Uh, my dear, these are only wanted for the term during which Mr Abelwhite has taken the house. Uh, we shall have great difficulty in finding persons of character to accept a temporary engagement if we try here in London. Um, I had better go to Brighton tomorrow and look there. Oh, that is kind of you, Drusilla. I would do it myself, but I have no experience in hiring servants. And you must stay with us there. You will stay, won't you, as my guest? And thus the glorious prospect of interference was open before me. Rachel was clearly no longer the reckless, defiant creature whom I had last seen. This of itself was enough to encourage me to take her conversion in hand. It was then the middle of the week. By Saturday afternoon I had engaged the servants and the house was in readiness. Between six and seven Aunt Abelwhite and Rachel arrived. Escorted by the lawyer, Mr. Bruff, 
Before going away to his hotel, he invited himself to Sunday luncheon. You've scarcely eaten anything, Rachel, dear. No, Aunt, I'm not hungry. The sermon was so uplifting this morning. A whole hour of eloquence thundering through that sacred edifice. It has given me a headache. That is really all that I can find to say for it. Do you know the best remedy for a headache, Miss Rachel? A nice long walk. <laughs> I am entirely at your service, if you will honour me by accepting my arm. How I shall have a nap instead. It will do me far more good. <laughs> I don't know when I have felt the solemn duty of interfering so strongly as I felt it at that moment. I was certain that Mr. Bruff had some private object in coming to Brighton, and that Rachel was concerned in it. On my return from the afternoon service, I found they had just got back from their walk. I had never before seen Mr. Bruff pay Rachel such devoted attention, or look at her with such marked respect. He had, or pretended he had, an engagement to dinner, and took an early leave of us. I overheard a few words between him and Rachel at the door. Are you quite sure of your own resolution? Quite sure. Nothing could make me change my mind now. There are not many young ladies who could be so much in command of themselves in circumstances like these. I have the highest regard for you, you know. I could do nothing if I didn't have your help, Mr. Bruff. Rachel immediately withdrew to her own room and locked the door. I made all sorts of sisterly offers through the woodwork, but the door remained locked. I felt quite cheered. Plenty of obstructive material to work on here. She came down to breakfast the next day, but she ate nothing and said hardly a word. Afterwards, she wandered listlessly about, then opened the piano and began to play music of the most scandalously profane variety. It would have been premature to interfere with her at such a time. I escaped the music by leaving the house for an invigorating walk. Upon my return, I entered the dining room and found myself face to face with Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Dear Miss Clack, Mr. Godfrey, I've been waiting to see you. Uh, what a pleasant surprise. Uh, well, we did not expect you so soon. Oh, by a happy chance, I was set free of my London engagements earlier than expected. Have you seen Rachel yet? I have. You are aware, Miss Clack, that she was engaged to be married to me. Was engaged to you? Was. It appears that upon reflection she feels that it would be best for both of us if she retracted her rash promise, leaving me free to make a happier choice elsewhere. And have you submitted to this, Mr. Godfrey? I have. Without a struggle. But why? Why indeed? I feel like a little child who, when you ask it why it has been naughty, puts its finger in its angelic mouth and says, I don't know. I don't know why I should accept her decision with such tranquillity. I only know I do. Have you perhaps realised how much you were neglecting us at the Mother Small Clothes conversion? And has perhaps your conscience troubled you on that account, dear Mr Godfrey? Ah, now there you have it exactly, Miss Clack. Ah. <laughs> how perceptive you are. It suddenly occurs to me that my true happiness is in helping my dear ladies and in doing my modest round of useful work. Oh. <laughs> true, I have lost an excellent social position, but I have got a position. True, I have lost a handsome income, but I can pay for my bread and cheese and my nice little lodging and my two coats a year. True, I have lost a beautiful girl, but she has told me with her own lips, this dear lady is between ourselves, that she loves another man, and her only idea in marrying me was to put him out of her head. Looked at reasonably, the only possible course is to submit to Rachel's change of mind. Everything you say only shows what a fine and noble nature you possess, Mr. Godfrey. Oh, how time flies with you, Miss Clack. I shall barely catch my train. Uh, what are you leaving us already? I fear so, dear lady. Business obliges my father to leave Frising Hall for London today, and he proposes coming on here. His heart is set on my marrying Rachel, and I must tell him what has happened. There'll be great difficulty, I fear, but I must stop him from coming here until he's reconciled to it. I will rapidly pass over the feelings of joy which assailed me when I realised that Mr. Godfrey had come back to the fold, 
and content myself with noting that at lunchtime it appeared to me that the recovery of her freedom had led Rachel to thinking again of that other man whom she loved. In the afternoon, she accompanied Aunt Ablewhite as she took her exercise in an invalid chair, while I armed myself with the life, letters and labours of Miss Jane Ann Stamper, 44th edition, passages of which bore with a marvellous appropriateness on Rachel's present condition. The next day, Aunt Ablewhite was as near to being astonished as her nature would permit by the sudden appearance of her husband. A minute later, he was followed, to my astonishment this time, by Mr. Bruff. This is a pleasant surprise, Mr. Bruff. When I left your office yesterday, I didn't expect to have the honour of seeing you here today. I turned over our conversation in my mind after you'd gone, and it occurred to me that I might be of some use. Only just had time to catch the train. No opportunity of discovering which carriage you were in. Rachel, my dear... I have heard some very extraordinary news from Godfrey, and I'm here to inquire about it. Uh, you have a sitting room of your own in this house. Will you honour me by showing me the way to it? Whatever you wish to say to me, Mr. Ablewhite, can be said here, in the presence of my relatives and Mr. Bruff. Just as you please, my dear. Some weeks ago, my son informed me that Miss Verinder had done him the honour to engage herself to marry him. Is it possible, Rachel, that he can have misinterpreted or presumed upon what you rarely said to him? Certainly not. I did engage myself to marry him. A very frankly answered. So, the error is evidently in what Godfrey told me yesterday. I begin to see it now. You and he have had a lover's quarrel, and my foolish son has interpreted it seriously. Pray let us understand each other, Mr. Ablewhite. Nothing in the least like a quarrel took place yesterday between Godfrey and me. If he told you that I proposed breaking off our marriage engagement and that he agreed on his side, then he told you the truth. Oh, come, come, my dear. Now, don't be angry and don't be hard on poor Godfrey. He has evidently said some unfortunate thing. Well, he was always clumsy from a child. But he means well, Rachel, he means well. Mr. Ablewhite. I have either expressed myself very badly or you were purposely mistaking me. Once and for all, it is a settled thing between Godfrey and me that we remain cousins and nothing more. Now, is that plain enough? Am I to understand, then, that your engagement is broken off? You are to understand that, if you please. Am I also to understand that the proposal to withdraw from the engagement came, in the first instance, from you? Yes, it did. And it met with your son's consent and approval. I beg to ask you, Miss Verinder, what complaint you have to make of my son. You are not bound to answer that question, Rachel. Don't you forget, Mr. Bruff, that you are a self-invited guest here. Your interference wasn't asked for. Your son, Mr. Ablewhite, put the same question to me. And my answer was that reflection had convinced me that I should best consult his welfare and mine by retracting a rash promise and leaving him free to make his choice elsewhere. Well, what has Godfrey done? I have a right to know that. What has he done? You have had the only explanation I think it necessary to give to you or to him. In plain English, it's your sovereign will and pleasure, Miss Verinder, to jilt my son. I have exposed myself to worse misconstruction than that, and I have borne it. I have nothing more to say. Well, I have. I have something more to say. I have to say that if my son doesn't feel this insult, I do. Insult? What insult? You know very well what insult, and so do I. I know it as certainly as if you had confessed it in so many words. Your cursed family pride is insulting Godfrey as it insulted me when I married your aunt. Her beggarly family turned their backs on her for marrying an honest man who'd made his own place and won his own fortune. I had no ancestors. I wasn't descended from a set of cutthroat scoundrels who lived by robbery and murder. I wasn't good enough for the Hearn Castles when I married, and now it comes to the pinch my son isn't good enough for you. I suspected it all along. A very unworthy suspicion. I'm astonished you have the courage to acknowledge it. Surely, Mr. Bruff, this is beneath notice. You've got the Hearn Castle blood in you, young lady. Uh, really, Mr. Ablewhite, I think you ought to control yourself. Really, I do. Who asked you to put your piece in? Oh. Now, Miss High and Mighty, it all comes out, doesn't it? Blood will out. Uh, dear Mr. Ablewhite, one word. Blood will... Eh? 
Who were you? An affectionate well-wisher and friend. As one long accustomed to arouse, convince, prepare, enlighten, and fortify others. Permit me to take the liberty of composing your mind. I know you. Miss Clack. Drusilla Clack. Sit down, woman. I don't suppose that I claim attention for my humble words. Oh, no. The blessed words of Miss Jane Ann Stamper. Miss Jane Ann Stamper be damned. Oh, 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 such language in a Christian household. Oh, oh, where are my tracts? Oh, and oh. your tracts be damned too. Uh, here is one entitled Hush for Heaven's Sake. Oh, there, that's what I think oh. of Hush for Heaven's Sake. Oh. That oh. and that. Oh. Who, who asked this impudent fanatic into the house? Did you, Mrs. Abelwhite? Miss Clack is here as my guest, Mr. Abelwhite. Oh. oh, Miss Clack is here as your guest. In my house. Mr. Bruff, what does he mean? You appear to forget, Mr. Abelwhite, that you took this house as Miss Verinder's guardian for Miss Verinder's use. Not quite so fast. I have a last word to say, which I should have said some time since, if this, this rampant spinster had not interrupted me. I beg to inform you, Mr. Bruff, that if my son is not good enough to be Miss Verinder's husband, I cannot presume to consider his father good enough to be Miss Verinder's guardian. In your legal phrase, Mr. Bruff, I decline to act. This house has necessarily been hired in my name. I have no wish to hurry Miss Verinder. On the contrary, I beg her to remove her guest and her luggage at her own entire convenience. And now I pray you will excuse me. My dear, I should be ashamed of my husband if I didn't know that it is his temper speaking and not himself. Thank you, Aunt. But I have no wish to stay where I am not welcome. You, Miss Clack, are the mischievous person who has irritated him. I hope I shall never see you or your tracts again. Now, Rachel, dear, in my husband's name... What can I do for if you? If I may be permitted to answer for Miss Verinder, might I ask you, Mrs. Abelwhite, to send Penelope down with her mistress's bonnet and shawl? This minute, Mr. Bruff. Leave us ten minutes together, Mrs. Abelwhite, and you may rely on my setting matters right. Oh, Mr. Bruff, you are a friend indeed. <clears throat> Miss Clack, might I ask you to... I, too, have an interest in Rachel. An infinitely greater one than yours, I make leave to say, concerned as it is with her Christian soul. Oh. Rachel, my dear, you are quite right. Mr. Abelwhite is beneath our notice. But what is to happen now? I'm coming to that. When your dear mother named Mr. Abelwhite as your guardian, I persuaded her to insert a clause in her will empowering her executors in certain events to consult with me about the appointment of a new guardian. One of these events has happened today. Now then, will you honour Mrs. Bruff and myself by becoming our guest? And will you remain as one of our family until we've settled what is to be done next? Oh, Mr. Bruff, how kind you are. I can think of nothing that would give me greater pleasure. Stop! Stop! I must be heard! Mr. Bruff, you are not related to her, and I am. I summon the executors to appoint me guardian. Rachel, dearest Rachel, I offer you my modest home. Come to London by the next train and share it with me. You are very kind, Drusilla, but I have accepted Mr. Bruff's invitation and I think it will be best if I remain under his care for the present. Come along, Rachel. See to the packing of your things. Miss Clack, good day. Reviled, deserted by them all, I was left alone in the room. From that day forth, I never saw Rachel Verinder again. She had my Christian forgiveness then, and when I die, she will have as a legacy from me the life, letters and labours of Jane Ann Stamper. My fair friend, Miss Clack, having laid down the pen, it is now my turn to take it up. 
My first task is to fill in the gap in Miss Clack's account, the conversation that took place in Brighton after Sunday lunch between Miss Rachel and myself. I sometimes think Miss Clack's Christian zeal betrays her into overdoing things. Another service on top of this morning's would really have been too much of a good thing. It's far too nice an afternoon to be indoors anyway. And how is your headache? Oh, much better, thank you. Will you forgive an old friend and servant of your family if I ask whether your heart is set on your marriage to Godfrey Ablewhite? Let us sit on this bench, Mr. Bruff. By all means. To tell you the truth, I'm marrying in despair. It is at least a positive act. It will certainly change my life, which is intolerable to me at the present. I suppose it may bring some sort of happiness to it. I don't know. Does that answer your question, Mr. Bruff? It goes some way, certainly. But Mr. Ablewhite's heart must be set on it at any rate. He says it is. And he would hardly marry me after what I have told him unless he was fond of me. It sounds strangely in my old-fashioned ears to hear you speak as though you were not quite sure about it. Isn't there any little doubt in your own mind about his sincerity? Mr. Bruff, you have something to tell me about Godfrey. What is it? It is not very pleasant. Well, tell me. Very well. In a word, he's marrying you for your money. What nonsense. He doesn't need money. How can you be sure of that? What's ample for one man isn't even a pittance for another man. I suppose you have proof. I have. Now, let me think where to begin. I don't suppose you know, and why should you, that before a will can be acted upon, it has to be proved, as we call it. Now, all wills go to a proctor who lodges them in Doctor's Commons. I happened to be calling on my own proctor one day, and he told me that your mother's will had been asked for and examined. Why? And who examined As for who, I'm coming to that in a minute. As to why. It's perfectly normal practice for anybody who applies to Doctor's Commons to be allowed to look over a will. They pay a shilling fee, that's all. But in your mother's case, there was absolutely nothing that could be contested. And I could think of nobody who would have the slightest interest in examining it, so I asked my proctor who'd wanted to see it. Godfrey Abel. So this is acting for Godfrey Ablewhite. Are you sure? Positive. I got in touch with the solicitor's concerns. It was somewhat irregular, I admit, but I have a small hold over them in the form of work that I can't be troubled with, I pass over to them. Strictly speaking, they broke confidence with their client. But you see, I was thinking of your interests. But why should Godfrey want to see my mother's will? I'm afraid, my dear, the cruel truth is, it must be, to see if it's to his financial advantage to marry you. But he proposed before my mother died. He would have known then that I would one day inherit from her. But only in general terms. He wanted to know exactly how much and when. But why? Let me explain. To protect you from fortune hunters, I advise your mother to draw up her will so that you have nothing but a life interest in the property. What does that mean? It means that neither you nor your husband, if you should marry, can raise sixpence either on the property and land or the property and money. You would have the houses in London and Yorkshire and you would have the handsome income. But that is all. And is that not enough for Godfrey? Uh, that I don't know. It wouldn't be enough if he needed to raise a large sum of money quickly. But, of course, I know nothing of Godfrey Ablewhite's financial position. All I know is he has an interest in finding out what it would be when or if he marries you. And that's why I'm here now. I see it as my duty to put these facts before you. I thank you, Mr. Bruff. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you hear any rumours of my marriage when you get back to London, contradict them at once on my authority. So you mean to break your engagement? Of course. After what you have told me, it's unthinkable that I should marry Godfrey Ablewhite. You may find some difficulty in getting him to release you from your promise. Can you not advise me? Tell him the next time you see him alone. That you know about his mercenary motive, and that in the light of that knowledge, the marriage is simply impossible. Then put it to him whether he thinks it wisest to secure your silence by agreeing, or if he persists in holding you to the engagement, to force you to make the facts generally known. What if he denies it or tries to justify himself? In that case, refer him to me. Thank you for your advice, Mr. Bruff. But I can't follow it. You can't? Why ever not? Don't you see? I have believed in this man. I've promised to marry him. After giving that promise, how can I tell him to his face that he's the most contemptible of all things, a mere fortune hunter? 
I couldn't endure the shame of it. Your principles are admirable, my dear, but you cannot possibly withdraw from your engagement without giving him some reason. I shall say that I have thought it over, and I think it will be best for both of us if we do not marry. Is that all? And have you thought of what he may say on his side? He may say what he pleases. And what may public opinion say? I have braved public opinion once over the Moonstone. I can brave it again over this, Mr. Bruff. My mind was in a strange conflict over Rachel when I left her that day. She was obstinate, she was wrong, but she was admirable, deeply to be pitied. I made her promise to write to me the moment she had any news. On the evening of my return to London, before it was possible to have received any letter, I was surprised by a visit from Mr. Abel White the Elder, who told me that Godfrey had got his dismissal that very day. Moreover, he told me that Godfrey had accepted it, and so my view was proved. Godfrey Abelwhite needed a large sum of money by a given time. He'd found out he would get no help from Rachel's inheritance and had been set free in a very timely manner by Rachel's own act. What other theory would account for his rejecting an income which would have kept him in luxury for the rest of his life? How events turned out afterwards, you already know from Miss Clack. Miss Verinder honoured my wife and myself by making a long stay at our house in Hampstead until a new guardian was appointed, and Mrs. Meridew, a sister of the late Sir John Verinder. Now I must take the story of the Moonstone onwards a little. About a week or ten days after Rachel left us, one of my clerks handed me a card and said that the gentleman was waiting to speak to me. There was a foreign name, I forget now what it was, and a line written in English at the bottom of the card which I remember very well. Recommended by Mr. Septimus Luca. The audacity of somebody in Mr. Luca's position presuming to recommend anybody to me. I was just about to refuse to see the man when my clerk told me he thought he was an Indian. Convinced immediately that the moonstone was at the bottom of it, I had the man sent up. He was tall, he was dressed in European clothes, he was very polite and spoke excellent English, but he was unmistakably an Indian. I have come, sir, to ask you to lend me some money, and I leave this casket as an assurance that my debt will be paid back. Very beautiful. Indeed it is, sir. It is made of ebony. The jewels are diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. But I'm sure a gentleman in your position would know that. And you apply to me on Mr. Septimus Luca's recommendation? That is correct, sir. How is it that Mr. Luca did not lend you the money himself? Mr. Luca informed me, sir, that he had no money to lend. I'm sorry, but Mr. Luca is quite mistaken in sending you here. Like other men in my profession, I am trusted with money to lend, but I never lend it to strangers and never on such security as this. I see. Thank you, sir. Before I go, will you allow me to ask you one question? Most clients want to ask me 50. Pray ask your question. It is this, sir. Supposing it had been possible and customary for you to lend me the money, in what space of time would it have been customary for me to pay it back? According to the usual course pursued in this country, in one year from the date on which it was advanced to you. Thank you, sir. I am deeply indebted to you. I will take up no more of your time. Later that same afternoon, I had another caller, Mr. Septimus Luca. I made another unprofessional sacrifice to mere curiosity. I saw him. Uh, uh, Mr. Bruff, uh, uh, I owe you an apology. Uh, you, you've been troubled, I fear, by an Indian gentleman on my recommendation. Uh, pray allow me, sir, to explain how I came to commit this unpleasant pardonable breach of etiquette. Do not distress yourself, Mr. Luca. I am all attention. It was like this. This man called on me and asked me to lend him money. He produced a beautiful little casket and the ebony inlaid with precious stones as surety. As he did with me. Uh, yes. Well, uh, let me continue. Uh, the, the, the point is, Mr. Bruff, that, excuse me, but no doubt you've read in the newspapers of an unfortunate incident in which I was bound and gagged and robbed of a receipt by three men whom I took to be Indians, the, uh, by the language they spoke, that is. Oh, yes. the, so you will readily understand with what suspicion I regarded being approached again. 
by an Indian. And more than that, and this is what really frightened me, I recognised this man as one of the three whom I had had occasion to complain about to the magistrate. Uh, perhaps you heard of that too, how they kept annoying me and how I'd had to dismiss an Indian workman in ivory on suspicion of theft. Indeed, Mr uh, Luca, I remember that. Uh, yes, well, th th then imagine how I felt. I thought he'd come to kill me. I could only think of the quickest way of getting rid of him. When he asked me to lend him money, I told him I hadn't any. When he asked me to recommend someone else, I told him that usually the safest course was to consult a respectable solicitor. Uh, when he asked me to name one, yours was the only name that came into my head. Really, Mr. Bruffer, I, 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 I do beg your pardon, but, but I was terrified. The perspiration was pouring off me like rain. Yes, sir. yes, Mr. Luca. Uh, well, no harm seems to have come to you. <laughs> Or to me, for that matter. Perhaps we may consider the incident closed? Oh, I do hope so, Mr. Bruff. Oh, and uh, thank you for being so understanding. Just one thing. The, oh, uh, yes, Mr. Bruff. Did this Indian gentleman ask you a question as he was leaving? Uh, well, really, sir, I don't remember. Try. Yeah, well, let me see now. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, he comes back to me. <clears throat> Uh, he, he asked me, uh, supposing I could lend him the money, uh, the how soon I would want it back. He asked me exactly the same thing. And you know, I had the distinct impression that that was the only thing he really wanted to know. Oh, yes, Mr. Bruff. Curious. I wonder why he should want to know that. Well, uh, uh, thank you for your time, Mr. Bruff, and uh, I do hope you will overlook this breach of decorum on my part, but I was frightened for my life, sir, for my very life. I had a dinner engagement that evening, and among the guests, I discovered the Indian traveller, Mr. Murthwaite. I also discovered that he was as bored by the inevitable political small talk as much as I was. So I informed him of my close connection with the Herncastle family and with the Moonstone. I instantly had his whole attention. And have you seen anything lately of the Indians? I have every reason to believe that one of them came to see me in my office today. What? You astonish me, Mr. Bruff. He tried to borrow money from me on security of a jeweled casket. He was particularly interested in how long it would be before he had to pay the loan back. Supposing I'd given it to him, which I had it. He tried the same trick with Septimus Luca, the dealer in precious stones, with the same result. But he asked him how long before he had to pay back. Curious, that. But surely you see his object? I'm ashamed of my stupidity, but I'm afraid I don't. Let me ask you one question. How far have the Indians got in their conspiracy to steal the Moonstone? I have no idea. The Indian plot is a complete mystery to me. That's because you've never seriously examined it. I have. Will you allow me to take you through it? I should be obliged if you would. I'm beginning to think that if I'm to serve Miss Verinder's interests, I cannot know too much about this plot. Very well. Let us begin with the Indians themselves. It is quite clear, bearing in mind that these are men in the prime of life, not yet forty, shall we say, that they have succeeded to the men who followed Colonel Herncastle home from India. They have also succeeded to the organization. Organization, you say? You mean there's a great network of spies and informers they can rely on? Not a very large one, no, but sufficient for their purpose, I should say, to judge by their results so far. Now, what gave them their first chance of getting at the diamond? Why, that would be the death of Colonel Herncastle. Mm -hmm. And I suppose their organisation would have told them about that. Of course. Up to that time, the Moonstone was safe in the strong room of a bank. I'm sure that as a lawyer, you can imagine what their first course would be upon hearing of the Colonel's death. Try to see his will, to find out what was to happen to the diamond. They could get a copy of the doctor's comments. Exactly. Through one of those shady Englishmen I mentioned. And they would learn that the Moonstone was bequeathed to Miss Rachel Verinder, and that Mr. Blake the Elder, or some person appointed by him, was to place it in her hands. Their next difficulty was to decide whether to try and take the Moonstone when it was being removed from the bank in London, or wait until it was taken to the country house. They decided on Yorkshire as the safer course of action. How was it that they didn't try and take the Moonstone from Lady Verinder's house before Rachel's birthday? But that's where they must have thought it would be. Ah, but they did. Gabriel Bitteridge surprised them lurking about the terrace on the first night of Franklin Brake arriving there. But having made that mistake, they didn't come near the house for four or five weeks until Miss Verinder's birthday. But why not? Oh, probably because they'd made their own inquiries in the neighbourhood and had found out that Mr Blake had put the diamond in the bank. And if they hadn't known that, they would still have waited. No Indian Mr Bruff ever takes unnecessary risks. 
And which would have been the safer course? To try and take the diamond while it was being looked after by a young and active gentleman? Or to wait until it was in the possession of a young girl who would naturally take a great delight in wearing it at every opportunity? And the proof of that is surely that they made no more attempts upon the diamond until Miss Verinder's birthday. They had calculated that she would wear it that night. And they were quite right. I was at her dinner party. I saw her wearing it. And I sent the Indians packing. They were prevented from making any further attempts because the next day they were thrown into prison as rogues and vagabonds. And that, I may fairly say, ends the first act. Indeed. Well, so what happened next in the conspiracy? Well, now I'm coming to that. I was staying with some friends at Frising Hall at the time, and a day or two before the Indians were set free, the governor of the prison came to me with a letter addressed to them. It had come through the ordinary post to their lodging house, and the landlady had brought it to the prison. When he opened the letter, the governor found it was written in Hindustani. That's why he brought it to me for a translation. I made a copy in my pocketbook. Uh, let me see. What about the writing on the envelope? Oh, that was in English, though not in the usual manner of addressing an envelope. Ah, here it is. Read it for yourself, Mr. Bruff. In the name, in the name of the region of the night, whose seat is on the antelope, whose arms embrace the four corners of the earth, Brothers, turn your face to the south and come to me in the street of many noises which leads down to the muddy river. The reason is this. My own eyes have seen it. Why, it's a lead to the moonstone, is it not? Undoubtedly. In the Hindu mythology, the god of the moon is represented with four arms and is seated on an antelope. Furthermore, the envelope had a Lambeth postmark. Lambeth? That points to Mr. Luca. Right again. The prison authorities saw no reason to hold back the letter from the Indians when I had translated it for them. And what is the first thing the Indians do when they're set free? They go to the railway station and take a train to London. Now, what is the next news we hear of the Indians? The report in the newspaper that Mr. Luca has been annoyed by their loitering about his house in Lambeth. He applied to a magistrate for advice, I remember. And in his statement, he referred to a foreign workman. Native of India, I remember it perfectly. Quite. He said he'd been forced to dismiss him on suspicion of attempted theft. It's a pretty plain inference as to who wrote that letter, isn't it? And to which of Mr. Lucas' treasures he tried to steal. You mean the Moonstone? I do, I most certainly do. I've never doubted the Moonstone found its way into Mr. Lucas' hands, however much he may deny it. The question is, who put it there? Yes, that's what I've often asked myself. Somebody must have taken the Moonstone from Yorkshire to London, and somebody must have raised money on it, or it wouldn't have come to rest with Mr. Luca. And you say there's been no discovery made of who that person was? None that I know of. There was a story, was there not, about Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite? There was, but I can tell you that Mr. Abelwhite has been completely removed from suspicion. Is that the case? On what evidence? Somebody, it will be a breach of confidence to tell you who, somebody has sworn to his innocence, and I consider it evidence beyond dispute. Mm. Very well. Let us leave it to time to clear the matter up. Uh, to return to the Indians. Ah, yes. Pray do. Uh, their coming to London simply ended in their suffering another defeat. Thanks to Mr. Lucas' foresight in depositing the bootstone with his bankers. And in dismissing the Indian workman. He would have given the Indians invaluable assistance in getting into the house. So the position stands at present with the Indians knowing the Moonstone's whereabouts and quietly waiting, with their unlimited oriental patience, for another chance of taking it. Now... Do you see the object of the last question which the Indian put to you and to Mr. Luca? Of course. He wanted to know when he could expect the Moonstone to be taken out of pledge. That's when they'll try again. Without a shadow of a doubt. Observe the cleverness with which they work. First they find out from Mr. Luca how long it is customary to wait before repaying a loan. Then they check that statement from a respectable authority. Yourself, Mr. Bruff. More than that, they took the receipt when they searched Mr. Lucas so they know when the Moonstone was deposited at the bank. They therefore know the earliest date at which it can be taken out of the bank. And they will be waiting, you can be sure of that. Now, when do you think, at a rough guess, that the Moonstone found its way into Mr. Lucas' possession? Oh, as well as I can reckon it, towards the end of last June. So, if the unknown person who pledged the Moonstone can redeem it in a year, it will be in that person's possession again at the end of June, 1849. I shall be thousands of miles away, but it may be worth your while, Mr. Bruff, to be in London at that time. Going off among the savages again, Mr. Murthwit? Rather new than me. I think... 
I shall be safer among the fiercest fanatics of Central Asia than I should be if I crossed the door of the bank with the moonstone in my pocket. The Indians have been defeated twice running. It's my firm belief they won't be defeated a third time. I made a note of the date, end of June 49, in my pocketbook. And now I hand the pen to the writer who follows me, Mr. Franklin Blake himself. In the spring of the year 1849, I was wandering on the borders of a desert in the east. One day, a letter reached my camp bearing a black mourning border. I opened it immediately. It informed me that my father was dead, that I was heir to his great fortune, and that Mr. Bruff begged me to lose no time in returning to England. At dawn the next day I was on my way home and eventually arrived in Yorkshire. Mr. Franklin, <laughs> as I live by bread... Betteridge. <laughs> Home at last. And how are you, sir? No need to ask. You look fighting fit. And you get younger, Betteridge, with every year that no, passes. No, 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 not so, sir. Not so, not so. Oh, but there have been sad changes since you went away. The house all shut up and the servants gone, but I'll cook your dinner and the gardener's wife will make your bed. Betteridge, my dear old friend, I cannot enter this house tonight. What's that you say? You not enter this house where you spent the happiest years of your life. That's all gone and will never come again. But my lady would... Uh, you know about my lady? I do, Betteridge, I do. No, but I was thinking about Rachel. This is her house now, and I cannot enter it and eat in it and sleep in it as things are between us. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. Have you seen Miss Rachel since your return? Oh, would that I had. You know she's under Miss Meridue's guardianship now. Oh, yes, 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 a sister of Sir John. A widow, is she not? Yes, and I've been to her house in Portland Place, but Rachel won't see me. She won't even write to me. I own it cuts deep, Betteridge, and that's why I cannot come in. Now, I shall walk over to Frising Hall and stay at the hotel. Oh, there's no need to do that, sir. There's Hotherston's farm nearby, and you can hardly object to that. Hotherston lives on his own freehold. Uh, they let rooms to anglers and artists and such like. And are they free now? Uh, Mrs. Hotherston asked for my good word to recommend them only yesterday. Oh, then I'll take them. And you must come and have breakfast with me tomorrow. I'm heartily sorry, sir, to hear the way things still are between you and Miss Rachel. I had hoped they were all smoothed over by now. Well, so had I. But she still can't forgive me for that business of the Moonstone. And uh, that's why I'm here now. You've... Oh, sir, you've not come to take that up again. I have, Betteridge. I've got to get to the bottom no, of sir. it. No, sir. No, sir. Let it be. That cursed diamond has misguided everybody who's come near it. No, 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 no. Let it be, no, Mr. Franklin. Betteridge, I can't. It's as simple as that. I can't. It's the only way I can see to put things right again between Rachel and me. Have you thought, sir? Supposing you make any discoveries, what you might find out about Miss Rachel? I'm as sure of her as you are. Now, whatever I find out, nothing can alter my opinion of her. The question is, how on earth do I begin when even the great Sergeant Cup failed. I can put you on the track, Mr. Franklin, if you're sure you want me to. You, Betteridge? Well, in heaven's name, how? Do you remember Rosanna Spearman? Of course! I always thought the poor girl was trying to make some sort of confession to me about the Moonstone. I think you can find out what that confession was. Whenever you please. What? She left a letter, sir. A letter addressed to you. Have you got it? No, sir. And where is it? At the fishing village, Cobb's Hole. Lucy Yolland has it. But why wasn't it sent on to me? Because Rosanna also left Lucy a note, in which she said your letter was to be given into your hands and no other way. Uh. Lucy had such a regard for Rosanna that nothing would make her part with it. And besides, you'd left for abroad before I could write to you. Well, let's go and get it at once. Wouldn't do any good, sir. They're great savers of candles along our coast, and they go to bed very early at Cobb's Hole. We could be there in half an hour. <laughs> you might, sir. And when you get there, you'd find the door locked and bolted. Much better wait until tomorrow. I'll come with you. Early? 
as early as you like, sir. I didn't wait for breakfast at the farm next morning. I took a crust of bread in my hand and set out. I had some misgivings that I might surprise Betteridge in his bed, but I found him ready and waiting with his stick in his hand. Good morning, Mr. Franklin. A good night at the farm. I own I didn't sleep much. Too excited. Now you this morning. Very poorly, sir. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. What's the trouble? A new disease, sir. I don't want to alarm you, but you're certain to catch it before the morning is out. The devil I am. It'll lay hold of you at Cobb's Hole. I first caught it in the company of Sergeant Cuff. And I call it the detective fever. <laughs> Sergeant Cuff. Yes, I might want a few words with him. I'm afraid he's retired now, sir. Got a little cottage at Dorking and up to his eyes in the growing of roses. Well, then I must do without his help. I assume you know all that has happened regarding the Moonstone while you've been abroad. Yes, Mr. Bruff told me everything as soon as I got back. To tell you the truth, Betteridge, the one grain of consolation I found was the fact that Rachel withdrew from her marriage engagement to Godfrey Abelwhite. How she could have contemplated it, I really don't know. Lucy Yolland insisted on taking me down to the beach before she would give me the letter. She led me behind some boats out of the sight and hearing of the few people in the village. She had a limp, it is true, but also remarkably beautiful hair. And there was a fierce keenness in her eyes. That she had no love for me was obvious from the start. So you are Mr. Franklin Blake? I am. Perhaps you'd like to see some formal identification before you give me the letter. I believe I have a note here from my lawyer, Mr. No, Brown. I don't want any lawyer's notes. Mr. Betteridge brought you. That's good enough for me. I just want to look at you first. I just want to see you with her eyes. <coughs> well, if you insist... I do insist. It's the least you can do for her. No. I can't see what you saw in your face. Oh, your eyes. I can't hear what she heard in your voice, the poor daft thing. You know, she'd be living now if it weren't for you, Franklin Blake. What? I scarcely knew the girl. I certainly never encouraged her in any way. Oh, to... no, you wouldn't, would you, with a shoulder like hers? Oh, she was in love with you, God rest her. In love? Yes. No, I can't see why. You're not even average height. Now, look here. And that's why she killed herself, because you never noticed her. Oh, but for you, we'd have been in London now, living together like sisters and earning an honest living from our needles. Oh, I suppose that doesn't seem much to you, does it? But it's better than living in service to someone like you, who tears your heart out every time he looks at you. Here, take your letter. I don't know what's in it, and I don't care. All I hope is, I never set eyes on you again. Extraordinary girl. She must be mad. Well, now, this letter. If you want to know the meaning of my behaviour to you while you are staying at Lady Verinder's, do what the enclosed instructions tell you to do. Your humble servant, Rosanna Spearman. Go to the shivering sand at the turn of the tide. What on earth? Walk out on the south spit until you get to the beacon and the coast guard station in line. Mr Franklin, I can't stand it any longer. What does it say? Here, read it yourself. Go to Shivering Sand, turn of tide, get beacon and coast guard station in line, lay a stick down on the rocks. I knew it, sir. I knew it. Knew what, Betteridge? And you're right, man. I have got the detective fever. So, what does all this rigmarole mean? Sergeant Cuff said it all along. From first to last, sir, he said she'd got a note of how to get to the hiding place, and this is it. Lord, save us. Here's the secret that puzzled even the great Cuff, ready and waiting to show itself to you. Now then, at the turn of the tide, she says, it's the ebb now, but when's the turn? There's young Duffy over at the net, so you'll know. Duffy! Duffy, hello! How long till the turn of the tide? Oh, about half an hour, I should say. Come along, Mr Franklin. We can just get round to the south spit before the turn, but we must hurry. It's 
wasn't it? Refresh my memory. What part did Rosanna Spearman play in all this? Sergeant Cuff thought that she was shielding someone, sir. Rachel? Uh, out with it, Betteridge. We'll be facing the truth in a few minutes, like it or not. Yes, sir. He thought Miss Rachel had taken Rosanna into her confidence. And there were suspicious circumstances. Rosanna saying she was ill in her room when really she was over in Frising Hall buying the stuff for a servant's nightgown. Did Sergeant Cuff prove that to his satisfaction? Oh, yes, sir. Had it from Maltby, the linen draper, that she bought the material. He suspected that she'd hidden the old one, but he could never prove it. Why should she make a nightgown? Because it was she who smeared the paint on the door with her own when she was visiting Miss Rachel in the early hours of the morning, before the paint was dry. But supposing that to be true, why hide it? It might accidentally come to light. If it was evidence against Rosanna Spearman, surely she'd have destroyed it, burnt it, or thrown it in the quicksand. That's what puzzled the sergeant. I don't think he liked to think, sir, that a servant girl had got the better of him. She bought a tin trunk and some chain from Mr. Yolland, and that's how she hid it. Somewhere out there, in the water. Nothing, Betteridge. Let's have your stick. Here you are, sir. She says we're to lay it along the edge of the rocks on the side overlooking the quicksand. Right. What next? Feel along the stick among the seaweed. She says you'll find the chain. I can't find any chain. Only seaweed. Get your hand well in among the weeds, sir. It might have grown up a lot since Rosanna hid it here. Wait a minute. Huh? What's this? Have you found it, sir? Uh, I think so. It's deep in among the weeds. Uh, yes, I've got it. Uh, yeah, it's come free. There. Oh. Oh. Well, there it is, Betridge. It's all rusty, sir. Let's hope it's watertight. And it's rusted fast. Never mind. Let's grip it between my knees. Now. Uh. Uh. Got it! Oh, well done, sir. Well done. Now uh, then. There's no water inside. A letter. My name on it. A linen, sir. A nightgown. Well, let's open it out and see. Yes. Yes, it's a nightgown, all right. And is there a stain of paint on it, sir? No, no. Not this side, so far as I can see. Turn it over, sir. Turn it over. Here, let me help you. Yes. Yes, there it is, Betteridge. Look! This trifle of yours, Superintendent Seagrave, has grown a little in importance since you've noticed it. We have now to look for an article of dress in this house with a smear of paint on it and to ask the owner of that article how he or she can account for being in Miss Verinder's sitting room in the early hours of Thursday morning. If that person can't satisfy us, we haven't far to look for the hand that took the diamond. Mr. Franklin, sir. Hmm? Uh, yes, Betridge? I said, is there a name in the nightgown? Oh, yes. Wait a minute. Let's see. Oh, my God. What's the matter, sir? Betteridge. The name is my own. This is my nightgown. It's mine. That was part four of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Brian Gear. The cast, Sergeant Cuff, John Franklin Robbins, Gabriel Betteridge, John Sharp, Franklin Blake, John Telfer, Rachel Verinder, Sally Baxter, Godfrey Abelwhite, Geoffrey Beavers, Mr Bruff, Nat Brenner, Miss Clack, June Barry, Mr Abelwhite, Godfrey Kenton, Aunt Abelwhite, Margot Boyd, Mr. Murthwaite, Gordon DeLue, 
Septimus Luca, Adrian Egan, the Indian, Geoffrey Searle, Lucy Yolland, Liza Flanagan, and Duffy, Debbie Cumming. The music was composed and conducted by Sidney Sega, and the programme, which came from Bristol, was directed by Brian Miller. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio in six parts by Brian Gear, with music composed by Sidney Sager. The Moonstone, part five. I do not clearly remember anything immediately after the appalling discovery at the Shivering Sand... The discovery that the nightgown Rosanna Spearman had hidden in the tin trunk was my nightgown. <sighs> my first proper recollection is of sitting with Gabriel Betteridge in his little room back at the house, with a glass of grog before me on the table. Now, Mr Franklin, there's one thing certain. That's a liar to begin with, that nightgown. Betteridge, I know no more about taking the moonstone than you do, but there is the evidence against me. The paint on the nightgown and my name on the nightgown are facts. Take another sip of grog, Mr Franklin. You'll soon stop believing in facts. But I can't... No buts, Mr Franklin. Foul play. There's foul play somewhere in all this, and we must find it out. Hmm. Now, what about the letter? Oh, good heavens, I'd forgotten all about it. Let's see now. There's pages of it. Is it from Rosanna? Um, yes. Wait a minute. She came from a reformatory, didn't she? Hadn't she been a thief? And what if she had? Well, isn't it likely that she stole the moonstone? How do we know that she didn't purposely smear my nightgown with the paint? And then hide it so that no one could find it? <laughs> doesn't make sense, sir. No, no, you're right, it doesn't. Now, what does it say in the letter? The letter? Oh, yes. Let's see. Sir... I have something to tell you. Sometimes such misery may be told in very few words. In my case, in three words, I love you. In the name of heaven, Betteridge. Go on reading, sir. I couldn't tell you this if I didn't know that I would be dead by the time you read it. You will find the hiding place and then you will find your nightgown with the paint on it. And you will want to know why I took the trouble to hide it. Well, the reason is in those same three words. Because I love you. Do you remember when you came out on us from among the sand hills that morning, looking for Mr Betteridge? I fell in love with you in that moment. You were like a prince in a fairy story. I suppose you'll laugh at this, but please don't. It's deadly serious to me. Oh, yes, I know all about the difference in our stations in life. And I know all about my deformed shoulder. But I know all about my heart, too. And that didn't lie. Neither did my tears at night. I cried because you never noticed me. Why should you? Except that I wanted you to. And of course I hated Miss Rachel. Oh, how I hated her. She used to give you roses to wear in your buttonhole, didn't she? Ah, oh, yes, but more often than not you wore my rose instead. I used to sneak in and put a rose in your glass of water and throw hers away. Anyway, about the diamond. As you know, Superintendent Seagrave began by setting a guard on all the women's bedrooms, and we all chased after him to ask what he meant by it. We found him in Miss Rachel's sitting room. He pointed to the smear on the door and said, look at the damage we'd done already, and sent us away again. Afterwards, I stopped a moment on one of the landings to see if I got the paint on my dress. While I was doing this, Penelope Betteridge came by. You needn't bother looking for paint on your skirts, Rosanna. Oh? Why not? I was nearest the door just now, I think. So you may have been, but that paint's been dry for hours. If that policeman hadn't set a watch on our bedrooms, I might have told him so. What an insult! Thinking one of us might have stolen Miss Rachel's diamond makes my blood boil, it does. How can you be sure about the paint? What? After all, I suffer from the smell of Mr Franklin's blessed vehicle, which I had to mix up for him. Oh, there's nothing I don't know about it. Miss Rachel asked him if it would be dry in time for the dinner company to see it last night, and Mr Franklin said no, it wouldn't be dry for twelve hours. 
Well, it was just past three in the afternoon when they finished it. That means it was dry by three o'clock this morning. So none of us could have done it just now, could we? Perhaps some of the ladies did go upstairs to look at it last night, after all. Well, even if they did, that door was all right when I left Miss Rachel in bed at midnight. Shouldn't you tell the policeman, Penelope? I wouldn't tell him after the way he's treated us. Not if he paid me for it. So there. Then I went in to make your bed and put your room tidy. There was your nightgown lying over the bed where you'd thrown it. I picked it up to fold it and saw the paint from Miss Rachel's door. For a moment, I was rooted to the spot. Then I ran with your nightgown to my room and locked the door and sat down to think what it meant. It meant you were in Miss Rachel's sitting room between midnight and three Thursday morning. That's what it meant. You can guess what I first thought, but I wasn't sure. For if you had been foolish enough to forget to take care of the wet door, Miss Rachel would never have let you carry away evidence like that against her. At the same time, I wasn't completely certain that I'd proved my suspicion to be wrong. So I decided to keep the nightgown, to see what use I could make of it. But of course it would be missed. There was only one thing for it. I'd have to make another nightgown exactly like it before Saturday when the laundry woman came. I locked your nightgown in my drawer and went back to your room to make sure there was no paint on any of your other things. There wasn't, except a few streaks on your flannel dressing gown, and I got rid of those by scraping them away. Later on, we were all questioned by Superintendent Seagrave, and Penelope came out of the room quite beside herself. That dreadful man thinks I did it. I know he does. Did what, Penelope? Stole Miss Rachel's diamond, of course. But why? Simply because I was the last one to be in her sitting room where it was in the Indian cabinet. The very idea. I've been brought up with Miss Rachel from a girl. Oh, that dreadful man, he'll have me disgraced. I know he will. Then I thought, if the last person in the room is to be suspected, then the last person was you, Mr Franklin, and I hold the evidence. This seemed to open such a chance of bringing myself to your notice that I passed in a moment from suspecting to believing. And the reason you've been so busy trying to help the police was simply to draw suspicion away from yourself. I saw my opportunity, and I came down to you in the library. Yes, what is it? Excuse me, sir, but you left one of your rings upstairs and I brought it down to you. Oh, thank you, Spearman. Just leave it on the table there, would you? Yes, sir. Sir? Yes? This is a strange thing about the diamond, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it is, indeed. They'll never find the diamond, will they? No, nor the person who took it. I'll answer for that. What are you talking about, girl? That made you look at me. And just then I heard Mr Betridge's step outside the door. That spoilt it all. I only just had time to get out of the room. When I got back to the servants' hall, the bell was going for dinner. Afternoon already, and the material for the new nightgown still to be got. I pretended I wasn't well and went to Frising Hall for the stuff. On the Friday morning, there was the new nightgown all ready to go back in your drawer. And even its newness wouldn't give it away, because you'd had all new things when you got back from abroad. The next thing I heard was that the sergeant had come round by his own road to my opinion, that the owner of the stained article of dress was the thief. Not even you. Good heavens, Betridge, this is unbelievable. I didn't know any of this. Why should you, sir? There's no governing the human heart, is there? Now, who can that be? Come in. Oh, uh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Betteridge. I didn't know you were engaged. I bought you the list for next week, that's all. Oh, thank you, Mr. Jennings. Yes, I'll see to it. Uh, would you care to join us in a glass of grog? No, thank you, Mr. Betteridge. I have some calls to make. Who was that, if I may ask? Ezra Jennings, Mr Candy's assistant. Candy? Candy? You remember, sir, the little doctor you had that argument with on Miss Rachel's birthday? Oh, yes. Told me I ought to go through a course of medicine if I was ever to get a good night's sleep again. You were rather sharp with him, sir. <laughs> so I was. He caught a severe chill going home in the storm. He was delirious for days. It left him just a shadow of his former self. And what's happened to his practice? Mr Jennings does it. The poor aren't fussy about who doctors them, and that's mostly all the practice is now. You don't seem to like him. No one likes him, sir. There's a story that Mr Candy took with him a very doubtful character. That list he left with you, what is it? Hmm? This? Oh, it's the sick people hereabouts who stand in need of a little wine. 
My lady always had a regular distribution of good, sound port and sherry among the infirm poor, and Miss Rachel wishes the custom to be kept up. Uh, shall we go on with the letter, sir? Yes, but uh, you read it for a while, would you, Betteridge? Uh, very well, sir. She'd made the nightgown. Uh, go on from there. Yes, sir. Sergeant Cuff would be sure to examine all our linen and dresses. There was nowhere safe from him. For the time being, I decided... to wear it under my dress. The next thing that happened, I was told to take the washing book to Sergeant Cuff. He looked at me as if I was a stranger, and he was very polite in thanking me for bringing the book. Both bad signs, I thought. Then it was time for you to come back from seeing Mr Godfrey off by the railway. I went to the shrubbery to try for another chance of speaking to you. But you never appeared. And what was worse, Sergeant Cuff and Mr Betteridge came along and Sergeant Cuff saw me where I was hiding. I thought I'd better get back to work before any more disasters happened. Just as I was going to step across the path, you came back. You were making straight for the shrubbery when you saw me. And you turned away and went into the house. So I... No, I swear I didn't see her. I was going to take a walk in the shrubbery, but I remembered at that moment that my aunt might want to see me and change my mind, that's all. I went into the laundry room. It was empty, and I sat down to have a think. There was talk about your debts. Penelope had heard Miss Rachel talking about them. Mr Betridge spoke of them too. So it was plain enough that you'd stolen the diamond to raise money on it. Well, I could have told you of a man in London who would have given you plenty and no questions asked. Why didn't I speak to you about it? The truth is I lost my nerve the moment you looked at me. I'd gone as near as I dared when I spoke to you in the library... Then Penelope came into the laundry room and gave me something else to think about. Oh, I really don't know how I can put up with Miss Rachel's temper. I never knew her like this. Anyway, perhaps I won't have to much longer. Why is that? Oh, she says she can't bear the house with a policeman in it. And she's going to speak to my lady this evening and go to her Aunt Ablewhite's tomorrow. One thing's for sure. If she goes, so will Mr Franklin. You mean he'll go with her? Oh, no. It's him she's in a temper with. No, if Miss Rachel goes one way, Mr Franklin will go another. Unless they make it up before tomorrow. What have they quarrelled about, do you know? Oh, it's all on Miss Rachel's side. I'm afraid he's far too fond of her to quarrel with her. It's all Miss Rachel's temper, that's what it is. Then there came a message that all the indoor servants were to be questioned one by one by the sergeant. My turn came after the upper housemaid and my lady's maid. He tried to wrap it up but I could tell that those two creatures had opened his eyes to some of the truth. He knew I'd made a new nightgown, but he thought it was my own. But what puzzled me was that he let me see, on purpose, I think, that he suspected me of having something to do with the loss of the diamond, but only as acting under somebody else's orders. But I couldn't think who that might be, and I still can't. One thing was plain. You were safe as long as the nightgown was safe, and not a moment longer but at any second I might find myself charged on suspicion and searched accordingly. I had to choose between destroying the nightgown or finding a safe hiding place for it. I think if I had been less in love with you, I should have destroyed it. But how could I destroy the only thing which proved I'd saved you? So I thought of the shivering sand. It was never far from my thoughts, as Mr Betteridge knows. I made the first excuse that came into my head and got leave to go out for a breath of fresh air. I went straight to Mr Yolland's cottage at Cobb's Hole. His wife and daughter were the best friends I had. But don't think I told them your secret. I told nobody. I'm writing this letter up in Lucy's room, and I've taken off the nightgown. From Mr Yolland's beach combings, I shall take a small tin trunk to hide the nightgown in the sand. And then what? I must try and speak to you again. If you leave the house, as Penelope says you will, I shall have lost my chance forever. But if I miss you, or you are as cruel to me as you have been, then goodbye to life, which has grudged me the happiness it gives to others. But it may not end like that. I may find you in a good humour tonight, or tomorrow morning. Besides, I shan't improve my plain face by fretting, shall I? Who knows, but I might have filled all these pages for nothing. I beg to remain, sir, your true lover and humble servant. Rosanna Spearman. Oh, God, Betridge, that poor wretch. Don't upset yourself, sir. You didn't make her fall in love with you. 
The way she puts it, I almost feel I did. But when she thought I was cutting her, I swear I was only trying to help. You see, I, I thought Cuff suspected her, and glad though I'd have been to see his suspicions diverted from Rachel. Not at that cost. I just couldn't bring myself to stoop to that. That's why I kept on playing when she tried to speak to me in the billiard room. To help her. I thought she wanted to confess to some part in taking the diamond. Now, that would have been on the Friday night after she'd wrote the letter. Then, the next morning, when she wanted to see me in the shrubbery walk, Cuff was trying to make me tell him what she'd said to me in the billiard room. And so, to warn her, I said loudly, I took no interest in Rosanna Spearman, and she misunderstood. It must have been that. That was the last straw. If only I'd let her speak. We'd have been at the point where we are now. And Rosanna Spearman might still be alive today. Take my advice, sir, and dismiss that thought from your mind. You still have to untangle yourself from this mess. Now, have you any plan? No, only to see Mr Bruff tonight and lay it all before him. Walk me to the station, Betteridge. There's a good chap. Betteridge? Was I drunk the night of Rachel's birthday? You drunk? Why, it's your greatest defect of character, Mr Franklin, that you only drink with your dinner. Yes, but, <laughs> but that night, I might have had a drop too much. No, sir. I'll tell you what did happen. You looked so wretched ill, we persuaded you to have a drop of brandy and water to cheer you up a bit. Precisely. I'm, I'm not used to brandy and water. It's possible... No, sir, it isn't. I know you're not used to brandy and water, and to my eternal shame, I drowned half a glass of our 50-year-old cognac in a tumbler full of cold water. A baby couldn't have got drunk on what you had that night. I see. Well, what about this? You saw a great deal of me here when I was a boy. Did you ever know me to walk in my sleep? Never. Oh. Are you sure? Perfectly. You never walked in your sleep in your life. I see what you're driving at, but uh, it won't do. Why not? Well, suppose you did take the jewel when you were drunk or walking in your sleep or both together, if you like. Mm -hmm. That doesn't explain what's happened since. It doesn't explain how you took the jewel to London and pledged it to Mr Septimus Luca. Were you drunk or walking in your sleep when you did those two things? No, sir. The sooner you put your head together with Mr Bruffs, the sooner you'll get an explanation for all this. We reached the station with only a minute or two to spare... Just as I was saying goodbye to Betteridge, I happened to glance towards the book and newspaper stall. And there was Mr Candy's assistant again. Our eyes met at the same moment. Ezra Jennings took off his hat to me, and I returned the salute. I arrived in London far too late to see Mr Bruff at his office, so I drove straight to his home at Hampstead, and disturbed him dozing in his chair, his bottle of wine at his elbow. He examined the nightgown which I'd brought with me and then read Rosanna Spearman's letter from beginning to end. In my opinion, this letter explains Rachel's extraordinary conduct. She believes you have stolen the moonstone. That had occurred to me too. I just couldn't bear to believe it. The first thing to do is to appeal to Rachel. She must be persuaded, or forced if necessary, to tell us why she thinks you took the diamond. The chances are that the whole of this case will fall to pieces if only we can get Rachel to speak out. Do you really think so? Listen to me. Admittedly, this is your nightgown, and admittedly, it has a smear of paint on it from Rachel's door. But what evidence is there that you were the person wearing it the night Rachel's diamond was lost? Now, as to this letter of Rosanna Spearman's, it merely proves her to have been clever at deception, and that justifies me in suspecting her of not having told the whole truth. I won't start any theory. I will only say that if Rachel has suspected you on the evidence of the nightgown alone, the chances are that it was Rosanna who showed it to her. Because she hated Rachel. Because it would serve her purpose to stir up a quarrel between us. Exactly. She had not decided on destroying herself then, remember. But suppose it turns out that I did wear the nightgown. What then? Well, if that were to be proved, we'd have a job to prove you innocent of taking the moonstone. But we won't go into that now. We'll wait and see whether Rachel hasn't suspected you on the evidence of the nightgown only. Good God! What right has Rachel to suspect me on any evidence of being a thief? Sensible question. Rather hotly put, but worth considering, nonetheless. Search your memory and tell me this. Did anything happen while you were staying at the house to, uh, to uh, shake her belief in your principles generally? 
Mm, no, I, I don't think so. Frankly, and I know your affairs rather better than you do yourself. Did any of your debts turn up on the doorstep in Yorkshire? Yes. Yes, you're right, they did. I, I'd completely forgotten. There was a Frenchman who appeared just before Rachel's birthday. After money? <sighs> I'm afraid so. It turned into rather an ugly scene, and, and Aunt Julia and Rachel were in the next room and overheard. What happened? I'm ashamed to say that Aunt Julia paid the man what he wanted on the spot. Oh, it was an awful business. I was, well, rather tight for money as usual, and I'd borrowed some from a man who kept a small restaurant in Paris. When the time came, I couldn't pay it back. And meanwhile, he'd gone bankrupt and sent a relative of his to England to find me and get the money. What view of this did your Aunt Julia take? Oh, she was very annoyed with me for being so careless and putting myself in such a position. Then Rachel started on me. You know what high romantic principles she has. Said I was heartless and dishonourable. Not without some reason. I know. Well, things were rather cool between us for a while, but, but I made my peace with her the next day. I thought no more of it. But perhaps she remembered it when the diamond was lost. It would have had its effect on her mind. You may be sure of that. Mm. Now then, Rachel must be our next step. But the great difficulty is going to be to get her to show her whole mind in the matter without reserve. Have you any suggestions to offer? I have made up my mind to speak to Rachel myself. You? Well, in cases of this extraordinary kind, the rash way is sometimes the best. And you have a chance in your favour which I don't possess. A, a chance in my favour? I don't trust your discretion and I don't trust your temper. But I do trust in Rachel preserving some perverse weakness for you. The question is, how are you to see her? May I venture to suggest, if nothing was said about me beforehand, that I might see her here? Cool. But may I? In plain English, my house is to be turned into a trap to catch Rachel, with a bait in the shape of my wife and daughters. If you were anyone else than Franklin Blake, and if this matter were one atom less serious, I should refuse point blank. As it is... Consider me your accomplice. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bruff. But when? Say the day after tomorrow. Stay at home all morning and expect me to call on you and tell you precisely when to be here. Two days later, as the clock of Hampstead Church struck three, I put the key into the door of Mr. Bruff's back garden wall. The garden was deserted. I went into the conservatory and crossed the small drawing room as Mr. Bruff had told me. Facing me was the door of the music room. At the other side of that door was Rachel. I own my courage almost failed me. My hands were trembling. I wanted to turn and run. So much depended on it. My good name, my future happiness. What would Rachel's reaction be? I began to feel all Mr. Bruff's doubts about the rightness of what I was doing. The moment I showed myself in the doorway, Rachel turned from the piano. She stood stock still looking at me. I took a few steps towards her and stopped. Slowly, as if in a dream, she advanced towards me. I forgot every consideration, past, present and future, which I was bound to remember. I caught her in my arms and covered her face with kisses. There was a moment when I thought the kisses were returned. Then, with a cry of horror, with a strength I could not have resisted, she pushed me away. Oh, you coward! You coward! I beg your pardon if I have offended you. How low can you sink? Only a coward would sneak in here and try and play upon my weakness for you. Perhaps. But you have done me an infamous wrong. I have done you a wrong. After what you have done, you can say that. Then you must be mad. You must be. No, Rachel, I am not mad. But you suspect me of stealing the Moonstone. I've never known the reason why, and that is why I'm here today. Let me ask you this. Was it because Rosanna Spearman showed you my nightgown with a smear of paint on it? What on earth are you talking about? Rosanna Spearman showed me your nightgown? Of course she didn't. Why should she? <sighs> because my nightgown has come to light with that paint on it, and there seems every reason to believe that whoever was wearing it stole the Moonstone. I have desperately clung to the hope that someone else wore it to throw suspicion onto me. So I ask you again, if it wasn't the nightgown, what made you suspect me? I don't suspect you. I know you stole the moonstone. Oh, Rachel, that is nonsense. I know I didn't. But I didn't, I tell you. And I tell you I saw you. I saw you steal the moonstone. What? You, you, you saw me? Yes. 
Ra Rachel, I... I can't explain the contradiction, but, but I swear before God that until now I did not know I had taken the Moonstone. Do you believe me? I believe what I saw. Rachel, I want you to tell me everything that happened, from the time you wished me good night to the time you saw me take the diamond. Why go back to it? How can you go back to it? Because we are both the victim of some monstrous delusion that has worn the mask of truth. If we look at it together, if we look at what happened that night, we may end in understanding each other yet. Very well. What do you want to ask me? After we'd said good night, did you go to bed or did you sit up? I went to bed. Did you notice the time? Was it late? Not very. About midnight, I think. And did you go to sleep? No. I couldn't sleep that night. Oh. I was thinking of you. Was there a light in your room? No. Uh, yes. I got up again and lit my candle. When was that? About one o'clock. I put on my dressing gown and I was going into my sitting room to get a book. I had just opened my bedroom door when I saw a light under the door from the landing and I heard footsteps coming towards it. I thought it was Mama. She tried to make me give her the diamond to look after for the night. I thought she was coming to see if I was awake and to speak to me about it. And what did you do? I blew out my candle. I wanted to keep my diamond. Ah, did you go back to bed? I had no chance. The minute I blew the light out, the sitting room door opened. And you came in carrying your bedroom candle. What was I wearing? Your nightgown. Are you certain? Quite certain. Could you see my face? Yes, clearly. Were my eyes open or shut? Open. Was there anything strange about them? Were they fixed or staring? No. They were very bright, I remember, but quite normal. You looked about you as if you were afraid of being found where you ought not to have been. But apart from that, there, there was nothing strange about me? No, nothing. So what did you do? I was petrified. I couldn't call out. I couldn't even move to shut my door. C could I see you where you were standing? You might have done, but you never looked towards me. Anyway, would you have taken the diamond if you had seen me there looking at you? The next thing to happen was that you went to my Indian cabinet. Then my back must have been towards you. How could you have seen my hands? There are three glasses in my sitting room. I could see your hands in one of them. You put your candle on top of the cabinet, and then you opened and shut one drawer after another until you came to the one with the moonstone in it. You looked at it for a moment, and then put your hand in and took it. How can you be sure I really took the moonstone out of the drawer? I saw it gleaming in your fingers. There is no doubt you took the moonstone out of my cabinet. Did I close the drawer? No. The diamond was in your left hand. You took the candle in your right, and you stood still for what seemed a long time. I could see your face in the glass. You looked as though you were thinking and were dissatisfied with your thoughts. Then you seemed to rouse yourself and went straight out of the room. Did I close the door after me? No. Your light disappeared along the passage and the sound of your steps died away. And I was left alone in the dark. Did anything happen between then and the time when the whole house knew the Moonstone was lost? No, nope, nothing. Are you sure? Perhaps you fell asleep. I never slept. I didn't go back to bed. <sighs> nothing happened until Penelope came in at the usual time in the morning. Have you anything else to ask me? <sighs> if you had spoken when you ought to have spoken, if only you, you had explained you yourself... You are unbelievable! I spare you when my heart is breaking. I scream you when my own character is at stake. And now you tell me I ought to have explained myself. What did you expect? That I should come to you and say, Franklin, dear, you are a thief. My love, you have stolen my diamond. I would rather have lost 50 diamonds than see your face lying to me as I see it lying but, now. Rachel, I, I'm sorry to have caused you this fresh pain. I, I think I'd better go now. No! It seems I owe you a justification of my conduct. Well, you shall have one. What I should have done, of course, was to raise the house and tell them what had happened. But I didn't do that. I thought and thought for hours. And then I wrote you a letter. But I didn't receive it. I know you didn't receive it. My letter said that I had reason to know you were in debt. There'd been that man from France, do you remember? Yes. And I remember how much it had disturbed you. So you would have known what I was referring to. And I also offered you the loan of as large a sum of money as I could get. I would even have pledged the Moonstone myself if there had been no other way. And then, 
Just as I was going to arrange with Penelope to give you the letter, what do I hear? I hear that you, you had brought the police into it. You were busying yourself trying to find the diamond. You even had the audacity to speak to me about it when all the time the diamond was in your own hands. I could scarcely believe that you of all people could be so false and cunning. So I tore the letter up. But even then I hoped I could save you. Somebody told me you were on the terrace. I forced myself to go down. I forced myself to speak to you. Do you remember what I said? Perfectly. But you must believe me, Rachel, when I say that I did not know what you meant. It, it astonished me. It, it distressed me. But it didn't give me an inkling of the truth. That's just the expression you wore on your face then. Oh. How can you persist in this charade after all this time? This charade of injured innocence? But in my own eyes, I was innocent. <sighs> So how could I have understood what you were trying to say to me? Those, those veiled hints and suggestions did no more than make me uneasy about you. You should have spoken out. How dare you tell me what I should or should not have done? Is there no limit to your audacity? And besides, if I had spoken out in front of other people, you would have been disgraced for life. If I had spoken to you alone, you would have denied everything just as you're denying it now. I tell you, I shrank from the horror of it. You led me to expect we would understand each other after all this. Well, do we? Do we understand each other now? No, Rachel. It, it grieves me to say that we seem to be as far from understanding as we ever were. I had hoped for so much from this visit. I, I had hoped that everything would be set right again. How could it be? It's just where it was. You stole the diamond. You pretended to help the police. You pledged the diamond to the money lender in London and went abroad with the money. And now you come here and tell me what I should have done. There is only one thing I should have done. Only one thing I should do now, and that is to expose you and ruin you. But I can't. I couldn't then and I can't now. God knows why, but I can't bring myself to. I can't tear you out of my heart even now. I think I despise myself even more than I despise you. I had set out with the hope raised by Mr. Bruff that if only Rachel would tell what she knew, the whole case against me would fall to pieces. And what had happened? She had told me that with her own eyes she had seen me steal the moonstone. How was I to clear my name now? And until I had cleared it, what hope was there of my marrying Rachel? For I was certain of one thing at least, that Rachel still loved me. Later that evening, I had a visit at my lodging from Mr. Bruff. I can hardly hold you entirely responsible for the shock and grief Rachel is suffering. After all, you saw her in my house with my permission. But I must insist that you give me your promise you will not try to see her a second time, except with my approval. I can assure you, Mr. Bruff, I'm in no hurry to repeat this afternoon's experience. You have my promise. Good. Well, I think we cannot be sure that Rachel has told you the whole truth. But we can hardly blame her for believing you to be guilty. Do you believe I am? No, not even on Rachel's evidence. Not even on the evidence of the night gown. I think there must be a dreadful mistake somewhere in all this. And somehow it must come to light. Oh, I wish I could feel so confident. Sergeant Cuff couldn't get at the truth. Neither, it seems, can I. Come, Franklin, you really must stop looking back to the past. We must close our minds to all that and see what we can discover in the future. But it is a matter of the past. Do you remember, Mr. Bruff, when we met over a year ago? Just after my father had given me the moonstone to take to Rachel in Yorkshire? Aye, I do. Well, we wondered then why Colonel Herncastle had left the moonstone to Rachel. I don't think we need wonder any more. Is that your opinion? Isn't it yours? Can you possibly doubt that he meant it to cause trouble? He must have thought that the Indians would pursue it to Yorkshire and steal it, perhaps even killing people if anyone came between them and it. He must have. What he could not have known was that he would cause even greater harm, that he would turn a happy household into one of suspicion and mistrust. This final blow, that I, of all people, should take Rachel's diamond, that she should see me do it. Oh, it's a master stroke, that is. He could never in his wildest imaginings have dreamt of that. Franklin, you're allowing things to get out of proportion. Oh, it's only natural I grant you, but listen to me for a moment. There's not the slightest ground for what you've suggested. Oh, come, Mr. I Bruff. repeat, not the slightest basis in fact, and the facts are what I deal in. But he knew the danger that followed him. 
He must have known that it would follow the Moonstone wherever it went. He thought he'd scotch the danger. He thought that by letting the Indians know the Moonstone would be cut into separate stones if he were killed, then he'd put pay to their pursuit. He could not have known how persistent they would be. But he knew how persistent... not finished. The only piece of factual evidence we have is the Colonel's will. You know yourself what he said in the clause relating to the Moonstone? That he left it to Rachel in token of his forgiveness of her mother for closing her house against him in his life. That's a blatant lie. You know it is. Excuse me, Franklin. But I know nothing of the sort. Neither in words nor in writing did Colonel Herncastle give me any cause to suspect his motives. It may have been all the things in his lifetime that people said he was. I knew he collected occult books, took opium, dabbled in chemistry, kept the lowest society. But does that stop him repenting of his ways at the end? No, Franklin, there's no basis for your suspicions, none at all. Now let's stop looking to the past and concern ourselves with the future. I confess I see no future. Ah, Franklin, that's not like you. Come, I have a little plan. At least we agree that the Moonstone's at the bottom of all this now. What do we believe was done with the Moonstone when it was taken to London? <sighs> it was pledged to Mr. Luca. Correct. And we know it was not you who pledged it. Do we know who did? Uh, no. And where do we believe the Moonstone to be now? With Mr. Luca's bankers. Exactly. Now observe. We are already in the month of June. Towards the end of the month, a year will have elapsed from the time when we believe the jewel to have been pledged and there is a chance that the person who pawned it may redeem it. Now, under the terms of Mr. Luca's own arrangement, he himself must take the Moonstone out of the bank. So, I propose setting a watch at the bank to see if he does and trying to discover to whom he returns it. That may lead us by a short road to who took it. What do you say to that? Very clever, Mr. Bruff. The only thing yeah. is... It means we've got to wait. Quite a fortnight. Is that so very long? It is when you're in my situation. I can understand that. But what else is left for you to try? I thought of talking to Sergeant Cuff. I'm afraid he won't help you. He's retired now. Betteridge has his address. I thought he might find the case interesting enough to help if he could. Perhaps. Keep me informed as to results. Meanwhile, I'll do what I can with my watch on the bank. But my inquiries produced only the information that Sergeant Cuff was in Ireland to look into some astonishing development in the art of rose growing. I wrote him a letter outlining the new developments and asking him to contact me upon his return. I then began to go over in my mind the events of the day leading up to my taking the diamond, in particular the dinner party. If only I could reconstruct those hours, I might begin to understand the events which happened later. It was useless to appeal a second time to Rachel. My aunt was dead. Mr. Bruff had been prevented from attending the dinner. That left Mr. Murthwait, who was now a thousand miles away. Miss Clack, who was living in France for reasons of economy. Godfrey Abelwhite, whom I soon discovered to be travelling on the continent. And Mr. Candy. I remembered a letter I'd received from Betteridge a few days earlier, full of chatter but starved of news, except that Mr. Candy, the physician, had heard from his assistant, Mr. Jennings, that I had been back to the locality, and that Mr. Candy had expressed a wish to see me. I left for Yorkshire by the next train. I've often thought of you, Mr. Blake, and if there's anything I can do for you, pray command my services, sir. Pray command my services. Very generous of you, Mr. Candy. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is something... Very well, sir. Uh, Speak out. What is it? You remember, of course, the affair of the Indian diamond a year ago at Lady Verinder's? Diamond. Diamond. Oh, yes. Well, go on, go on. Uh, uh, there now seems to be some chance that it may be found after all. Naturally, it would help if all the evidence could be collected again. And I must say, I have some hope of discovering new evidence. Oh, evidence. That's what you're after. Oh, well. And I remembered that you had been one of the guests at Miss Verinder's birthday celebration. Don't see anything of her these days, bright little thing she was. Gone abroad, they say. Uh, no, Mr Candy, not abroad. She's staying in London with her guardian, Mrs Meridue. I knew a Meridue when I was a student. Not related, I suppose. This was a tall beanpole of a fellow. Came to grief over his gambling. Couldn't leave it alone. Lost his overcoat and all one night. Yes, Meridue. Related, do you think? You sent me a message by Gabriel Betteridge. You had something to say to me. Yes. Ye yes, Betteridge was quite right. I had something to say to you. Yes. 
Oh, what a wonderful man, Betteridge. At his age, what a memory. Was it by any chance about the dinner party? That's it, that's it. The dinner, the birthday dinner. Yes, the dinner. Perhaps you made a note in your diary of what you wanted to say. I require no notes, Mr Blake. I am not such a very old man yet, and my memory is thoroughly to be depended on. Yes, the dinner. It... It was a, a, a very pleasant dinner, was it not, Mr Blake? A very pleasant dinner. I really had it on my mind to speak to you about it. I don't know when I ever spent such a pleasant evening among friends. Yes, come in, come in. Excuse me, Mr Candy, but I'm just off on some calls. Is there anything you need? Oh, no, thank you, Mr Jennings. This is Mr Blake. Indeed, we are already acquainted. Uh, perhaps I may walk a little way with you, Mr Jennings. It would be a pleasure, sir. Yes, a very pleasant dinner, Mr Blake. Very pleasant indeed. I'm afraid you find Mr Candy sadly changed. Yes, his illness must have been far more serious than I'd supposed. It's almost a miracle that he lived through it. Is his memory never any better? He's been trying to recollect something he wanted to tell me. Was it something that happened before he was taken ill? Yes, that is, it happened immediately before. Then I'm afraid it's most unlikely that he'll be able to recall it. Is it important to you? Yes, Mr Jennings, it is. Can you... As a medical man yourself, can you suggest any way I might be able to assist his memory? Mr. Candy's memory is beyond the reach of any assistance. I know. I've tried often enough to help him remember. That's a very disappointing answer, I must confess. But it may not be a final one. It may still be possible to trace Mr. Candy's lost recollection. Really? But how? Before I come to that, I must tell you a little about his illness. You have heard how it happened, I dare say. It was after dinner party at Lady Verinder's. He, he drove home in his gig and it was pouring with rain. And that was the start of it. When he returned home, he found an urgent message waiting for him. And he went straight off to visit his patient without stopping to change his clothes. I was out myself on a case some way from Frisinghall. And by the time I got back the next morning, the mischief was done. The fever had set in. I sent at once to two other physicians to give me their opinion. They agreed with me that it was serious, but... Unfortunately, we differed over treatment. Eventually, they left the house and I managed the case alone. But obviously, your treatment was successful. Mr Candy is alive today, it's true. It was successful to that extent. But it was not a rapid recovery. I sat by his bedside for days on end as he hovered between life and death. I wondered all the time if I'd done the right thing. It must have been an exhausting experience. It was. The only relief I had, though you may not think it a relief was to pass the time working on my book, on the brain and the nervous system. I'm sure you would have found it professionally most interesting. So will you, I think, Mr Blake. It has some bearing on Mr Candy's memory. For long periods, he was delirious. Now, it's part of my theory that although the power of speaking connectedly may be lost under such circumstances, the faculty of thinking connectedly is not necessarily impaired... Do you begin to see what I'm driving at? I think so, but, but how does it help me to discover what he was trying to tell me just now? I write shorthand, Mr Blake, and I use it to take down all Mr Candy's incoherent ramblings while he was in a state of delirium, night after night. And have you kept your notes? More than that. I have transcribed them into ordinary writing, and I think I've been able to fill in the gaps. It was rather like trying to put together a child's puzzle. I think it supported my theory. The superior faculty of thinking was going on in Mr Candy's mind, while the inferior faculty of speech was in hopeless disorder. Did my name appear in any of this? There was one night when he seemed to be concerned with going over something which had happened between the two of you. Hmm. And the question is, of course, is this the thing he was trying to remember when you saw him half an hour ago? It must be. Can't we go back and look at your papers, Mr Jennings? Well, forgive me, but it is not quite so simple as that. I am a physician. I cannot disclose what a patient of mine said when he was quite helpless and unable to act for himself. Not unless there's a very compelling reason for me to do so. Naturally, I understand your delicacy of feeling, Mr Jennings. My reason for wanting to know what Mr Candy was trying to remember is that later that night, the night on which he got soaked and caught his illness, a very valuable diamond was stolen from Miss Ferrander's sitting room at the house. Now, there is some reason to hope that it might be recovered. And as a member of the family, I'm trying to collect every scrap of information about the events of that night. I am sorry to disappoint you, Mr Blake, but the information I have has nothing to do with a diamond. 
In fact, Mr. Candy didn't say a word about diamonds the whole time he was ill. Now, if you will excuse me... Mr. Jennings, I have not treated you quite fairly. The fact is that it's very painful to have to tell you the real reason for my interest. In a word, I took the diamond. You, Mr. Blake? There seems to be no doubt about it, no doubt at all. Miss Verinder herself has told me that she saw me take the diamond. But why do you need to appeal to Miss Verinder? Surely you know yourself that you took it. No, Mr. Jennings, I do not know. I'm sure that Miss Verinder is telling the truth, but I swear to you that I took the diamond without knowing it. Now do you see why it is so vital to me to find out every scrap of information? The least thing may provide some clue which will lead to unravelling the whole affair and clearing my name in Miss Verinder's eyes. Then Miss Verinder has not made her statement publicly? Of course not. I am going to ask you a question, Mr. Blake. I want you to think carefully before you answer it, and I want you, for your own sake, to tell me the truth. You have my word. Very well. It is this. Have you ever taken opium, Mr. Blake? Uh, opium? Good heavens, no. Why do you ask? Were your nerves out of order this time last year? Were you unusually restless and irritable? Why, yes, I was, now you mention it, but, but what has all this to do... Uh, did with... you sleep badly? Y yes, wretchedly. Many nights I'd never slept at all. Was the birthday night an exception? Try and remember. Um... Did you sleep well on that one occasion? Uh, yes, I do remember. I slept marvellously well. Mr Blake, will you come back to the house with me? Can you spare me an hour of your time? Well, of course, but what are you driving at? The truth of what happened that night. It's in my notes. The notes I took off Mr. Candy's delirious ravings. I can explain everything for, for you. For God's sake, Mr. Jennings, tell me now. No, not here, in the street. Besides, I need my notes. Come back to the house. Uh, but your calls. My calls can wait. Back to the house, Mr. Blake. But what does all this mean? A, a page of writing with great gaps in it. Another page, part of it in red ink and the other part in black... How am I to make any sense of all this? You will, Mr. Blake, in a moment. May I ask you a few more questions? By all means. You've already told me that you've never taken opium in your life, so far as you know. Of course not. You also told me that at this time last year you were irritable and sleeping badly, except on the night of the birthday. That's right. Can you think of any reason for this nervous irritability? No, none whatever. Oh, I remember old Betteridge had an idea about it, but it's of no importance. Well, pardon me, Mr. Blake, but in a case like this, anything, however trivial, is worth mentioning. Why did Mr. Betteridge think you were sleeping badly? Because I'd stopped smoking suddenly. Miss Verinder said the smell of it offended her. Hmm. And had you been an habitual smoker? Oh, yes, I enjoy my cigar, and I didn't find it easy to give up. Then Mr. Betteridge was perfectly right. You were an habitual smoker... You suddenly stop smoking, yes. and your nervous system suffers as a result. Of course you couldn't sleep at night. Now, do you remember getting into an argument with Mr Candy about medicine? Either at dinner or afterwards? Yes. I'm afraid I was rather rude to him about his profession, but we parted on good terms at the end of the evening. May we turn to these papers? There's one more thing I should like to know. Were you particularly worried about the diamond at the time of the birthday? I had every reason to believe that there was a plot to steal it, and I rather thought that some attempt would be made that very night. Ah. There was also the question of Rachel's... of Miss Verinder's personal safety. She was wearing it in her dress. Did you talk about the diamond before you went to bed? Uh, Lady Verinder tried to persuade her daughter to give her the diamond for safekeeping. I overheard that conversation, yes. But, Mr Jennings, tell me what you suspect. I would rather you found out for yourself. Try the papers now. Begin with this one. Mm -hmm. This is a transcription of my shorthand notes of Mr Candy's speech while he was delirious. Mr Franklin Blake and agreeable down a peg medicine <laughs> Mr Jennings, I'm at my wit's end. You, you play with me. What does all this mean? Go on to the other sheet of paper. You must understand that the fragments you have just read were repeated over and over again. And that helped me, eventually, to reconstruct what was going on in Mr. Candy's mind. The other sheet of paper contains Mr. Candy's disconnected thoughts in black ink mm -hmm. and my attempt at connecting them together in red. Ah. Read through it and see what you think. Mr. Franklin Blake is clever and agreeable 
that he wants taking down a peg when he talks of medicine. I see. He confesses that he's been suffering from want of sleep at night. I tell him that his nerves are out of order and that he ought to take medicine. He tells me that taking medicine and groping in the dark are one and the same thing. Mr Jennings, this is unbelievable. This is exactly the conversation I had with Mr Candy at dinner that night. Go on with the reading, Mr Blake. I'll show him a thing or two. He really wants sleep, and Lady Verinder's medicine chest is at my disposal. Give him five and twenty minims of laudanum tonight, without his knowing it, and then call tomorrow morning. How did you sleep last night, Mr Blake? Like a log, he'll say. So much for medicine. And then come down on him with the truth. Mr Jennings, does, does this mean that somehow or other Mr Candy contrived to give me opium that night? Yes, he did. I don't think there can be any doubt about that. But how? I don't remember taking any medicine. Isn't there anything about it in your notes? Uh, nothing at all. Mr Candy made no mention of it. The interfering, meddling old fool! Try to forgive him, Mr Blake. He acted innocently enough. He's not the first doctor to practice a little deception on a patient. You certainly needed sleep, and he saw you got it. I think I might well have done exactly what Mr Candy did. Are you saying that, in your opinion, as a medical man, I was acting under the influence of opium when I took the diamond? Yes. That is precisely what I think. In your overwrought condition, with the safety of the diamond uppermost in your mind, you went to where it was kept and took it. You were in a state of trance produced by the opium. And for a whole year, I've been wrestling with this. For a whole year, Rachel Verner has thought I was a thief and a hypocrite. And it's all Mr Candy's doing. But if he hadn't fallen ill, he would have called the next day. Told you of the trick he'd played on you. Miss Verinder would have heard of it and questioned him. And everything would have been cleared up straight away. Everything except what I'm supposed to have done with the diamond. And where it is now. Hmm. Those questions I can't answer. But there is one way I think I can help you. You and I know you didn't steal the diamond. Yes. Uh, at least that you didn't steal it with malice or forethought. But Miss Verinder doesn't. Perhaps I could prove to her that you did. <sighs> if only you could. It's almost more important to me than getting the diamond back. Mr Blake. Hmm. Would you agree to taking part in a medical experiment? What sort of experiment? One in which we try to recreate as exactly as possible the circumstances of last year. You go back to the house, you give up smoking. You get irritable, you sleep badly, and then I give you another dose of opium, and we see what happens. You mean, we see if I try and steal the diamond again? Yes. But it would never work. How could it? That is not a scientific answer, Mr Blake. The experiment will certainly not work if it is not tried. It may work if it is tried. How badly do you want to clear your name in Miss Verinder's eyes? Very well, Mr Jennings. I agree. When do we begin? This very moment. Put that cigar out, Mr Blake. It is your last for some time. That was part five of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Brian Gear. The cast, Gabriel Betteridge, John Sharp, Franklin Blake, John Telfer, Rachel Verinder, Sally Baxter, Rosanna Spearman, Tammy Ustinoff, Penelope Betteridge, Josie Kidd, Mr Bruff, Nat Brenner, Ezra Jennings, Philip Sully and Mr Candy, Danny Schiller. The music was composed and conducted by Sidney Sager and the programme, which came from Bristol, was directed by Brian Miller. The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio in six parts by Brian Gear, with music composed by Sidney Sager. The Moonstone 
Part 6 I sat facing Ezra Jennings in the bare little room. On the table between us lay Mr Jennings' notes, pieced together through the long nights of Mr Candy's delirium, and hovering in the air, the suggestion that I should put myself back, as nearly as might be, into the frame of mind I found myself in a year ago, and then take another dose of opium to see if it would induce me to steal the diamond a second time. May I assume that you agree to this attempt at reconstruction? Is it necessary? Here is the evidence in front of us. My notes are not evidence. They were taken under circumstances entirely out of the layman's experience. And there is only my word for it that they're genuine, and not some invention of my own. And even if you accept those two points, what do they amount to? A theoretical possibility and nothing more. Then we must try the experiment. It's the only way. Pass me your ashtray, Mr Jennings. This is the last cigar I shall smoke until we have put this idea to the test. Be quite clear in your mind about what I am suggesting. It may expose you to ridicule, even from your closest friends. I don't care what it involves. I will try anything to clear my name. But if I'm to do what you suggest, if I'm to steal the diamond unconsciously a second time, it must be in the presence of unimpeachable witnesses. But of course. Now, there's another point. I want you to go into this expecting a reasonable success, not failure. This isn't just some eccentric idea of my own with no scientific foundation. I'm acting on sound physiological principles. Would you like me to turn up the relevant passages in the textbook? Oh, no, thank you. But I'd be grateful if you'd explain one thing. How could I have walked into Rachel's sitting room, opened the cabinet, taken the diamond and gone back to my own room again? I thought the effect of opium was first to stupefy you and then to send you to sleep. A common error about opium, Mr Blake. Would you have supposed that I am, at this moment, under the influence of a dose ten times larger than the one Mr Candy gave to you? Why, no, Mr Jennings, I should not. There's no need to look so alarmed. I take it strictly for medical reasons. From necessity, I might say. Besides, as to the point you've just made about the effect of opium... De Quincey, in his Confessions of an English Opium Eater, tells us that after what he calls a debauch of opium, he either went to the opera to enjoy the music, or he wandered about the London markets on Saturday nights. But there is no doubt that I had a perfect night's sleep after Mr Candy gave me the opium. When you take opium, two things happen. First, you are stimulated. Then, you are sedated. Now, going back to the night in question. Mm. In the stimulating phase... The latest and most vivid impression left on your mind, the anxiety about the diamonds, yes. would be likely to become intensified in your brain. Little by little, this anxiety would drive you to take whatever steps you could to make sure the diamond was safe. In the spiritualised intoxication of opium, you would go into the room, mm -hmm. find the cabinet, open it, take the diamond out and retrace your steps. Uh, but, but if I could do all that, how could I not remember it the next morning? Because later... As the sedative effect began to gain on the stimulant action, you would slowly become inert and stupefied, and later still, you would fall into a deep sleep. <laughs> With the morning, when the effect of the opium had been slept off, you would wake up completely ignorant of what you had done during the night. Very well, then. What did I do next? What did I do with the diamond once I'd taken it? That's the very point I was coming to. When you left Miss Verinder's sitting room with a diamond in your hand, I should think it very likely you went back to your own room. Yes. And what then? It's possible that with the idea of preserving the diamond uppermost in your mind, you hid it somewhere in your bedroom. Oh, just a minute, Mr Jennings. That can't possibly be the case. Mm -hmm. The diamond is in London now. In London? How did it get there? Nobody knows. But you say you took it out of Miss Verinder's room. So how was it taken out of your keeping? I have no idea. But where was it when you woke up in the morning? Did you see it? No. Has Miss Verinder got it back? No, or I would not be here now. Mr. Blake, there seems to be something here that needs clearing up. But for the present, let's return to the experiment with the opium. We have decided that you leave off the habit of smoking. From this moment? Good. Not many men could make that resolve, I can assure you. Now, the next step is to reproduce, as nearly as we can, your domestic circumstances as they were last year. But how can we? The house is all closed. My aunt is dead. Godfrey Ablewhite is on the continent. And so long as the suspicion of the theft rests on me, it is quite out of the question for me to meet Miss Verinder. 
Oh, I, I don't think reassembling the same people is very important. But I do think you should see the same objects, uh, pieces of furniture and so on. Above all, you must sleep in the same room, and it must be furnished the same way. So must Miss Verinder's sitting room. Oh, but you're forgetting something else. It is Miss Verinder's house now, and as things are between us, I cannot even write to her. Hmm. I see. Uh, Mr Blake, may I ask you a delicate question? Yes. Am I right in thinking you felt no common interest in Miss Verinder this time last year? And I still do. And Miss Verinder returned that feeling? She did. So it would not be unreasonable to assume that she would like to see you proved innocent? Well, there's no doubt of that. Then, with your permission, I will write to her and ask leave to use her house for the experiment. <sighs> Mr Jennings, if you would do that... I believe you would be doing me the greatest possible favour. Then that's settled. I shall write by today's post. Now, don't forget to lock up your cigars when you get back to the hotel. <laughs> yes. I'll call tomorrow and hear how you've passed the night. It was then the 15th of June. The events of the next few days are all recorded in the journal kept by Ezra Jennings. Let him tell how the venture with the opium was tried and how it ended. Miss Verinder wrote to say that she believed in Mr Blake's innocence simply from reading my theory of the opium. Nevertheless, she willingly gave us her permission to use the house if we still wanted to try the experiment. And she would like to come to Yorkshire herself and be one of the witnesses. I agreed, as long as she promised not to see Mr Blake beforehand. Meanwhile, Mr Blake's health was visibly suffering from his giving up smoking. He was sleeping badly and becoming short-tempered. Both very good signs. On one of my visits to Mr Blake at the hotel, I found him in the company of Gabriel Betteridge. I'm sorry to have to tell you, Mr Jennings, that it's quite impossible to furnish the inner hall as it was last year. You're not sorry at all, Betteridge. You're positively glad. It's a simple matter of fact, Mr Franklin. Last year there was a stuffed buzzard in the hall. And when the family left, the buzzard was put away with the other things, <gasps> and when he was put away, he burst. Very well, Betteridge. <laughs> we will do without the buzzard but I should like the carpet to be laid on the stairs as before. Now, that can't be done either. The man who laid that carpet down is dead, and the like of him for reconciling a carpet in a corner is not to be found in all England. Very well. We must try the next best man in England. Uh, just as you wish, Mr Jennings. What else? Miss Verinder's sitting room to be restored exactly to what it was last year. Also, the corridor leading from the sitting room to the first landing. Also, the bedroom, occupied last year by Mr Black. When we took up the carpet in Miss Verinder's sitting room, we found a surprising quantity of pins. Am I to put them back down again? I don't think the pins are material to the experiment. Uh, thank you, Mr Jennings. Now, as to Mr Franklin's bedroom, who is responsible for keeping it in a permanent state of disorder? Ah. His trousers here, his shirts there, and his French novels everywhere, him or me? Oh, I think you can rely on me for that, Betteridge. Then if there are no more instructions, I would like to make a start. Uh, no. Nothing more, better. Uh, very good, sir. Good day to you both, gentlemen. <laughs> Do you think we can depend on him, Mr Blake? Implicitly. We shall find the house exactly as you want it. Oh, by the way, I've heard from Mr Bruff, the family lawyer. Ah. It will not surprise you to know that he heartily disapproves of the whole thing. But, on the other hand, he thinks we ought to have somebody of sound common sense present, and he will therefore act as a witness. June the 25th, the day of the experiment, and everything at the house was ready. From giving up his cigars, Mr Blake was fully as irritable as he had been a year before. Mr Bruff appeared, and was given the room communicating with Mr Blake's. Miss Verinder arrived during the evening with her guardian, Mrs Merridew, a chaperone, and went straight to her own rooms. Mr Blake, Mr Bruff and I dined at exactly the hour of the birthday dinner. I led the conversation back to the Moonstone and seemed to have revived Mr Blake's anxiety about it before he went upstairs. Because of Miss Verinder's interest, I had Betteridge bring the medicine chest to her sitting room. May I help you, Mr Jennings? Is there anything I can do? You can pour on the water when I've measured out the drop. Is this likely to take long? I brought some papers with me to work on. Just witness the measuring out of the laudanum, Mr. Bruff, and we shall not want you again until it begins to take its effect on Mr. Blake. 
By the way, Mr Jennings, Mrs Meridue has retired to bed. She seemed to be under the apprehension that your experiment involved an explosion. I told her it would not take place until nine o'clock tomorrow morning. I hope I did it right, sir. You did splendidly, Betteridge. How much laudanum are you going to give him? I've decided to increase the dose. Oh, is that safe? Quite safe, Miss Verinder. You see, my notes tell me that Mr Candy gave him only 25 minims. Now, that's a small amount to produce the results we know it did. Not only that, Mr Blake knows this time he is to take the laudanum, and that's likely to make him rather resistant to its effects. There we are. Forty drops. I think that will do nicely. Oh, let me pour out the water. I must do something. Very well. Just half full. How long before anything happens? An hour, perhaps. Now, this room must be dark, as it was before. And I have here a piece of crystal, which is to be the substitute for the diamond. Oh, let me put it in the cabinet. Can you remember the right drawer? Of course. This one. Did you witness that, Mr Braff? I did, Mr Jennings, and I say before everyone that I am astonished that you, a physician, should countenance such a charade as we're all taking part in tonight. Oh, come, Mr Bruff. Surely any attempt to clear up this affair is worth trying. It would so ease my own heart if it succeeds. It is only that consideration, Rachel, that has persuaded me to be present. Now, Miss Verinder, you must wait in your bedroom just as you did before. Are you sure you can control yourself? He must not suspect your presence. Oh, for his sake, I can do anything. Besides, so far as I am concerned, he has proved innocent already. The thought does you credit, Miss Verinder. But remember that we also have hopes that the experiment may show us what happened to the diamond after Mr Blake took it. Of course. I shall leave my door just a little open as it was that night. Good. Now, gentlemen, I would like you both to come with me to Mr Blake's room. It's time to give him the laudanum. Really, Mr Jennings, the suspense is intolerable. Am I to have the opium tonight or not? You are to have it now, Mr Blake. Here it is. Then give it to me at once before I change my mind about the whole affair. You'll do no such thing. My time's valuable, even if yours is not. Oh, don't grumble, Mr Bruff. Here, give me the glass. Ah, oh, there you are, Mr Jennings. Yeah. Now, are you satisfied, Mr Bruff? You've seen me take the laudanum? Uh, I've seen it. Now may I do some work on my papers? Oh, you have no more imagination than a, than a cow, Mr Bruff. A cow is a very useful animal. <laughs> and what are we to do now, Mr Jennings? Be so kind as to draw the curtains round the bed, Betteridge. Very good, sir. Uh, they were not closed on this side, Betteridge. Uh, then leave those. We will wait in the other part of the room. Mr Jennings, I own I'm not a little apprehensive. The dose I have given you cannot possibly do you any harm. No, no, no it's not that. I, I mean, I'm afraid it may not work, that nothing at all will happen. Put your mind at rest on that point. It will all happen as it did before. Of that I am convinced. <sighs> Very well. And thank you, Mr Jennings. Now, let me try and compose myself for sleep. <clears throat> For the Lord's sake, sir, tell us when it will begin to work. And not before midnight. Say nothing and sit still. No, there's, there's one thing we must all do. Take off our boots. What, sir? Take off my boots. Whatever next. It's absolutely essential. If Mr Blake leaves his bed, we must follow him. And we must do so without noise. Now, please be so good as to do as I ask. You too, Betteridge. Having so far forgotten ourselves, why stop at taking off our boots? Oh, oh. I hope no word of this ever gets back to my office. How long, Mr Jennings, before I fall asleep? Did it not occur to you, Mr Blake, that when you brought the Moonstone here from the bank at Frising Hall, you were running a great risk? What? Oh, why? No, not then. It seems greater now, when I look back on it in the light of subsequent events. And about this time last year, as you lay in this bed... Were you not anxious for Miss Verinder's personal safety? Of course I was. I know Murthwaite said that the Indians wouldn't try to take the diamond a second time that night, but I didn't know how far his opinion could be relied upon. Yes, I was very anxious, and determined the next morning to make her see the danger she was in. I encouraged him to talk about the diamond, so as to make him forget about the opium. As the minutes of the new morning wore away, the sublime intoxication of the drug 
gleamed in his eyes. He ceased to complete his sentences. The sentences dropped to single words. Then silence. He sat up in bed. He began to talk again, but to himself, not to me. The stimulant effect of the opium had taken control of him. I wish I'd never taken her out of the bank. I was safe in the bank. Oh, how do I know? The Indians may be hidden in the house. It's not even locked up. It's in the drawer of her cabinet. And the drawer doesn't lock. Oh, anybody might take it. Mm. Oh, no, why should they? This is England, the 19th century. Be sensible and go to sleep. Deal with it in the morning. <laughs> the devil am I to sleep with this on my mind? I must make sure it's safe. He rose, took the candle from beside his bed, and went swiftly out of the room. We followed him along the corridor, down the stairs, along the second corridor. He never looked back. He never hesitated. He went straight into the sitting room, leaving the door open. He advanced to the middle of the room and looked about him. I saw the door of Miss Verinder's bedroom standing ajar and the dim outline of her summer dress. Not a sound, not a movement from her. Mr. Blake put his candle on top of the Indian cabinet and opened one drawer after another until he came to the one with a piece of crystal in it. He took it out with his right hand and picked up his candle with the left. All this was what he had done last year. Would he now repeat what he had done next? He put the candle down on a little table, wandered irresolutely towards the sofa, and collapsed on it in a heap. The crystal fell from his hand. He was asleep. The experiment was over. Come along. We may go into the room now. Nothing will disturb him for some time. The sedative effect of the opium is upon him. Mr. Jennings, I owe you an apology. I own I thought this whole thing would be a waste of time. But we have seen Franklin Blake take the diamond under the influence of opium just as he did last year. You have proved your case. And now I'm going to draw up a paper to that effect. Will you sign it with me, Mr. Betteridge? It will be a pleasure, sir. By jingo, we're beginning to see daylight in all this at last. Thank you, both of you. But I must point out that the experiment has not been a complete success. And perhaps it has failed where it should have been of most use. Oh? In showing us what Mr. Blake did with the diamond after he'd taken it from the cabinet. Why do you think that was, Mr. Jennings? Perhaps I gave him too large a dose of opium. And then we could not reproduce exactly the conditions of last year. I mean the conditions in Mr. Blake's mind. However, we have proved that even if he did take the diamond, he was not acting consciously when he did so. One word about the diamond. Your theory, Mr. Jennings, is that he hid it in his room. Mine is that it's in the possession of Mr. Lucas' bankers in London. But can you put your theory to the test? I'm doing so even at this moment. I know that Mr. Lucas must take the diamond out of the bank himself, and if the pledge is being redeemed when it first falls due, then he will be doing so about this time of the month. So I am setting a watch for Mr. Lucas at his bankers. If he does redeem the moonstone... He must lead us to the person who deposited it with him. And we clear the mystery up once and for all. Then let us hope that your watch is successful. I'm going back to London with the morning train. If I hear that a discovery has been made, it'll be a good thing to have Mr Blake in London with me. Will he be fit to travel? Oh, I should think so. He'll have had a good night's sleep. Good. Now sign this, Betteridge. Yes, sir. Mr Jennings? Thank you. You may rest assured that I shall keep this document in a safe place. Mr. Jennings, I am in your debt. Franklin Blake is more than just a client to me. I've known him since he was a boy. Well, I want my bed. Good night. Good night, Mr. Bruff. Mr. Jennings, I would like to make my rounds and be sure that all is locked up for the night. I trust it will be in order if I now resume my boots. Perfectly in order, Betteridge. Good night, and thank you. I was alone in the room with Mr. Blake. I arranged him in a more comfortable position on the sofa, and as I was doing so, 
Miss Verinder came out of her bedroom. Is he quite safe like that, Mr. Jennings? Quite safe, Miss Verinder. He will sleep deeply for several hours. Besides, I shall stay and watch him. You need have no fear. Oh, let me watch him with you. You need your rest, Miss Verinder. Oh, but I can't sleep. Not after this. It's all proved, isn't it? He didn't take the diamond, did he? Well, not, not as himself, consciously. No. Oh, I've been so cruel to him. How can I ever make amends? If I may say so, Miss Verinder, I don't think from what Mr. Blake has let drop to me, I don't think you will have to make amends. Oh, I'm so happy. He will see me here when he wakes up and everything will be all right again. I'd forgotten what it's like to be happy. Mr. Jennings? Yes? How do you come to know so much about opium and what it can do? It's a very commonly prescribed drug. Any physician would know about it. But you seem to have a special interest in it. The nervous system is my particular study. Mr. Jennings, this may be an impertinence, but you do not look a well man. Do you use opium yourself? Yes, Miss Verinder, I do. I have a disease which... Let us just say, opium gives me some relief. I'm sorry. I should not have mentioned no, it. No, no. No one could possibly be offended at anything you said, Miss Verinder. <laughs> now you will understand if I have to leave you to watch alone later on. The pain is at its worst in the early morning. Perhaps you could fetch a shawl or a coverlet. I don't want him to catch cold. I woke up without the slightest knowledge of what I'd done under the opium. Of what happened after my waking, I merely report that Rachel and I thoroughly understood each other before a word was spoken. We all returned to London that morning. We wanted Ezra Jennings to come with us, but it was impossible to persuade him to leave Mr Candy. When we arrived at the terminus, Mr Bruff was met by a small boy who ran up to him. Mr Bruff, sir! Mr Bruff, come quick! Why, Gooseberry, whatever is it? What's happened? Mr Luke has gone to the bank, sir, with two police officers in plain clothes, sir. Has he, by Joe? There's not a moment to lose. Cabby, cabby! Where to, sir? Lombard Street. Quick about it. Right, sir. In with you, Franklin. Right. Quick. Uh, New boy, uh, on the box. Look lively. Do you think he's going to redeem the Moonstone? It certainly looks like it. He's got two playing clothes officers with him. I've had two of my clerks watching Mr. Lucas House. Who's that boy? Gooseberry, you called him, didn't you? Aye, uh, my clerks gave him that name on account of his eyes. But I wish they were as much to be depended upon as he is. That's the sharpest boy in London. I hope we're in time. Might be all over when we get there. Hurry, driver, hurry! Now then, Gooseberry, you stay by me. You keep your eyes open. Yes, sir. Ah, here's my man. Well, what's the news, Hopkins? He's in the inner office now, Mr. Bruff. Been there nearly half an hour. For man. Well, we'll wait here. You go back to where you are. Yes, sir. I see no sign of the Indians, Mr. Bruff. In fact, nothing but perfectly ordinary people going about their business. Excepting that man with a beard and a round hat. Looks like a sailor. So he couldn't be one of the Indians in disguise? No, 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 no. He's taller than any of them. Well, he must have their spy somewhere, and he may be the man. Mr. Bruff, here's Mr. Luke and his two plain clothes men coming out the office. Keep your eye on him, Gooseberry. If he passes the diamond to anyone, he'll do so here. I don't think he's seen us. There. As he passed that man in the grey suit, I saw his hand move. And I. And now he's out of the door with the two policemen either side of him. That's my other man slipping out after them. Now then, where's Hopkins? Come to that, where's Gooseberry? He was here a moment ago. Oh, wretched boy. What the devil does it mean? They've both left us just at the very time he wanted them most. Look, look. The man in the grey suit has just paid in a cheque. Now he's on his way out. What's oh. to be done? We can't degrade ourselves by following him. I can. I wouldn't lose sight of that man for ten thousand pounds. In that case, I wouldn't lose sight of you for twice the money. He's getting on to that omnibus. Come along, Mr. Bruff. A nice occupation for a man in my position. For heaven's sake, don't mention it. I should be ruined if it was known. Well, 
What did you find out? It's greatly to our credit, Franklin, that you and I are the two worst amateur detectives that ever tried their hands at a trade. You mean the man in the grey suit knows nothing about the diamond? He went into that chemist shop. I know the proprietor well. Been going there for years. And? I had a few words with him in private. The man in the grey suit has been in his service 30 years and he would trust him with the crown jewels, let alone the moonstone. He was simply paying money into his master's account and that's all. Now what's to be done? Come back to my office. Gooseberry and Hopkins have evidently followed somebody else. Let's hope they're better at the game than we are. I'm very sorry, Mr. Pruff, but I made a mistake. I could have taken my oath I saw Mr. Luca pass something to an elderly gentleman in a light-coloured overcoat. I followed him, and it turns out to be a master ironmonger. I'm most respectable. Oh, dear. And I suppose you've no idea where Gooseberry is? No, sir. I've seen nothing of him since I left the bank. Very well, Hopkins. That'll do. Thank you, sir. Well, it looks as though we've all made a mess of it. Are there still Woods, my other clerk, the one who followed Mr. Luca? And the boy. Yes, I've great faith in young Gooseberry. Perhaps he saw something we didn't. What do you say to dining here on the chance he may come back in an hour or two? Have some good wine in the cellar. We can get a chop from the coffee house. Excellent. Then I should like to see Rachel in Portland Square this evening and bring her up to date with events. Of course, of course. Come in. Ah, uh, Woods. Well, what news? I followed Mr. Ligger as per your instructions, sir. He went back to his house and dismissed the two policemen when he got there. Did you see any sign of the Indians? No, sir. I looked carefully in the street and in the alley behind the house. There was no one at all loitering nearby. Thank you, Woods. Thank you, sir. Well, there we are. We must have lost the diamond. Mr. Luca would surely not have dismissed the policeman if he still had it with him. Exactly my opinion. So Gooseberry's our only hope. But Gooseberry didn't come back before I went on to see Rachel at her guardian's house. So I left my card at Mr. Bruff's to be given to the boy with a message saying he could find me at my lodgings at half past ten that night. But I stayed too late with Rachel and found he'd been and gone, leaving me a note to say he'd return next morning. Ah, come in, Gooseberry, there's a good chap. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Sergeant Cuff! <laughs> Excuse me, I was not addressing you. I was expecting someone else. That's quite all right, sir. I thought I'd look in on the chance of your being in town before I wrote to York. Well, come in, come in. Uh, would you like some breakfast? No, thank you, Mr. Blake. Six o'clock is my breakfast hour these days, and I go to bed with the sun. <laughs> the complete country gentleman, eh? Well, you certainly look the part. I would not have recognised you. The smell and noise of London is fearful, Mr. Blake. <laughs> I don't know how I endured it all these years. Well, pray, take a seat. Oh, thank you, sir. I only got back from Ireland last night. Hmm? But before I went to bed, I read your letter. So I know what's happened in the affair of the Moonstone since last year. I'm afraid I completely mistook my case. It's only in books that officers of the detective force <laughs> don't make a mistake. But now you're in the nick of time to recover your reputation. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr Blake. But now I have retired from business, I don't care a straw about my reputation. Lady Verinder was very liberal to me in the matter of my fee, and that's why I'm here now. I'll go back to work, if that's what you want. Only on condition that not a farthing is to pass from you to me. If those are your terms, Sergeant Cuff, then I gratefully accept them. Just plain Mr. Cuff these days, sir. <laughs> now, perhaps you'd tell me how the case stands since your letter. Well, I told you that Miss Verinder had seen me take the diamond. Well, she was quite right. I did. But I did so under the influence of opium given me some time the previous night by Mr Candy. Good gracious. Can that be proved? It has already been proved. Mr Candy's assistant, Mr Jennings, conducted an experiment. He gave me a second dose of opium and I repeated my actions of that night witnessed by Mr Jennings, Miss Ferrander and Mr Bruff. It's quite amazing. In all my experience, I never heard the like. However... Did you repeat whatever it was you did with the Moonstone after you took it? Unfortunately, no. But Mr Jennings thinks I must have hidden it in my room. Then how did it get to London? No, that won't do. But I agree with him that you must have taken it back to your room. Well, and then what happened? Have you no suspicion yourself? None whatever. And there's one more thing I must tell you. Mr Luca took the Moonstone out of the bank yesterday. Oh, come in. Gooseberry, come in, boy. Good morning, Mr Blake. Uh, Mr Cuff, this is Mr Bruff's office boy and budding detective. Uh... Gooseberry. Not the Mr Cuff. Sergeant Cuff of the Detective Police. Formerly of the Detective Police, now retired. But newly come out of retirement to help us in the affair of the Moonstone. Shut the door, Gooseberry, and tell us your news. Now, 
Did you follow anyone yesterday at the bank? Yes, sir. But first I am to tell you that Mr Bruff presents his compliments and says he's prevented from being with you today. Gout, sir. Oh, dear, I am sorry. Poor man. Well, my lad, and what have you got to tell us? Please, sir, may I tell you in a cab, sir? And why in a cab, Gooseberry? Because I think we ought to get over the docks as quick as we can. And why do you think that? Because yesterday at the bank I followed a man and that's where he went, sir. It was a tall man, sir, with a big black beard, and he was dressed all like a sailor. I remember him. Mr Bruff and I thought he was a spy for the Indians. And why did you follow him, Gooseberry? Because I saw Mr Luca pass something to him. Why didn't you tell Mr Bruff or Mr Blake what oh, you no, saw? Oh, no, there was no time. He went out in such a hurry. Well, what did he do when he got into the street? He called a cab, sir, and I held on behind a run off it. And he went to the docks, you say? Yes, sir, Tar Wolf. Spoke with a steward of a Rotterdam steamboat. He asked if he could go aboard and sleep in his berth overnight. But the steward wouldn't let him because of the cabins being clean. Uh, then what did he do? He left the wharf and came back into the street. It was then I noticed a man. What man? Well, a workman, sir. He seemed to be watching the sailor. And when the sailor went into an eating house, the workman waited on the other side of the road. Then after a minute, a cab came by and stopped by the workman. A man leaned forward at the window. A man with a dark face. All like an engine, sir. And he spoke to the workman. I couldn't hear what they said. Well, then the cab went on right down the street and the workman went across the road into an eating house. What did you do? Oh, well, I waited till I was hungry and then I went in too. I had a shilling in my pocket and I had black pudding eel pie and a bottle of ginger beer. Mr Blake, what can a small boy not digest? The substance in question has never been found and yet. What happened in the eating house? Well, the sailor read the newspaper at one table and the workman read the newspaper at another table. Well, then the sailor got up and went out, so I went out too. Here, he didn't seem too sure of where he was going. But in the end, he went into the Wheel of Fortune public house. They do very good pork pies there, sir. And what of the workman? Oh, he followed too, on the other side of the road. And in the Wheel of Fortune, what happened? Well, the sailor asked if he could have a bed. The landlord said they were full. But the barmaid said, no, number 10 was empty. And they sent for a waiter to show the sailor up. Just before that, I'd noticed the workman among the people at the bar. But before the waiter had answered the call, he'd vanished. Who's vanished? The workman? Yeah, that's right, sir. Well, the next thing was, the sailor was taken up to see number 10. So I waited to see if anything happened. And did it? Oh, yes, sir. There were men shouting upstairs, and the landlord was called for. And then he came downstairs again with a workman by the collar. So the workman had gone upstairs? Yes, sir. But why the landlord got him by the collar? Because he was drunk, sir. Drunk? Ah, oh, but wait till I get the end of my story, sir. Well, the landlord put him out into the street and said he'd have the police round if he'd come back. You see, sir, the waiter and the sailor had found the workman in room number 10, and the workman kept saying he'd taken it. But this is extraordinary. The workman wasn't drunk before, was no, he? No, sir, and he wasn't drunk afterwards either. Oh, I followed him. He was rolling and staggering about something shocking, sir, until he got round a corner. And then he was so busy all me, sir. So... We have the sailor in room number 10 and the workman drunk and then suddenly sober. Anything else? Only this, sir. I went back to the Wheel of Fortune to see if I could see any more of a sailor, but he must have stayed up in his room. When I left again, there was the workman standing on the other side of the road looking up at a window at the top of the public house, the only window with a light in it. Well, then he walked away again and I'll come onto your lodgings, Mr Blake, to tell you what I'd seen. But you didn't come back even though I waited. So then I went home, because I ain't fit for nothing if I don't get my night's sleep, sir. What a pity you were not at home, Mr Blake. We've lost valuable time in this. But you were not here until this morning, Mr Cuff. True, but you might have thought to pursue inquiries yourself. However, let that be. What do you make of all this? The sailor is evidently the person to whom Mr Luca passed the dial. But I distinctly saw his hand move as he passed another man. Bluff, Mr Blake, to put you on the wrong track. And the workman who followed the sailor, a uh, spy for the Indians, of course... How do you explain the sudden drunkenness? Oh, that's easy enough. He was caught having a look at room number 10 and pretended to be drunk as an excuse. But why did he want to see the room at all? To report it all to the Indians. They couldn't risk arousing suspicion by appearing themselves. So they would have told the man he must give them a description of the room where the sailor was lodging for the night. Because that's where the moonstone would be. Here we are, Mr Cuff, the Wheel of Fortune. The place is in turmoil, Mr Cuff. Yes, I fear we may be too late. Ah, this will be the landlord. Now, who the devil are you and what do you want? I'm Sergeant Cuff, late of the detective police, and I'll thank you to keep your temper, landlord. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but something unpleasant has happened. Has it anything to do with a man dressed like a sailor who slept here last night? In room number ten? Why, yes, it has. He didn't answer his call at seven, nor at eight, nor nine. That's a carpenter you can hear trying to open his door this very minute. Is there any other way he could have left his room? Well, 
I suppose there is, but you see, this room's a garret and there's a trap door onto the roof. Uh-huh. You don't think he's gone that way without paying? The sailor might have done. The room's open. Come on up, sir. Oh. No, you wait here, boy. Oh, sir. We still can't get in. There's something behind the door. Very well. Stand aside. I'll put my soul into it. There he is on the bed, still asleep. It's the man we saw in the bank. Hold on. This man's in a fit. Look at his eyes. He's dead. What? This man's dead, landlord. You'd better send for a doctor and the police. Go on. You heard what a sergeant said. See to it, man. Yes, sir. Right away. Mr. Blake, sir. Look at this. What? You were told to wake downstairs, boy. Yeah, but look at this box on the table and this receipt. Here, give it to me. Deposited with Messrs. So-and-so by Mr. Septimus Fluker, a small wooden box containing a valuable of great price to be given up only on the personal application of Mr. Luca. It had the diamond in it, didn't it, sir? Mr. Blake. Look, sir, Mr. Cuff's pulled off the man's hair. May I trouble you to come over to the bed, Mr. Blake? Oh, he's pulled off the man's beard. For God's sake, what are you doing? Making due allowance for the dark complexion, which I have not yet had time to wash off. Who would you say this man was, Mr. Blake? What? How should I know him? Perhaps if you could... Bring yourself to look, Mr. Blake. My God. It's Godfrey Ablewhite. Yes. That's what I thought. But but how does Godfrey come to have the Moonstone? Does it mean that he, he took it after all? We may find that out with further inquiries. But why? He had money. I should say he was suffocated with this pillow. Still, the post-mortem will tell us that. Look here, sir. There's a piece cut out of the trap door just behind the bolt. That's how they got in the mood for gentlemen. Well done, boy. Yes, yes, that's how they got in, all right, landlord. Yes, sir. How could anyone have got onto the roof from outside? Why, there's a house under repair only three doors down. Or the scaffolding and ladders. Oh, then that's how they got up. A flat roof, is it? Uh, yes, sir. And if you kept being low, the parapet would hide you from the street. Besides, this is one of the quietest streets in London after midnight. When the police arrive, landlord, be so good as to tell them I shall put myself at their disposal later. But now there are some inquiries I must pursue. Urgently. Yes, Mr Cuff, this is the box I handed to Godfrey Ablewhite, uh, and the moonstone was in it. And where is it now? On its way back to India, where it came from. Mr Luca, how did you come by the moonstone? Godfrey Ablewhite brought it to me uh, just over a year ago, it was. Uh, I was more than surprised, I can tell you. And no such diamond as that was in the private possession of anyone in Europe, let alone in Great Britain. And what proposal did Godfrey Ablewhite make to you? Well, first, that I should buy the stone off him, and if I didn't want to do that, uh, would I sell it on commission and pay him a sum down on account? <laughs> well, of course, I, I wasn't prepared to do either. But my curiosity was aroused, as you can well imagine. I examined the stone, and I came to the conclusion that it was worth £30,000, if it was worth a penny. Then I asked him how he got it. And what did he say? He tried to fob me off with a couple of stories, so I showed him the door. And then? And then he told me the truth. He had no option if he wanted to raise any money on the stone. Mr Franklin Blake and I don't always see eye to eye, and he was in a particularly waspish mood the night of Rachel's birthday. He crossed swords with a doctor on whether or not he needed medicine to make him sleep at nights. The doctor proposed that I should help him give Mr. Blake a little lesson by slipping some laudanum into his brandy and soda last thing. I had the room next to Mr. Blake's. Do you follow me so far? Perfectly, Mr. Ablewhite. Uh, Pray continue. I wished him good night and went into my own room. I sat thinking for about an hour. And then, just as I was getting into bed, I heard Mr. Blake talking to himself. His voice sounded unnatural, and I looked in to see if he was all right. He was mumbling about the diamond. Was it safe, and he couldn't sleep with it on his mind, that sort of thing. Go on, Mr. Abel, why do you interest me? Well, then he took his candle and went out of the room. I thought the laudanum had had some effect on him, which the doctor hadn't foreseen, and I was afraid of an accident, so I followed him. He went to Miss Verinder's sitting room, and I saw him take the diamond out of a cabinet. I also saw that Miss Verinder was standing at another door, and I knew that she'd seen it too. 
Then I hurried back to my room, or else he would have blundered into me as he came by. The, and then what happened? I'd scarcely got back when he came through the communicating door into my room. He seemed to be awake, yet not awake, if you understand me. Mm. Well, I was afraid to say anything, but he spoke first. Put it in your father's bank at Frising Hall, he said. It'll be safe there. And then he turned and went back into his own room. He gave me the diamond, Mr. Luca. He put it into my hand. But the next morning, was there not a hue and cry? Oh, of course. The police are there still. But for reasons of her own, Miss Verinder has said nothing about what she saw. And I, of course, am not suspected. No. Yeah, but as a man of honour, Mr. Ablewhite, are you not obliged to declare what has happened? Uh, that Mr. Blake took this stone apparently under the influence of a drug? Uh, and that it's in your possession? Oh, yes, as a man of honour. But I have my reasons for keeping silent. Pure greed, perhaps? How dare you, sir? How dare you, after what you've just confessed, speak to me like that? Come, your reasons. I don't see that my reasons are any concern of yours. If you want me to consider involving myself as an accomplice to your crime, you will tell me your reasons or you will leave my house. Very well. I was... I am pressed for money. Desperately pressed. Debts? Of course, debts. What kind of debts? I'm one of two trustees for a young man's fortune. Twenty thousand pounds. I have sold every farthing of it out of the funds. And why should you do that? Do you not have sufficient income of your own? Not... Not to maintain a villa in the suburbs. And a certain lady who lives in it, and who is accustomed to a luxurious style of living. <laughs> and uh, the other trustee's signature? Forged. So, uh, uh, forgive me for being so intrusive. Uh, so, what is your present financial position? I have £300 to find tomorrow for the young man, the half-yearly payment from his capital. And when the trust lapses on his coming of age next February, 20000 I don't even have the 300 I've tried to borrow from my father, but he won't lend me a penny. That is why I kept the diamond. It's all that stands between me and ruin. <sighs> Yes, well, uh, you've been to me before to borrow money. Under necessity, yes. And I hold certain promissory notes of yours. Yes. Uh, Mr. Ablewhite, even in my line of business, this is a, a doubtful, I, I might even say a dangerous transaction. You will therefore not expect me to be, well, what shall I say, a, a liberal? But you yourself have just valued this stone at £30,000. It's a fortune! And you say you can't be liberal? Here is what I propose. And I will lend you the sum of £2,000 on... £2,000? Oh, that's... On uh, condition that you deposit the Moonstone with me as a pledge. If after one year you pay me £3,000, you may have the Moonstone back. If you do not, then you forfeit the pledge. The Moonstone stays with me. In this... Unfortunate case, I will make you a present of those promissory notes of yours. It's monstrous, outrageous. Certainly not. Very well, here is your diamond. Good night, Mr. Ablewhite. No, no, wait. I have no choice. I can't give the young man his £300 tomorrow. If it weren't for that, I should have taken the diamond to Amsterdam and had it cut up. But there's no time. Very well. I accept. But I must have £300 now. Of course, Mr. Ablewhite. I'm not an unreasonable man. £300 now and the balance of £1,700 in one week. Oh, and of course, now that we've entered into this little business agreement, you may rely implicitly upon my silence, Mr. Ablewhite. Mr. Luca, you, you amaze me. Godfrey Ablewhite was my cousin. I would no more have suspected him of taking the Moonstone than of... than... Than of having the villa and the mistress? Yeah, perhaps. But it is well within my experience, I can assure you, that these philanthropic gentlemen often have another side to their lives, a side which they would not care to have revealed to their ladies' committees. And how did he raise the £3,000 to redeem the Moonstone? One of those committee ladies fortunately died and left him £5,000. 
It happened a few weeks ago, I believe. Yes. Just before I went to Yorkshire for the experiment, Mr Cuff, I tried to get in touch with Godfrey. Someone at his club told me he'd gone to Europe. Rotterdam, you may be sure, to make arrangements to have the diamond cut up into a marketable commodity. Of course, the Rotterdam steamer. The boy told us he was trying to spend the night aboard it. And where, I wonder, is that troublesome jewel now? I think there's little doubt it's well on its way back to where it came from. Then there's a chance you might recover it yet. I think not, Mr Luca. The Indians, from what we know of them, will not take the direct route. They will cover their tracks, pursue them how we may. And I think I can speak for Rachel when I say that we don't want it back. <laughs> not, not want a stone like, like that worth 30,000? If it were worth ten times that amount, I would say the <laughs> same. Well, I, mean, uh, I, I believe it was deliberately left to Rachel by her uncle to cause as much trouble and misery as it possibly could. Well, it has done that. Let it come to rest where it belongs. I want no more of it. Well said, Mr Blake. I should say the same in your place. But Mr Luca has, on his own admission, been an accomplice to the theft. What's that? There's no denying it now, Mr Luca. You admitted it in front of two witnesses. And you have made a cool a thousand pounds out of it. Yeah, but the, 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 that, that, that is my business, gentlemen. Only my business. Mr Luca. Uh, if you would restore that £1,000 to Miss Verinder, to whom surely it belongs, then I think Mr Blake and I would be prepared to overlook your part in the affair. Well, if I... not... Well, I shall be returning to the police this afternoon to assist them in their inquiries into Mr Hebelwhite's death. Very, very well. Very well. Here, let me write you my cheque. Godfrey Abelwhite, eh? Well, well. A man doesn't spend a lifetime in my profession without becoming inured to surprise. But I own I'm surprised now. But it does explain one or two things. His proposal of marriage to Miss Verinder. And his calm acceptance when she released herself from the engagement. You couldn't get her the money? Right, Mr Cuff. Rachel only has a life interest in her mother's property, and there's no raising 20,000 on that. <laughs> Oh, there's something else. When I was trying to find anyone who'd been at Rachel's birthday dinner to try to reconstruct what happened that night, I made inquiries for Godfrey at his club. Mm -hmm. I happened to meet a mutual acquaintance, and he told me that Godfrey had become engaged to another young lady, Dear. another very rich young lady, mm -hmm. and that had founded because he couldn't come to an agreement with her father over the marriage settlement. I didn't attach any importance to it at the time. Now, that would have been when he was travelling abroad on his legacy of 5,000. Yes. You know, it may sound absurd, but I can't help feeling sorry for the fellow. Wasted sympathy. It was all his own doing. Yes, but what a position to be in. On the one hand, known in society as a respected philanthropist. On the other, keeping a mistress and having squandered money held in trust by him in order to do so. And he very nearly got away with it. Yeah. If he'd got to Amsterdam with the Moonstone, there would just have been time to get it cut up into separate stones, to have sold them and been able to have restored the young man's fortune when it was due. He might even have made a small profit. And as it is, he gave his life for it, for a wretched piece of carbon. It's funny. I remember him calling it that the day I gave it to Rachel, and everyone else was saying how wonderful it was. And I suppose there's no doubt it was the Indians who murdered him? No moral doubt, no. Though I don't suppose we'll ever be able to prove it in a court of law. <laughs> so what will the inquest verdict be? Almost certainly willful murder by person or persons unknown. Well, let's put it all behind us, gentlemen. It's a year of my life. I never want to live again. <laughs> but one good thing has come out of it. And I'd like you both to be the first to know. <laughs> Rachel and I are going to be married. Ah, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Mr Blake, I wonder if I might ask you a small favour. My dear Mr Cuff, anything. As you know, in my retirement, I've been able to give more of my time to growing roses. And I'm rather proud of having produced a new variety. Give me considerable pleasure, Mr. Blake, if I could have your permission to call it Rachel Verinder. Uh -huh. A pretty name. And a pretty name for a rose, too, <laughs> darling. With all my heart. And Rachel will be delighted. I know she will. And so I come to the end of the story. Or almost the end. One thing more remains to tell. Rachel and I had been married for about three months when I received a letter from abroad, much crumpled from its travels. It was from Mr. Murthwaite, the Indian explorer. About a fortnight since, I found myself in a province of northwestern India called Katiawa, where the people are fanatically devoted to the old Hindu religion. 
I resolved not to leave these romantic regions without looking once more upon the magnificent desolation of Somnath. I had not been long upon the road before I noticed that other people, by twos and threes, appeared to be travelling in the same direction. On the second day the number had increased to hundreds, and on the third to thousands. I learnt that there was to be a great religious ceremony in honour of the God of the Moon. The shrine was on a hilltop, and looking back I could see tens of thousands of people dressed in white and carrying torches. In front of the shrine stood three men. My companion told me they were Brahmins who had forfeited their caste in the service of the god. They were to purify themselves by pilgrimage, to set forth in three separate directions, never to look on each other's faces again, never to rest on their wanderings until the day of their death. They descended from the shrine and took their ways, the crowd parting for them and closing in again, obliterating the paths they had made. Then the curtain in front of the shrine was drawn aside, and the figure of the god was seen, his four arms stretching out to the four corners of the earth. And in his forehead shone the yellow diamond I had last seen on a woman's dress in England. How it came back to its rightful place I do not know. But I do know that after eight centuries, the moonstone looks out once more over the sacred city in which its story began. What will be the next adventure in the life of that accursed jewel? Who can tell? That was the final part of The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Brian Gear. The cast, Sergeant Cuff, John Franklin Robbins, Gabriel Betteridge, John Sharp, Franklin Blake, John Telfer, Rachel Verinder, Sally Baxter, Godfrey Abelwhite, Geoffrey Beavers, Mr Bruff, Nat Brenner, Ezra Jennings, Philip Sully, Septimus Luca, Adrian Egan, Mr. Murthwaite, Gordon DeLew, Gooseberry, Debbie Cumming, Hopkins, Barclay Johnson, and Woods, Emlyn Harris. The music was composed and conducted by Sidney Sager, and the programme, which came from Bristol, was directed by Brian Miller. The Haunted Hotel by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio by Rod Beecham Excuse me, it's so terribly crowded. Would you mind if I shared your table? Oh. Not at all. Please feel free to do so. Thank you. Adele gives wonderful tea parties, but she does tend to ask half of London. <laughs> I don't think we've met, have we? Not to my knowledge, no. My name is Agnes Lockwood. And you are... You are Agnes Lockwood? Yes. And you pretend not to know who I am? I'm terribly sorry. Should I know you? I am the Contessa Narona. I see. I had no idea. Oh, you must hate me. And of course I don't hate oh. you. No, really. It was made quite clear. I'm aware that you knew nothing of my situation. Will you believe me that when I discovered the truth, I tried to convince him to honour his obligations? Of course I believe you. But it would have made no difference... 
No woman would want to spend her life with a man who clearly wishes to spend it with someone else. However, in the circumstances, I'm sure it would be better for both of us. Oh, oh wait. Please. Can I ask you to do something for me? Let me see your face. Oh. If you insist. If you would just lift your veil for a moment. Is that too much to ask? Of course not. <clears throat> there. My face. For what it's worth. <gasps> My evil angel. What? What is it? Oh, oh. oh Chantessa, can, can somebody help me, please? What's the matter, miss? This lady, I think she's fainted. Can you get me some smelling salts? Oh. Agnes, what has yes. happened? Oh, Adele, I, I don't know. I, she wanted to look at my face. Your face? And then she fainted. But her expression, I, I've never seen anyone look so frightened. Come in. There's a lady, sir. She insists on seeing you. Does she indeed? Well, she can insist as much as she likes. I've had a trying day. And as soon as I've finished these notes, I intend to spend a quiet evening at my club. Um, she's a countess, Doctor. I don't care if it's Her Majesty herself. Tell her she can come back in the morning. It may be too late in the morning. Madam, you can't just Doctor, walk in. My bro you have the reputation of being the sort of man who never runs away from a chance. Uh, do I indeed? So I simply want you to answer one straightforward question. Uh, and what is that? Whether or not I am going mad. Uh, madam, I think you have been given an exaggerated notion of my abilities. All I ask is five minutes of your time to tell you my story and to hear your opinion. Uh, all right, Robert, you may leave us. Well, if you're sure, Doctor. <laughs> Quite sure. Very well, madam. You have my full attention. Oh, doctor. This afternoon, I met someone. Someone I had unintentionally wronged. A young Englishwoman who had been engaged to the man I am going to marry. A woman of whose existence I give you my word. I had been totally unaware until after I had agreed to become his wife. I see. Indeed, when I discovered the truth, I offered, I insisted that he honored his obligation. But then he showed me a letter from the woman herself, a noble, high-minded letter releasing him from his promises, but also one that made it clear, gently but firmly, that there was no hope under any circumstances of ever renewing their relationship. Go on. He... He appealed to my compassion. You know what women are. I was too soft-hearted. And we are to be married this very week. I can see this has been very distressing for all parties, Contessa. But you spoke of... Madness. This afternoon, as I say, I met her by chance. We exchanged a few words. And then, I don't know why, I was seized with a need to study her face, to look into her eyes. But when I looked into them... I felt a terror that I have never felt in the whole of my life. A terror of what, exactly? Retribution. I felt at that moment she knew I was going to commit some dreadful crime and that she would make me pay for it. And then? I fainted. And when I recovered, she was gone. Well, 
Tell me. Am I mad? I think the best explanation I can offer is that you feel some sense of understandable guilt towards this woman, which you have tried to rationalize but can't, and that when you met her, it transformed itself into this irrational sense of foreboding. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, the much... mind is a strange organ, madam, which we are only just beginning to understand. Oh, is that the best you can do, doctor? Oh, then, I really am doomed. Why, Brown? You're very late this evening. I'd just about given you up. I was unexpectedly detained by a lady. Really? Well, do sit down and tell me about it, always assuming it's fit for my tender ears. Waiter, bring me a large whiskey, will you? Yes, Doctor. Obviously, the ladies put you through it. Yeah. Tell me, have you ever heard of the Contessa Nerona? <laughs> I take it that means you have. And am I to take it that you're the only man in London who hasn't? What a sheltered life you doctors lead. Certainly. I pay very little attention to casual gossip. Was it the Contessa in person who detained you? An extraordinary woman. Fascinating and utterly repellent. As pale as death. And her eyes. At once the cruelest I've ever seen and, and the saddest. Uh, what do you know of her? A great deal, and none of it to the lady's credit. But as you say, you're not partial to casual gossip. I think it would be fair to say that in this instance, my interest is professional. <laughs> of course. Well, they say she was, in fact, never married to the Count whose widow she claims to be. That she narrowly escaped being implicated in a poisoning trial in Vienna. That she was a spy for the Austrians in Milan. And that the man she claims is her brother isn't really her brother at all. What man is this? Are your whiskey, sir? Ah, thank you. He calls himself Baron Rivard. Word has it that he's a gambler at every table on the continent. And that most recently, Milady herself had to flee Paris under the accusation of running an illegal gambling salon. But I don't understand. What man of any sense or breeding would break off his engagement to marry such a woman? Hmm. Uh, would I have heard of him? That depends if the name Mulberry means anything to you. You're not serious. Never more so. Herbert John Westwick, first Baron Mulberry of Mulberry, Kings County, Ireland. That's the fish your Contessa has landed for herself. But the man must be mad. That's the kindest way of looking at it. Oh. oh. Henry, I'm so sorry. I had no idea you were there. Now don't distress yourself, Carstairs. Nothing you can say about my brother that would offend me. Unless, of course... You were foolish enough to try and defend him. It's a sad business, certainly. It's a vile business. The way my brother has treated Agnes is vile, beyond belief. There's no other way of putting it. Quite. D will you join us, Henry? Oh, if I'm not intruding. No, no, of course not. Whitebrow, this is Henry Westwick, Mulberry's youngest brother. How do you do? Except that he is no longer my brother. I told him so to his face. The thing is... Wybrow has just come hot foot from an interview with the lady herself, the so-called Contessa. Really? May I ask what you made of her, Doctor? I found her to be a very uh, troubled woman. I'm delighted to hear it. She's caused enough trouble for others. Yes, but to be fair, well, you know, women, they go where their hearts lead them. Always assuming they have a heart. No, but I mean, she's hardly marrying him for his money. The estate is entailed, surely. I mean, if anything happened to Montbarry, she wouldn't see a penny of it. Not of the estate, no. But I happened to learn only this morning that my brother, the Montbarry, has insured his life in her favour for the sum of £10,000. <laughs> Sounds like Montbarry's walked into a hornet's nest. Well, he only has himself to blame. After the way he's treated poor Agnes, he deserves anything that happens to him. Now, <clears throat> if you'll excuse me, gentlemen. Yes, yes, of course, pleasure to me. Oh, poor young devil. He certainly seems passionate about his brother's behaviour. No, no. He's in love with the girl himself. With Miss Lockwood? Yes. Well, they're cousins, you know. Agnes practically grew up with Herbert, Henry and Francis. He's the middle brother, next in line to the title. And Henry's been sweet on her since they were children. Rumour has it Henry even proposed to her. But she preferred the eldest brother. Agnes felt about Montbarry the way Henry feels about her. Maybe even more passionately. Montbarry and your Contessa between them. 
they broke Agnes's heart. Megan, what is it? It's Master Henry, Miss Agnes. Wondering if he might have a word with you. I, uh, I'm not sure if at the moment... He's I... going away, Miss. He wants to say goodbye before he leaves. All right. Show him in. Right. Agnes, my dear, I just... Oh, I'm sorry. I've come at a bad moment. You're, You're burning his letters? You've come at exactly the right moment, Henry. This is the very last one. Oh, there. That's done. Now that they're actually married, it seemed appropriate somehow. Agnes? Did you go to the church? Of course I didn't. How could you even think it? None of the family went. Not even Francis. Well, Francis least of all. He feels even more contempt for Herbert than I do. And even if he wanted to, do you think Susanna would have let him? Oh, Susanna is a dear... She's just written, in fact, asking me to go and stay with the family. Shall you go? I think so. It will help me take my mind off. I understand Montbarry and the Contessa went abroad the day after the marriage. Because no decent person would look them in the face. I think they're in Italy somewhere. They could be in hell for all I care. F forgive me. And now Megan tells me you're going abroad. I'm out of spirits, Agnes. I, I, I want a change. Besides, if I stayed here... There are things I might say to you that probably better left unsaid. For the moment, anyway. Excuse me, miss, I'm sorry to disturb. But little Mrs Ferrari is here, wondering if she might say a few words to you. Uh, of course. Henry, you remember Emily Bidwell, my favourite pupil at the village school. Mm. She married an Italian courier named Ferrari, but I'm afraid it hasn't turned out very well. Do you mind my having her in for a minute? I'd be happy to see her some other time. I think probably it's best if I say goodbye. As you wish. Take care of yourself, Henry. This way, sir. Don't be downhearted, Mr Henry. Try her again when you come back. Well, Emily, what can I do for you? I'm afraid to tell you, miss. Afraid? Have I become some sort of dragon? Is it your husband who's making you afraid? No, no, miss. In his own way, he's devoted to me and the children. But he has got a temper on him, especially if he's not working. But didn't you tell me he had an engagement to take some ladies to Italy? That fell through, miss. And it's left him lost in the queue for any more work that's going. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. The thing is, miss, if he could be privately recommended... Oh, I see. Because a letter inquiring for a good courier came to the office this morning. Six months at least, travelling through Italy and then staying on in Venice. Only there are other people ahead of Mr Ferrari. But if he could send off his testimonials with a special recommendation from you, it, it might just turn the scales. Why, yes, of course. Who are the people concerned? Emily? Oh, I'm ashamed to tell you, miss. What on earth do you mean? It's Lord Montbarry. Emily! How could you? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss O. Oh, I, I beg your pardon. I'm not quite as bad as you think me, but I beg your pardon all the same. No, wait. Wait. Oh, you must have been desperate to have dared to ask this of me. Oh, money's getting very short, Miss. Ferrari's temper's getting shorter. And there are the children. But I expect we'll manage. No, no. You're right, Emily. It's not really such a terrible thing to ask. Oh, God bless you, Miss. you really go back to London tomorrow, Agnes? Susanna, I really must. There are things I have to do. We'll all miss you, especially the children. You've been here no time at all. <laughs> I've been here a good three months, Susanna. I can't trespass on your charity any longer. Oh, nonsense. There's no question of charity. 
Or if there is, we're the ones on the receiving end. Whatever do you mean? Oh, the children absolutely adore you. In fact, Francis and I were discussing it only last night, and we were saying... Uh, no. No, you'd probably be offended. Susanna, what are you trying to say? We were wondering what you would think of formalising the arrangement, becoming the children's official governess. Oh, there, now I have offended you. No, you haven't. Not in the least. I think it's a wonderful idea. Really? Then you'll do it. Can I think about it? Just for a week or two. Oh, please do. Please do. And you know what travellers we are. I promise you, you'll see the world. Oh, Miss Agnes. Thank heavens you're back. Megan, whatever is the matter? It's little Mrs Ferrari. She's been here all day waiting for you. She's in a dreadful state. Dreadful. Emily? Oh, miss! Whatever could have happened to him? I don't understand. Happened to whom? My husband! It's Ferrari, Miss Agnes. He's left Lord Montbarry without a word of warning. And nobody knows what's become of him. Who told you this? The courier's office, miss. The secretary himself. Calm yourself, Emily. <laughs> I'm sure there's some perfectly reasonable explanation. What explanation could there be, miss? I know he's not always the best of men, but to walk away from his employers without a word... Why would he do such a thing? Was there nothing in his letters that might give you some sort of explanation? Not really, miss. I have them all here. The last one, perhaps. It made me feel uneasy when I read it, but it still doesn't explain anything. May I? Of course, miss. Maybe you'll see something I couldn't. Dear Emily, more of my lord's economy. Instead of going to a hotel, we have hired a damp... Instead of damp going to a hotel, we have hired the damp rambling old palace. Apparently, it comes cheaper for a two-month term. My lord tried to get it for longer. He says the peace of Venice is good for his nerves. But if foreign speculator has it quiet, the palace, and is going to turn it into a hotel... The Baron is still with us. He and his lordship seem to disagree more and more with every passing day. What about exactly, I couldn't say. But it seems to be to do with money. And it's had a bad effect on Milady as well. She was much nicer before the Baron arrived. The result is Lord Montbarry shuts himself up in his own room with his books and sees as little of his wife and the Baron as possible. The thing is, I've heard the rumours that the Baron and Milady are something quite different from the brother and the sister they claim to be. If my lord's suspicions are once awakened, the consequences will be terrible. However, the pay is good, and I cannot afford to talk of leaving. You see, miss? He can't afford to talk of leaving. And yet, within a week of writing that letter, he just ups and walks out. At least, that's what she says. She, the so-called Contessa, that's what she wrote to the courier's office. But you think she's lying? Oh, I don't know what to think. Oh, miss, what should I do? It's Mr Henry, miss. Ah, oh, Henry! How wonderful! Just the person I wanted to see. Agnes. In fact, I was just writing to you. I very much need your advice. My advice? About Emily, Mrs Ferrari. Something very strange as... Henry, what is it? I, um... <clears throat> I... I have some news. Bad news, I, I suppose. Yes, even in the circumstances, it's very bad news. Montbarry is dead. Dead? Herbert is dead? I'm afraid so, yes. But when? How? Bronchitis. But Herbert never suffered from bronchitis. Apparently it came on very suddenly. I don't know very much about it. But it seems he had a most able physician in attendance, a Dr Bruno. But there was nothing he or anyone else could do. I see. I'm 
so sorry. In a sense, he was dead to me already. I would never have seen him again in this life. Oh. I think perhaps I should uh, lie down for a little. Of course. It's, uh, Megan. M Megan! Whatever is it? Could you help her to bed? He's dead. Lord Montbarry. Herbert is dead. Oh, my poor, poor lamb. How, how is she? Oh, she'll be all right, sir. I've given her one of my sleeping drafts. Is there anything I can do? No, not at the moment, sir. But come back in the morning. She'll be needing you. What on earth is that? Emily. Where's Miss Agnes? I have to see her. Well, you can't. She's sleeping. Emily? What's all this about? Oh, sir. Sir, they've killed him. What? Who are you talking about? That Contessa and her Baron's so-called brother. They've murdered him. Lord Montbarry? No, my husband. The pair of them had done away with Mr Ferrari. There's no other explanation. What on earth makes you say that? Because of this. It came in the post this morning. A cheque made out in my name for £1,000. No. And this is the note that came with it. To console you for the loss of your husband? You see, sir, it's blood money. What else can it be? Are you sure you want to talk about this, Agnes? Perhaps you shouldn't excite yourself. But what on earth can it mean? Who can have sent it? Well, this is the thing. We know that now. Emily made inquiries at the insurance company. It was my brother. Herbert? He sent the money. And so it would appear. The doctor, Dr Bruno... Apparently Herbert placed it into his hands with urgent instructions to put it in the post immediately. But why would he do that? I don't understand. Neither does anyone else. Well, perhaps Emily will find out the truth. She's gone to see the Contessa. The Contessa is in England? In London, at Norbury's Hotel. She arrived yesterday. But why has she come back? Oh, why do you think? To collect the £10,000 that became due to her on my brother's death. What is it you want from me? It's very simple, me lady. I come to acknowledge the receipt of the money sent to Ferrari's widow. Are you mad or drunk? I'm no more mad or drunk than you are, my lady. Ah, then you are only insolent, like so many of your countrymen. My lady... You walk in here. You mention the name of a courier who left us very strangely. Are you his wife? I'm not his wife. I'm his widow, as you very well know. Oh, it was an evil hour when Miss Lockwood recommended my poor husband to be his lordship's courier. What did you say? I said it was an evil one. <laughs> liar. You liar. Tell me that you're lying, or I swear to God, I strangle you with my own hands. I, 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 I don't, don't. Tell me that you lied when you used Miss Lockwood's name. Just now. Oh, no, 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 no. That's no good. <laughs> I wouldn't believe you now if you swore it under oath. I'll believe no one but the woman herself. Where does she live? Tell me where she lives, you noxious little insect. It's her, miss. Who? The Contessa. She says she has to talk to you at once. What impertinence! Tell her to go to the devil! No, Megan... Wait. Show her in. Agnes? She may have some explanation about Ferrari. I want to hear what she has to say. Forgive me, Miss Lockwood. I know you have no desire to lay eyes on me, but I have to ask you one simple question. Have you indeed? A question which no one can answer but, Miss Lockwood. When the courier Ferrari applied to my late husband for employment, did you... 
Did you permit Ferrari to make sure of being chosen as our courier by using your name? I have known Ferrari's wife for many years. Yes. <laughs> there you are, madam. You've received your answer. I have received my sentence. Just one moment, Contessa. I have answered your question. Now, will you answer one of mine? If I can. You have spoken of Ferrari. No trace of him has been found anywhere in England. Have you any news of him? You will know what has become of Ferrari when the time is ripe. What do you mean? Someone will tell you. Perhaps your ladyship will be the person. Perhaps I will if... If... if what? If Miss Lockwood forces me to it. How can I do that? Do you mean to say my will is stronger than yours? When I took your hero from you and blighted your life, you were made the instrument of retribution for my sins. I am certain of it. Such things have happened before. One person has been the means of innocently ripening the growth of evil in another. Henry, do you understand what she's saying? There's nothing easier. She knows perfectly well what has become of Ferrari and she's simply trying to confuse you with a cloud of nonsense. You must make allowances for women, Mr Westwick. We all talk nonsense. So, goodbye, Miss Lockwood. We shall meet again, either here in England or in Venice, where my husband died. And it will be for the last time. Do you think she is mad? I think she is simply wicked. I believe she came here to enjoy the luxury of frightening you. She has frightened me. I'm anxious about you, Agnes. If, if I hadn't been here, who knows what that vile woman might have said or done. It's all right, Henry. No, Agnes, please. Listen, I, I can't bear the thought of you spending your life alone and unprotected, especially after what's happened today. I don't need protecting, Henry. Of course you do. All women need protection. And you must know how I've always dreamed of being the one who does protect you. Please, Henry, don't. Have I offended you? Of course not. And I know how you feel, Henry. And of course I'm touched and grateful, but... But you don't return my feelings. It's too soon, Henry. It's too soon to know what I feel. About anything. I'm sorry, I've been very clumsy. I know you're only concerned for my well-being. But I can set your mind at rest about that at least. For the next year, I shall be well looked after. Oh, by whom? By none other than your brother Francis and my oldest friend in the world, Susanna. You're going to live with him? Oh, I shall earn my keep, Henry. I shall spend my time as governess to their delightful children. Yes, but... It will give me time to think, Henry. To recover. To sort out the jumble in my poor, confused head. When you say, sort it out... Please, you... Henry... I've no idea what I'll be feeling a year from now. I'm not saying things will be different, and I'm not saying they won't be, either. I know it isn't fair, but it is the best I can do. All right, then. A year it is. Francis? Francis! Good Lord! Henry! Is it really you? It's really me, big brother. But I had no idea you were in Paris. No, I wasn't, until an hour ago. I've just got off the train. Well, well. But, but, what are you doing here? What do you think? Come to see my nieces and nephews. I haven't laid eyes on them for over a year. I see. Well, touching as this display of avuncular devotion undoubtedly is, you're sure it isn't their governess you've come to see? Well, Agnes, too, of course. How is she? Uh, as sweet and charming as ever. But has she recovered to any degree? Uh, you'd better come back to the hotel. Perhaps the sight of you will put some colour in her cheeks. Agnes, are you busy? Not in the least. Simone has taken the children to the Tuileries and I'm doing my best to correct their mathematics. Good. 
I've timed it perfectly. I had a surprise for you. Henry! He arrived in Paris this very morning. <sighs> Agnes, it's wonderful to see you again. Well, I'll leave you to it. I have various things I must attend to. So, Agnes, how are you? As you see me, Henry, how do I appear to you? Not terribly happy, I must say. No. I thought... I thought with all the time that's gone by, you might have come to a different frame of mind. Did you? Well, I'm sorry to have to disappoint you. Agnes! Henry, when I see you... It reminds me of everything I've suffered. Can't you see? It's left its mark on me for life. I swear, Francis, I'll never understand women. As long as I live. <laughs> you must give her time, Henry. Time? I've given her a whole year. It's true, Francis. I thought that being with us and the children would help her to take a more positive attitude. Mm, she seems to feel the loss of Monbarry as though he died faithful to her. She mourns him in a way that none of us does. Well, even if he was unworthy of her, he was still the man of her choice. Mm. It's in her nature to be faithful to his memory. <sighs> I don't know, Henry. Perhaps things will change when we get to Venice. Venice? It's our next port of call. We're going to try out this wonderful new hotel everyone's talking about, the palace. Perhaps the change will have a beneficial effect on Agnes. For heaven's sake, Herbert died in Venice. It will only make matters worse. Or it might bring things to a head. Enable her to say goodbye to him once and for all. Henry, I've just had the most wonderful idea. Why don't you come with us to Venice? What? That's an excellent idea. Why don't you do that, little brother? Stay here for the next couple of weeks and then we can all travel together. The idea doesn't seem to appeal. No, no, it's not that, is it? It's just, I, I don't think Agnes would relish my company at the moment. I seem to irritate her, to say the least of it. I think, I think it's wiser if I make my farewells. All right, then. You leave. Go on to Venice ahead of us. And meanwhile, I'll use all my best efforts on Agnes, try and convince her she's done her duty by Montbarry's memory and that it's time she was free to think about her own happiness. By the time we join you, she might be in a different frame of mind. What do you think? Your cigar, signore. Oh, thank you. Can I fetch you anything else? No, no, that's all. Thank you. It's a lovely night, isn't it, signore? Mm. Yeah, it certainly is. Lovely night in a lovely city. Good night, signore. Good night. Oh. Hello? Who's there? You! Mr. Westwick. For a moment, I couldn't believe it. Contessa, what are you doing in Venice? I heard you and your brother had gone to America. Oh, you heard correctly. Uh, may I sit down? I'm smoking a cigar. I like cigars. Well, sit down then. I can't stop you. Thank you. So I take it you lost your appetite for things American? I lost more than my appetite. I lost my companion. Oh, I see. He found more congenial company? Another sister, perhaps? He died. Oh, dear. Shot to death in a gambling saloon. My brother died no extraordinary death, Mr. Westwick. He sank with many other unfortunate wretches under a fever prevalent in a city we happened to be visiting. And now you've returned to Venice, in spite of what must surely be unhappy memories. Yes. I couldn't help myself. Whatever do you mean? If I had the will of my own, I would never have set foot in Venice. I hate the wretched city. But <laughs> here I am. Tell me, when does Miss Lockwood arrive? How the devil did you know Agnes was coming here? Let's say that I guessed it. And do you know why? I've no idea what the superficial reason may be. 
I only know that we are to meet. By chance, by destiny, call it whatever you like. Mm, chance seems to have a queer way of bringing the meeting about. We've arranged to stay at the Palace Hotel. Your name is not on the visitors' list. Surely you understand my reasons for shunning that hotel. I'm afraid I have absolutely no idea. If you say so. Nevertheless, I think you are right, Mr. Westwick. Destiny demands that I move into the Palace Hotel. <laughs> I shall see to it immediately. Oh, isn't it beautiful? In the moonlight? What? The Church of San Marco. <sighs> Goodbye, San Marco, by moonlight. I shall not see you again. She's here? In Venice? More than that. She's moved into the palace. Oh, that's absolutely dreadful. Well, we can't possibly stay in the same hotel as that woman. I suppose we shall just have to move bag and baggage. Oh, don't be absurd, Francis. I'm sorry, but there really is no need for it. Are you sure, Agnes? Quite, quite sure. Henry, have you actually talked to the wretched woman? I exchanged a few words with her, yes. Well, perhaps you can persuade her to move. She must see the situation is impossible. I think that might be rather difficult. I got the impression that she booked in here with the specific intention of seeing Agnes. You, boy, come here. Yes, Signora, how can I be of service? Tell me, do they pay you good wages for the job you do? The money is poor, Signora, but the tips sometimes can be very good. Ah, yes. The tips. Uh, what would you say to a hundred lira? What would the signora require of me in order to earn such a gratuity? Hmm, nothing bad. I just want you to help me play a joke. Signora? A harmless joke on a friend of mine. You can have no objection to that, surely. Agnes, my dear, whatever is it? Oh, Francis! Oh, God, the things I've seen! Have another sip, my dear. No, no, I'm all right. You're not all right. I will be in a minute. Agnes? Can you tell us what happened? It was the room. I had to sleep in a different room. Why? There'd been some sort of accident in mine. So they took me to another room. Room 14. I felt uncomfortable in it from the start. I don't know why. It was a perfectly decent, well-furnished room. There was something about it, something oppressive. Nevertheless, I, I got into bed, and after a little while I managed to get to sleep. And then, when I woke up... <gasps> you! What are you doing here? <gasps> it was the Contessa, sitting in a chair opposite the bed looking straight at me, except she wasn't looking at me, she was asleep. Either that or, or she'd fainted. Wake up! How dare you! How, how did you get in? I shouted at her, but she didn't answer, didn't stir, just went on sitting there. 
But still, she didn't move. And then... And then... Oh, dear God, I shall never forget it. Agnes, dear. No, I'm all right. It was a head. A terrible human head floating in the air in the middle of the room. I've never seen anything like it. There was no flesh. The skin was stretched tight over the bones and, and dark, like the skin of a mummy. The eyes were closed. The lips, oh, oh, horrible blue lips, were pulled back from the teeth in a terrible grin. For a moment, it seemed suspended between the floor and the ceiling, and then it started to descend towards me. Oh, and then there was this vile smell, like the smell of graveyards. And then the head stopped, moved away from me, moved towards the Contessa as she lay in the chair. And then... And then the eyes opened. <gasps> the eyes, bright, with the glassy film of death, were fixed on the Contessa with a look of unbearable hatred. And then slowly, they turned back to me. Oh, my dear. The head floated across the room towards the chimney place. It turned round and fixed that terrible glance on me one more time, almost as though it was beckoning to me. And then, it went into the wall. And you say this is where the head disappeared? Just there, at this very spot. Sounds surprisingly hollow. Does that mean anything? Well, there are two possibilities. Either Agnes dreamt the whole thing... It wasn't a dream. Oh, I only wish it was. Or the thing was trying to tell her something, draw attention to whatever lies behind this wall. I think we should get hold of the manager, persuade him by whatever means we can to let us take the plaster down. Ah, Henry. I've just learnt the most extraordinary thing. I was talking to the servant who made you change rooms last night. I put the fear of God into him and he finally told me the truth. About what? There was nothing wrong with your original room. He was paid to trick you into sleeping here last night. God. Paid by whom? By the Contessa. I'm right, aren't I, Henry? You are. She wanted me to sleep here last night. She wanted me to see what I saw. I think it was her way of confessing. Confessing to what? I shudder to think. Well, one thing... The misbehaviour of one of his employees might give us a little leeway with the manager. All right, stand well back. Let's see what we have here. Signore, perhaps in these circumstances I should be the one. No, 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 no. I'd, ra I'd rather see for myself. Henry? Just a moment. Go. Well? There's a body. Oh. It's a man. It's just about all you can tell. It has rotted away to almost nothing. God, terrible. Can I see? No, no, you most certainly cannot. Stay there. There's no point, anyways. There's nothing anyone could identify him by. Hardly any face, clothing. It must have been there well over a year. Ah. Over a year. 
Does that signify? I was merely thinking, Signore, that, that the hotel has only been open a few months. Whoever is responsible for this terrible thing, it, it must have been before that time. But surely during the rebuilding? Uh, no, Signore. This part of the palace was left unaltered. Some decorating, yes, but the structure was left exactly as it was. Ferrari! What? What do you mean? In his last letter to Emily, Ferrari said Herbert was angry because he could only rent the palace for a few months. It was going to be turned into a hotel. This must be the place. Well, it's possible, I suppose. I'm certain of it. I think this is the room in which Herbert died. That's why the Contessa wanted me to sleep here. Yes, but even so, it doesn't account for the body behind the wall. <sighs> Poor Emily. Emily? It's Ferrari. I'm sure it is. Of course. Of course, you're right. They, they put him there. They? The Contessa and her so-called brother. You know, Ferrari never walked out without giving notice. They killed him and hid his body behind the wall. But why? Because he knew something about Herbert's death. I don't care what the famous Dr Bruno says. I've always known there was something suspicious about Herbert dying of bronchitis. Ferrari must have found out the truth. And they killed him to shut his mouth. No, I am sorry, Signore. There can be no doubt at all. I will stake my reputation. Your brother died a natural death. But couldn't there have been some sort of poison? No, there is no poison that can imitate the symptoms of bronchitis. And all the symptoms were present. Symptoms? Yes. Difficulties in breathing, fever, occasional lapses of the mind. But what do you mean, lapses? I would speak to him in English and he would answer in Italian. I would switch to Italian, he would answer in English. It was no matter, most of the time he could hardly speak at all. Go on. I attended him for three days, giving him what medical care I could. For a time I thought he might rally, but on the fourth day he contracted severe pneumonia, by the fifth day he was dead. Before he died, did he ask you to do anything for him? Yes, yes, he gave me a letter. He begged me to post it for him. His eyes were full of entreaty, like those of a spaniel. Do you remember who it was addressed to? Of course, yes, to a Mrs. Emily Ferrari. I still can't imagine why he did that, why it was so important. I do not know, Signore. He said nothing. Now, is there anything else I can help you with? Yes, actually, Doctor. There is one last question I'd like to ask. You go up and tell the others, Henry. I'll wait here. Will, we, will you be all right? Yes. I'll sit on the veranda. There's so much to think about. Oh, I'll be back directly. You're sure you'll be all right? Quite sure, Henry. Off you go. Ah, uh, Mr Lockwood. Oh, yes. What is it? I have a message for you from the Contessa Naronda. It's a little strange. Uh, perhaps you will understand it. What did she say? She said it was uh, time for you to keep your final appointment. Uh, is she in her room? No, she said she would wait for you on the Ponte della Paglia. Uh, where is that? It is near the Bridge of Sizer, uh, by the Grande Canal. Ah, oh, yes, yes, I know it. Uh, when Mr Westwick comes back, will you tell him where I've gone? You will not wait for him? No. This is a private appointment. So, you are here at last. Yes, I'm here. Beautiful, is it not? The moonlight on the water. I see from your face that you know everything. Oh, I know nothing. I have guessed a great deal. We went to see the doctor who attended Herbert when he was dying. He said something very strange. And what was that? He said that in his delirium, Herbert lapsed back and forth between English and Italian. But Herbert knew almost no Italian. And perhaps he learned it on his travels. And the doctor said something else. He said when Herbert asked him to post the letter to Mrs. Ferrari, his eyes were full of entreaty, like a spaniel's. Hmm. It seemed an odd way to think of Herbert. So... I asked the doctor one more question. Yes? 
I said, do you mean his eyes were brown, like those of a spaniel? And he said yes. Well, Herbert's eyes were blue. Blue as the sea. It was Ferrari's eyes that were brown. It wasn't Herbert, was it? Who died in that bed? It was Ferrari. You discovered that Ferrari was ill, knew that it was bound to be fatal, and so you found the perfect plan for killing Herbert with impunity. Uh. Ferrari would pretend to be Herbert all the time Dr. Bruno was treating him. In exchange, you would care for Ferrari's wife and children to the tune of a thousand pounds. Poor, wretched man. How could he refuse? It's the truth, isn't it? Why do you even ask? You know everything. No. I don't know what happened to Herbert. Did he suffer? Not greatly. It was poison. Oh. Something the Baron had found. He put it in his wine. It was painful, but it was over very quickly. Poor Herbert. Poor Herbert. He was not a good man. You know that. He didn't deserve to die like that. Mm. Perhaps not. And Ferrari, did he know what you'd done? He knew nothing. Perhaps he guessed. What difference does it make now? Of course it can be argued that you can prove none of this. I'm sure if we opened Herbert's coffin, even after all this time, there would be enough discrepancies to prove the body wasn't his. Good. So there is no escape. You have done what you were always meant to do. I, I don't understand you. From the moment we met, when you first looked into my eyes, you said I was your evil angel. More certainly than I have ever known anything in my life. Then why did you do it? Were you so weak? Were you so much in the Baron's power? All you had to do was refuse. Oh, oh. Oh, how easy it must be for someone who has lived the life you have to speak of resisting temptation. <laughs> if you only knew. But never mind. You are right. In the end, we bring our fate on ourselves. You are not to blame. Go now. Your work is finished. It's strange. I almost want to thank you. Thank me? It's as though, by finding out the truth about Herbert, I am finally free of his memory. Good. Then I have been of some service. Go to your destiny. We shall not meet again. Pray for me. Agnes, thank God. I was worried about you. Oh, there was no need, Henry. I was simply keeping an appointment. How could you let yourself be alone with that woman, knowing what she's capable of? It's done now, Henry. It's finished. Finished? It's only just begun. I'm going straight to the authorities to tell them everything we know. What was that? Nothing. Really? I thought I heard... Perhaps she's found some sort of peace. What? I, I don't understand. Never mind. Henry, would you like to take me home now? Agnes, you very well know I've been waiting all my life to take you home. Good. Let's go then, shall we? In the Haunted Hotel by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Rod Beecham, Agnes Lockwood was played by Jasmine Hyde, Henry Westwick by Harry Lloyd, 
Countess Narona, Adjua Ando, Francis Westwick, Simon Bubb, Susanna Westwick, Catherine Igo, Emily Ferrari, Alex Rivers, Megan, Josie Kidd, Dr. Wybrow, Gerard McDermott, Carstairs, James Laley, and Dr. Bruno by Rod Beecham. Other parts were played by the cast, and the play was directed by Bruce Young. Whether you kill a man in a duel or stab him in the back, the charge against you is the same these days, the charge of murder. The murderer may escape scot-free, the slain man may have deserved death a thousand times, yet the effect upon his family can only be regarded as disastrous, whatever the circumstances. This I was to discover for myself in the spring of 1858, when I was holidaying in Italy. Mr. Fortune? It is Mr. Fortune, isn't it? Miss Elmsley, good heavens, what brings you to Naples? My mother and I are here as guests of Mr. Monkton. Alfred, he's here too. But this is a most delightful surprise. Well, I hope you'll be my guest for dinner as soon as possible. Oh, uh, well... What's the matter? You seem troubled. May I join you for a moment? Yes, of course. Please, sit down. <laughs> How pretty the gardens are this time of year. I don't believe it's the gardens you wish to discuss. How well do you know Alfred, sir? <laughs> We're neither bosom friends nor distant acquaintances, ma'am, but something in between. Why? But he knows you well and trusts you, I believe. I hope so. Oh, Mr Fortune, if ever Alfred needed the help and advice of a friend, that moment is now. Is he in some kind of trouble? Let me tell you, in the strictest confidence, that Alfred is dying. What? Well, slowly, to be sure, and of no physical malady. But he is dying. And unless he receives help, and quickly, I believe he will be dead long before we can return to England. When Ada told me she'd met you at the Villa Reale Piers, I scarcely believed her at first. <laughs> Such a coincidence. What are you doing in Naples? The last time we met was at Wincott Abbey. Yes, indeed. Well, your Uncle Stephen was visiting at the time, I recall. Uncle Stephen. You met him then? <laughs> yes, of course you did. And if you'll forgive me, he was not a man I should greatly wish to meet a second time. There's no likelihood of that. Not in this world. What's the matter? What's caught your attention? What? What are you staring at so oddly? Nothing. Nothing at all. Um, Piers, would you object to sitting in a stronger light? Of course not. But isn't the reading lamp sufficient? I must have more light. As you please. I don't mind. Would you help me to light some candles? My hands... I find it difficult to stop them from trembling. What's wrong? Well, just light the candles, will you? Do I gather from what you said just now that your Uncle Stephen has died? His death is the sole reason for my being in Naples. Oh, really? You recognised at your one meeting with Stephen Monkton that he was uh, an unpleasant man? If I'm to be honest, I must confess, I found him... I'm sorry, but I found him depraved. <laughs> depraved. I can think of no word more apt to describe him, yet... I need him. Now that he's dead, I need him. Look, I can see you mean it, but I don't begin to understand you. I mean, why should you need him now when you clearly despised him during his lifetime? Oh, Piers. There's so much to tell you that... So much that is bizarre and terrifying. I, I scarcely know where to begin. Well, then tell me first about your uncle. Very well, then. <laughs> Since I'm already known as Mad Monkton to almost everyone in Naples, I may as well appear mad to you also. You don't appear in the least mad to me. 
But you do look distressed and unwell. There's a legend connected with Wincott Abbey and the Monkton family. I should like you to read before I proceed any further. Thank you. Uh, this is your handwriting, is it not? I copied it from the original, written on the blank leaf of the Abbey manuscript. But the legend existed long before that verse came to be written. When in Wincott Vault a place waits for one of Monkton's race, when that one forlorn shall lie graveless under open sky, beggared of six feet of earth, though lord of acres from his birth, that shall be a certain sign of the end of Monkton's line, dwindling ever faster, faster, dwindling to the last left master. From mortal ken, from light of day, Monkton's race shall pass away. <sighs> Now, I'd call this superior doggerel and nothing else. Doggerel or not, it is being accomplished. I am now the last left master, the last of that elder line of the family at which the prediction points. And the corpse of Stephen Monkton is not in the vaults of Wincott Abbey. Oh, but you surely can't take this nonsense seriously. My family has taken it seriously for the last 500 years. Every one of the Monktons was buried in Wincott Vault, no matter at what risk or sacrifice. For centuries, the succession of the dead in that vault has been unbroken, absolutely unbroken. Until now. The place mentioned in the prediction as waiting to be filled is Stephen Monckton's place. The voice that cries vainly to the earth for shelter is the voice of the dead. <sighs> You don't believe me, do you? But I swear to you it's true. I swear this. Because Stephen Monckton stands behind you at this moment, confirming me in my belief. I see. There. The figure of a dark-complexioned man standing up with his head uncovered. One of his hands still clutching a pistol has fallen to his side. The other presses a bloody handkerchief to his mouth. The spasm of mortal agony convulses his features. Plainly, as if he stood there living, I see him now at your side, with the death glare in his great black eyes. And thus I have seen him, ever since the moment of his death, at home and abroad, waking or sleeping day and night, we're always together, wherever I go. I promise you, Miss Elmsley, I was never more frightened in my life than I was in that room of Alfred's. His belief in the presence of his uncle was so real that I too felt it. Then, and for several hours more. But what happened afterwards? It seems that Alfred has not told you the whole story yet. His description of the prophecy, that wretched poem, had so exhausted him that I realised it might actually impair his health were he to continue the narrative. So I summoned his man. Together we persuaded Alfred to retire for the night. I supervised his taking of a little laudanum, enough to assure him of a good night's sleep, then I left. So you are still unaware of the peculiar circumstances of Stephen Monckton's death? I am indeed. But do they have any relevance to the prophecy? An extreme relevance. Alfred feels he cannot marry me until his uncle is interred in the vault, thereby assuring the continuance of the Monkton line. Well, to inter Stephen Monkton's body, it must first be found. And though Alfred has searched everywhere for three months now, he cannot discover it. But why should it be so appallingly difficult to find Monkton? He was murdered. In some respects, one might say legally, but he was murdered. Somewhere between Naples and Rome on February 22nd of this year. What happened, Piers, was this. It seems that my uncle and some equally unscrupulous Frenchman, the Count saint Lo, fell out over a gambling debt. Stephen Monckton challenged saint Lo to a duel, and it was to be a duel to the death. They were on Italian soil at the time, Mr Fortune, and both the Pope and the Neapolitan authorities had recently forbidden dueling. Well, certainly, as far as Naples' law was concerned, the survivor of any such duel would be dealt with as if he were a common murderer, 
and executed. For this reason, Moncton, Saint-Lô and their seconds were obliged to keep their duel a profound secret. In order to avoid Neapolitan legislation, they would fight outside the jurisdiction of Naples in a place agreed amongst themselves. In the event, the Count Saint-Lô shot Stephen Moncton. He died a few minutes later. Mr. Monckton II wrote a brief description of the manner of his death on a piece of paper and pinned the paper to Mr. Monckton's topcoat. The body was disposed of and the remaining members of the escapade vanished. Well, it's a hideous and perplexing affair, to be sure. But in view of so much detailed evidence, you amaze me that no trace of your uncle has been found. Uh, presumably because of the facts at your disposal, you have confined your inquiries to the Roman territory. Certainly. The search has been made there and there only. If I can believe the police, they and their agents have inquired for the place where the duel was fought, offering a large reward in my name to the person who can discover it, all along the high road from Naples to Rome. If you can believe the police? What else have they done? They've circulated descriptions of the duelists and their seconds and have attempted to trace the whereabouts of the Count San Lo. But all these efforts, supposing them to have been really made, have so far proved utterly fruitless. This leads me to believe the police take no great interest in the affair. You have something in mind, Mr Fortune? My belief is that the duel was fought somewhere near the Neapolitan frontier. Yes. If I were pursuing the search, I should only have pursued it parallel with the frontier, starting from west to east until I found myself among the, the lonely places in the mountains. That is my notion. Do you think it worth anything? I think it an inspiration. We must begin at once, because the police are certainly not to be trusted with it. I shall start myself. Tomorrow. Ah, uh, one moment, Alfred. What is it? You must forgive me mentioning this in your presence, Miss Elmsley, but there is one very real practicality to be observed. What, man? What? Your uncle has been dead since February the 22nd. It is now late May. However the body was disposed I'm of... I am certain it was never buried. That it is, in the words of the legend, graveless under open sky. Then my caveat becomes even more relevant. Forgive me, Miss Elmsley, but the corpse must now be hideously decomposed. If we find it, how shall it be conveyed back to Wincott? Well, that's the least of our problems. The moment I received news of my uncle's death, I had a lead-lined coffin prepared. It's here now. Where? Not five yards away. In my bedroom. Two days later, our preparations made... Alfred and I left Naples before sunrise without a soul in the streets to stare at us. You may imagine that I shrank instinctively from looking forward a single day into the future when I found myself starting in company with Mad Monkton to hunt for the body of a dead duelist. Well, after three days we reached the small town of Fondi, high in the mountains, and already I was beginning to regret that Alfred had accompanied me. I'm sorry. I shall have to rest for a while. If we're to make any sort of a headway, we must proceed faster, not slower. I'm exhausted. But why? We've only been walking for an hour. I haven't slept. Not for three days. Oh, that's absurd. It's true. The moment I realised we might be within reach of finding my uncle, he's never ceased to make my nights monstrous with his presence. You're overindulging your imagination and it must stop. You're free. You aren't a Moncton tied to that intolerable abbey and its archaic responsibilities. You can have no conception of what I'm going through. I know this much. You have in Miss Elmsley a very remarkable, very courageous and very loyal fiancé. And if you believe more strongly in this creature of your imagination than you do in her, then I suggest we abandon this search at once and you may resume your communications with Limbo. But he's here. He's here now. Don't you see him? Where? Alfred, where? I see a mountain track, I see trees, rocks, a multitude of birds, and nothing else. Then you are very fortunate. Ah. Very well. Let us continue. Refresh my memory. What did the priest say exactly? Your Italian is so much better than mine. Well, as you observed, he seemed terrified when I spoke of a dueling party and a dead man and said he had no idea what I was talking about. When I gave him money for his church, he was prepared to say that there's an old convent up this track that the Father Superior there might just be able to help. Might just be able to help? And that's all? That's all. How far do you estimate we are from the convent now? I'd guess. 
Perhaps a quarter of an hour's walk away. It was an hour before we reached the convent, and a more indescribably sinister place I never wished to see. Moss clustered thick in every crevice of the scowling wall that surrounded it. Lank weeds grew from the fissures of roof and parapet. The very cross opposite the entrance gate, with a terrifying life-size figure in wood nailed to it, was so beset at the base with crawling creatures that I absolutely shrank from it. What an abominable place. Yes, it seems deserted. Who could possibly live in this squalor? Do you think that priest was lying? For money, he'd tell you anything. So what do we do? I don't think I can bear to stay here much longer. Yeah, nor can I. But since we are here, we must attempt to raise this Father Superior. If he exists. If he exists. Is that a bell rope up there? Try it. Oh. This is an awful place. I hope your pistol is primed. We may have need of weapons here. You believe we're in danger? Of this place, I believe anything. That smell. What is it? Smell? There is something. Something... Something rank and noisome. Where's it coming from? It's from that outhouse, isn't it? Alfred, come here. What have you found? This stench is sickening. I know, I know. But the outhouse has no roof to it. Look, look give me a leg up, will you? What can you... What can you see? Oh, dear God. It's unbelievable. Piers, get down. Someone's opening the door. What do you want here? Whom are we addressing, sir? My name is Damien. I am the Father Superior of this convent. Why are you here? We wish to speak to you, Father. Are you alone? Quite alone. There are no women with you? We are alone, sir. Then come inside. So, gentlemen, why are you here? It's a long story, Father Damien. Alfred, one moment, please. Sir, to my disgust and horror, I find there is an unburied and rotting corpse in the outhouse attached to this convent. What? And I believe that corpse to be the body of an English gentleman of rank and fortune who was killed in a duel. Beggared of six feet of earth. This gentleman is his nephew. We are here to recover the remains and for that purpose only. Sir, why was the man not given a decent burial? You spoke of the disgust and horror you felt on seeing his corpse. We too felt disgust and horror that a non-believer should dare to fight a duel within the territory of Holy Church. You stand on consecrated ground, sir, and we are not accustomed to bury the violators of our most sacred laws in consecrated ground. That is all the explanation I think it necessary to give. Father... Was there a paper pinned to the dead man's coat? There was. Did it explain his identity and the manner of his death? It did. And are you certain that the corpse is indeed that of my uncle, Stephen Monkton, formerly of Wincott Abbey in the county of Shropshire, England? That is the inference I have drawn. Then may we have your permission to remove the corpse? We've made the necessary preparations. You say you are that wretch's nephew. What proof do you have of this? I have papers, both with me and at Fondi, which will establish my relationship beyond all doubt. Then return to Fondi. Satisfy the civil authorities of your claims, and you may remove that... that sacrilegious object from hallowed ground immediately. Piers, you've been marvellous. How shall I ever repay you? No brother could have borne with me more affectionately or helped me more patiently than you. Well, I'm relieved to see a happy outcome to our search. And once we're aboard ship, we should be able to relax at last. <laughs> I feel years younger already, centuries younger. And the spectre? Does it still appear to you? Alfred. Did I not tell you that it followed me everywhere? We shall part, that phantom and I, when the empty place is filled in Wincott Vault, then I can stand with Ada before the altar in the Abbey Chapel. And when my eyes meet hers, they will see Stephen Monkton's tortured face no more.
Within ten days, the necessary formalities had been looked to, and we were ready to find a ship. Ada Elmsley and her mother set off ahead of us. They would meet us at Wincott Abbey. But we had difficulty in finding a suitable vessel. Eventually, we were obliged to charter one ourselves, a Sicilian brig with a job lot of crewmen and an English skipper. Finally, by mid-June, we put to sea, on a calm and lovely afternoon. The captain and crew were in high spirits, and Alfred was happier than I had ever known him to be. I alone felt heavy at heart. There was no valid reason that I could assign to myself for the melancholy that possessed me. Yet I struggled against it in vain. Mr. Fortune, could I have a word with you, sir? Yes, of course, Captain. What is it? There's something wrong among the men up forehead. Did you notice how they all suddenly fell silent just before sunset? Well, now you mention it, I believe I did notice something odd. Yes, well, there's a Maltese lad aboard, smart as a whip but a handful to deal with. I've discovered he's been telling the men something fairly unpleasant about that packing case your friend keeps locked in his cabin. What has he been saying? Uh, that there's a dead body in that case and not a statue. <laughs> What could have given him that ridiculous notion? No idea, sir. He wouldn't say. But I'd advise you to call the crew aft and contradict the boy, whether he speaks the truth or not. The men are a pack of superstitious fools, and they're getting very restive. We shall have trouble, sir, if you don't do as I suggest. I'm grateful for your concern, Captain Rance, but I have no intention of allowing that young mischief-maker the privilege of hearing me contradict him. And if I may make a suggestion to you, a touch of the rope's end would solve the situation a good deal more satisfactorily. How much longer can she take this kind of beating? It was calm not two hours ago. What kind of freak storm is this? Gentlemen, open the door. Let me in. The men are blaming this on that damn corpse. They're saying it's a Jonah. They intend to quit the ship. But can the brig be saved? No chance. She's broached during the waves are pounding it in pieces. You'll have to leave everything and make for the longboat. We must take the case with us. They'd never let you aboard with it. Now move, gentlemen, now, before we all drown. Piers, if the brig sinks, the empty place in Wincott Vault will remain empty forever. Forget that gibberish and come up on deck. Now! Come. Let me show you the vault. There's no need, and it can only distress you further. I want you to see it. I, I want you to feel with me the power of that damnable legend. No good will come of this. Would you refuse me? I shall come with you, but with the most extreme reluctance. Your life lies outside these vaults, with Ada. Do you suppose I could marry Ada now? It's out of the question. She does not seem to be of that opinion. Ada has never been down here. I would never allow it. Now... Are you coming with me? Very well. Here sleep all the Monktons but two. Myself. And Stephen. See that niche? Alfred, for heaven's sake, you're being excessively morbid. Let's get out of this charnel house. If Stephen Monckton's corpse were not lying fathoms beneath the ocean, the coffin would have been placed there. Keep him away from me. What? Keep him away from me. I cannot bear those terrible eyes of his. Look at him. One of his hands, still clutching a pistol, has fallen to his side. The other, Alfred, the stop other it! He a bloody handkerchief to his mouth and he looks at me with those terrible black eyes. He looks at me. Always at me. Always at me. Oh. Oh. Alfred! Alfred! Dwindling ever faster and faster. Dwindling to the last left master. From mortal ken, from light of day... Moncton's race, 
shall pass away. Mad Monkton by Wilkie Collins was adapted for radio by Michael Robson. Alfred Monkton was played by John Castle. Pierce Fortune by Gary Bond. Ada Elmsley by Sandra Freeman. Damien by Lewis Stringer. And Captain Rounce by Geoffrey Matthews. It was devised and directed by Derek Hoddenot. The event occurred a little before Christmas. I was unmarried and I was childless, which was a greater regret. I'd been living at Tunbridge Wells, and when I complained that I was feeling a little less than lively, my doctor, who I think was tired of seeing me, declared that what I needed was a change of scene, and that a move to London might be the answer. I pondered his suggestion, and at last I summoned my manservant, his name is Trottle, and sent him off to see if he could find a place in town where I might be happy enough to lay my troublesome old head. After two days, he returned. I've uh, found somewhere for you, (gasps) ma'am. Excellent. It's quite charming. Oh, splendid. You can take it for six months and then extend the lease if you so desire. Perfect. Perfect indeed. There's not a fault in the entire property. The fault lies outside it. Yes. The house in question is situated opposite another house. A common occurrence, totally in the great metropolis. True, ma'am, but uh, this other house, which is a house to let, is a dull and dingy house, in need of much repair. Ah, Well, perhaps it'll be let quite soon and it'll take on a brighter appearance. I don't think so, ma'am. The house, it seems, won't let. It never does. I journeyed to London. I viewed the place which Trottle had found for me and decided it was very fine. I decided, too, that the house over the way was, in truth, an eyesore. But that all in all, when one set the good points against the bad, the good one as I like to think it often does. Just a week or so prior to Christmas, I moved my old bones, along with bags and baggage, into my new accommodation. I settled myself into a chair by the drawing-room window. Oh! Oh, yes! And I gazed through the window and I told myself that I was contented enough. But that event somehow had not gone quite right in my life, and... What was missing from it was a dear child whom I could love. And then all of a sudden, as I looked out at the house over the way, (laughs) I threw myself back and my limbs felt as if electricity had shot right through them. Good heavens. Good heavens. (laughs) Before my tale progresses any further, I ought to confess that I have an unusual Christian name. Zofanitzpah. The name justifiably has grown out of fashion. It is particularly absurd when on the lips of Mr. Jabez Jabba. Sophie Nispa, my uh, dear Sophie Nispa. But then, in all fairness, Mr. Jabba himself is somewhat absurd. A perfumed, prettily dressed fellow with a little smile and little legs and little roundabout ways. An admirer of mine who had proposed on numerous occasions. So, Finnisper, <laughs> welcome to London. How are you, my dear? Oh, infirm as ever. Nonsense. Well, I am distressed at any rate. Distressed by what? By that house, the one over the way. And how exactly does that house distress you, so Finnisper, dear? Well, you'll think it very foolish. You'll think I'm a silly old woman with a fevered brain. Never, never. Go to the window, Mr Jarber, and tell me what you see. Hmm. I see a dirty, dilapidated building, rusty railings, several shattered panes of glass. The steps leading to the door are broken. Oh, and on the door, some child has attempted a drawing in chalk. It's meant, I think, to be a ghost. Ah, perhaps it's the ghost that has perturbed you. No, Mr Jarber, it is not. What can you see at the first floor window? The first floor? On the right. Well, there's a blind. Yes, and what about the blind? It has a hole in it. It does. This morning, Mr Jarber, when I looked across at that window, at that hole in the blind, I found I was looking at an eye. An eye? Whose eye? Well, I have no idea whose eye. Well, it's not there now, Sophonis, (laughs) but... I'm glad. 
Why, may I ask, are you upset about this eye? I am upset, Mr Jarber, because I have been informed there is no one living in that house. It has been unoccupied for a great many years. There ought not, therefore, to have been an eye at the first floor window. Sophie Nisper, uh, Sophie Nisper, only one explanation can suffice. A spirit haunts that house. Uh, a spirit with a malevolent eye. Uh, a somewhat hasty and over-imaginative conclusion, I feel. Though the house is haunting my spirit, I'm certain of that. Still, when I speak with Trottle... Trottle? Oh, yes, I remember Trottle. He stayed behind at Tunbridge Wells to make sure that all is in order there, but he'll arrive on Saturday and he'll tell me, no doubt, that I'm being ridiculous and he'll calm my anxious state. Perhaps he will. But Jarber is here, here and now, and Jarber can discover the truth. Oh, uh... Jarber has connections. He dines with house agents and tax officers and church wardens. He is intimate at the circulating library. Why shouldn't Jarba set about investigating the house over the way and do so immediately? Yeah, for this reason, the Jarba is as infirm as I am. Oh. There were all that toing and froing. You might catch cold. Sophie Nisper, my dear, I've suffered worse for you. Oh. Whatever extraordinary secret is contained within the walls of that house, Jabez Jarba will reveal it. Oh. I thought of little else but the house to let. I kept a watch on it. I dreamt of it. And when Trottle arrived, I spoke to him not of domestic arrangements, but of the eye at the window, and of Mr Jarber's avowed intention to solve the mystery. Mr Jarber? Huh. What good is he? Well, he has some uses, I'm sure. He'll not get very far with a problem of this nature, ma'am. I can assure well, you of that. We shall see, Trottle. We shall see. He is to return here tomorrow and he will give us the result of his investigations. Hmm. The morrow came, and so did Mr Jarber. Good evening, my dear oh. Sophonisba. Oh, and Trottle too. Evening, Mr Jarber. These pleasantries over, I poured Mr Jarber a cup of tea, and he brought out from underneath his cloak a roll of papers. Behold. Oh. And he waved the roll triumphantly in the direction of the house over the way and then spread the papers out upon the table. Trottle, meanwhile, began to move towards the door. Uh, I have made some very interesting discoveries. Mr. Jarber, I'm overwhelmed. Trottle. Yes, ma'am? Sit and listen and learn. Yes, ma'am? <clears throat> First, would you be very much surprised, my dear Sophonisba, if the house in question turned out to be the property of one who is related to you? Yes, Mr. Jarber, I would. It is owned by Mr. George Forley. Forley? A cousin of yours, I believe. Yes. He is, I gather, unwell at present. Is he? I hadn't heard. I hold no communication with him. He's an unpleasant man. He fell out with one of his daughters because he disapproved of her marriage. My daughter's child died, poor thing, and he showed no pity. Well, now that I think about it, Mr Jarber, I am not so very much surprised that my cousin owns that house. It accounts for the grim appearance of the place and its ability to upset me so. Is Mr Forney mentioned in those sheets of paper? No, no, not at all. I'm glad. So, let us hear what you have uncovered. Trottle, you are rather far away from us. Yes, ma'am. Why are you mortifying yourself in those Arctic regions? Come and join us round the fire. I'm happy over here, thank you, ma'am. As you wish. Go ahead, Mr Jarber. The very first occupants of the house were a man and his wife from Manchester. The wife, Alice, was a pretty, gentle, pliant creature who had been married before uh, to a young man named Frank Wilson. This Frank had sailed to the East Indies and had never returned, and with no news of the ship or any of the crew, he was presumed to have perished. There was a child by this first marriage, though the father never saw it, a weak, sickly thing it was, and in order to provide for herself and the child, Alice had let her house out to lodgers. One of these lodgers was Mr Openshaw, a bluff, self-taught businessman, who had found that despite himself he felt a tenderness towards Alice's frail child, which soon extended towards Alice herself. 
Mrs. Wilson. Yes, sir? I'm wondering, what do you think? Is there any reason, do you suppose, why we two shouldn't, as it were, put up our horses together? I'm not sure I understand what you mean, sir. Well, to be a little plainer, will you have me to be thy wedded husband for richer and poorer? Richer, I can assure you, and all that sort of thing. Hmm? What'd you say? Sir, forgive me, but this is all rather unexpected and... I need some time to think the matter over. Three minutes. Three minutes? But I'd sooner not wait that long. I have a lot of office work to get through tonight, so be a sensible woman and say yes without delay. She said yes. Oh. Not quite without delay, but she found it hard to resist Mr Openshaw's strong will and the promise he held of comfortable circumstances as well as the affection he showed towards her daughter. They married... Mr. Openshaw prospered, and they moved from Manchester to London. To the house over the way. To the house over the way. Uh, excuse me, uh, but does this story have a point? Of course it has a point. Wait, listen, Tottle. Now, I'm sure you'll be enlightened. <sighs> With the Openshaws came Nora, who had been in Alice's service since the time of the first marriage, and who was devoted both to Alice and to the child. Between her and Mr Openshaw, however, relations were very far from cordial, for each of them was unable to detect the other's good qualities. The events of one particular evening brought the situation to a crisis. Yes? Good evening to you, Nora. May I come in? How do you know my name? Who are you? Dear Nora... Can't have changed that much. In truth, Frank Wilson had changed a great deal over the years. But as Nora gazed at him, there was no mistaking those bright blue eyes of his. Just a little while before, Nora had been looking down at a young girl's bright blue eyes till they had closed in sleep. Oh, heavens! Oh, good Lord! I could find no trace of Alice, so I searched for you, Nora. It took a while to find you, but I've succeeded at last. And now, you must tell me, and tell me straight. What has happened to my wife? She's still alive, is she not? Tell me, please. If she's dead, then I shall try to endure it, but I must know... She's not dead. Oh, thank God, thank God. Where is she, Nora? Did she get any of my letters? No, she never got your letter, sir. Nothing was heard of you. Nothing at all. She thought... She, she... thought I'd died. Yes. You can't blame her, sir, surely. Has she married again? She has. Oh, God. And she is content and happy. Oh, no, Nora. Be good to me. Be honest with me. And tell me where I might find her. Are you still in a service? Is she living here? Well, mercy me. A tragic situation, was it not? Yes. The unfortunate Nora felt such pity for this man. And yet she was terrified of the effect on her mistress if she discovered that Frank Wilson was alive. Poor oh, Nora. Poor Frank. Poor Trottle. May I leave now, Mum? Leave? How could you think of leaving? And have a cup of tea, Mr Java, or something stronger, perhaps, for both of us. This tale, I fear, won't have a happy ending. Shortly before Christmas, I had moved to London and had found myself in a state of anxiety on account of the house over the way. The house was dilapidated, it was unoccupied, so I had been told. And yet I was certain I had seen an eye peering out from one of the windows. Mr Jarber, a long-standing admirer of mine, had promised to discover the mystery of the house to let, to the annoyance of my manservant Trottle, who was no admirer of Mr Jarber. And he had uncovered a story relating to the first occupants of the house. So, picture the scene. 
Alice Openshaw's devoted servant, Laura, confronted by her mistress's first husband, Frank, who had been supposed by everyone to have died at sea. Oh, uh, no. uh, Trottle, forgive me, Mr. Job. Uh, Trottle, are you being polite? Uh, with respect, ma'am, I have become a little doubtful as to the usefulness of this tale. Well, perhaps you have, but you will do, Mr. Jarber, the courtesy of hearing him out. Continue, Mr. Jarber. Thank you, my dear. Now, I should tell you that Alice herself was not in the house when Frank's unfortunate visit occurred. Uh, she and Mr. Openshaw were in Richmond with friends, and Nora whose fierce desire was to protect Alice from pain and distress, was desperate to ensure that Frank was gone before the Openshaws returned. At the same time, she felt deep sorrow and pity for the man who stood before her. There is one thing I ought to tell you, sir. Well? You have a child. <gasps> Nora. She's a frail, pathetic thing, but she's loved... And life gives her pleasure despite her illness. Is the child here? May I see her? She's asleep upstairs. Oh, listen, after you've seen her, you must leave immediately. If you were to make yourself known to my mistress, she'd be unable to endure it. You promise you will leave? I promise. If you like, I'll arrange to meet you tomorrow. Very well. And in the meantime, I'll, well, I'll try and think what can be done. This way. The servant took Frank into the nursery, and he bent over the cot, and with wistful eyes gazed upon his daughter. Sweet little thing. Sweet, dear child. What is her name? Elsie. Elsie? <laughs> Let me hold her. Oh, no, no, no. She mustn't be walking. Dearest Elsie, am I never to see you again? <laughs> it seemed to the anxious Nora that it was a full half an hour before she managed to persuade Frank back downstairs. He told her the address of the hotel where he was staying, and then she ushered him out of the house. Shortly before eleven, Mr and Mrs Openshaw returned and Nora, fearful and sick at heart, pretended that the evening had passed without incident and said nothing about the visitor. But Elsie had some words to say in the morning. Papa? Yes, Elsie? That man in the nursery last night, who was he? I think, dear child, that there wasn't a man in the nursery. There was a man perhaps in a dream you had? No, no. I woke up and I saw him. He was large... And I was frightened of him, so I pretended I was still asleep. He was kneeling down and crying, and he said his prayers. Listen to me, my dearest. Sometimes dreams can seem very real. No, I saw him. I did. Thomas. Alice, please. You must have a talk with this little lady of yours concerning dreams. You must tell her how vivid they can sometimes be. But it wasn't a dream. Thomas, have you seen my brooch? Your brooch? The one you gave me last Christmas. It was on the table in the hallway. My shawl was there too, and I meant to put it on yesterday evening before we went out, but I forgot. You haven't seen it? The loss of the brooch and Elsie's absolute insistence that a man had visited the nursery the previous night began to create some suspicion in Mr Openshaw's mind. Elsie was taken from the room and Nora was summoned. Nora? Yes, sir? Did someone visit here last night? Last night, sir? Yes. Someone who was not only admitted into the house, but was even allowed to go into the nursery? The man was familiar to you, no doubt. An acquaintance. Oh, no, no, It was some fellow, I'm guessing, that you're sweet on, and who imposed on no. you. No! You believed, I'm sure, that he was good and honest. At any rate, you had no reason to think that he was a thief. A, a thief? Last night, Nora... A brooch of mine went missing. Perhaps, indeed, other things have been stolen. Tell us the man's name. Nora, please. No, no. I am not finding fault with you, Nora. It's true that you and I haven't always got on, but Mrs Openshaw likes you and trusts you, and I want to trust you too. And I'm prepared to accept, therefore, that you were not privy to the theft of the brooch. I know nothing about the brooch. Exactly, but the man who was here last night, you know something about him. Tell me his name. No, sir. Nora! No, I can't. I won't. But I will tell you this, sir. 
I care more for your dear wife and her dear child than anyone ever cared for me. I devoted my life to looking after them. And it's sad. It's very sad if this is my reward. You're a harsh man, sir. You're a cursed man too, I'm sure of that. No good can ever come to you. She left the room and she put on her bonnet and shawl and rushed out of the house and though she had no notion of what could be done, she hurried towards the hotel where the unfortunate Frank was staying. I shan't go back. I shall never go back. I shall never see Elsie again or her mother. Even if I were not under suspicion, to be there in the house knowing the truth... Knowing that sometime, sooner or later, my mistress must discover the truth herself. It's impossible. She never spoke with Frank. She was informed at the hotel that he had gone out some time earlier. She waited for him. Mr Openshaw, meanwhile, had gone to the police station and reported the theft of the brooch, and he was now returned. Oh, Thomas. Oh... I am so sorry. My dear, whatever is the matter? She'll never forgive me. I'll never forgive myself. Alice, please, what has happened? I found the brooch. Look, here. Where was it? It was attached to my shawl. Yesterday evening when we went out, I picked the shawl up from the table and as I did so, the brooch must have got caught in it. Oh, Thomas, I am so sorry. What on earth are we to do? Mr Openshaw, of course, went back to the police station in order to state that the brooch had been discovered and also to seek any advice as to how best to make a search for Nora. But the police officer already had some information for Mr Openshaw. I have to tell you, sir, that a man's body has been found in the river. We think that he drowned himself, though we can't be certain. This piece of paper was in his pocket. The writing's hard to make out but it looks like the address you gave me earlier. Yes. Yes, indeed. It seems possible to us, sir, that this fellow may be the one who visited your house last night. The dead man's pocket also contained a card bearing the name of a nearby hotel, and thus it was that Nora was found and she was brought to the police station. She identified the body, describing Frank as an acquaintance of hers from many years before, And after this ordeal, Mr Openshaw, who had waited for her, offered his hand to her and spoke to her gently. Why did he come to the house, Nora? Why did you let him go up to the nursery? Who was he, Nora? Tell me. Tell me the truth. His name was Frank Wilson. Wilson? Mrs Openshaw's first husband. Oh, God. He had been shipwrecked. But he survived and got back to England. He had no idea what had happened to his wife. But he found out where I was, and I told him the truth. Oh, but Sarah was so frightened. They wanted him out of the house as quickly as possible. He saw Elsie, though, before he left. Yes, yes. And I think, Sarah, I ought not to have let him, for it can only have made him feel more anguished still. Can now the... Poor man lies dead and cold. Nora, you are not to blame, not in any way. Indeed, it is I who should be asking to be forgiven for doubting if you were honest. Oh, you won't tell Mrs. Oppenshaw, will you, sir? About Frank Wilson, I mean. No. I'll not tell her. It will remain a secret, Nora, between you and me. Now, if the police require nothing more of us, we should be getting home. The secret was kept. Nothing was said to Alice. Nothing was said to the child. Though, some years later, Alice died. And one morning, Mr Openshaw took the girl to the cemetery in order to put flowers on Alice's grave. And not very far away, there was a grave marked F.W. And Mr Openshaw led Elsie there and told her the truth at last and shed the only tears that she ever saw fall from his eyes. Well, a most moving tale. Thank you, Sovenispa. Thank you. Hmm. Mm. I am compelled to point out, however... Yes, Trottle. 
that as regards the mysterious nature of the house over the way, we are just as much in the dark as we were before the story began. Well, um... Yes, that is the case, is it not, Mr Jubb? Far from it. Oh. The tale explains the oppressive pall of misery and morbidity which enshrouds that decaying edifice. It explains the curse that lies upon it. I venture to advise you, Sophonisba, that the eye which has stared out at you from the window opposite is not the eye of a mortal. It is a phantom eye. Huh. It belongs to Frank Wilson, who has returned to the house, seeking his wife and his daughter. This is Clank No, oh, Trottle, please. Utter bunker. Forgive me, Trottle, the house is cursed. And if in your foolishness you need to be convinced of the fact... I have another remarkable tale to tell. Oh. Permit me, so Nisper, dear, to come here at the same time tomorrow, and I shall, I promise, amaze you with further revelations. Now then... If Mr. Jarber will persist with his senseless stories, then Trottle, it seems to me, is obliged to act of his own accord and deal with this matter as best he can. The house over the way is said to be unoccupied, and yet my mistress has seen an eye at the window. Would it not be a sensible plan, therefore, to go straight up to the house and knock upon the door and find out exactly who it is? Which mortal creature, I mean, who peers out through a hole in the blind? So, Trottle takes the initiative. Trottle goes straight up to the house. Phantom eyes indeed. Jabez Jarba is a ninny. A buffoon. That having been said, I have no notion at all as to what might await me inside this place. What if... What if the truth, when it reveals itself, should be more than Trottle's flesh and blood can bear? Well, Trottle, you have come this far. Will you knock upon the door? The house over the way contained a mystery. It was said to be unoccupied, and yet I had seen an eye peering out at me from one of the windows. Mr. Jarber, an acquaintance, well, no, admirer of mine, was certain that some ghostly activity provided the answer, but my sceptical manservant Trottle decided to search for a more rational explanation. A few days before Christmas, he walked across the street to the house to let. He knocked upon the door. He knocked a second time. At last, the door opened and there stood an aged, lean and wiry woman and at her side a younger man who found it helpful to lean against the wall in order to steady himself. Good evening, sir. And to you. Chilly weather, ain't it? Yes. Well, please, come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Slide the bolt, Benjamin. Slide the bolt. Right. We was expecting you, sir. <laughs> You were? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mr. Forley. Mr. Forley? That's right. He wrote us a letter. That's right. Oh. The 20th of the month, he said you might be coming in the evening. <laughs> and here you are, ain't you, sir? Mr. Forley's particular associate on the 20th. In the evening. That's right. Uh, we, we, we'll go into the dining room, shall we, sir? <laughs> I've a candle burning there. Oh. Nice clean room, as you see, sir. We keep it clean, don't we, Benjamin? Clean, 
That's right. In readiness, you know, for when Mr Fawley comes to visit. <laughs> How is he faring? How is he faring? Um... We were sorry to hear he hadn't been too well. He hasn't, that's true. You'll wish him good health when you see him next, won't you, sir? Certainly, certainly. <laughs> My son's not too well himself. Your son? Benjamin here. Indigestion he has, the poor dear. Indigestion, that's what it is. By the way, sir, I don't suppose you and I have ever met, have we? You? Me? No. Your face is strangely familiar. Oh. Anyways, um... Yes? Shall we commence our little bit of business? Hmm? Shall we, sir? I had no notion that Tottle was engaged upon his adventure over the way. That very evening, Mr Jarber called again with a further instalment of his revelations about the house to let, and I had intended that Trottle should join us. But Trottle, of course, was not to be found. Philandering somewhere, oh. that's what he's up to. Philandering? Oh. oh, I hope not, Mr Jarber. I thought I'd cured him of that tendency when we were at Tunbridge Wells. Oh, do you remember? <laughs> Sophonisper? The last time I was with you at the Wells, mm -hmm. and you and I danced the polka... Uh, no, Mr Jarber, you are wrong. We walked the polka. Oh. <laughs> now, what more is there to tell me about the house to let? So, Finispa, my dear, behold. As before, a roll of papers was extracted from beneath Mr Jarber's fur-collared cloak, and as before, was waved in triumph. On my previous visit, so, Finispa, I brought you the sad tale of the first tenants of the house over the way. Mm -hmm. Now, I can reveal the identity of the very last person to rent that cursed abode. I have met with him and spoken with him. Where did you find him? Among the marshlands near Deptford. Among the marshlands? He was in his caravan. Mr. Maxman? That's me. You've nothing against the name, I hope. Who are you? Mr. Jabez Jarber. Oh. In a theatrical profession, are you? Uh, no, no. I am making an inquiry about a house. Well, this one's on wheels, sir. I'm very nicely decorated, as you see. Uh, uh, the, the house in question is one that I believe you rented some years ago. Ah, oh, the big house, you mean? Yes. I was wondering, Mr. Magsman, uh, if it might be compatible with your inclinations to tell me about your tenancy there and why you left the place. Well, now, I left it on account of the dwarf. The dwarf? The very same. And as to entering it, I did that a few years previous. I've been looking about for a good pitch and I sees that house and I says to myself, I'll have you, I will. And you did? Yeah. I made it a lovely thing, that house. Up the front, I put numerous canvases of the fat lady of Norfolk and the Indian savage with his tomahawk and a scalp oh. and the wild ass of the prairies. Yeah. Not that we ever had no wild asses. And lastly, there was a canvas representing the dwarf. A small canvas, that one. What, I wonder, did the neighbours think of all this? Well, they cut up rough about it and made complaints, which shook me, I must admit. A house of amusements right there on their very own street. What more do they want? Perhaps it was a question of respectability. Respectability? Well, if from submission ain't a respectable price, I don't know what is. Mm. And what about the dwarf? Oh, yes, the dwarf. Uncommon small he was. Not as small, of course, as he was made out to be, but then what dwarf ever is? Uh, uh, <laughs> he was worth threatening on his own, in my view. Major Tupaschovsky of the Imperial Bulgradarian Brigade was his official title, but for reasons of convenience he became Chops. Uh, uh, yeah, such a kind man was Mr Chops, and always falling in love with large women. Ooh. The fat lady of Norfolk, to give you a weighty example, though she chose to have a preference for the Indian savage. <laughs> Something else about him. Despite the fact that he never owned anything more than what he collected in his saucer, he was always thinking that he was entitled to property. <sighs> 
Come then, Toby Maxman. Turn the handle. Give us some music. To bring in the crowds, we'd have the barrel organ at the front of the house, and Mr Chops would sit on top of the organ. Grind away, Toby. Grind away. And with each turn of the handle, he'd become more and more excited. Oh, I can feel the vibration running through me. I can feel my property coming. I can feel the coins are jingling in me. I'm swelling out with money. Swelling out and swelling out till I'm as big as the Bank of England. Such is the influence of music, you see, on the poetic mind. The fact is, Toby Maxman, I don't much like this occupation of mine. And I don't much like the general public. This is often the case, I find, with human phenomenons what depend on the public for their living. Society is where I ought to be. Society. And when I get my fortune, that's where I'm going. Your fat lady, she isn't formed for society. Your Indian with his tomahawk most certainly isn't. But I am. I am. One afternoon, after Mr Chops had taken leave of his audience, three times round with the saucer and then retire from view, that was his custom, I was in the kitchen having serious conversations with the fat lady of Norfolk on account of her losing some bulkage during recent months. Help! When Mr Chops began shouting from the stairway. Help! Help! Throw a pail of water over me, quick! Mr Chops, what's happened? Give me a brandy. Well, I ain't got no brandy. Well, then carry me to my bed. What the devil is the matter? The lottery. That's the matter. The lottery and a winning ticket. <gasps> oh. Toby Maxman, I have come into property at last. How much? £12,000. £12,000? <laughs> oh. I'm rich. You're that all right. I'm rich. And when I've recovered my senses, do you know what I'm going to do? You'll stand us all around, I hope. And after that... You'll be going into society. I shall, Toby Maxman. I shall. And he did. Well, to be truthful, he went mad for a week. And I had to make sure we kept him away from the organ in case a minute or two of sitting on it should make him explode with excitement. But then, when the week was over... Toby Maxman. Mr Chops. I bid you farewell. Good Lord. This is your carriage, is it? It is. Fine nags. Very fine. And their jackets, Toby Magsman, are made of silk. And where will these nags in their silk jackets be taking you, Mr Chops? Pall Mall. I've rented a place there. So, open the carriage door, will you? Uh, Hoist me up, please, and put me in. Yep. Yeah. You'll visit me, I hope. Gladly, Mr Chops. I expect I could do with a friendly face. Going into society, it's been a dream of mine, as you well know. But now that it's coming true, I have to tell you, I'm not a little trepidatious. Mr Jarber's tale, or rather the showman's tale as recounted by Mr Jarber, was a while in the telling, and we broke off for refreshment. We were standing near the drawing-room window and Mr Jarber had raised his glass and wished me very good health, and much else besides that I wish he hadn't wished me, when I glanced at the house over the way. Mr Jarber? Yes, Sophie Lisper, dear. Look across, if you will, at the house to let. Ah. Uh. Look in particular at the ground floor. Is there by any chance the flickering of a candle? Um. Mr Jarber was uncertain on this point. He was uncertain, too, whether it would be very wise to venture forth in the evening gloom in order to settle the matter himself. Little did we know, the Trottle had already gained entry to the house to let. Well, then, sir. Yes? To business. Business, that's right. Oh. Fair reward for honest work done, eh? Uh, you watch yourself, sir. Shall have the shirt off your back. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um... <coughs> you, um, you did bring Mr Ford his money, did you not? Madam, I shall tell you what I brought and, um, and, and you'll be wonderfully surprised. Oh! But first, that noise. The noise? 
That's right. He's at it again, you see. Even in the dark. Is he now? I suppose you want to take a look at him, do you, sir? Well, yes. Certainly. I think I should. And then you'll give us our wonderful surprise. I very much hope to. <gasps> Come then. <laughs> Bring a candle, Benjamin. Uh. You won't have never met the little creature. <laughs> no. It stands to reason that Mr Fordy should want you to see him. You're very slow, Benjamin. Slow, yes, that's right. My leg, sir, is stronger than his. Oh. <laughs> I get younger and younger every day and <laughs> jollier and jollier. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> now then, this is the room. This is where we keep him. Open the door, Benjamin. Uh, uh. Open the door. And let our guests take a peep at Mr. Fawley's funny friend. It was the Monday before Christmas, and the house to let had not yet yielded up its secret. Though Trottle, my manservant, had taken it upon himself without my knowledge to gain entry to the house... This was on the very same evening that my friend Mr. Jarber was informing me of a conversation he had conducted with a certain Toby Maxman, who some years before had transformed the house into a place of amusements. Among Maxman's attractions, Mr. Jarber learned, was a dwarf by the name of Mr. Chops, and Mr. Chops had won a fortune on the lottery and had left... Maxman's employment. So tell me, Mr. Maxman, did Mr. Chops communicate with you at all? Not for some while. But then, out of the blue, I got an invitation to have a drink with him at his lodgings in Pall Mall. So I cleaned myself and I drank with him. Was he alone? No, he was not alone. There was a young fellow there who'd been a swindler at a gaming booth and another who used to play the clarionet at a wild beast show. Mr. Chops! Well? The supply of wine is perilously low. Yeah, let more be sent up from your capacious cellar, Mr. Chops, lest we die of thirst. Yeah, and if all I forget... Yes? We shall need a carriage for tomorrow. And a substantial hamper made up of a, a flavoursome comestible. Yeah. And wine, of course. Wine, yes. See to it, Mr. Chops, if you please. See to it. Then he kissed her cold oh, corpus, corpus a thousand, a thousand times off. He called her his diner, though she was no more. <laughs> <laughs> help. Mr. Well. Chops. Yes, Toby Magsman. Mr. Chops. Even the best of companions must part. So soon. I thank you for the variety of foreign gargle what you have provided so handsome. And now I shall take my leave. Well, if you must, then I shall see you out. Hoist me up, will you? I lifted him up and carried him downstairs. And he smelt so strong and madeiry that he was like a wine jug what had a large and interesting stopper. I ain't happy, Magsman. Are you not? They don't use me well, those two. They puts me on the mantelpiece when I won't have more champagne in. And if I don't give them money, they locks me in the sideboard. <sighs> Get rid of them, Mr. Chops. I can't. Me and them two were in society together. What would society think if I tried to send them away? Time passed. It's a feature of time, I find. One night, after the fat lady of Norfolk had sung a final song and the Indian had scalped his last victim, till tomorrow, that is, I heard a kicking at the front door and to the front door I went. I opened the door, I looked out, but I saw nothing. It's me. I looked down. Mr Chops. Mr Chops. Will you take me back? Take you back? On the old terms. If it's a deal, say done. Done. Good. I thank you for it. Got a bit of supper in the house. 
Considering what fine fare must have been guzzled at the Pall Mall lodgings, I was ashamed to offer him cold sausage washed down with gin and water, but he seemed happy enough with it. Hmm. Well, Toby Magsman, you see before you one who has gone into society and got out again. And how did you manage the getting out? I got out after paying out to the tune of £12,000, which you may recall is what I won with my lottery ticket. 12000 I paid out, and in return, I've been given a lesson. A valuable lesson. But you can have it for free. Society is all fat ladies. Society is all fat ladies. That's right. You see, your fat lady of Norfolk, she might be considered by some to be an offence upon the eye. How is she, by the way? Very well. Very fat. But them other fat ones, who come and ogle at you and drill holes in your heart and make a colander of it, and who leave you to have your bones picked dry by vultures, like the dead wild ass of the prairies, which is what I deserve to be. Them other fat ones is an offence upon decency and good taste. Maxman, when I was out of society, I was paid just a little in return for being looked at. And when I went into society, I was looked at just the same. And I paid heavy for it. So, the plain fact is, I'm glad to be back. Mm. Good sausage, this. My small friend's observations on the world were not entirely the result of sausagerial influence. It seemed to me that he got wiser and wiser every day and that his head got bigger and bigger as his wisdom expanded. For a while he was kept away from the organ, upon which he had sat in former times, but one evening... Toby Magsman? I should like to be seated upon the organ and to hear some music. Mr. Charles, are you sure? I am. Hoist me up. I hoisted him up, and with fear and trembling, lest he find it all too much of an excitement, I began to turn the handle. Well, Mr. Chops? Very nice. What are you thinking, Mr. Chops? Thoughts. Weighty thoughts. Weighty thoughts, you see, which were a match for his weighty head. And he sat through all the changes, and then he come off and declared that he'd walk three times round without the saucer, and then retire from view, which he did. When I called for him in the morning, I found that he was no longer with us, not in spirit at least. He'd gone into a society much better, I think, than Magsman's amusements. Much better, certainly, than what was offered in Pall Mall. A fine tale, Mr Jarber. Most affecting tale. It is indeed. I should add, by the way, that soon after the funeral of Mr Chops, Toby Magsman decided that his house of amusement seemed so dismal that he must give it up and return to his caravan, which is where I found him. Oh. The house is cursed. It's quite clear those who live there are doomed. Oh. Heavens, who's this? A trottle. Mum, I have solved the mystery of the house to let. How extraordinary. Mr. Jarber here is making the self-same assertion. Mr. Jarber knows nothing, nothing at all. Oh, dear, you... Trottle! But I shall tell you what I know, ma'am, if you are willing. Trottle began to describe to us how the occupants of the house to let, an old woman and her inebriated son, had taken him to be an emissary from Mr. Forley, the owner of the house, and as it happens, a cousin of mine. He told of how when the old woman became insistent about the money she expected to be given, he heard a curious scratching noise from a room above and asked that he might see for himself who, or what, was causing it. Benjamin, uh. give some light so that the gentleman can observe Mr Forley's little friend. Well... Can you see him now? I looked around. The room was empty of all furniture, save for an old bedstead. Over there, sir. Under the window. I peered forward, and there, kneeling on the bare boards, with his bright, sharp eyes towards me, 
was a tiny, wizened boy, no more than five years old. A greasy old shawl was wrapped around him, and on his head was a big cotton nightcap that had dropped down to his very eyebrows. A fine lad, eh? <laughs> What's he been doing? Praying? Oh, praying? Oh, God help us, no! No, he's not been praying. See, he's cleaning the floor. Oh. <laughs> he's pretending to be me. Oh, it's his regular game, morning, noon and night. Practice dirt, practice. And where's my beer? <laughs> Just listen to him, the little scamp. <laughs> you, you, um, you tell Mr Forley when you next call on him that the boy's going on nicely. You will, won't you, sir? Oh, yeah. Where's my beer? Oh, where's my beer? Has he... Has he nothing else to amuse himself with? Some toys, perhaps? Oh, no. No, no, no. This is what he likes to do. I'm a good I am. I work hard and I save candles. That's right. Save candles. That's right. I don't suppose there are many who know about the boy. You're not in the habit of showing him to visitors. Oh, bless your heart alive. Nobody comes to this house. Not now. No, not now. The outside of it warns most folk off. But if anyone is fool enough to inquire about renting it, a hundred and twenty pound, I tell them. <laughs> and that works every time. That sends them scurrying. So Mr Fall is not interested in the place being let? You could say that, yeah. And we make sure it isn't. <laughs> mm. I'll tell you, sir, what Benjamin and me have done for Mr Forley, one way and another, is quite beyond words. Beyond words, that's right. We left the pitiful little boy and we returned to the dining room. The question of money, I was only too aware, was about to be raised once more. So, there you are, sir. You've met the lad upstairs and you've seen that all is well with him. Mm. And now, the matter of remuneration. That's right. Yes. I uh, take it you'd feel somewhat disappointed if I were to tell you that I came to you today without the money. Without, without the, the money. money? You are disappointed, I can tell. But listen, the situation is that Mr Forley is waiting for the report I'm to give him as to how you're managing with the boy and so on. Once he's received it, found it satisfactory, he'll send me back here with a bigger bit of business, by far, bigger than you could ever imagine. How big? This much? Oh no, madam. You'll need both hands to count it. You will indeed. Oh! Oh, heavens! Oh, sir! Oh, my! Oh! Oh, for... oh. Thereupon... The old woman grew exceedingly light-headed and began to take great liberties with invoking unearthly beings whose names ought never to have approached her lips. And as quickly as I could, I took my opportunity and bade her and her son farewell and hurried out of the house. Extraordinary. Extraordinary, Mr Jarby. Is this not extraordinary? Not at all, my dear. It merely confirms my own discoveries. The house, as I have told you, is cursed. It is cursed. And it is haunted. Border dash! Uh, shuttle, it is a house, quite simply, that is owned by a contemptible villain. Namely, ma'am, your cousin, Mr Forley, who for some reason or other has kept a poor child hidden away in it, ignored by the world, unseen... Unseen indeed. Except... What do you think, Mr Jarber? Except perhaps for an eye of his looking out through a hole in the blind? Trottle... The child must be rescued. He must. And his identity must be discovered too, along with the cause of my cousin's despicable action. Mr Jarper, will you assist? No. So for Nisper, I shall not. Uh, huh. Why should I labour any further when my endeavours thus far have received such scant appreciation? Oh, <laughs> Mr No, no, Jarper. I withdraw my goodwill. What remains of this sad business? Let it be left to trottle oh. here. <laughs> Adieu. Oh. <laughs> Adieu. Oh. Hmm.
There were now a few days only before Christmas, but I was not yet in a festive mood. True enough, my manservant Trottle had solved the mystery of the house to let. It was not cursed, as my friend Mr. Jarber had claimed it was not haunted. The eye that I had seen peering through a window belonged not to a phantom spirit, but to a small boy, who on the instructions of my cousin George Fawley was kept imprisoned inside the house away from public view. <laughs> but now that I knew this much, a sense of helplessness threatened to overcome me. Trottle! Oh, Trottle, what can be done to secure the unfortunate child's release? I've been wondering as much myself. Perhaps I should go to the house and demand custody of him. With respect, ma'am, I'm not quite sure you have the right to do that. But I would look after the boy. I would love him. Yes, ma'am, I'm certain you would. The boy, however, is not yours. True. Let us first discover whose boy he is and why your cousin has chosen to treat him in this fashion. Yes. Uh, remind me, if you will, about Mr Foley's family circumstances. He is a widower? He is. And there were children, were there not? Two daughters... Only one of whom survives. She lives in Canada, married, childless. And the other daughter? She had been her father's favourite. But she defied his wishes by marrying a man of low birth whose name was Kirkland. Mr Fawley was so opposed to the match that he vowed he would never forgive her, nor did he. Though in truth, the couple's marriage was very brief. The husband, a sailor, drowned on his next voyage. And the wife died soon after giving birth to a boy who was stillborn. Well, where was their home? And in a village called... Um, oh, what is the name? Uh, uh, Flatfield. I think near, near Pendlebury. Pendlebury? Yes, is that of any significance? It could be. You may recall, ma'am, that six or seven years ago I took a short holiday and went to Pendlebury to visit some friends of mine? Yes. One of these friends kept a chemist shop, and through him I met a doctor named Barsham. Mm. He'd been a first-rate practitioner in London, by all accounts, but he was a first-rate fool as well. Began to drink heavily, gambled, lost money, lost custody. This is beginning to sound like one of Mr Jarber's tales. No, no, ma'am. There is sense and meaning to it, I assure you. It's connected with my evening visit to the house over the way and my encounter with the old woman and Benjamin, her drunken son. Mm -hmm. It's connected in particular with the ugly subject of Benjamin's face. When I set eyes on that fellow, ma'am, I was almost certain that I had encountered him before. But you think perhaps you had in Pendlebury? Correct. The <gasps> drunken Benjamin, I rather suspect, is none other than the foolish Dr Barsham. It is Barsham and his mother who were deputed by your cousin to take care of that hapless, pitiable little child. Take care of, surely, is too generous a phrase. But, Trottle, even if you're right about Barsham, are we much the wiser? Well, one thing may lead to another. Mum, I require a day's absence. I must visit Pendlebury again. Trottle! Hey, Trottle! Proctor! <laughs> how very good to see you. I hope so. Though your letter suggested you had business in here. I do, Proctor, I do. I want you to tell me a few things about an acquaintance of yours. Benjamin Barsham. Barsham? Oh, Lord. Well, I'm happy to tell you the little I know, but not in preference on the station platform. <laughs> Let's get home and have some tea. Mm. How long ago was it that he left Pendlebury? Four years, five. And his charming mother? She went too? She did. Why did they leave? Was there a particular reason? Well, an unfortunate event had just occurred. The death of a young woman. A Mrs Kirkland, if I'm not mistaken. No, you're not. A child had died at birth and Barsham was the doctor who had attended her. You're certain of that? Quite certain. And his mother was the nurse. This was at a time when Barsham's professional reputation was already as good as destroyed. Who was it who summoned him for the birth? Mrs Kirkland? No, her father. Mr George Fawley? That's right. You seem to know a great deal about all this. I'm beginning to feel I know more than I want to. The child's death, that would have been registered by Barsham, I take it? Yes, I suppose so. The poor thing was buried in the local churchyard in his mother's grave. No, Proctor, I don't believe so. Oh, forgive me, but I remember quite distinctly. Proctor, the poor thing was never buried at all. The poor thing still lives. 
Trottle, your investigative efforts have been quite magnificent. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. I'm almost inclined to agree with you. <laughs> of course, there is as yet no proof. We cannot be certain that you're right about the child. Oh, I can. It's clear to me that Mrs Kirkland's baby survived, but that George Forley decided it must be thought to be dead, and Barsham and his mother were employed to carry out the deception. But why should he conceive such a plan? Why, indeed. <sighs> I wonder, ma'am, do you have a notion as to the arrangements for inheritance in the Forley family? Anything which might have some relevance in this matter? None at all. Well, then, I shall have to see what I can discover myself. I happen to have a friend who does clerical work for a lawyer. Oh. Perhaps with his help, something can be found. Trottle, I am beginning to perceive that you are not only a man of great resourcefulness, but also extremely fortunate in your acquaintances. <laughs> True, I am. <laughs> and may I say, ma'am, that of all my acquaintances, I am most fortunate in knowing you. Trottle's legal inquiry occupied him for much of the following day, during which time I kept watch over the house to let, and rather hoped that I might see an eye looking at me through a hole in the blind, now that I knew who the eye belonged to. But I saw no eye, and I saw no one come or go. Mum! Oh, Trottle! Mum, I bring news. Trottle, I too have news, but you first. What did you find in the probate office? Do sit, Trottle. Documents, ma'am. Oh, and more documents. And, alas, yet more of them. <sighs> but after considerable searching, the last will and testament of Mr Forley's father was unearthed, and it contains an interesting particular. The will stipulates that the money left to George Forley may not then be assigned to whomsoever he pleases. <laughs> Mr. Forley is granted merely a life interest in the money and has no discretion as to where it should go when he dies. And where is it to go? If either of Mr. Forley's daughters has a son, the money must go to him. Think on that, ma'am. I am doing so. The child of the daughter who had defied Mr. Forley and who was the object of his vexation and anger, that child, were he to live, would inherit the family fortune. <gasps> Good reason it might be considered to register that child as stillborn yes. and to shut him away and blot out all trace of his parentage. <sighs> so, ma'am, what now? Do we go to the police? Do you wish to confront your cousin with our discovery? Bring proceedings against him, perhaps? No, Trottle. No, ma'am? That won't be possible. My news is that Mr George Ford is dead. I had been informed by my sister. Forley had died three days before, quite suddenly. Barsham and his mother, Trottle reasoned, were now in a helpless position, and he decided to pay a second call at the house to let in order to obtain from them an admission of the truth. I watched from the window. I saw Trottle crossing the road towards the house, but I saw another man also. The paths of the two men converged at the foot of steps. Oh, oh, forgive me. No, no, my fault. After you. Oh, you're making a visit here, are you? That's right. Do you wish to speak to a certain uh, Benjamin Barsham? I do, as it happens. Uh, and indeed to his mother. Are they known to you? The two men were in conversation for some while, and then I saw Trottle lead the stranger away from the front steps and back across the road. Very soon, I was being introduced to Mr. John Dalcott, confidential legal adviser to the late Mr. Forley, and now his executor. Strange to say, ma'am, it's Mr. Dalcott here who must be thanked for my discovery of the child. Is it now? Last Monday, when I called at the house, Barsham and his mother had assumed that I was Mr. Dalcott and therefore admitted me. Oh, well, it was arranged, you see, that I was to visit them either last Monday or today, bringing money with me for whatever service it was that they'd rendered. On the Monday, other business prevented me from travelling to London. But you're here so... today, despite Mr Forley's death. Uh, well, madam, the money is still owing to Barsham and his mother, and I thought also that as executor I should inform them of Mr Forley's death oh. and advise them that whatever arrangements had previously obtained between themselves and Mr Forley are for the time being discontinued. Nay, for all time, I would hope. Yes, madam. What your manservant has told me of the situation in that house almost beggars belief. Yes. Mm. Um, Mr. Dorcott, 
It had been my intention before our chance meeting to speak to Barsham and his mother and encourage them to make some sort of statement as to their part in the whole sorry affair. Oh, good idea. I shall accompany you. And we shall obtain such a declaration in writing, if we can. Yeah, and what about the child? The poor creature mustn't stay in that place any longer than necessary. I shall bring him here, ma'am. Shall I? Well, what do you say, Mr Dolcott? Would it be in order for me to look after the boy? In the short term, I mean. At least. Mr Dolcott agreed, and he and Trottle, it was late evening now, returned to the house over the way. They obtained the written declaration and Trottle removed the boy from his wretched room and carried him out of the house. The boy was brought to me. And though he held away at first, it was not long before he clung close. A bed was made up for the little mite and he was washed and a shirt of Trottle's was used as a nightgown and he was soon fast asleep. He looks contented enough, does he not, ma'am? He does. Trottle? Yes, ma'am? God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. It occurs to me, Trottle, that I ought to have asked Mr. Dolcott about what will happen to the house to let now that my cousin has died. I should imagine, ma'am, that it will be put up for sale. If it is, I'd like to buy the place. If I succeed, I shall make some changes to it. I hope you will. I shall transform it entirely. I shall turn it into a hospital. A hospital, ma'am? A hospital for sick children. That's my plan. What do you say, Trottle? I say God bless you. <laughs> The following day, it being Christmas Eve, I sent Trottle round to my friend Mr Jarper, he who had attempted, but failed, to solve the mystery of the house to lead. But Mr Jarber, it transpired, was unable to accept my invitation to come over for refreshments. He was suffering from a fever, as a consequence of which he had become somewhat distracted in his mind about various strange occurrences including a sailor return from the dead and a dwarf return from society. So instead of entertaining Mr Jarber, I devoted the time to my little boy, the dear child whom I have since adopted and who is the beloved and loving answer to my prayers. I sat with him and I played with him and I thought about the misery from which he had been rescued. I thought too about another child who is never thought about enough at Christmas time. And I humbly gave thanks to God for all his blessings. A House to Let by Charles Dickens, Wilkie Collins, Elizabeth Gaskell, and Adelaide Ann Proctor was dramatised by Martin Wade. It featured Marcia Warren as Sophonisma, Alec McCowan as Jabez Jarber. Warwick Davis as Mr Chops, Brian Croucher as Trottle, Stephen Critchlow as Frank, Sam Dale as Openshaw and Magsman, Mark Straker as The Proctor and Benjamin, Paul Biggin as Dolcott, Miranda Keeling as Alice, Bethan Walker as Ailsie, Marlena Sideway as The Old Woman, Saikat Ahmed as The Police Officer and The Bandsman, and Tracy Wiles as Nora. The director was Ned Chaillet.